Wondering if Saba had any idea how bad she looked, Leia turned to Han. She might beat it with a healing trance, but... We've got to take her back. He looked as worried and frustrated as Leia felt. There was no question of not taking Saba back. The Baribal was clearly in danger of dying or being permanently paralyzed, and Silgal, the Jedi Master Healer, had an infirmary and a lab back on Asus that would have the best resources to help her. Han turned to Kakmame. Catch me wall and start prepping the Falcon. The Nogri nodded and raced off toward the tunnel that led down to the hangar. And don't wake Juan up! Han yelled as an afterthought. The last thing we want is a Celestin slowing things down with procedure. Leia motioned the stretcher bearers after Cockmane. Let's get her to the Falcon. Not so fast, Saba said. The Kilix paid no attention to her and started across the dance field after Cockmane. The third is Azin. We must warn Master's Skywalker. Leia exchanged a concerned look with Han, then said gently, Saba, the shadow is gone, remember? We won't be able to warn them until we reach Galactic Alliance space. Jaina appeared alongside the litter with Zek and Alma. Saba, are you sure about the assassins? Alma asked. It really doesn't sound like. The inquiry was cut short when the severed arm rose off the stretcher and hit the Twi'lek in the chest. Yes, Zur. They reached the tunnel leading down to the hangar. Leia sent C-3PO on with the Kilix and Saba, then stopped at the entrance and turned to Jaina. How soon can you be ready? Jaina's jaw fell. Ready? Yeah, to leave, Han said, coming in on cue. You can't have much stuff to pack. Jaina continued to look shocked for a moment. Then a shadow of her father's crooked grin came to her lips. Nice try, guys. Try. Han managed to sound outraged. We had a deal. You can't hold us to that. Zek cried. Jaina raised a silencing hand to him. Let me handle this, Zek. I've had practice. Jaina, Leia said sternly. We did go after Loi. Don't try the desilogic shift on me, Jaina said. The terms were that we had to bring him back. Yeah, well, you should have told us your ex-boyfriend was sitting on him, Han countered. You held back. Didn't know, Jaina said, and it wouldn't matter if I did. Lobak is still out there. We're not going back without him. As Jaina folded her arms, the gesture was simultaneously mimicked by the swarm of Kilix that had gathered around them. But Leia was not ready to give up. Jaina, you know you're only making the situation worse, she said. The Chis are escalating things because of your presence. That's right, Han said. And you proved on the rescue mission that your judgment isn't exactly sound. Jaina did a good job of maintaining a neutral expression, but Leia was too adept at reading faces to miss the glimmer of hurt that flashed through their daughter's eyes. Jaina, if you really want to help Lobaka, you'll come back with us. Leia switched her gaze to all three Jedi. You know the Chiss are an honorable people. Stop making the situation worse and give us a chance to work this out diplomatically. Jaina and Zek actually dropped their gazes, but Alma was ready with a response. And while you're still trying to make contact, they'll send in a fleet of defoliators to finish what they began. Jaina nodded. Diplomacy is good, she said. But it's better when there's something to back it up. Go ahead and make contact with the Chiss, but we're staying. That's one option, Leia allowed but I'm concerned that you really don't know who you're dealing with. Jaina's scowl of confusion was mirrored by the other two Jedi. We're not talking about the Chiss, Han explained. You three are in way over your heads here, 
Unless you think Saba really did imagine those assassin bugs? Alma's eyes flashed at the word bugs, but she was the first to shake her head. They were real. But they weren't taught, Zek added. That's one of the things we'll be working on, Jaina said. Until when? Once again, Leia was unnerved by how easily the trio were finishing each other's sentences. Until you become joiners? Jaina and the others shared a glance, then Zek said. That depends. On what? Han asked. On how quickly you convinced the Chiss to stop, Alma finished. Maybe you'd better hurry back to the Falcon, Jaina finished. Especially if Saba is right about where that third assassin went. Leia's stomach grew hollow and worried. Jaina was right about that much, at least. They did not have a lot of time to waste trying to talk the three Jedi into coming home. And Han knew it, too. He stepped close to Jaina. Jaina, listen to me. I don't have to listen, Dad, Jaina said. I can feel what you're thinking. We all can, Zek added. No daughter of mine is going to become a bug hugger, Alma finished. Hey, no fair, Han objected. Just because I don't like bugs doesn't mean I'm wrong. There's something sneaky going on here, and Raynar's in it up to his neck. You don't know that, Jaina said. This is the third time we've been attacked, Leia reminded her. And Raynar did tell us he was afraid we'd try to take you away. Then he can stop worrying, because we're not going anywhere until the Chiss leave, Jaina said. So hurry up and make that happen. She opened her arms to embrace Han, but he stepped back shaking his head. No, Jaina, I'm not giving this my... I wasn't looking for your blessing, Dad. Jaina's voice had grown hard, not angry, just hard. And I guess I'd be foolish to hope for anything else. If you're going to be ronto-brained about this, yeah, Han said. I'll tell you what. You take Saba back in the Falcon, and your mother and I'll stay here to handle the chiss. And recover Loi, Leia added. You'd let me fly the Falcon home? Jaina asked, cocking her head in an all too killick like fashion. Alone? Well, with Alma and Zek, Han said. Sure. Jaina scowled. Who do you think you're talking to, Dad? I know how you feel about insects. She turned her back on Han and held her arms out to Leia. Mother? I wish you'd listen to your father. Leia's chest grew heavy, for she could see Han's frustration with Jaina turning to anger. You do know you might be the real prize in this conflict? Raynor isn't the earnest young man who went to Mwarkeo with you. He's desperate and lonely. I wouldn't be surprised if he had instigated the whole border conflict just to draw you. Mom, sometimes you think too much. Jaina lowered her arms, then turned and started away. You'd better get the Falcon off this moon. I'll try to warn Aunt Mara through the Force. Jaina! Han barked. Jaina ignored him. Zex said, Do what you can with the Chiss. We'll keep things in check here. He turned and started after Jaina. This isn't over, you know. Han said to their backs. We're going to come back. Jaina waved over her shoulder, but Alma remained where she was, in front of the solos. I'll be going with you, the Twi'lek said to Leia. Jaina and Zek both stopped and whirled around in surprise. You will? Jaina asked. We didn't expect this, Zek said. They'll need a guide. Alma explained. They can't go back the same way they came without stopping at Yaga, and that may not be a good idea, at least not until we know who's behind these attacks. Jaina scowled at the unexpected change of plan, 
but nodded and turned to her father. Do you have room on the Falcon? Sure, Hans said. Why don't you all come? Twenty. Even curled into the primal egg position on the Falcon's medbay bunk, staring dead ahead with glazed eyes, Saba looked more annoyed by her wounds than pained by them. Her pebbly lips were drawn back in a frozen sneer, with the tips of her forked tongue showing between her fangs, and the claws on her hands were fully extended. She held her bandaged tail wrapped tightly around her hindquarters, and if she was breathing at all, Leia saw no sign of it in her constricted nostrils and motionless chest. She looks like she's dying, Alma whispered over Leia's shoulder. Is she dying? I don't know. Leia checked the monitors and found a single spike on the cardio line. There was a barely discernible upward slope on the respiratory chart. I think it's just a healing trance. Well, she looks like she's dying, Alma said. Saba's tongue shot out and snapped the air, drawing a surprised gasp from both Leia and Alma, then returned to its place between her teeth. The Barabelle's eyes remained fixed and glazed. Healing trance, Leia concluded. Do you think she'll survive? Leia studied the silken bandage that covered half of Saba's skull. With that head wound, anyone else would be dead already, she said. But Saba's a barable. Who knows? Alma's only answer was a long, concerned silence. After a time... Leia lowered the lights and told the med computer to alert her if anything changed in Saba's status. As Leia drew the privacy curtain across the med bay, she asked, How about a nice mug of hot chocolate? We have some of Luke's special supply on board. Really? Hot chocolate. Alma gasped. Always scarce. Hot chocolate had become a true hut's pleasure after the Yuzen Vong reshaped seven of the eight planets capable of growing the rare pods necessary to produce it. What about your duties in the cockpit? Don't worry about that. Leia took the Chuilek's arm and led her forward. The Falcon had just left Koribu and was preparing to make its first jump to hyperspace, but Leia needed to find out what was really happening on Julio, and the sooner, the better. June is filling in for me. Han's growing fond of the little guy. Alma curled her leku. That's not the impression I get from Han. Leia gave a knowing smile. That's because Han doesn't realize it yet. They entered the main cabin. Anyway, we have time. Have a seat. Leia took several white thumb-sized seeds from a storage box and placed them in the galley multiprocessor. She set the controls to dry and powder, then turned, placed a fist on her hip, and began to study Alma with the same slightly interested, slightly preoccupied expression that she had been using to soften up her subjects since her days as a junior senator in the Old Republic. Leia should have known it wouldn't work on Alma Rar. Lithe, beautiful, and averse to modest clothing, the Twi'lek was used to being stared at. She simply stared back, making Leia feel as though she were the one dressed only in a sideless chemise. The multiprocessor chimed, allowing Leia to turn away gracefully. She added a lot of sweetener and a small amount of water, then set the controls to agitate and heat. You have a complicated way of making hot chocolate, Alma noted. Usually, it just comes out of the dispenser nozzle. This is better, Leia said, turning back toward the Twi'lek. Trust me. Of course, Alma said. Is there a reason not to? Leia began to wonder who was being interrogated here. She waited until it was time to add the milk, then instructed the multiprocessor to heat slowly and joined Alma at the table. Okay. Leia assumed her best motherly tone and leaned in close. So what is it? Alma frowned, but did not pull back. What is what? The reason you're here, Leia said. We both know that Jun could have gotten the Falcon past Jago. 
Finally, a glimmer of doubt showed in Alma's face. Leia was tempted to probe her feelings through the Force, but suspected the Twi'lek would sense the intrusion and resent it. Alma looked toward the multiprocessor. Shouldn't you check the hot chocolate? The unit will chime. Leia kept her gaze fixed on the Twi'lek's face. I saw how Jaina and Zek reacted, Alma. That doesn't mean... You three could barely start a sentence without someone else finishing it, Leia said. It's the meld. Alma's answer came a little too quickly. We really baked ourselves on the Voxen mission. That so? Leia was far too experienced to miss the Twi'lek's attempt to change the subject, but she decided to play along, for now. When did you start using the battle meld with Killix? Alma looked genuinely confused. We haven't. What makes you think that? They're not even Force-sensitive. I know. Leia gave her a motherly smile. But there is a mental connection, especially with you. I saw it at the dance. Alma cast a hopeful look toward the multiprocessor, then seemed to realize that the bell would only delay the inevitable. Maybe there is, she said. It's nothing you're aware of. You start feeling like you belong, then you sort of, suddenly you just seem to have a larger mind. Leia began to wonder if there were any deprogrammers in the Galactic Alliance capable of handling eight Jedi. It's hard to describe. Alma must have sensed Leia's thoughts in the Force, because her tone was defensive. You're aware of so much more. You see outside the nest when you're inside, or inside when you're outside. And what you feel, you feel everything. I've heard Glitterstim is a lot like that, Leia commented dryly. This is even better, Alma said. You don't get sick. It's completely harmless. Leia was beginning to see why the Twi'lek's infatuation with Anakin had always made Han so nervous. Though the multiprocessor hadn't chimed yet, she returned to the galley and took two empty mugs from the cabinet, then placed a sliver of tang bark and a drop of orchid bean extract in each. What's that? Alma asked, joining Leia at the galley. Spice, Leia said. Alma's eyes lit. Not that kind, Leia said. Just flavoring. The multiprocessor chimed. She filled both mugs, topped them with dollops of mallow paste, made from real mallow root, and handed one to Alma. You're wrong, you know, Leia said. It's not harmless. Alma glanced at her mug and looked confused. The colony, Leia said. Or have you forgotten the attack on the shadow? And the tower collapse on Jagoi? You can't believe the colony was responsible. Tot may not have healed Saba, but they saved her life. Tot's healers had to save Saba's life because someone else tried to take it. Not Killix. Saba said she was attacked by. Alma frowned, then finished. A man. You heard her. She thought it was Welk, Leia said, supplying the name Alma had not been able to recall. Saba also said he was protecting a Killick nest. A nest with two dark blue Killicks. Leia paused, then demanded, Who were they? That part makes no sense, Alma said. There are no blue Killicks, at least none we've seen here. The denial would have been more convincing had Alma's eyes not slid away. Leia took a sip from her mug, savoring its silky sweetness as she pondered what the Twi'lek might be trying to conceal. It makes sense to you, Leia said finally. But you don't want to tell me. Alma took a sip of her drink, hiding from Leia behind the rim of her mug. We're all upset about what happened to Master Sebatine. Why would anyone hide information about that? Obviously, because you're trying to protect the Killix. Leia returned to the table and sat down, regarding the Twi'lek from across the cabin. 
What I can't figure out is why you wanted to come with us. Are you afraid we're going to discover the secret they're trying to protect? Very good. Alma raised her mug to indicate she was talking about the hot chocolate. It is better this way. Leia ignored the compliment. Or maybe you're afraid that what happened to Master Sebatine is going to happen to us. Alma raised her mug again, but she swallowed too quickly to enjoy what she was drinking. So that's it, Leia said. She could not help feeling a little hurt that her own daughter had not worried about her safety, but that was probably because Jaina knew that Leia and Han could take care of themselves, or so she told herself. You're trying to protect us. Not at all. Alma came to join her at the table. You don't need protecting, at least not from Killix. The Chiss are afraid of something, Leia pointed out. Yes. Alma sat down next to Leia. They're afraid the Galactic Alliance will learn what they've been doing in Korribu. They're afraid of the Killix, Leia said. And you're hiding the reason. All of you are. There's nothing to hide, Alma said. Chis xenophobia is well documented. And where insects are involved, it's pure bigotry. Just because a life form has six legs, they think they're free to smash it. Nice try, Leia said. But we're not changing the subject. The jump alert knelled softly, and the silky beverage in their mugs shuddered slightly as the falcons slipped into hyperspace. Leia decided the time had come to start pushing. Alma, what were those insects Welk was protecting? Alma made a point of meeting Leia's gaze. You know as much about that as anyone. Fair enough, Leia said. I do have a theory. Those insects were exactly what Saba thought they were, colony assassins. Alma shook her head. Why would the colony need assassins? Because Yuna wants its own Jedi, Leia said. And that means stopping us. No, Alma insisted. The colony would never murder anyone. Sure it would, Leia said. That's why Raynar was willing to let us leave after we discovered Jagoi's location. He didn't think we'd live long enough to reveal it to anyone else. He let you leave because he trusted you to keep the secret. Yunu has nothing to do with the attacks on you and the shadow. That was... Alma frowned again, as though she were trying to recall the name of Saba's attacker. Well, Leia supplied. I'm surprised you have so much trouble remembering the name of someone who betrayed you. It doesn't mean anything, Alma said. You're flustering me with this nonsense about the colony trying to kill you, that's all. The excuse was just convenient enough to rouse Leia's suspicion. I'm sorry. Maybe you can remember the name of Welk's master? What was his name? Her name, Alma said. Good try, though. Do you recall her name? Alma thought for a moment, then asked. What does this have to do with anything? They're both dead. Then it wasn't Welk who attacked Saba? Leia asked. Alma shook her head resolutely. It couldn't have been. He died when the flyer crashed, along with his master. Now it was Leia's turn to frown. The truth, at least Alma's memory of it, seemed to be changing before her eyes. Then who was it? It must have been a Chiss spy, Alma said. With a lightsaber? He could have stolen it, Alma said. Or found it. That's possible, Leia said carefully. But wouldn't a simpler explanation be that Welk survived the crash? Alma shook her head, and her tone grew ardent. Raynar was the only one Yagoi found at the crash? That doesn't mean Raynar was the only one who survived, Leia insisted. Didn't Jason tell you? He was there. 
He saw Raynor pull both Welk and Lomi out of the crash. Jason said that, she admitted. But it's impossible. When the flyer crashed, he was on Bon Aras with us. Or Vergera's prisoner on Coruscant. True, Leia said. Still, he saw what happened at the crash. I don't know how, but he did. He said he did. Alma stood and turned as though to leave, then whirled back toward the table. That doesn't make it true. Leia was puzzled by the strange reaction. When I was at the crash, he spoke to me, at the same time he was on Julio, she said. So I tend to believe him. You would. Alma began to pace. He's your son. And I've seen what he can do. Cautiously, Leia asked. Why is it so important for you to believe Jason is wrong? Why is it so important for you to believe he isn't? I'm trying to figure out who's been attacking us. Leia was speaking in a soft, non-threatening voice, and wondering who exactly she was talking to. Maybe there had been more to that hopeful look than Leia imagined when Alma had mistaken the Tang Bak for Glitterstim. And I'm pretty certain Welk is involved. Possibly Lomi. It doesn't matter what Jason thinks he saw. Alma said. They're both dead. And you know this? Alma nodded. How? Leia asked. We... Alma's face went blank, and she began to make loud clicking sound deep in her throat. The colony knows. The colony knows. Leia made a point of letting her skepticism show. Alma, what are you trying to protect us from? Nothing. The Twi'lek banged her fists on the table. You have nothing to fear if you will just do what we tell you. We who, Alma? Alma's eyes widened, then she drew herself upright and stood at the table in shock, her mouth working but no sound coming from her lips. The Nogri appeared silently at the cabin entrance. Leia signaled them to wait with an eye flicker, then let the silence hang while she finished her hot chocolate. Finally, she put the empty mug down and looked up. Well, I'm happy to see you understand why that statement is so wrong. Of course, Alma said. We, I apologize. She spun on her heel and left the cabin so quickly that the Nogri barely had time to step out of her way. Leia did not go after her. There would be plenty of time to tease the rest of the truth out of her on the trip back to Asus, and Leia had learned enough for now. She closed her eyes and reached into the force for Luke, hoping that this time her sense of him would be a little more solid, that she could impart to him some hint of the hidden danger that the shadow might have carried back from Korribu. 21. The four brains displayed above the Medhalo varied broadly in size and shape the largest being oblong with only a slight downward bulge to join the brain stem, the smallest looking more like a withered pal eye mounted on a pulsing mushroom stem. In three of the brains, bursts of activity were simultaneously blossoming in bright identical colors, then fading at exactly the same rate. Even more telling were the two-dimensional alpha waves crawling through the air beneath each hologram. Three of the patterns were indistinguishable, with matched frequencies and amplitudes. The fourth wave, located beneath the solid blue shape of a human brain, was alternating between dead flat and so wildly erratic that the peaks vanished into the hollow above. Very funny, Jason. Luke frowned toward the relaxy chair where his nephew reclined, looking out through viewing window of a huge scanning hood. Would you stop playing with the brain mapper? Just making the point. The fourth brain went entirely white. This won't tell you anything. You must decide for yourselves whether we can be trusted. Trust isn't the issue, Corin Horn said. Along with Luke, Mara, and several other Jedi Masters, he was standing in the isolation ward of the infirmary at the Jedi Academy on Asus, where they would be far from the prying eyes of the Galactic Alliance Advisory Council. We're just trying to figure out what happened to you. 
It has nothing to do with Kilix, Tessar said. We overused the meld, Tahiri said. And now we can't stay out of each other's minds, Tekli finished. Though Luke certainly knew about the problems the meld had caused the strike team survivors, he suspected these new symptoms had more to do with Kilix than the meld. Still, that was a judgment better made by the Jedi Order's master healer. Luke turned to Silgal. What do you think? The Mon Calamari looked at him out of one bulbous eye. I think they are mistaken. Mistaken? K.Y.P. Duran asked with his usual lack of tact. Or lying? Tessar Sebatine started to push his scanning hood off. This one does not. Easy, Tessar. Luke flashed K.Y.P. a look of irritation. Now was hardly a good time to be testing Tessar's patience. The Baribal had felt his mother get wounded less than 24 hours earlier and the only thing anyone knew about the circumstances was a vague sensation that Luke had felt from Leia suggesting that she was caring for Saba, and that he and Mara faced the same danger on Asus. I'm sure Master Durin didn't mean to impugn your honor. Ignoring the opportunity for an apology, KYP continued to look at Silgal. Okay, why do you think they're mistaken? Because the activity is in the wrong places. Silgo keyed a command, and a blobby structure about the size of a thumbtip began to glow deep within the hologram of Tahiri's brain. With the meld, the hypothalamus responds to emotional reverberations in the force, Silgo said. The blob began to swell and grow red. Prolonged use, or very intense use, can enlarge it and make it hypersensitive. Melders can become so attuned to each other that their minds begin to read the reverberations much as transceivers read calm waves. That's when the meld slips into telepathy. What about the mood swings? Corin asked. Silgo keyed another command. What looked like a wishbone with two long, curling tails appeared above the image of Tahiri's hypothalamus. As use is continued, the effect spills over into the rest of the limbic system, and melders begin to alter each other's emotions. The masters watched for a few moments as the wishbone grew thicker and darker. They were all aware of the risks associated with the meld, but this was the first time many had heard Silgal's theory concerning the actual mechanism. Luke had the sense that some were looking inward trying to guess how sensitive their own limbic systems might be growing. Finally, Corin asked, And where is the other kind of activity occurring? Silgo keyed another command. A fibrous, cap-like structure about 10 centimeters long appeared above Tahiri's limbic system and beneath both her cerebral hemispheres. It was, Luke noted, in a perfect position to act as bridge among all major sections of the brain. The structure of the corpus callosum has changed, Silgal said. As she spoke, the hypothalamus and limbic system paled, and a hazy yellow fuzz formed in their place. That haze you see is composed of free-dangling dendrites. It suggests that Tessar, Tekli, and Tahiri are sending impulses directly from one brain to another. And Jason? Mara asked. That's difficult to say. Silgo glanced at Jason, who sat beneath his hood, playing color games with the hologram of his brain. But probably not, since he was there only a fraction of the time the others were. What about these impulses? Kyle Katarn asked. With brown hair, brown eyes, and a tan shirt tucked into brown breeches, he looked like a farmer about to return to his fields instead of one of the Jedi Order's most famous and skilled members. Are you talking about Force Impulses? Silgal shook her elongated head. Probably not. From what Master Skywalker said, the Killicks don't appear to be Force-sensitive. She stepped away from the controls, then continued, I suspect the impulses are moving through their auras. Their auras? Kent Hamner asked. A tall Jedi with a deeply lined face and dignified bearing, 
he had a keen mind and a habit of skeptical inquiry. I've always had the impression that auras were so much Falanasi nonsense. Not at all, Sogil said. Every being is surrounded by an aura of subtle energies, heat, electric, magnetic, even chemical, some extending as far as 10 meters. I have a multi-band detector that can image your own, if you like. For now, we'll take your word for it, Luke said. At the moment, he was less interested in proof than in a working theory. How confident are you? Not confident at all, Sogil said. I'll have to perform some tests to verify my hypothesis. Tests are useless, Techly said from inside her scanning hood. They won't reveal anything. Our problem is the meld. Tahiri insisted. We need no tests to tell us that, Tessar agreed. Luke and the other masters exchanged uncomfortable glances, their mutual concern growing sharper in the force. The trio's insistence on blaming the meld was beginning to sound irrational. Finally, Corin said, Sogol, you said their corpus CA, er, whatever it was had changed. How did that happen? Was that also caused by the auras? Probably not, Sogol said. Most insects rely heavily on pheromones to regulate their lives, so that's where my suspicions fall first. That makes sense, Mara agreed. The nests were soaked with pheromones. You're saying a smell changed our Jedi's brain structure? Koran asked. Pheromones aren't just odors. Silgal said. They're very powerful chemicals. They trigger a wide range of behaviors and physical changes in nearly every animal in the galaxy. And they change your brain? Corin repeated, still unconvinced. Everything changes your brain, Silgal said. Whenever you learn something new or develop a skill or make a memory, your brain grows new connections to store and access information. Under the right stimulus, it's very conceivable that parts of it could be completely modified. So, Mara asked, spend enough time in the pheromone bath, and your brain rewires itself? Exactly, Sogol said. Especially if the pheromones work through the nose. In most species, smell is a direct input to the brain. And you're sure these Jedi Knights are just mistaken about what's happened to them? KYP asked, raising the question again for no good reason Luke could see. They couldn't be lying? We are not lying! Tessar stood, pushing his hood up and pointing a talon in KYP's direction. We do not lie! Concerned that KYP was sensing something he had not, Luke reached out to Tessar and the others in the Force. He felt outrage, confusion, even a small hint of a joiner's double presence, but no dishonesty. As far as he could tell, the trio believed they were telling the truth. Luke sent a gentle force nudge urging KYP to apologize, but the shaggy-haired Jedi ignored it and returned the glare Tessar was shooting in his direction. Then prove it, KYP said. Tell us why you agreed to come back from Koribu. The tip of Tessar's forked tongue darted between his lips, and the anger in his slit-pupiled eyes slowly changed to admiration. Very good, Master Durin, Tessar said. We did not see that coming at all. I'm glad I still have something to teach, KYP said. Are you going to answer? Of course, Tahiri said, slipping out from beneath her own hood. All you had to do was ask. So we're asking, Mara said. We came to persuade the council to help the Kilix, Tessar said. The colony can only stop the Chish through war. And the Jedi can bring other pressures to bear, Tahiri added. It's best for everyone. That will be for the Master's Council to decide, Kent said. And when it does, will you abide by our decision? We aren't wrong about this. Tahiri dodged. The Chish are committing genocide, 
Tessar added. We must intervene. Immediately, Tekli pushed her hood up and came to stand with the others, leaving only Jason's brain, currently gold and pulsing, displayed on the medhalo. Aren't we bound as Jedi to protect the weak? Jedi are bound by a great many duties, often contradictory, Kent said. Which is why we call Master's Councils. I ask again, will you abide by our decision? The trio fell silent, then Tahiri and Tekli dropped their eyes, and Tessar said, That depends on what the decision is. Kenth and Corin recoiled visibly. But KYP Duran smiled. Well, it's an honest answer. As much as that is possible for them, Silgo said. She turned to Luke. I don't like to question their integrity, Master Skywalker, but anything they tell us is suspect. We must assume their judgment has been compromised by the same power that called them away in the first place. Tessar glared openly in Silgo's direction. You are saying we cannot be trusted? She met his gaze evenly. You're not to blame, but yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Tessa looked from Silgal to Luke to KYP and back to Luke, then thumped his tail and retreated to his relaxy chair. Tahiri took his place. We don't deserve this. She glared directly into Luke's eyes. You have no reason to treat us like we're Sith. Probably not, Kent said. But until those mysterious attacks on Jagai and at Korobu are explained, there's no harm in being safe. By all means, Tessa rasped from his chair. This one would not want you to fear us. Luke turned to Silgal. Perhaps you'd explain your concerns? The Mon Calamari nodded. It's very simple. The meld always comes from the outside. You know you're listening to someone else's thoughts and reacting to someone else's emotions. But this, this joining feels like it comes from inside. The things our Jedi Knights see through it, or hear or smell or taste, seem like things they're sensing themselves. Even the thoughts they share seem to arise inside their own minds. So they don't know whether their thoughts are their own or someone else's? Mara asked. Luke could sense that she was as concerned as he was, that she was afraid their young Jedi Knights were lost to the colony already. They can't just ignore outside thoughts, like we can in the meld? I'm afraid that's correct, Silgal said. In all likelihood, it's impossible to know the difference. The masters studied Tahiri and the other young Jedi in silence, their faces betraying the same disappointment and concern and uncertainty that Luke felt. Silgal could probably find a way to negate the changes to their brain structure. But the patients were clearly going to be uncooperative, and that would make recovery a long, difficult process. Finally, Kent said, Well, that explains a lot. They certainly haven't been acting like themselves. Perhaps not, Tessar admitted. He leaned forward, being careful to remain seated and non-threatening. But that doesn't mean we are wrong about Koribu. Asked Master Skywalker, Tekli said. They both saw Julio. They can tell you what the Chis have done to the moon. Fair enough, Luke said. Mara and I weren't on Julio long enough to gather many facts, but it is clear the Chis are trying to drive the Killix out of the system. And it's just as clear that the Killix don't have the resources to leave, Mara added. The way things are looking... The result will be war or extermination, probably both. Tahiri beamed, Tessar assumed a reptilian grin, and Tekli brought her ears forward. Then Corin asked, Why? Tessar rose. Why what? Why are the Chis doing this? He asked. They're xenophobic and secretive, but they're not expansionists. If they're trying to drive the Killix away, they must have a reason. They are afraid the colony will expand into their territory, Tessar said. That is what their joiners say. 
There's more to it, Mara said. If all the Chiss were worried about was border security, they just wait for a nest to pop up in their own territory, then attack. That's right, Luke agreed. Something about the Killick scares the Chiss so much they don't want them in the same sector as an ascendancy system. You'd have to ask the Chiss about that, Tahiri said. We shouldn't need to, Kent pointed out. Isn't it the first duty of a Jedi to understand both sides of a conflict? Tahiri met his gaze with a raised chin. We were occupied. Saving innocence. And look what happened, Kent said. Both sides are closer to war than ever. Perhaps, Tekli said. But our mistakes shouldn't condemn the Corybin nests. And they shouldn't commit the Jedi to any action the Masters haven't authorized. Corin turned away from the trio and addressed the other Masters. Our first concern must be the stability of the Galactic Alliance. No. K.Y.P. Duran surprised everyone by stepping to Tahiri's side. The Jedi are no one's mercenaries, not even the Galactic Alliance's. Our first concern, our only concern, is our own conscience. We must follow it wherever it leads. Octa Ramus, who had remained silent until now, spoke up to agree with K.Y.P., then Kent agreed with Corin. K.Y.P. repeated his position and the discussion degenerated into argument. Tahiri, Tekli, and Tessa remained silent, content to let their advocates argue their case. Luke glanced over at Jason, who was continuing to create elegant swirls of light in his brain hollow, and wished he were also free to ignore the argument. What he really wanted to be doing was looking for a slicer who could access that sequestered sector in R2-D2's memory but personal business would have to wait. The argument among the masters was rapidly growing more heated. Luke eased his way into the middle of the knot. Enough. The tumult began to quiet, and he said, This isn't the time for discussion. We're just here to have a look at Sildal's tests and listen to our Jedi Knight's report. An embarrassed silence fell over the room as the masters contemplated their outbursts. Then KYP flushed and dropped his chin. I let my emotions carry me away. I apologize. No need, Corin said, slapping his shoulder. We were all a little excited. Master Skywalker is right, Kyle added. We're just here to listen. You haven't listened to me yet. Jason sounded as though he were less than a meter from the group. But when Luke turned around, he found only the image of his nephew's brain floating above the holopad. Jason himself remained seated in his relaxy chair, eyes staring blankly out through the viewing window of his scanning hood. Okay, Jason, Luke said. We'd be very interested in hearing your report. The hologram pulsed in a brilliant show of iridescent color, and the alpha line below it quivered in time to a deep booming voice that was barely recognizable as Jason's. Killix are dangerous friends, but no one's enemy, the brain said. The true danger lies not in what the Jedi do, but in their failure to act at all. The effect was exactly what Jason had intended. A thoughtful silence descended on the group, and the master's gazes turned inward as they searched for the deeper meaning in Jason's words. Luke walked over the control panel. Very funny, he said, switching it off. Didn't I tell you to stop playing with Sildo's brain mapper? 22. Han and Leia were alone in the cockpit, sitting together in one chair, watching the opalescent nothingness of hyperspace slide silently past. The jump was a long one, and there was no reason for them both to spend it on watch. But the flight deck was the one place on the suddenly crowded Falcon to find some discreet time together, and, after the way things had ended with Jaina, Han was glad they had. Somehow, it helped to know that Leia was as frightened for Jaina as he was, that she, too, was determined to find out what Raynar really had planned for their daughter, 
to return to Korba the minute they could, and to put a stop to it. You're in a better mood, Leia said. Talking to you, I guess, Han admitted. How'd you know? The humming. You never hum. Humming? Han frowned. I'm not humming. Really? Leia cocked her head. It certainly sounds like you are. Han spun the seat around until he was facing the same direction Leia had been, then he heard it, a faint, undulating purr. That's not me. Han jumped up, dumping Leia onto her feet. It's a coolant line. A coolant line? Leia slipped into the co-pilot's chair and began calling up status displays. What happened to the alarm? Good question. Han turned toward the back of the flight deck and started down the access corridor. Disengage the hyperdrive and do a slow cooldown. I'll see what I can find out back in systems. The hum grew steadily louder as Han advanced. By the time he entered the main cabin, it had risen to an irritating drone. He met the rest of his crew and passengers coming the other way. Cockmame and Miwa were wide awake, but still pulling on their sleeveless robes. Alma and Jun were both bleary-eyed and dressed in their sleeping shifts, which, in Alma's case, was considerably more than she wore when she was awake. C-3PO was also present, and of course, fully alert. I don't believe I've ever heard the Falcon make a sound quite like this, Captain Solo. What is it? Boiling coolant, Jun said through a yawn. He stretched his arms. The hyperdrive must be. The bleariness vanished from the Celestin's bulbous eyes. Bloa! The hyperdrive is overheating. A loud boom reverberated through the hull as the Falcon executed an emergency drop into Rio space. The drone in the coolant lines became a loud, bubbling hiss. Han pointed at Juin, then jerked a thumb toward the cockpit. Take the navigator's station and get a fix on where we are. 3PO, take the comm station in case we need to send an emergency hail. Everyone else, with me. Han led the way to the rear of the ship, then opened an access panel and peered in at the contorted tangle of valves and radiation-shielded conduits surrounding the unit itself. There was no need to ask for a thermoscanner to determine which lines were overheated. The lower inside conduit was bulging, glowing pale blue, and banging as if there were a pro-fog inside. Han activated the lighting and crawled into the sweltering cabinet then traced the pipe up to the dark nook where it passed through the flow regulator. The diverter valve was stuck half-closed, but Han could not see what had caused the malfunction, or why the sensor hadn't sounded an alarm. Miwal, get me some burn gloves and a face shield. Before he finished asking, the Nogri was passing the gloves and face shield into the cabinet. As Han donned the equipment, June's voice came over the intercom. Captain Solo, I haven't identified exactly where we are yet. Well, keep working on it. I'm sure you can figure it out. Han rolled his eyes. Let me know when you do. Of course, Jun said. But I thought I should report. Look, I'm kind of busy here, Han said. So unless we're under attack, hold the reports until you're done. There was a moment of silence, then Juin asked. Do you want me to wait until we're actually under attack? What? Han turned, banging the side of his head on a strut. Blast! What do you mean, actually? Han, it looks like we're still in colony territory, Leia said, breaking in. We've got a swarm of dart ships coming. Rodder! Han nodded the Nogri toward the cannon turrets, then pulled on the second burn glove. Okay, forget the cooldown. Recalculate the rest of the jump using three-quarter power and go. This shouldn't take long. You've found the problem? Juin's voice was full of all. Already? 
Even better, Han reached up to the regulator and shut down the damaged coolant line. I've found a fix. When Han pulled himself out of the cabinet, Alma was frowning down at him with her leka crossed over her chest. Don't scowl at me, he said. It gives you wrinkles. The frown vanished at once. Are you sure it's necessary to take this kind of risk? She asked. Those dart ships are only coming to greet us. Their nests might even be able to help us make repairs. First, not all dart ships are friendly. Han passed her his face shield, then pulled off his burned gloves. Second, Saba can't wait for repairs, and maybe not Luke and Mar either. And third? There is no third. There's always a third, Alma said. Okay, third. Han passed her the burned gloves and, as the falcon slipped back into hyperspace, concluded. I'm the captain. It's safe if I say it is. Alma shrank back. Okay, just asking, she said. Maybe we should check on Saba. You go ahead, Han said, wondering why the Twi'lek thought he was needed to check on the Bariable. Bugs and bug lovers, he thought, you can't trust either of them. He had a sudden image of Jaina and Raynar rubbing forearms and shuddered. He closed the access panel and started forward. I need to keep an eye on things in the cockpit. Han had barely stepped onto the flight deck when June reported. We have to recalibrate the warp controller. The heat buildup caused a performance spike in the number two nacelle, and we veered off course by seven one thousandths of a degree. We don't have time, Han said. Recalibrating meant days of trial jumps, then he'd have to do it all again when they returned to the Galactic Alliance and repaired the problem. Just run a compensation program. A compensation program? Juin was aghast. But procedure mandates recalibration any time. It also mandates obeying the captain's orders, Han said, slipping into the pilot's seat. Just run the blasted program. Jun was silent for a moment, then asked in a subdued voice, Was the malfunction anything I should account for? Han softened. Good question. He considered for a moment, mentally reviewing the entire coolant system in his mind. An underactive diverter could cause another performance spike, but probably not a closed one, especially not if the hyperdrive remained below maximum power. I don't think so. You don't think so? Jun repeated. Didn't you identify the malfunction? Didn't have time, Han said, growing irritated again. But if you haven't identified the problem, how can you know it's safe? I know, Han growled. Now, are you going to stop bothering me and run that program, or do I have to do it myself? I'd advise you to choose the first option. C-3PO said. When Captain Solo's voice assumes that tone, he has a nasty habit of tripping primary circuit breakers. It's okay, Jay, Leia said. Han knows what he's doing. Oh, I realize that, Princess Leia, Jun replied. I was only asking because I'd like to understand how Han Solo makes decisions. Wouldn't we all? Leia replied. Juin ran the compensation program, then they jumped back into hyperspace and spent the next quarter hour riding in silence, watching status readouts and listening for the faintest hum in the coolant lines. Finally, Han felt confident enough to pronounce the emergency past. He sent Juin back to tell the others they could return to their bunks, then looked over to find Leia staring raptly into her display biting her lower lip as she double-checked Jun's compensation parameters against status readouts. She wore the same enthralled expression she'd often had as New Republic Chief of State, poring over a report on an initiative to feed hungry natives on Galgab, or as rebel leader studying a cruiser buildup on Farbog. It was a look Han had not seen since the end of the war with the Yuzen Vong, 
when the challenge of combat had faded to the drudgery of reconstruction and they had retreated into the falcon to build a smaller, more private life together. It was a look on mist, and one he felt responsible for losing. As much as he loved having Leia all to himself, finally, he knew she needed more out of life. She would never be happy flying around just having adventures. She needed to be doing important things, putting the galaxy back together, and seeing to it that the mega-conglomerates did not end up owning everything. Seeming to feel the weight of his gaze, or perhaps sense it through the Force, Leia looked up from the columns scrolling down her display. Something wrong? Nothing, Han said. I was just wondering. He wanted to say if you were happy, but knew that would sound wrong. It would sound like he was unhappy. Well, if... Juin's parameters are very complete, if you're worried about that, Leia said. We're not going to stay in the safety margin, but when do we ever? Yeah, Han said. That's kind of the point. Do you ever miss our old place back on Coruscant? Leia cocked her brow and remained silent, studying him like a work eyeing a creedal. Having a whole bedroom suite to ourselves, and a real kitchen where we could cook real dinners. That apartment is gone, along with everything else we might remember about that planet. Leia made a point of not looking at Han. And I don't recall you doing much cooking. That doesn't mean I didn't like the food, he said. And we could get another place. With the Reconstruction Authority trying to move the seat of government back. What's this talk about moving into an apartment? Leia asked. I thought you loved living on the Falcon. I do, Han said. But there's more to life than being happy. Leia frowned. Han, you're starting to sound confused. Have you been seeing color flashes? Feeling dizzy? Having trouble here. I'm not having a stroke. Han interrupted. I'm fine. Good. Leia returned to her status display. So am I. And I'm not old, Han said. Did I say you were? Han activated his own display and went to work running sensor tests, trying to locate the fault that had prevented the safety system from detecting the coolant problem before it grew critical. An hour later, he had determined that all of the sensors on the coolant line were stuck at the optimum readings. It took another hour to determine that the number one nacelle readings were being repeated on the number two status bar. By itself, either malfunction was dangerous. Together, they could prove catastrophic. I don't know where we serviced the hyperdrive last time, Han said, but the next time we're in the neighborhood, remind me to send them a concussion missile. Bad coolant? Leia asked. Corrosive impurities were the cause of most coolant problems. Yeah, and that's not all, Han said. Some short circuit ran a double status feed from the number two nacelle. Really? Leia grew thoughtful. I wonder what the chances of making those two mistakes are. Approximately 112,000 to one, Princess Leia. C-3PO said helpfully. The hangar staff at the Jedi Temple are generally quite proficient. That's where we got our last coolant change. Without waiting for a reply, Han turned to Leia. Something smell bad to you. Very, she said. The temple would know by now if it had been using bad coolant. Someone would have warned us. Yeah, Han said. It's gotta be something else. Sabotage? That'd be my bet, Han said. 3PO, find out how Saba's doing, and have Miwal and Cockmane do another sweep of the ship. Tell them to look for droppings and bug tracks. That may be the only way we know they're here. They? C-3PO asked. Killix, Han said. Stowaways. The droid left to obey. 
Han turned to find Leia staring out the viewport with a distant expression. It was the same look he'd seen a dozen times, as she reached out in the force and tried to warn Luke about the assassin bugs Saba had found. He waited until her attention returned to the cockpit, then asked, Any luck? Luke's preoccupied with something about our family. I think he thought I was trying to tell him about Saba. Leia shook her head. And I just don't have a strong enough connection with Mara. What about Jason? I don't know, Leia said. I can't tell if he doesn't believe me or just doesn't understand. Blast, Han said. We could us a little help here. If this is Sabata. Han let the sentence trail off, for a faint thread of blue had appeared ahead, stretched horizontally across the pearly void of hyperspace. Leia, do you see that? What? Han pointed at the thread, which had thickened into a line of mottled colors ranging from white to dark purple. Colors. Very funny, Leia said. I'm sorry I called you old. No, really. Han jabbed his finger toward the line, which was now a finger-width band darkening toward sapphire. Look. Leia looked, and her jaw dropped. Should that be there? Fangs of blue light began to flash out from both sides of the sapphire stripe. No, Han said. Then why hasn't the proximity alarm dropped us out of hyperspace? You don't want to know. By the time Han had a hand on the hyperspace disengage, the sapphire stripe had thickened into a braided grimace of purple and white, and the tips of the blue fangs were flashing clear up to the canopy. He pulled the control lever back to emergency override, and a muffled bang sounded deep in the falcon stern. Han! Leia demanded. What don't I want to know? Tell you in a minute. The entire ship began to buck and shudder, and an eerie chorus of words hummed up the access corridor. Blast! Han re-engaged the hyperdrive. The ship stopped shuddering and the words faded to silence, but the crimson blue ahead reached out and closed around the falcon. Tell me, Han. What don't I want to know? What is this? A reedy voice asked from the back of the flight deck. Have we flown into a nebula? Han was vaguely aware of Leia turning toward Juin's voice, but only vaguely. The blue teeth had become the interior of a white-veined mouth, and most of his mind was busy trying to figure out what to do next. You've flown into a nebula before? Leia asked Jun. Of course, many times, Jun assured her. But usually I disengage the hyperdrive and fly right back out. Not an option. Han eased the hyperdrive control lever back until he heard the first hint of a whir. It didn't take much. We'll blow that bad coolant line when the shutdown temperature spikes. I thought you fixed that. June complained. So did I. Han glanced up at June's reflection in the canopy. Someone unfixed it. If June noticed the fear in Han's voice, he hid it well. Well, you can't just keep going. The gas friction will distort the continuum warp. Distortion won't kill us, Han said. The Falcon stabilizers would probably keep their warp within safe parameters. It's the dust shell I'm worried about. Oh, yes. Juin's voice was forlorn. The dust shell. How long? Leia asked. She was too good a co-pilot to need to ask what would happen when a vessel traveling through hyperspace tried to punch its way through the striated layers of dust and debris that hung inside an expansion nebula. That depends on how old the nebula is, Han said. Two meter circles of white began to flash ahead of the falcon as the first dust particles blossomed against her forward shields. But not long enough. This is a young one, Juin agreed. A very young one. The were finally went silent, and Han eased the control lever back until he heard it again. 
He was only prolonging the inevitable, but sometimes stalling was the only move you had. Han. There was a tremor in Leia's voice, and she was staring straight out the forward viewport. Tell me the truth. Are we going to die? Can you do that fog parting trick you used on Borao again? Han asked. And extend it to about twelve light years. I doubt it, Leia said. Then, yeah, we're probably gonna die. What a pity Tarfong isn't here, Juan said. Han scowled into the canopy reflection. I thought you liked that map all. Very much, Juan exclaimed. And I'm sorry his name won't be listed among those who died with Han Solo. Not so fast, Leia said. The dust particles were blooming fast and furious now, turning hyperspace almost solid white with microscopic novae. If we're going to die anyway, there's nothing left to lose. I hadn't thought of it that way, Juan said. But watch and learn, Leia said. She activated the Falcon's attitude control system. Then, before Han could stop her. Spun the ship around so that it was traveling backward through hyperspace. The white blossoms vanished, and for a moment, the Falcon felt as though she were simply traveling through hyperspace backward. Then the nebula turned red and started to spiral away from the viewport. Han's stomach turned somersaults faster than a Jedi acrobat, and the Falcon's hull began to wail and screech like a rancor in full rut. Kubi ff. Han could not understand Leia above the terrible clamor, but it was easy to guess what she was yelling. He eased the lever back another centimeter. There was no question of listening for the humming coolant line, so he decided to count to thirty and do it again. What did it matter? They were going to die anyway. Then Leia did something really foolish. She fired the sublight drives. The shrieking and wailing stopped at once, and suddenly it was the Falcon spinning instead of space. Han felt as though his heart were going to fly out between his ribs, and he lost his last three meals. But incredibly, he was still alive to know how bad he was feeling. He realized he had lost his count and eased the control lever back some more. The whir returned. It occurred to him that the Falcon had fallen otherwise silent. Which meant they weren't being pelted by dust particles, which meant the sublight drives were blasting a hole through the dust shell. Han looked over to congratulate Leia. Her face was a meter wide and five centimeters tall. Nice try, he said. It came out yeared e cyan in his own head. He doubted he would ever know how it sounded to Leia. The were vanished. He eased the control lever back. Leia's face went to a meter tall and ten centimeters wide. Something big exploded against the Falcon's rear shields, and the ship shook so violently that Juan, who had not strapped himself in, ended up splayed against the forward viewport. Han eased the control lever back and took a long, deep sniff. Smelled only the sour barf of five different species, maybe a hint of verbal brain actuating gas, and eased the lever farther. Leia's face shrank to half a meter on the diagonal, and Han said, "I love you, princess. Even if you drive like a." He didn't finish. The words came out e e w b b o, which wasn't half bad, considering. Han eased the control lever back again, and Juan slid down the canopy and disappeared behind the instrument console. Then the proximity alarm went off. And the color outside the canopy went from blue to red to blue to whirling stripes of silver. Suddenly, Leia's face was the proper size and shape, still far too green, but at least oval and no more than twenty-five centimeters from chin to hairline. And Han felt even sicker than before. That was when C-3PO came tumbling up the access corridor. Doomed. He crashed to a halt behind the navigator's chair. Then fell to the deck, flailing. We're doomed for sure. Han immediately knew they were going to make it. He took control of the Falcon and began to fire attitude thrusters, 
slowly bringing their spin under control. There was just a hint of coolant sweetness in the recycled air, enough to mean they would have to decontaminate the ship, but not so much they would die before they had a chance. A pair of small hands appeared at the top edge of the control panel, and Juin pulled himself up to peer over the edge. Real space? Yeah. Han glanced out the viewport and saw nothing but the veined, red sky of a still-cooling nebula. I think. It is, Leia said. The proximity alarm dropped us out of hyperspace. And we survived? Juin sounded almost disappointed. His sunken eyes swung toward Han. That wasn't in any of the history vids. Did you teach her that? No, Leia said. And it hasn't worked yet. There's still one tiny problem. As long as it's tiny, Han said, eyeing the white static on his sensor screen. Well, not really tiny. Leia used the attitude thrusters to spin the falcon around, bringing into view the green, rapidly swelling disk of the planet they were about to crash into. It was big enough to drop us out of hyperspace. 23. Jason dropped out of the tick tree to discover that even here, in the muggy heart of her private jungle garden, Queen Mother Tenel Ka was not alone. Seated in a small sunken courtyard with her rust-colored braids hanging down the back of her sleeveless frock, she was surrounded by twenty courtiers, mostly male and attractive, all attired in absurd, hand-tailored imitations of the Queen Mother's rustic fashion. Tenoka could have that effect on people. Jason crept up silently behind a camouflaged sentry who was patrolling the musky foliage along the garden wall, the last of the palace's many layers of security, and grasped the man's neck. The fellow tried to spin and yell the alarm, but went limp as Jason sent a paralyzing jolt of force energy through his spine. Still alert to her Jedi instincts, Tenoka felt the disturbance and turned on her bench, revealing a classic profile even more stunning than the one in Jason's memory. He expanded his presence in the force so she would not be alarmed, then lowered the unconscious sentry to the ground and stepped out of the shrubbery. Several courtiers cried out and sprang forward to shield Tenoka, and three more sentries emerged from the foliage along the garden wall. The two guards with clear angles zipped blaster fire in the intruder's direction, while the third called for help. Jason deflected the bolts with his palms, then reached out with the force and jerked the blaster rifles from their hands. Cease fire! Tenoka ordered a bit late. Stand down! The guards, already rushing Jason with their hand blasters half free of their holsters, reluctantly obeyed. The nobles complied far less reluctantly. Once Tenoka was satisfied her orders were being followed, she leapt onto the courtyard wall and, smiling warmly, opened her arms. Jason was not surprised to see that the left one still ended above the elbow. After the sparring accident that had claimed the limb, Tenoka had refused an artificial replacement, keeping the stump as a reminder of the arrogance that had led to the mishap. Jason! She cried. Welcome! Thank you. It warmed Jason's heart to find such an enthusiastic reception. It's good to see you again, Queen Mother. As Jason stepped forward to receive her embrace, half a dozen burly hapans blocked his way. One of them, an icy-eyed noble with neck-length blonde hair and no left hand, glanced back at Tenoka. This man is a friend of yours, Queen Mother? Clearly, Drokel. Tenoka pushed between Drokel and an even larger noble missing an entire forearm. Would I wish to hug him if he weren't? She pressed herself tightly enough to Jason's chest for him to tell that a lot had changed in the last five years, all for the better. Jason hugged her back and, noting the noxious glowers from her male courtiers, tried not to smirk. I apologize for entering this way, Jason said. But your social secretary refused to announce me. He kept telling me you were unavailable. 
Tenoka released him and took a step back, her expression darkening. Which one? I must see that he's corrected. No need. Jason allowed himself the hint of a smile. He has been. Is that so? Tenoka waited for him to elaborate. When he did not, she shrugged and took his hand, then jumped into the sunken courtyard to face her slack-jawed courtiers. Jason was astonished to see that more than half had lost parts of their arms. Jason is one of my oldest friends. She squeezed Jason's hand, then looked up at him with a mischievous grin. He was the boy who cut my arm off. Though Jason and Tenoka had long ago come to terms with that terrible accident and had developed a friendship bordering on romance, even he was taken aback by the bluntness of the announcement. The courtiers were left stammering, which was exactly what he sensed Tenoka wanted. Pulling him toward the far side of the courtyard, she slipped her arm through his and leaned her head against his shoulder. I would like to catch up with my friend, she called back. Please amuse yourselves. She guided him onto a stone path that wound its way through the jungle alongside a small stream. Though the lush foliage and gurgling water made it seem as though they were alone, Jason could sense the guards shadowing them in the brush, and the courtiers following them down the path, just out of sight one curve behind. Guessing this must be the normal state of affairs for Tenoka, Jason said. Thank you for taking the time to see me. Queen Mother. No, thank you for coming, Tenoka said. You cannot know how refreshing it is to speak with someone who is not trying to win my hand or coax something out of me. Jason felt instantly guilty. Actually, I did come to ask a favor. A big one. I know. Tenoka squeezed his arm and leaned closer to him. That changes nothing, I said. Hapan nobles never ask. They arrange or contrive or, if I am lucky, merely persuade. You would not believe what they do to curry favor. Jason raised his brow. The amputations? Fencing accidents. Tenoka snorted. The path came to a jungle pond, complete with a waterfall and a small island rising out of the green water. To judge by the number of limbs being preserved in Hapan Cryovats, most of my idiot nobles have no idea which end of a sword to hold. They stopped at the edge of the pond, and Jason leaned down so that his voice would not carry up the path. You do know we're not alone, don't you? Of course. Tenoka turned and raised her voice. Be gone, or I will ask Jason to take your other arms. The nobles retreated quickly, but Jason could sense the sentries continuing to lurk in the bushes. Tenoka sighed. There are some things even a queen mother cannot order. She slipped off her shoes, then turned toward the island. Would you like to get your feet wet? Why not? Jason eyed the twenty-meter distance to the island. Only our feet? Trust me. Pulling him along. Tenoka stepped out onto the water. Her feet sank only to the ankles. Walk only where I walk, or it will be more than your feet. Jason did as she ordered and found himself standing atop a stone pier concealed just beneath the surface of the murky water. The secret way, Tenoka said. It is an ancient Hapan defense, and it leads to the only place I can ever be truly alone. Why do you put up with them? Jason followed her along a jagged pathway of sharp, seemingly random turns. Those idiot nobles, I mean? They have their uses, Tenoka said. I allow one to sit at my side, then watch to see who seeks him out. And that tells you what? Jason asked. Who wants something from you? Everyone wants something from me, Jason. They reached the island and stepped onto a mossy path that, Jason suspected, was rarely trodden by any feet but Tenoka's. But the families who don't change alliances when I change favorites, 
I know those are the advisors I should listen to. It seems very intricate, Jason said. Calculated, Tenoka said. She led the way into a shielding copse of pond trees, then sat down on one end of the only bench. It is the Hapan way, Jason. There is a use for everyone. Knowing it would not be proper etiquette to assume, Jason did not sit on the other end of the bench. Including me? Tenoka looked away. Even you, Jason. She patted the bench beside her, then said, Now the houses of my suitors will be united against you. It would be wise to watch what you eat while you are here. Thanks, Jason said. But I won't be staying. Of course not. Tenoka continued to look away, but Jason sensed tears in her voice. What is it you need from us? You felt Raynar's call? Jason asked. Yes. In the end, I had to keep myself locked in the palace. I didn't know who it was from. I thought maybe. When Tenoka turned to face him, her gray eyes were clear and steady, but she had not bothered to wipe the tear tracks from her cheeks. I have heard that a colony of Kilix is threatening Chis space. In that moment, the entire weight of the last five years' loneliness fell on Jason's heart, and he wanted nothing more than to take Tenoka in his arms and kiss her. Instead, he said, It's a complicated situation. Jason went on to recount his journey into the colony, from his arrival at Lizzle to his exploration of the Tachyon Flyer to joining Jaina and the rest of the strike team on Julio. Tenoka's gaze never strayed from his face, and he described his slowly dawning awareness that the Kilix shared a collective mind, what Raynar had become, and Sildil's theories about how the pheromones altered the joiners' minds. This drew a cocked brow from Tenoka, and for a while she seemed a young Jedi Knight again, her thoughts consumed by adventure and mystery rather than intrigue and politics. Jason ended by reporting the mysterious attacks against his parents, an aunt and uncle, and by noting that the Killix claimed to have no memory of Lomi or Welk. The two of them just disappeared after the crash. Jason finished. The Killix insists Raynar was the only one aboard the flyer, even though I know he dragged both Lomi and Welk out of the fire. Jason did not say exactly how he knew. There was no reason to go into the subtleties of Aang T. Flow walking right now. Tenoka sat in deep silence for several moments, then swung around, straddling the bench, and faced him. What became of MTD? Lobacca's translator droid? Jason asked. He was on the flyer when it was stolen, she pointed out. I think he was destroyed in the fire, Jason said. I found a melted lump of metal that kind of looked like him. Tenoka sighed. Too bad. He could be a very annoying droid, but I know Loi would have liked to have him back. Their gazes met, and neither hurried to look away. So, you've come to ask me to leave here and help track down Lomi and Welk, before they create a whole legion of dark Jedi? Jason's heart leapt. You could do that. Tenoka smiled, but her eyes turned sad. No, Jason. It was a joke. I see, Jason said, also growing a little sad. Am I required to laugh? Only if you wish to avoid offending the Queen Mother. Never. Jason laughed dutifully, then added, You still have a lot to learn about jokes. So you say. Tenoka raised her hand and made an elaborate wave skyward. Everyone here seems to think my jokes are quite funny. And you trust them? Only the ones who don't laugh, Tenoka admitted. She swung her leg back over the bench and assumed a more regal pose. All right, Jason. I confess I cannot guess. What is it you require of us? A battle fleet he said. For the colony. 
Tenoka's face did not show the surprise that Jason sensed from her in the Force. That is a great deal to ask. The Hapes Consortium is a member of the Galactic Alliance. Does that mean the Galactic Alliance makes your decisions for you? Tenoka's gray eyes turned steely. It means that we try to avoid angering Alliance friends. It's more important to prevent this war, Jason said. The Chiss are pushing too hard, and the Kilix couldn't withdraw if they wanted to. It's going to erupt into full-blown carnage, unless something happens to give the Chiss pause and the colony a reason to be patient. And why should it matter to the Hapan people if a border conflict on the other side of the galaxy does become war? Because it would end in genocide, one way or the other, Jason answered. Tenuka turned and looked up into the pond trees, and Jason sensed in the silence her Jedi instincts battling her duties as the Hapan Queen. The Kilix are tied to the history of the galaxy in a way we don't understand yet, Jason said. They were living in cities before humans learned to build, and they were a civilization before the Sith were spawned. They were here when Centerpoint and the Maul were constructed, and they were driven from Alderaan by the beings who did it. Though Tenoka's gaze remained in the treetops, her eyes widened, and Jason knew he was reaching her. Tenoka, the galaxy will turn on what happens next, Jason said. And the Kilix are the pivot point. We need time to figure this out, because it could be total war, or true and lasting peace. Tenoka finally turned to look at him. What about the will of the Force, Jason? Why not trust it? The reference to the Jedi's new understanding of the Force made Jason think of Vergir, the lost master who had opened their eyes to so much of that new understanding, and he smiled at the first truth she had taught him. Everything I tell you is a lie. To Tenoka he said, Should I trust a river because it wants to run downhill? Tenoka frowned. I am the one who asks the questions on Hapes, Jedi Solo. Jason chuckled. Okay. The Force isn't a deity, Tenoka. It's not self-conscious, and it isn't capable of caring what happens to us. It's a flow. Its only will is to remove that which blocks it. When we facilitate that flow, when we allow it to run through us to others, we're in harmony. We're using the light side. And the dark side? is when we block that flow and turn it to our own ends, Jason said. We keep it from others. And when we release it too quickly, we turn it from a nurturing stream into a destructive flood. Didn't Vergir teach that our intentions make an act dark or light? Tenoka asked. She did, Jason admitted. And she was telling the truth from a certain point of view. If you have good intentions, you tend to let the force flow through you. If not, you tend to bottle it up inside, and it starts eating away at your good looks. Tenoka looked at him from the corner of one eye. I prefer my truths to remain true from all points of view. Sorry, Jason said. The force is too big. And this is what you learned in the five years you were gone. The core of it, yes. Tenoka studied the ground for a moment, then looked back at him. It took five years to learn that? There was a lot of travel time, Jason said. Tenoka smiled and rolled her eyes, then asked, What about our Kilix? Is the force flowing through them, or into them? Too early to say, Jason said. Raynar has grown incredibly powerful in a short time. And that doesn't scare you? Of course it does, Jason said. But right now, he's trying to avoid a war. I'll be a lot more frightened when he stops. Tenoka nodded. Fact. She stood and extended her hand. I think my suitors have had enough time to plot your death. I'm glad I could bring them together. Yes, you have been very useful that way. They started down the moss path toward the water. 
I hope you will stay the night. It would be even more effective. Jason slowed. Tenoka. He did not need to wonder exactly what she was asking. He could feel it in the force. I didn't come here to, to become your paramour. You won't. Paramours are playthings. She stopped in full view of the pond's far bank and gave him a long, warm kiss. And I would never play with you, Jason Solo. Jason was beginning to feel very carried along, and spending the night could only help his chances of getting the fleet. Then I'll stay, he said. But it can only be one night. One night is fine, Tenoka said. One night will be very useful. 24. The observation deck was as stately, luxurious, and hushed as one would expect aboard the Bornerin Trading Company's mighty flagship, the Tradewind. A curving wall of transparent steel enclosed the cabin on three sides, offering an expansive view of the vast cargo fleet waiting permission to descend into the thin atmosphere of a dusty orange planet. In the distance, a starfighter security screen was scratching a grid of blue ions across a starflecked backdrop. The luxurious cabin was the kind of place that always made Tessar drool with nervousness. He drew air through his fangs to dry them, then followed his human escort past a long beverage bar toward a woman and two men waiting at the front of the deck. It was a long trip made longer by the fact that they had all turned to watch his approach and by his fear of depositing a glob of saliva on the expensive Rasha wood floor. Now that he was actually here, twenty steps from the Thull family, Tessar could not understand what had possessed him to track down the Bornerin merchant fleet. He had overheard Master Skywalker and several others discussing how much should be told to Raynar's mother about her son's fate. A few hours later, Tessar had felt compelled to find Aaron Thull himself, and a few hours after that he had sneaked off Asus in a Jedi stealth ex. It had not begun to seem like a bad idea until he had arrived outside the Tradewind's docking bay, taking the ship's watch officer by surprise and causing the consternation that had scrambled the fleet's starfighter screen. Tessar's escort stopped in front of the three humans and bowed to the woman. Madam Thull, may I present Jedi Sebatine, Tessar Sebatine. Dressed in a blue shimmer silk gown, Madame Thull was gaunt and short, with long chestnut hair and a regal bearing. She wore a sash striped with scarlet, yellow, and purple. Tessa was one of the Jedi Knights who accompanied Raynar on the mission. The escort stressed the word mission just enough to make clear that this was how they referred to Raynar's disappearance. He agreed to leave his weapons in a locker. Thank you, Lon. Madam Thull lifted her chin and examined Tessar head to toe, lingering a moment on his brown Jedi robe and the empty lightsaber clasp on his utility belt. I know the name. Suspecting he was expected to speak now, Tessar drew more air to dry his fangs, creating a small hiss that caused Madam Thull to flinch. The dark-haired man behind her fingered the holdout blaster in his pocket and took a single step forward. Sorry. This one did not mean to scare you. Tessar felt a drop running down his front fang and sucked air across his teeth again. It is very warm in here. Madam Thull raised a carefully thin brow. Something to drink? Yes, that would be good. Madam Thull waited a moment, then prompted. And Dorian Port? Bespin Sparkle? Talhovian Ale? Do you have Nerf Milk? Milk always slowed the drool. Which planet doesn't matter? The shadow of a smile flicked across Madame Thull's lips, then she turned to her servant. Milk for Jedi Sebatine, Lan. We'll have our usual. The servant bowed and departed to collect the drinks. Madame Thull gestured to the blonde man at her side. This is my late husband's brother, Tycho. She did not bother to introduce the bodyguard. Now, what can Bornerin Trading do for the Jedi? Nothing. Sensing he should probably not just blurt out the news about Raynar to this frail woman, Tessar said. 
This one is here with news. News? Tycho asked. About Raynar. Tycho scowled and slipped half a step forward, moving to shield his sister-in-law. Raynar died at MYRKR. Yes, Tessar said. After a fashion. After a fashion? Madame Tho gasped. You mean he's alive? After a fashion, yes, Tessar said, happy he had broken the news gently. That is what I... My son is alive! Madame Tho's knees buckled, and she would have hit the floor had Tessar not reached out and caught her beneath the armpits. He waited while the stunned bodyguard jerked his hand from the blaster pocket, then laid her back into the man's arms. As sorry, Tessar sucked more air to dry his fangs. This one did not mean to touch her. When he saw her falling, he just... It's... it's okay. Thank you. Madame Tho glanced up at her bodyguard. Perhaps we should sit down, Gundar. Of course. Gundar returned Madame Tho to her feet and guided her toward a chair. Tessar started to follow, but Tycho put a hand on his chest. Tessa reacted as most barbells would to being touched by a stranger. He grabbed Tycho's wrist and pulled it past his face, bringing the elbow into perfect biting position. Stop! Tycho cried. What are you doing? Tessa looked down at the man out of one eye. You did not challenge this one? And no! Tycho was up on his toes, being held so that his feet barely touched the floor. I just wanted to talk to you. We were talking, Tessa pointed out. Alone, Tycho's eyes slid toward the crate leather couches where Madame Thull's bodyguard had deposited her. Quietly. My brother-in-law is being protective, Madame Thull explained from her seat. Her blue eyes shifted to Tycho. That's hardly necessary, Tycho. I'm sure I can judge for myself whether Jedi Sebatine has come selling Starlight. If he is a Jedi, Tycho said. I doubt anyone here can tell one variable in a robe from another. Tessar saw the doubt flash through Madame Thull's eyes and realized he might be asking the Thulls to take a lot on faith. He released Tycho's arm and turned toward the bar where the servant had gathered their drinks on a silver tine tray. Tessa reached out with the force and lifted the tray out of the servant's hands, then floated it over to Madame Thull. Her surprise quickly turned to approval. Thank you, Jedi Sebatine. She removed a small crystal goblet filled with burgundy liquid, then shot her brother-in-law an amused look. I think that establishes Tessar's bona fides quite sufficiently. Tessar floated the tray over to Tycho. It would be hard to argue. Tycho took a golden-limbed snifter that contained a clear yellow liquor. Tessar took his milk, then returned the tray to the astonished servant and followed Tycho over to Madame Thull. He sat down on a padded tail stool the bodyguard offered. Now, Jedi Sebatine, tell me about my son, Madame Thull ordered. What does after a fashion mean? The ship he was aboard crashed in the unknown regions, Tessar began. There was a fire. Oh, Madame Thull reached for her brother-in-law's hand. Go on. He was taken in by a nest of sentient insects, Tessar said. The Killix? Tycho glanced at Madame Thull. Our agents have been hearing reports of an insect colony in the unknown regions. They call themselves as the kind, Tessar clarified. Raynar Z Nest is the Yunu. It is the colony Z King Nest, and he is the prime Yunu. That doesn't surprise me. There was a touch of pride in Madame Thal's voice. Raynar has always been such a natural leader. Always, Tycho agreed. What exactly is the prime? The chairman? voice would be closer, Tessar said. 
He started to explain how other species sometimes joined the collective mind of the Kilix, then felt a restraining influence, and decided to leave it for later, when the Thulls would be better able to understand. He represents the colony, and sees that its will is done. Tycho nodded as though he understood exactly what Tessa meant. The operating officer. Not quite as high as the chairman, but more important in terms of real power. That hardly matters, Tycho, Madam Thull said. We'll groom him to take my place when he returns home. Madam Thull may have missed the alarm flash in Tycho's eyes, but Tessa did not. This one does not think Reyna will return, he said. Part of Tessa still wanted to bite Tycho's arm off, but another part realized that it was important to avoid making an enemy of the man. To be certain Tycho understood that Reynard did not threaten his position. Reynard is too important to the colony. Of course he is, Madam Thull said, addressing Tessar. How long will it take him to groom a replacement? This one is sorry, Tessar said. He is not making himself clear. Reynard will not be returning. He has joined the colony. He has become Yunu. He has become the Unithel. Are you really trying to tell me that my son has become an insect? Madame Thull demanded. Not physically, Tessar said. But yes. By the core. Madame Thull studied him for a moment, then grew pale. You're serious? Tessar nodded and the purpose of his visit finally began to grow clear to him. Yunu wishes to establish a relationship between the colony and Borner in trading, he said. A confidential relationship. And you're the authorized agent? Tycho asked. Tessar considered a moment then said, For now. Tycho accepted this with a nod, then turned to Madame Thull. I've heard that there is large demand for the shine balls and amber ale the independent smugglers are bringing back from the unknown regions. Madame Thull seemed too shocked to reply. She merely nodded, then drained the contents of her goblet and held it up for the servant. Lan. Of course, madam. Lan took the empty goblet and replaced it with a full one. I shall keep them coming. Twenty-five. Even full hazmat gear could not prevent Alma from appearing immodest and just a little bit debauched. The suit she had selected was two sizes too small, stretched so tightly over her svelte curves that it was apparent she had decided to leave her underclothes, if she owned any, aboard the crippled falcon. Leia shook her head in weary amusement, wondering whom Alma was hoping to attract on the deserted planet that had jerked them out of hyperspace. Then again, had Leia spent her formative years as a dancing slave in a Kalyan wild den, or merely been a Twi'lek female, she, too, might have felt comfortable only when on display. Alma glanced back, no doubt feeling Leia's scrutiny through the Force. Is something wrong? Not really. Leia dropped her gaze to the Twi'lek seat area. Just wondering if that suit is going to split. Alma craned around to look, then gave a roguish smile. Only if I bend over. Juin came down the access corridor holding Alma's utility belt and lightsaber. You forgot this, Jedi Rar. I don't think we'll be needing weapons, Leia said. The skin showed no animal life at all. Better to be safe, Juin said. Why, thank you, Jay. Alma raised her arms and let him buckle on the belt. When the short-armed Celestin had to press his face against her stomach, she smiled and added, You're always so considerate. Silently cursing the Celestin's growing infatuation with Alma, Leia had C-3PO fetch her own belt and buckled it on herself. After a thorough inspection of the Falcon had revealed no trace of insect stowaways, the Solos had been forced to turn their suspicions in other directions. Their plan had been to keep Alma separated from her weapons until Leia figured out whether she was the one who had been sabotaging the Falcon, 
but no one had told that to Juin, of course. He was the only other suspect. Leia passed the Trilek 420-liter buckets, then lowered the boarding ramp. A cool wind was hissing across the marsh grass, carrying on its breath the fragrance of a carpet of nearby blossoms. Not far beyond, a ribbon of open water probe passed, vanishing into the dark wall of a distant conifer forest. It's stunning! Leia led the way down the ramp, carrying four empty buckets of her own. It reminds me of Aldrin, unspoiled and beautiful. Yes, it's very, natural. Alma was looking above the forest, at a single jagged mountain silhouetted against the veined ruddiness of the nebular sky. Not a bad place to crash. Nobody crashed, Han said over their headsets. And nobody's going to be marooned neither, if you two will get under the drive unit with those collection buckets. On our way. Under her breath, Leia added, Hut. I heard that. Good. When Leia stepped off the ramp into the grass, the ground felt soft and spongy under her feet. She parted the grass and found water seeping up around her boot. We'll have to make this fast, Leia reported. The ground's a little soft here. Ready when you are, Han replied. Leia pulled on her hazmat hood and ducked under the falcon. She tromped down the grass beneath the hyperdrive hull access panel, then positioned her collection buckets under likely-looking leak points. Only when she finished did she notice that Alma was out beyond the boarding ramp, kneeling over a magenta blossom the size of a Wookiee's hand. Alma, we're kind of in a hurry here. Leia wondered if the Twi'lek was intentionally dawdling, hoping the falcon would sink in the soft ground, and then she put the idea out of her mind. This was going to be dangerous enough without Alma sensing her suspicion through the Force. We can look at flowers later. Sorry. Alma glanced in her direction, but did not rise. Are you sure there are no animals here? No insects or birds or flying mammals? The skin didn't reveal any, Leia said. And I've seen nothing to suggest it was wrong. Interesting. Alma plucked the flower off its stem and brought it over to Leia. If there are no insects or animals, what pollinates the flowers? Leia studied the blossom. Its structure was much the same as flowers across the galaxy, with a stamen, anther, and pollen. Good question, Leia said, surprised the Twi'lek had noticed. I didn't think Ryloth had any true flowers. We have sex, Alma replied. And males who want sex bring. I get the picture, Leia said. The answer is I don't know. Wind seems pretty inefficient, and that's about the only pollen transfer agent I can see. Han's voice came over their headsets. If you two are done talking about the birds and the bees, I'd like to change out this coolant line before the falcon sinks to her belly. It's my fault. Alma's voice assumed the same purring quality she used with Juin. I hope you can forgive me. That remains to be seen, Han said. Leia winced at Han's cool tone, but saw no sign that Alma had sensed truth beneath his words. The Twi'lek simply retrieved her own buckets and positioned them beneath the falcon, then curled her leku into her hood and pulled it on. Ready. Han grunted, and one corner of the hyperdrive hull panel sagged open. Toxic red coolant began to pour out. Leia quickly moved one of the buckets into position to catch the primary flow, then placed three others beneath adjacent drips. It took only a minute to fill the first bucket. Alma passed an empty to Leia and moved the other one out of the way. They repeated the process four more times, carefully placing the filled buckets five meters away, where they were unlikely to be accidentally overturned. Finally, the flow slowed to a drip, and Han said, we're done. Just catch those last drips, and we'll be ready. Affirmative. Under her breath, Leia added, For all the good it will do.
Relax, Han said. I can handle this repair. No problem. The final drops of coolant fell from the hull panel. When they moved the last buckets aside, Leo was surprised to find the first little bit that had fallen on the flattened grass was evaporating before her eyes. Look at that, Leia said. It killed the grass, Alma observed. That's to be expected. It should have killed a lot more, Leia replied. And look at how fast it's drying up. It's not that hot, or dry, around here. Alma shrugged. Maybe the grass is absorbent. She glanced at the vast field surrounding the falcon, then added, I don't think we need to worry about the environmental damage. They carefully wiped the access panel down with absorption pads, then Leia reactivated her throat mic. Okay, it's clean. You can close up now. The panel hissed into place, then Han asked, How much did you get? Leia eyed the buckets. About a hundred and twenty liters. That's all? Maybe one thirty, she said. No more. A disappointed sigh came over the headsets. It'll have to do, but don't spill a drop. We need it all. Copy. Leia picked up a bucket, using both hands on the handle, and started for the Falcon's ramp. We'd better take it in one bucket, Etta. A liquid thunk sounded behind Leia, and she turned to find Alma holding a broken handle. At the Twi'lek's feet lay three overturned buckets, an 80-liter pool of hyperdrive coolant slowly spreading across the ground. Alma! Leia was trying to feel genuinely surprised, rather than disappointed, to avoid giving Alma any hint that this was exactly what she had expected. What happened? The handle broke, Alma said. I'm... The Twi'lek's eyes grew large behind her faceplate, and suddenly she sprang toward the falcon's prow in a diving roll. An instant later, Miwal and Cockmame dropped out of the ship's far side airlock, their blaster rifles spraying stun bolts at the place Alma had just been standing. Blasted Jedi danger sense. Alma came up on her knees, her hazmat gloved hands fumbling for her lightsaber. Did they get her? Han asked over the headset. Leia and Alma answered together. No! The Nogri spun toward the Falcon's prow and opened fire again, but Alma was already leaping behind a landing strut. Leia dropped her own bucket and started to circle behind the Twi'lek, fumbling at her lightsaber through the thick hazmat gloves. Wait! Alma cried. What's this about? Spilled coolant, Han replied over the calm. It was an accident! Sorry, kid, Han said. We were watching on the hull cam. You broke the handle. The four remaining buckets of coolant rose and went flying toward Miwal and Cockmame. The Nogri dodged easily, but the maneuver gave Alma time to pull off her hood and gloves and snap her lightsaber off her belt. Blasted telekinesis. Leia pulled off her own gloves and hood, then grabbed her lightsaber and continued toward the prow. Though she felt certain that the colony was behind Alma's treachery, Leia could not help feeling hurt, angry, and confused. Somehow, the Twi'lek's vulnerability felt like a betrayal in itself, and Leia could not help wondering whether Jaina had really been as surprised as she seemed when Alma announced her plans to return aboard the Falcon, or if her own daughter had known of the plan and kept silent about it. Alma glanced in Leia's direction, but then Cockmame and Miwal were fanning out toward her flanks, firing as they ran. The Twi'lek spun from her hiding place, her silver blade deflecting the Nogri's stun bolts back at them as she ran. Han continued to chatter at Alma over the headsets. What we can't figure out is why. What did we ever do to you? We told you, Alma insisted. It was an accident. 
You kicked over two buckets, Han said. We had no choice. Alma launched herself through the air, flipping and corkscrewing closer to Kakmame, turning bolt after bolt in Miwala's direction. You betrayed the colony. We betrayed them? Han was incredulous. Saba's the one lying up there half dead. You see? Alma landed. You blame the colony. We can't. She directed one of Kakmame's stun bolts into Miwala's chest. Let you poison the master's council against us. Miwal dropped to her knees, but kept firing. Leia ducked under the falcon's prow, ignited her own lightsaber at Midgard, and raced to attack. Alma did not even show Leia the respect of turning around. She simply raised a leg and planted a hazmat boot squarely in Leia's stomach and sent her flying back into a landing strut, then directed a second stun bolt into Miwal and turned all her attention to Kakmane. How's it going down there? Han asked. Aya, Leia answered, trying to suck some air back into her lungs. Ugh. That good? Seeing that his blaster rifle was doing him more harm than good, Kakmane tossed it aside and drew his favorite weapon, a thin durasteel club connected by a hilt cord to a short sickle. Alma continued her advance more slowly, her lightsaber weaving a silver shield in front of her. Leia really didn't want to turn this into a killing fight, but neither did she want to die marooned on an empty planet. She pointed to the bucket she had left near the boarding ramp and used the force to send it flying at Alma, then pointed at Kakmame's discarded blaster rifle and sent that flying as well. Alma pivoted away from the bucket and ducked the blaster rifle. Then Kakmame was on her, club and sickle whirling, lashing sickle low and club high, then sickle high and club low, hands flashing as he switched from one weapon to the other. Alma fell back jumping, skipping, ducking, trying to land just one parry with her sizzling blade and send her attacker's weapons spinning away. Kakmame's reflexes were too quick for her. Every time she turned her wrists to intercept an attack, he reversed his whirling weapons and hit her where she was unprotected, clubbing her in the ribs, slashing her across the thigh, always forcing her to retreat. Han continued to speak over the headsets. Hang tight, Leia. His voice was strained, which was not surprising, given the length and diameter of the twisting access tunnel that led to the hyperdrive coolant drain. Be there, any time now. Leia pushed off the strut and rushed Alma with a heavy heart. Though she still intended to capture the Twi'lek alive if possible, she knew a killing fight when she found herself in one. She reached striking range and, activating her blade, swung for the head. Alma had no choice but to drop to her haunches. Cockmane was all over the Twi'lek, catching her weapon's hand with the sickle and whipping it around slashing the tendons that controlled her fingers. The lightsaber deactivated and went tumbling away. Kakmane brought his club around for a temple strike, but at the last instant must have glimpsed the sorrow in Leia's face and dropped it below the ear for a knockout blow. Alma took full advantage of the switch, turning to take the strike on her leku, then continuing around, bringing the palm of her good hand up under the Nogri's chin putting the power of the force into the blow and driving him off his feet. Cockmame's head hit the underside of the falcon with a dull clang, then he dropped limply into the smashed marsh grass. Leia slammed the butt of her lightsaber into Alma's head, striking to subdue but striking hard. The Twi'lek staggered and looked as though she might pitch forward. Leia cocked her arm to strike again and felt one of the Twi'lek's legs catching her across the ankle swinging through to sweep her off her feet. Leia landed on the back of her head so hard that, even with the soft ground, her vision began to narrow. She braced a hand by her hip and instantly brought her feet under her, but Alma was already rolling to her feet, facing Leia, her good arm reaching out to call her lightsaber. Leia reached out in the force and tried to wrench the weapon away, but her head was spinning, and the lightsaber floated straight into Alma's hand. 
With both Nobri lying limp and helpless in the grass, Leia was on her own. She didn't like her odds. Her ankle was beginning to throb, and she wasn't sure she'd be able to stand on it. Han? Almost stopped. A frightening darkness came to Alma's eyes, and she took one step toward Leia. Put down your weapon, princess. There's no need for us to fight. Without coolant. The Twi'lek stopped mid-sentence, apparently realizing how she had been tricked, then said, You have extra coolant. Leia shrugged. The gesture felt like it would split her head. We had to find out. You can still lay down your weapon, Alma said. It would be better if you did. Leia eyed the unconscious Nogri. If they had failed to take Alma by surprise, it seemed unlikely that Leia could win a lightsaber duel, even if Alma would be fighting with her offhand. You're right about one thing, Leia said. There's no need for us to fight. I've been reaching out to Luke in the Force. Alma remained where she was, about five steps from Leia, safely out of attack range, but close enough to spring. And? And the Masters already know that something happened to Saba, Leia said. Her vision had returned to normal, but now her head was throbbing worse than her ankle. They know the Skywalkers might have had a stowaway, too. My guess is they'll assume the colony is responsible. You're lying. You're a Jedi Knight, Leia said. You should know I'm not. Alma's eyes narrowed, and Leia felt the Twi'lek probing her mind, searching for any hint of deceitfulness. Leia made no attempt to resist. The colony's best chance to win the Master's support, its only chance, is for you to go to Asus now and explain what really happened. Alma's lightsaber crackled to life. You won't win any friends for the colony that way, Leia pointed out. Alma shrugged. It doesn't matter to you? Leia began to drag the force into herself, preparing to pull herself to her feet the instant the Twi'lek even looked like she was going to advance. I thought you sabotaged us because... Leia let the sentence trail off, suddenly realizing how badly she had misunderstood the situation. Alma did not know why she had sabotaged the Falcon. She thought she was protecting the colony when she was actually damaging any chance it had of winning the Master's sympathies. And why? Luke and Mara! Or Ben? Leia's heart felt like it would burst with rage. You ungrateful. Alma sprang. Leia activated her lightsaber and blocked the Twi'lek's first attack then stretched out with the force and used it to pull herself to her feet a dozen paces away. Alma started after her, coming fast but under control, and that was when a muffled thud reverberated from inside the Falcon, Han finally dropping out of the hyperdrive access tunnel into the aft service corridor. Alma glanced up, and Leia had an idea. Han, I think she's figured us out. Leia screamed into her headset. She's looking toward the drive exhaust. The drive exhaust? Han managed to make his confusion sound like alarm. Well, stop her. If she cuts one of those. Han! Yeah? Enough! Leia said. Han certainly knew his own ship well enough to realize that the aft escape pod discharged a couple of meters forward of the drive exhaust and she would just have to trust him to figure out the significance of that. She has a headset, too. Remember? All right, just stop her. Leia raised her lightsaber and charged. Alma looked first puzzled, then worried. Then finally she pivoted away and blocked as Leia swung at her head. Leia kicked wildly at the Twi'lek's leading foot, forcing her to step back, then swung again at the head. Alma blocked and stepped into the attack, trying to work her way past Leia to strike at the drive exhaust. Leia attacked hard, smashing her knee into Alma's ribs, forcing herself not look toward the escape pod hatch, to
to not even think about it. Alma surprised Leia with a spinning hook kick that caught her across the shins and sent her sprawling onto her face just centimeters from a pool of spilled coolant. Han's panicked voice came over the headset. Leia! Stop her! Leia looked up to find Alma racing past, only three steps shy of the pod hatch but a full meter off to one side. She locked her blade into the activated position, then rose to her knees and threw her lightsaber at the Twi'lek's shoulder. Whether Alma sensed or heard the blade coming did not matter. She dodged away, and that was when the escape pod's outer hatch blew, catching the Twi'lek along her whole left side, buckling her knees and leaving her lying motionless in the grass. By the time Leia scrambled to her feet and raced over to make sure Alma would not be getting up again, C-3PO was already riding the rear cargo elevator down with a hypo full of tranquilizer in his hand. Well done, Mistress Leia! C-3PO said. Captain Solo said all along that experience. Give me that! Leia snatched the hypo from the droid's hands and knelt down to inject the Twi'lek, then nearly fainted as a terrible pain shot up her leg. Blast! If I'm going to make a habit of this, I really have to practice more. 26. At the near end of the academy training grounds, the youngest students were practicing force leaps, stepping to the mark with knitted brows, then launching themselves one after the other over a three-meter cross ray. Most cleared the red beam with a simple arcing dive, then dropped into the landing area headfirst, relying on the safety repulsors to break their falls. But a few, especially from the more agile species, executed graceful somersaults and came down on their own feet. Some of the children in line noticed Luke and Mara emerging from the access tunnel and began to point and whisper, so Luke made a show of nodding approval as the next few jumpers cleared the beam. These are the Wudas, Luke explained to their guests, Aristocra Chafor and Bintrani of the Chis Ascendancy. They're our youngest students. Your youngest? A few centimeters shorter than Luke, the Aristocra was relatively small for a Chis, with a blue angular face just beginning to sag with age. How young are they? The Wudas are generally between five and seven years old, formed by... Mara said, calling the Aristocra by his core name. Though that varies by species, some mature at markedly different rates. Yes, well, we wouldn't have that problem in the Ascendancy. Formby folded his hands behind his back and peered across the running track at the children. Which one is your son? Luke felt the pang in his wife's chest as clearly as the one in his own. But when Mara answered, her voice betrayed no hint of her emotions. Our son doesn't attend the Jedi Academy. How strange. Formby continued to watch the Wudas. My file lists his age as seven. Ben is withdrawing from the Force right now. As much as it pained him, Luke had no intention of hiding the fact. That would have implied he was ashamed, and he was not. We don't know why. Formby turned. I didn't know children could do that. Most can't, Mara said. Ben demonstrated exceptional power from birth. This only confirms how gifted he is. I see, Formby said. I'm sorry, then, that he is choosing not to develop his potential. We're not, Luke said. He felt Mara's ire rising, but the smile on her face remained polite. Winning Formby's cooperation was going to be difficult enough without allowing Chiss manners to become an issue. Children must want to be at the academy to succeed. We don't force anyone to attend, and we do everything we can to encourage them to enjoy their time here. We can even arrange employment for their parents on Asus. Some are assistant trainers here at the academy, Mara said. And we encourage students to develop at their own pace. So when Ben is ready, his natural capabilities will allow him to establish himself very quickly. I have no doubt. Formby turned back to the training grounds, 
looking past the Wudas to where the Rantos were practicing telekinesis by smashing giant bean bags against each other. But I'm sure you didn't summon me here to discuss Jedi training techniques. As a matter of fact, we did, Luke said. They had also asked Sunterfell to come, but he had politely declined, explaining it would not do for anyone on the Defense Fleet General Staff to consort with Ascendancy enemies. We want you to understand what goes into the training of a modern Jedi. Hoping to impress me so much that I'll persuade the ruling circle to let you handle the Korib problem? Form by asked. Precisely, Mara said. And it was an invitation, not a summons. Funny, Form by said. Your message mentioned the Brask Oto. That's right, Luke said. The Brask Odo was a Chiz battle station he and Mara had saved during an earlier trip into Ascendancy territory. We wanted you to know it was authentic. Formby smiled. As I said, a summons. We Chiz always repay debts of honor. He waved a hand toward the interior of the training complex. Please impress me. Luke led the way across the running track to the sly walk that circled the inner fields then heard an alarmed whistle behind them. He glanced back to find our 2 d 2 traversing a bank turn, one tread off the ground and perilously close to tipping over. Your droid seems rather intoxicated, Formby observed. A memory fault is playing havoc with his systems. Luke reached out in the force and carried our 2 d 2 over to the sly walk. I don't want it repaired until we find a way to extract some information stored on the chip. Formby watched with an amused expression as the droid settled onto the slide walk behind him. And this information is so valuable you must keep the droid with you at all times? Luke thought for a moment then said, Yes. The truth was that our 2D2 kept scheduling himself for a chip replacement so Luke had decided to keep him nearby until the Galactic Alliance's best slicer, Zacharis Gint, arrived to bypass the security program protecting the memory chip. It could solve a very old mystery for us. Then I wish you luck, Formby said. He pointed to a circle of twelve-year-olds, Banthas, sitting cross-legged around a single happy-looking nerf, waving their fingers and sending the contented beast waddling back and forth among them. What in space are they doing? Mind tag, Mara explained. It's how they develop their persuasive abilities. Formby gave her a sharp look. I trust that's not how you intend to persuade me? The technique only works on the weak-minded, Luke said. And no Jedi would ever consider a Chiss aristocrat to be weak-minded. Good, he said. I was given to believe Jedi Knights are rarely fools. We generally try to train that out before anyone becomes a Jedi Knight, yes, Mara said. Then why do you insist on involving yourselves at Korribu? Formby's voice was casual, as though it were only an idle question. The conflict is of no concern to the Galactic Alliance. The Jedi serve the Force. Luke was keeping an eye on our 2D2 making sure he did not wander off. Our concerns reach well beyond the Galactic Alliance. Formby's gaze grew hard. Into the Ascendancy? Into the colony, at least, Luke said. Formby looked away, focusing his attention on a group of 14-year-olds who were using their lightsabers to bat live blaster bolts back and forth. These students had no nickname. Once students built their first lightsabers, they were known simply as apprentices. You understand nothing about the colony, Formby said, almost absently. If you did, you would leave it to us. We understand that what you're doing at Koriba comes close to violating Chis law, Mara said. Unless the ascendancy has bent from a thousand years of tradition? A lot has changed in the ascendancy. Formby's voice grew resigned. But not that. It remains unlawful for the Chiss to be the aggressor people. I've always admired that about the Ascendancy, Luke said. 
In truth, I find it rather quaint, Formby replied. But having no desire to find myself exiled, I'll follow the law, even if it means the destruction of the ascendancy itself. A line of ten-year-old students appeared ahead, racing toward Luke and the others against the flow of the sly walk. Formby started to step aside so they could pass, but Mara used the force to gently tug him back. Please, Aristocra, she said. They'll be disappointed if we rob them of their chance to show off. Formby eyed the chubby kitten act girl at the head of the line, then cocked his brow when she suddenly sprang off the sly walk, turned a force flip over his head, and landed gracefully, if somewhat heavily, behind him. The rest of the students followed suit, beaming in pride as they somersaulted over Luke and the others. Once Formby grew accustomed to the game, he even encouraged the students by pretending to flinch before each one jumped. Thank you for indulging them, Aristocra, Luke said. The dining halls will be buzzing tonight with how they actually drew a reaction from you. My pleasure, Formby said. As long as they understand the difference when they become Jedi Knights. They will, Mara said. Chiss courage is legendary around here, which is why I'm so puzzled about your fear of Kilix. If you are puzzled, it is only because you are ignorant of the colony's true nature. Then enlighten us, Luke said. The sooner the Jedi understand the situation, the sooner we will find a solution and end our presence at Korribu. And if there is no solution? It would be better to discover that now, Luke said, before any more of our Jedi become like Raynar. Formed by frowned. Who is Raynar? Raynar Thull, Mara said. He went MIA during the war. He was presumed dead, but apparently his ship crashed inside the colony. A nest of Kilix rescued him and saved his life. Luke said. Saved his life? Formby sounded surprised. When did this Raynar come up missing? About six years ago. Close. Luke began to have a sinking feeling. It was a little over seven. I see. Formby's gaze turned inward. That explains it. Explains what? Mara demanded. The Defense Fleet Reconnaissance Corps has been watching the colony for centuries, Formby said. It has been slowly expanding over time, but it wasn't considered a threat. Until recently, Mara surmised. Correct, Formby said. The insects, Killix, as you call them, are clearly intelligent, but they've customarily shown little concern for life. When one was injured, its companions would simply abandon it, and when food grew scarce, whole columns would just wander off to die. And that changed six years ago, Luke said. Formby nodded. The first satellite nests appeared on our border, and we began to notice an exponential population increase. Imagine our surprise when we learned that now they had hospitals to care for their ailing and were using interstellar trade to alleviate the cyclic food shortages that once kept their populations in check. And that frightened the ascendancy into sending your defoliators to give nature a helping hand? Mara asked. No. Formby accepted the criticism in her question without visible emotion. We didn't make that decision until later after we had discovered how dangerous they were. The sly walk carried them past the sunken basin, where a group of adolescent apprentices stood meditating under the watchful eye of a training Jedi knight. They were surrounded by twenty grown adults, who were shouting insults at them and pelting them with missiles ranging from kitchen leftovers to sting balls. My word! Formed by gasped. What kind of drill is that? It's a centering exercise, Luke said proudly. He was counting on this part of the tour to persuade Formby to speak on their behalf on the Chiss capital world, Scylla. Young Jedi must learn to detach themselves from their emotions, to remain focused regardless of whatever they are feeling at the time. 
There are several other versions, Mara added. A five-day fast while the rest of the academy feasts around them, a three-day swim in a warm bubble pool, an all-night tickle where they're forbidden to laugh. That may sound silly, but that's actually the most difficult test, Luke said. And if they fail, they repeat the other exercises. Formby stared at them as though they had told him they were Sith Lords. You people make the SSI Rook look kind. Jedi Knights often find themselves in tumultuous situations, Luke replied. Their judgment must remain sound, no matter what they are feeling. Sound judgment is a warrior's best weapon, Formby agreed. Though I don't understand what the Jedi have against laughing. The sly walk carried them past the centering exercise, and our 2D2's presence began to fade. Luke looked back and, finding the confused droid facing the wrong direction, used the force to lift him back to the group. Mara was already grilling form by again. Convinced the ascendancy the Killicks are dangerous? Form by hesitated a moment, then asked, Do you recall our first meeting? when I welcomed you aboard the Chaff Envoy to examine the wreck of the outbound flight? How could we forget? Luke said. The whole mission was a gambit to lure the Vigari into attacking, so you could carry the war to them legally. The choice was theirs, Formby said defensively. But yes. And do you happen to remember how many ruling families there were at the time? Nine. Mara said instantly. When it came to politics, she rarely forgot a fact. But five years later, when we visited Scylla, the number was four. I assumed the discrepancy to be a result of a war with the Vigari. Not directly, Formby said. But the Third Vigari War did leave us with a labor shortage, and that led to the discrepancy. I'm afraid I don't understand. Luke said. Were the losses of some families so heavy? Several families began to hire entire nests from the colony. It seemed the perfect solution. The insects were plentiful, industrious, and not averse to risk. This was a couple of years before Yorena arrived, and they began to care about surviving. Formed by Winstead how that sounded then hastened to add, Of course, we were careful not to take advantage. Of course. Luke had the unhappy feeling that he saw where this was leading. Didn't you know about the joiners? We took precautions, Formby said. Very stringent precautions. That still didn't work, Mara surmised. They worked, Formby replied. Until someone started sabotaging them. The Killix? Luke asked. Formby frowned. We value fools no more than the Jedi, Master Skywalker. The precautions remain solely under our control. There was a moment of silence, then Mara asked. And? We don't really understand, Formby admitted. It may have been inter-family rivalries. All we know is that the precautions broke down, and before we realized it, two entire families had become joiners. Only two? Luke asked. What about the other missing families? Three of the families had become critically dependent on insect labor, Formby replied. There was a dispute over the best course of action. The Ascendancy had a civil war? Luke gasped. Chis do not have civil wars, Master Skywalker, Formby replied. We have disagreements. The matter was resolved before your visit to Scylla, though I do believe you were witness to some reverberations. The attack on Sunter fell? Mara asked. I thought that concerned the aid he provided the Galactic Alliance against the Yuzen Vong. It is easy to disagree with the policies of someone who has destroyed your family, Formby said. Fell has a habit of being too merciful for his own good. 
The sly walk carried them to the training field that had been Luke's destination all along, a jumbled course full of traps, hazards, and obstacles. Two teams of senior apprentices, one team large and strong, the other small and quick, were running back and forth through the course, using long-handled rackets, stunt blasters, and forced telekinesis to pass half a dozen crackling jet balls to each other through the air. In the midst of the crashing bodies and acrobatic power plays, a single referee was struggling to maintain order. Motioning formed by and Mara along, Luke stepped off the sly walk, then reached out with a mental hand and pulled our 2 d 2 to his side. Luke did not launch into a description of the game, however. He still had some questions about the trouble the Killicks had caused the Chiss Ascendancy. I'm beginning to see why the Ascendancy doesn't want the colony encroaching on its frontier, Luke said. Were the Killicks also responsible for the destruction of the Empire of the Hand? Formed by turned and in a surprised voice asked, What makes you think the Empire of the Hand has been destroyed? Luke wasn't fooled for a moment. He could feel the aristocrat's dismay through the force, and so could Mara. Baron fell, for starters, she said. He wouldn't have abandoned his duties while the Empire of the Hand stood. Perhaps it was merely absorbed, Formby suggested. After being battered into nothingness, Mara said. We know that Nirwan has been abandoned. Something must have happened. Formed by side and resignation. The Empire of the Hand served the purpose Mithra Naruto intended, though it was not against the colony, as you suggest. The Vigari, then? Mara pressed. The Yuzenvon? That's really all I am at liberty to say, formed by answered wearily. Except, perhaps, that the colony is only one of the terrors remaining to the unknown regions. Do not be surprised to see the Empire of the Hand rise again, when there is need. I see, Luke said, saddened to have confirmed what he had only suspected until now. I know that three of the fell children survived, but what of Chuck? Only two survived, Formby said. Jagged and Wynn. Chuck, Davin, and Cherith are all dead. I'm sorry to hear that, Luke said. I like Chuck very much. But what of Sam? Mara asked, picking the question off the top of Luke's head. Was she killed too? Sam? A sly smile came to form by his mouth. Sam is a son's name. Excuse me, Mara said. We never actually met. I should think not. The smile grew wider and shiftier. Sem would be the Fell's shadow child. Shadow child? Luke asked. Publicly unacknowledged, formed by explained. Secret, in fact. It's a common chist precaution to keep enemies from wiping out an entire ruling family. Luke began to have a guilty feeling in his stomach. How secret? Quite, formed by replied. In fact, this is the first time I've heard of a Sem Fell. I imagine you heard the name from Wynne. Jason did, Mara replied. How could you know? Wynne is notorious for spilling secrets, he said. And now we've compounded it, Luke said. I hope you'll hold the name in confidence. Of course, Formby's voice was sincere. And you shouldn't feel bad, Sinterfell is a clever one. I often suspect that Wynne reveals only what he wishes her to. Thank you. Luke returned the smile, hoping to conceal his doubt about the aristocrat's reassurances. He waved at the training field, where the small team had won control of all six jet balls and was driving deep into opposition territory. And now, perhaps you'd allow me to explain the game we're watching. Please, Formby said. It looks refreshingly riotous. We call it Scorch, Luke explained. It's actually the referee who's being trained. 
Each team has a set of secret goals, such as collecting three balls or sending two into one goal and one into another. And it's the referee's job to discover those goals and see that both sides win. If that's possible, Mara said. In some scorch scenarios, the goals are mutually exclusive. Then the referee must see that both teams achieve an equivalent level of victory. The referee, a Blackford defell with eyes as red as formbys, popped up from behind a wall and sent a small Rodian sprawling. He intercepted the jet ball that had been coming in her direction and sent it sailing toward the other end of the course. The referee can also arrange complete losses for both sides, Luke said. Though that's a last resort. It's considered barely adequate. What an odd game, Formby said. Our 2 d 2 emitted a discordant series of beeps, then raised his transceiver antenna and began to move off. Luke scowled and called. R2, come back here. When R2-D2 continued toward the scorch field, Luke excused himself and caught up to the droid. Didn't you hear me? We're in the middle of some very important business. R2-D2 whistled a sharp reply. I'm sure your business is important too, Luke said. But you'll have to conduct it over there, with us. R2-D2 pivoted on a tread, then tweedled a question. If it can't wait, you'll have to, Luke answered. You're in no condition to wander around the training grounds alone. Another question. Yes, Onassis, Luke said. Where did you think we were? R2-D2 gave a confused sigh, then reluctantly returned with Luke. Mara was explaining the theory behind Scorch as two players, a Wookiee and a Squib, wrestled with the DFL referee in an attempt to keep him from interfering with the game. The only rules are the ones the referee can persuade the players to accept, she was saying. And his only rule is that he can't use his lightsaber on any of the players. It sounds like a dangerous game, Formby observed. How many students are killed playing it? These are senior apprentices, Luke said. They can take care of themselves. And there are always healing trances, Mara added. Healing trances are good, Luke agreed. The idea is to teach our Jedi Knights to look for secret agendas and develop solutions that work for everyone. He turned to form by. That's what we hope to do at Koribu. Very noble. Formby turned away from the game. But I have seen nothing to convince me that you understand the Killix any better than we do. Quite the opposite, in fact. We haven't had as long to study them as you have, Mara retorted. But our senior scientist has already developed a theory about how joiners are created. And about how the Killix collective mind functions, Luke said. Which is? Formby asked. Luke sensed that the question was a test. We believe joiners are created when Killick pheromones alter the basic structure of the corpus callosum, he said. Those changes allow the joiners to receive signal impulses directly from the Killick brains, which, we presume, have a similar capacity. And what is the transfer agent? Luke hesitated. He could sense that they were close to winning Formby's support, but they were crossing from theory to guesswork here, and he did not want to undermine their progress by making a wild-sounding assertion. Mara disagreed. He could feel her through their force bond, urging him to take the chance. We think the impulses are transferred through auras, Luke said. But we're having trouble identifying exactly which part. All of them. Formed by said. Heat, electric, magnetic, probably chemical. At least that's what our scientists think. But that doesn't explain the will. The will? Mara asked. As far as we know, only individuals from the same nest share a truly collective mind. Formed by said. Our scientists describe it as a sort of very advanced telepathy 
where an individual has access to the thoughts and sense impressions of the entire nest. Luke nodded. That was just as Tekli and Tahiri described the experience, though he was not going to admit that to form by. That's what our investigations suggest. But insects from different nests must communicate with each other via language, just as we do, Formby said. The collective mind doesn't seem to extend far beyond the confines of the nest. Which is exactly what you'd expect if the communication medium is their aura, Mara said. To participate in the collective mind, an individual would always have to be within range of another insect's aura, and that one would have to be close to another. Precisely, formed by agreed. The collective mind can extend over quite a large area, as long as the chain of insects remains unbroken. R2 D2 began to beep for attention. Not now, R2, Luke said. He did not want to give formed by time to reconsider what he was about to tell them. Please continue, Aristocra. Formed by glanced at the droid, then nodded. But the entire colony seems to be subject to a single will. We've noticed that nests all across the sector are acting in concert, pursuing a single, unified purpose. Let me guess, Luke said. Expanding the colony. Very good, Formby said. And this will appeared about six years ago? Mara asked. When they started to develop hospitals and interstellar trade? Right again, formed by replied. And frankly, we're puzzled. How so? Luke asked. Perhaps we can help clear something up for you. Formed by smiled. Yes. Sinter suggested you would respond well to an information exchange, and we believe this mystery to be particularly well suited to the Jedi. We'll do what we can. Mara said, leaving out what exactly she meant by Ken. Though, as I said before, we haven't had as long to study the Killix as you have. That has been to your advantage, I assure you, Formby said. If you were wise, you would leave our part of the galaxy to us and avoid the colony at all costs. We Jedi try to be brave as well as wise, Luke replied mildly. Now, how can we be of service? Our scientists are having trouble understanding how the will exerts its hold over the entire colony, Formby said. The distances involved are too great for it to function through their auras, as the collective mind does. Killix aren't force-sensitive, if that's what you're thinking, Luke said. At least not the ones we've met. Would they need to be? Formby asked. If each nest had just one joiner who could feel the will, wouldn't the entire nest be subject to it? Possibly, Mara allowed. Luke felt her alarm growing as clearly as his own. It was growing all too obvious that Yunu, Raynar's nest, was the source of what the Chiss were calling the will. But this central will would have to be magnitudes stronger than the wills of the individual nests. And it could be, Luke said recalling how powerful Raynar had grown in the Force. A gifted joiner might be able to draw on the Force potential of his entire nest. I thought you said that the Killix aren't Force-sensitive, Formby said. He did, Mara answered. Force-sensitive means you have the ability to tap into the Force. Force potential is just another way of saying life energy. All living things generate force energy, Luke explained. He was beginning to see that Formby had played them, just as he had during the investigation of the outbound flight wreck. But I suspect you already know that. The information is readily available on any Holonet terminal in the Galactic Alliance. But it is good to have our theory vetted by the experts, Formby said, still trying to maintain his charade. And it seems a reasonable exchange, considering what I gave you. It would have been, if that's all you had come for. Luke turned back to the scorch field, 
buying himself a moment to contain his rising emotions. The anger he felt was at himself, for failing to see Formby's game early on, before they had told him about Raynar. But you came looking for a name, for the source of the will. Formby spread his hands and stepped to Luke's side. You were the ones who summoned me. On the scorch field, the small team once again had control of all six jet balls and were racing toward the large team's goal. The defell referee was limping after them with one furry arm synth glued to his knee. You have what you came for, Mara said. But it wouldn't be wise to act on the information. Formby looked at her in surprise. Are you threatening me? She's telling you that killing Raynor won't return the colony to what it was, Luke said. If you assassinate him, all you're going to have are a trillion angry insects who don't care if they die. The Jedi won't be able to save you. Actually, we weren't counting on that, Formby said. The Jedi have no business. R2-D2 emitted a piercing shriek, then began to bang back and forth on his treads until Luke looked down. R2, I said. R2-D2's hollow projector activated, and fuzzy image of Leia appeared on the ground in front of him. For a moment, Luke thought that it was the old message she had recorded for Obi-Wan. Then he noticed that she was dressed in a white jumpsuit instead of a ceremonial gown, and her hair was falling loose down her back instead of being gathered in those ear buns she used to wear. Luke? Her voice was scratchy and barely audible. Are there? Yes, Luke answered. R2, where's this coming from? R2-D2 tweeted a sharp reply. I know it's being relayed through the Academy Holonet transceiver, Luke said. He dropped to his knee. Leia, where are you? Luke? Leia's image said. Can't you? But, important, Killick attack Saba, stowaways on, think, after you and maybe Ben. Stowaways? Mara gasped. An image of their son holding an empty container of gel meat flashed from her mind to Luke's, then she was racing toward the exit. Ben! Careful, Leia's image said. The image grew motionless obviously waiting for a reply. Tell the comm officer to acknowledge and ask for a repeat, Luke instructed R2. Tell if, Leia said. Again later. The image winked out, leaving R2-D2 buzzing in frustration. It's okay, R2. We heard enough. Luke turned to find form by eyeing him with an expression halfway between smugness and concern. I'm afraid we'll have to cut our tour short. Of course, Formby replied. It sounds as though you'll be quite busy, as will I. Is that so? Luke used the force to summon a pair of apprentices out of the Scorch game to escort Formby and look after our 2D2. Can the Jedi be of any assistance? Not really, Formby said. Chief of State Olmus was kind enough to send an escort to accompany me to his office on Coruscant. I see, Luke said. I assume you'll be discussing the situation at Koribu. Formby smiled and dipped his head in acknowledgement. Discussing would be the wrong word, I'm afraid. 27. Leia had heard it said that no captor could imprison a Jedi longer than the Jedi wished to be imprisoned and she was beginning to understand how true that was. Even with Alma lying unconscious in the number two hold, with all four limbs shackled to cargo tie-downs and two angry Nogri guarding her with T-10 stun blasters, Leia constantly found herself limping back with a new way to confine their prisoner. Her head and ankle were throbbing harder by the minute, and the last thing she wanted was to start fighting the Trelec again. Now Leia was holding a pair of LSS-1000 series automatic stun cuffs from the security locker. Highly illegal, of course, but standard equipment aboard the Falcon. 
after checking the vital signs monitor on Alma's wrist to make sure the Trilek was still unconscious. Leia limped around behind her head. A sudden shudder ran down Alma's leku. Her eyes started to move beneath their lids, and she began to mumble in a frightened, high-pitched voice. At first, Leia thought the Trilek was crying out incoherently in a dream, but then she recognized a couple of Trileki words, those four, Knight and Herald, and realized Alma was actually talking in her sleep. Leia turned toward the intercom panel. 3PO, activate audio recording in hold 2. As you wish, princess, he said. But I will need to leave Master Sebatine unattended for a few moments. As long as she's still stable, Leia said. Oh, she's quite stable, C-3PO said. Her vital signs have been hovering close to zero for hours. A moment later, a red light activated on the intercom panel. Alma continued to mutter in her native language, something about the Night Herald, and her limbs began to jerk against their restraints. Leia glanced at the vitals monitor and saw that the Twi'lek had slipped into the REM state. She motioned for the Nogri to cover her, then squatted on her haunches and clamped the stunned cuffs on Alma's leku. You're a hard woman, Leia Solo, Han said, stepping into the hold. I kind of like it. Just being careful, Leia said. She set the power to maximum, then slowly rose and backed away. I doubt we could trick her twice. Sure we could, Han said. Teamwork and treachery will beat youth and skill every time. Alma isn't that young, and I'd say she beats us hands down in the treachery department, Leia said. She crossed the hold emptied so Alma would have nothing to fling with the force, and stopped at Han's side. I thought you and Juin were plotting the next jump. We've been trying, Han said. Trying? After repairing Alma's sabotage, they had emerged from the nebula to find themselves staring into the creamy heart of the galactic core, no more than twenty light years from the galactic alliance. You said we'd be on the Rago run in one more jump? We will, Han said. But every time we engage, the Navi computer detects a mass fluctuation and shuts us down. You're sure we're in the right place? Leia asked. Worried about the possibility of an escape, she had insisted on supervising the security precautions while Juin filled in as co-pilot. Jay didn't plot a bad jump? Han shook his head. It's definitely the same place we stopped on the way out. Rago is five light years ahead, and the star charts match what we stored in the Navi computer. The only difference is the fluctuation. Leia cast a nervous glance at Alma, who was continuing to mumble and thrash against her restraints, then asked, Could it be something coming down the run toward us? Sure, Han said. If it had the mass of a battle fleet, I see what you mean. Leia studied Alma for another moment, then checked the Twi'lek's vital signs again. The monitor showed her deep in the REM state, but Leia remained suspicious. She withdrew a hypo of Trancaris from her jumpsuit pocket and pressed it to Alma's neck. Whoa! Han said. She has a head wound. She's young. Leia hit the injector and held it down until the hypo stopped hissing. A little coma won't hurt her. Remind me not to get on your bad side, Han said. Alma stopped thrashing and fell silent, and her vital signs dropped into the coma range. Leia thumped the Twi'lek on the eyelid just to be sure, then nodded when there was no reaction. Let's go see if we're still having that mass fluctuation. Han raised his brow. You think she was? I don't know, Leia said. Leaving instructions for the Nogri to blast the Twi'lek at the first sign of trouble, she left the hold. But it never hurts to be careful. You don't think you're overdoing it? Han, she sabotaged the Falcon and gave me a beating, Leia said. 
and there's every chance my message didn't get through to Luke and Mara. If the shadow had a stowaway aboard, or if Tahiri and the others are as far gone as Alma, we might be too late already. Okay, there's that, Han said. But, Han, you do understand how good Alma is? Leia stopped and turned him to face her. How lucky we were to knock her out. Yeah, I understand. There was barb to Han's voice. But we've still got to keep her alive. Even if it means she might escape and blow us all to stardust? Yeah, even if it means that, Han said. Because what happened to her is probably happening to Jaina and Zek, and maybe Silgo can learn something from Alma to help us fix it. That's why you're so worried about her. Leia was glad to hear the ruthlessness in his voice, to know that so many decades of strife and danger had only made him shrewder and more stubborn. I was starting to think you'd gone soft. She took Han's arm and started up the access corridor. They had lost so much during the war that it was impossible to believe they had come out stronger or happier. But they had emerged together, with a better understanding of each other, and a bond that had survived the deaths of a son, a close companion, and more friends than Leia could name. No matter how alarming this latest crisis, no matter how frightened they were for Jaina, they would face it together, and together they would do whatever was necessary to prevail. They reached the flight deck and found Juin staring at the navigator's display, so engrossed in star plotting and continuum calculations that he did not notice the Sola's presence. Leia could see that he was attempting a broad-spectrum variable analysis with a ten-decimal accuracy parameter. With his eyes bulging and his cheek folds flared in frustration, it looked like he would blow a circuit before the Nava computer did. Leia brought her mouth close to Han's ear. I hope you've been backing up our navigation log. You bet, Han said. I knew what you were thinking the minute we realized we were coming down on an abandoned planet. Really? Actually, Leia had been too busy trying to cold-fire the repulsor engines to be thinking much of anything, but she wasn't going to admit that to Han. She didn't want him thinking Juin was a better co-pilot than she was. Pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Yep. Han flashed a cocky grin and I charted everything in sensor range on the way out. The grin grew larger and cockier. There might be another dozen stars inside the nebula. A dozen? Leia gasped. Then, not wanting Han to see just how well he really did know her, she assumed a more subdued tone. So there might be another five or six habitable planets, plus a few moons, if we're lucky. Five or six? There'll be a dozen, even two. The indignation in Han's voice faded quickly to concern. But will anyone want to colonize there? It's still outside the Galactic Alliance, and it's not easy to reach. The Athorians will go right away, Leia said. The world we came down on is perfect for them. And, given how they feel about violence... It's about the only chance they have of getting around the Reclamation Act. As long as the rehab conglomerates don't steal it out from under us again. The Reclamation Act doesn't apply outside the Galactic Alliance, Leia said. Besides, who's going to tell them? Han nodded quietly at the navigator's station, where Juin was mumbling to himself and shaking his head in frustration. Finally, he banged the side of his fist into his temple and whined something in Celestin that Leia did not quite catch. We'll just have to keep him close, she whispered. At least until we've relocated the Athorians. Han let his chin drop. You really know how to spoil the moment. He stepped on the flight deck and, peering at the display over Juin's shoulder, asked. So, what have? Juin jumped out of his seat the top of his head avoiding Han's chin only by virtue of his short stature, then spun to face them. What are you doing, sneaking up like that? Han raised his hands. Easy. I wasn't trying to give you a power surge. 
Actually, Jay, we've been standing here talking for a couple of minutes. Leia leaned down to look at the display. It appears you've been hard at work. Juin relaxed somewhat. I've been running a full gravitational analysis, per emergency troubleshooting procedure. Come up with anything besides a headache? Han asked. Nothing that makes sense. Juin returned to his seat and began to call up columns of stellar deflection observations. Light is definitely being distorted at a steadily increasing rate which means that either there's a very large, completely invisible rogue body dead ahead, or something big is about to come out of hyperspace, Leia finished. Did you do a rate of change analysis? Of course. Juin typed a command and brought up a graph plotting angle of deflection against time. According to this, space-time should be separating just about. Leia's hair stood on end, then an iridescent flash lit the interior of the cockpit, and tiny snakes of static electric began to drag race down her neural pathways. The proximity alarm blared to life. She hurled herself toward the co-pilot's seat, but lost her footing and hung in midair for a moment, her eyes aching with the brilliance of the silvery flash ahead, her stomach swirling inside her like water down a drain. Then Leia stumbled into the co-pilot's chair and found herself staring out the viewport at an immense, cylinder-studded crevice of durasteel whiteness. Her stomach rose toward her throat as Han put the falcon into an emergency climb, and her ribs began to throb from an impact she did not remember receiving. What is it? Han yelled. Leia activated her tactical display and found the top half rapidly filling with transponder codes. It took her a moment to find the Falcon's own code, surrounded as it was by others of a similar color. I, I think it's a battle fleet, Leia reported. Whose? A jagged line of familiar white ellipses appeared along the bottom edge of the viewport. Interspersed among them were about twice as many thin white arrows. Hapan. Leia did not bother to confirm her conclusion with a code search. She had seen the distinctive ships too many times, at Dathomir, Corellia, and even Coruscant, to need corroboration. Those are Novas and Battle Dragons. Yeah, Han agreed. What are they doing out here? Going to Lizzle, Juin said. What else? The calm channel crackled to life, and a voice with a thick Hapan accent said, this is Hape's Battle Dragon Kendall hailing Galactic Alliance Transport Longshot. Heave to and prepare for temporary impoundment. Impoundment! Han maintained his course. Better let them know who we really are. Leia was already reaching for the transponder controls. Longshot, this is your last warning. Battle Dragon Kendall. Leia activated the Falcon's true transponder code. This is Leia Organa Solo aboard the Millennium Falcon. The Hapan voice grew more uncertain. Millennium Falcon? Yes, Leia said. Sorry for the confusion, but we usually travel incognito. I'm sure you understand. Of course, the voice said. Good. If you'll assign us a safe vector, we'll move through and let you be on your way. I'm sorry, princess. We have orders. Then I suggest you let me speak to whoever issued them, Leia said. Queen Mother Tenoka has been a frequent guest at my dinner table. I'm sure she would be unhappy to learn we were detained as a matter of procedure. A new voice came over the comm channel. Princess Leia Organa Solo? He asked. The mother of Jedi Jason Solo? That's correct. Disturbed by the way the man had emphasized Jason's last name, Leia reached out in the Force and was relieved to feel no sense that her son was anywhere in the fleet. To whom do I have the honor of speaking? Forgive me, the man replied. I am Ducatale Sun Grey. Ninth cousin to the Queen Mother and dutched it to Lady Algray of the Relifon Moons. Thank you, 
Leia said. I'll remember you to the Queen Mother the next time we meet. You're very kind. Gray's tone was polite but doubtful. I'm certain we can trust you to hold our encounter here in the strictest confidence. Of course, Leia replied. We wouldn't want to jeopardize the colony's reinforcements. The calm fell silent. Blast, you didn't have to say that, Han groaned. We know where they're going. But not why, Leia said. If a war is breaking out, we need to know. Why? Han asked. We won't be able to tell anyone if we're stuck in the belly of a battle dragon. Gray's voice came over the calm again. Actually, our mission is closer to peacekeeping than reinforcing. Leia shot Han a smug grin, then said, Yes, that's what I was given to understand. Do you need navigation data to the colony gateway? That won't be necessary, Gray responded. We have a course to the Lizzle Nest, and your son assured us that someone would be waiting. Our son? Leia interrupted. Yes. Gray sounded confused. The Queen Mother's new consort. He was the one who, uh, convinced her to intervene. A loud smack sounded from the pilot's seat. Leia glanced over to find Han holding his palm to his brow. You think you know him, Han said, shaking his head. And then he tries to start a war. 28. The door slid aside, revealing the clean-lined interior of the Skywalker's uncluttered Asin cottage. Mara had grown so accustomed to the vague uneasiness she had been feeling in the Force that the sensation barely registered as she crossed the foyer. But this time she paid special attention, closing her eyes and letting her feet carry her toward where it seemed strongest. Mom! Mara opened her eyes and found Ben standing before her, on the other side of low table that was the living room's only furniture. The sliding wall panels that partitioned the house into rooms were all closed, so it was difficult to tell where he had come from. He pointed at her feet. Your shoes! Mara glanced down and saw she had neglected to leave her dusty boots in the foyer, as was the custom on Asus. Never mind my shoes. She started around the table toward Ben. Did you bring a pet back from Julio? Ben's eyes grew round. A pet? A killick, Mara said. The uneasy feeling was as strong as ever, but she could not pinpoint a location. It seemed to be coming from Ben and from all around her. Is that what you've been doing with all that gel meat and nerf spread? Aren't Killick smart? Ben asked. Smarter than I thought. Why? Cause then she'd be a friend, not a pet. Mara cocked an eyebrow. She Ben? Ben's mouth fell open, and he backed toward the kitchen. I, uh, they're all. Stay here. Mara started around the table. Don't even think of moving. But, Mom. Don't argue, she ordered. Your father will talk to you later. Mara stretched her awareness into the kitchen and sensed only Nana inside, but that did not stop her from pulling her lightsaber. Mom, don't. Quiet. Mara used the force to slide a wall panel aside and found Nana down on her knee joints, quietly brushing morsels of gel meat onto a sheet of flimsoplast. The rest of the room appeared deserted. Nana? The droid looked up, but was so flustered she continued to brush morsels, missing the flimsoplast and spreading them across the floor. Yes, Mr. Skywalker? Mara's eyes went to the three gel meat containers lying empty on the preparation island. Don't worry, Nana said. Ben didn't eat all that. I hope not, Mara said. That would be a good way to earn a memory wipe. There was too much YVH droid in Nana to be intimidated. That won't be necessary. 
My nutritional programming is very up to date. Mara pointed the handle of her lightsaber at the wrappers. Then who ate that? The droid peered up at her. I'm sorry. I can't say. Then how can you be sure it wasn't Ben? I'm afraid you're misunderstanding, Nana replied. I know who ate the gel meat. I'm the one who opened the food locker. I just can't tell you. What? Mara used the force to jerk the droid off her knees. Explain yourself. It's a secret, Ben said from the edge of the kitchen. You promised, Nana. You can't have secrets from me, Mara said, holding the droid in the air. I'm his mother. Under normal circumstances, of course not, Nana agreed. But where there is a danger to the child, my programming. Danger to the child? Mara demanded. What danger? Nana lowered her feet to the floor. Ben said you would kill him if you found out what he was doing, the droid explained. And I must say, considering how angry you are now, his fear certainly seems warranted. Ben? When he failed to answer, Mara glanced back and found an empty doorway. She turned to go. Ben! I said. Nana started after her. I'm sorry, Master Skywalker, but until you calm down I really must. Mara whirled on the droid. Stand down, beautiful blaster. The override code stopped the droid mid-stride darkening her photoreceptors and dropping her chin to her chest. I'll handle this myself. Mara continued into the living room and went straight to Ben's room, where he was busy pushing the closet panel closed. Ben, come away from there, now! Ben pressed his back to the closet. It's not what you... Mara reached out with the force and pulled him to her side, then grabbed his wrist and, keeping one eye on the closet door, knelt at his side. Ben, we just received a hollow from Aunt Leia, she said. She was worried that a killick assassin might have stowed away aboard the shadow. So if all that gel meat you've been taking is for... Garog's no assassin, Ben said. She's my best friend. She's an insect, Ben. So... Your best friend's a lizard. Don't be ridiculous. Mara rose and pushed him behind her. Aunt Leia is my best friend. Doesn't count, Ben said. She's family. Salba is a lizard. Okay, maybe my best friend's a lizard. Mara was both repulsed and terrified at the thought of her son developing a relationship with a Killick especially given what Silva was learning about the joiner bonding mechanism. But she was also beginning to worry about the psychological damage Ben might suffer if she slew his friend in front of him. If Garag's your friend, tell her to come out nice and slow. We'll talk this. The muffled groan of a sliding wall panel sounded from two rooms over. Holding her lightsaber at the ready, Mara used the force to open Ben's closet and nearly ignited her blade when an empty exoskeleton tumbled into the room. It was about a meter high, with thick blue-black chitin and barbed mandibles half the length of Mara's arms. Ben! I told you it wasn't what you thought. Stay here! Using the force to slide the wall panels aside in front of her, Mara rushed two rooms over and found six black limbs two legs and four arms, sticking out from under the low table that Luke used for a writing desk. The mandibles were protruding from one end, and the whole piece of furniture was trembling as though there were a ground quake. Ben rushed up beside Mara. I told you to stay in your room, Mara said. I can't, Ben said. Garag scared. Okay. Tell her to come out. Everything will be all right. A low rumble reverberated from under the table. She doesn't trust you, Ben reported. 
Mara actually looked away from the bug. You speak Killick? I don't speak it. I just understand it. Garag drummed again, and he added, She says you're a killer. Coming from her son, the words felt like a vibrablade to the heart. We talked about that, Ben. Sometimes I have to kill. Many Jedi Masters do. Garag rumbled something else, and it seemed to Mara that there was something sharp in the insect's rhythm, something spiteful and malevolent. Mom, what's cold blood? Ben asked. Is that what she's saying? Mara squatted down so she could look Garag in the eye. Instead, she found herself staring at a dark sheaf of mandibles and mouthparts. It means you kill when you don't have to. I don't do that. The Killix slowly moved away, carrying the table along on her back and drumming incessantly. She says you killed lots of people when you didn't have to for Palpatine, Ben said. Mom, who's Palpatine? Palpatine, Mara corrected automatically. She felt as though the Emperor were reaching across time to her yet again, as though to prove how foolish she had been to believe she could ever truly escape him. A bad man I used to know. How does Garag know his name? A stream of brown saliva shot out from under the table. Mara's reflexes were too quick for it to come near her face, but in the quarter second it took her to draw away, the insect came flying at her with the table still on its back. She activated her lightsaber instinctively, and heard Ben crying out over the crackle of the igniting blade. Don't! Ben cried. Please! Mara deactivated the blade in a pang of motherly concern and whirled into a spinning back kick instead, her foot landing high because she had to lift her leg above Ben's head. Instead of launching the killick across the room, the attack simply knocked off the table and drove the insect to the floor. A soft sizzle sounded from the wall beside Mara, and a sour, acrid smell filled her nostrils. She put down a hand to push Ben back and Garag slammed a mandible into her ankles, sweeping her from her feet. Mara hit the floor flat on her back. The Killick stabbed a pair of sharp pincer hands down on her shoulders and brought her head around, a hypo-shaped proboscis pushing out between the mandibles, venom dripping from its tip. Mara smashed her lightsaber handle into the tube, folding it over and drawing a boom of pain from the Killick's chest cavity. Mom! Ben cried. Go to your room. Mara hooked her elbow around the arm on her shoulder and pulled, dropping Garag to an elbow. Now! The killick reached for Mara's neck with its other two hands. Mara drove her free hand up under the insect's jaw, then bridged on her shoulders and flipped it onto its back. She sprang instantly to her feet, and the killick flexed a wing and flipped instantly to its feet. Ben remained in the doorway, on the opposite side of the killick from Mara. Ben, I'm very disappointed in you. Mara's shoulders were throbbing where the pincers had pierced them, and blood was running down the front of her jumpsuit. She could sense that Luke was only a couple of minutes behind her, but a lot could happen in two minutes, too much to be sure that she would not have to kill Ben's friend. You need to start obeying me and go find your father but you said to go to my... Ben! Mara brought her lightsaber up and started to circle toward him. Just do as I say. You're in enough trouble already. Ben's face grew pale, and the killick began to pivot with Mara, keeping itself between her and her son. She thought for a moment the killick meant to use Ben as a hostage, but it was careful to stay away from him, as though it, too, were worried he might be accidentally injured. Ben, I think Garag wants you to leave, too. Ben glanced at the killick, then asked Mara, Are you going to kill her? Ben, I'm the one who's bleeding here. But you're a Jedi Master, Ben said. It doesn't matter if a Jedi Master bleeds. You've been watching too many action holos, Mara said. 
Nevertheless, she hung her lightsaber on her belt. But okay, I promise, if you leave right now. Garab rumbled something that caused Ben to scowl. Maybe you should just be nice, he said to the Kilik. Then maybe Mom would let you stay. Garag thrummed, and Mara began to wish C-3PO were here to translate. She doesn't always lie, Ben protested. Not even most. Garag raised two hands and shooed him toward the door. Ben sighed and left the room. Mara waited until she heard the front door slide open, then said, Thank you for that. The killick spread its mandibles and sprang. Mara caught it in the force and slammed it into a support post. There was a sharp crackle, and when the insect dropped to the floor, one of its wings jutted out at an angle. I don't understand why you want to fight, Mara said. Because you have no chance of winning. Garag jumped across the room, mandibles snapping at head height. Mara rushed to meet the attack, then dropped into a slide, catching both ankles as she passed beneath the insect, spinning to her belly, twisting its legs around and slamming the killick down on its back. The insect flexed its good wing and landed back on its feet, but Mara was already driving an elbow into a tubular knee. The leg snapped with a sickening crackle, and the killick dropped to the floor. Mara grabbed the killick's good leg and stood, jerking it up more or less upside down, then Snake locked her leg over the insects and shoved against the joint. All right, that's enough, she said. I promised Ben I wouldn't kill you, but I didn't say anything about hurting. The killick clacked its mandibles wildly, then released an acrid, foul-smelling vapor that filled Mara's eyes with cloudy tears and turned her stomach queasy and rebellious. She snapped the joint and attempted to launch herself out of danger with a departing thrust kick, but the insect was already rolling into Mara's leg. She landed face down, her kicking leg trapped beneath the killick. Four pincer hands grabbed hold of her calf and began to pull, dragging her foot toward the clacking mandibles. Mara's own hand drifted toward her lightsaber, but she stopped short of pulling it free. This bug was not going to make a liar and a killer of her in her son's eyes. She reached forward, clawing at the wooden floor, trying to pull free, and only slipped farther beneath the insect. Then Mara saw the table, lying on its side where it had fallen when Garag attacked. She reached out with a mental hand, turned it end on, and brought it sailing into the killick's head. The table connected with a spectacular pop, and Garag's grasp loosened. Mara scrambled free and force sprang to her feet, then spun around to find the killick collapsed on its belly, all six limbs trembling and shaking in convulsions. She rushed to its side and pulled the table away, revealing a ten-centimeter dent in the head where the edge had cracked the chitin. Stang! Mara pulled the comm link from her pocket and started to call for medical assistance then noticed the killick slowly drawing its trembling arms and toward its body, gathering itself to spring. Mara slipped forward and brought her heel down on the dented chitin. I said that was enough. Garag collapsed again, unable to do anything but lie on the floor and tremble. Then Mara felt Luke urgently reaching out to her, warning her to be careful, urging her not to kill it. Mara eyed the insect with spite in her heart. What is it with you? A few seconds later, Luke came rushing in the door with half a dozen senior apprentices at his back. Mara, are you? I'm fine, Skywalker. She took the hand he offered and glared down at the trembling insect. But I'm getting awfully tired of people telling me not to squash that bug. Sorry about that, but the comm center just finished reconstructing some of Leia's message. Luke motioned the apprentices to secure the killick, then added, She says it could explode. 29. Reclining in long diagnostics chairs with their heads hidden beneath scanning helmets and their bodies swaddled in sensor feeds, the subjects of the experiment, Tahiri and the other joiner Jedi Knights, reminded Luke of captives in an Imperial interrogation facility. 
It did not help that the Kilik and Almarar, who had arrived aboard the Falcon just hours before, were heavily sedated and strapped in place with Nyla steel bands. Even the isolation chambers in which the subjects were located, dark, gas-tight compartments with transparent steel doors, looked like detention center cells. I'm sorry it's so dim in here, Master Skywalker, Silgal said. She was standing behind a semicircular control station in a white laboratory smock, studying a data hollow comparing the brain activity of her subjects. But it's better to have as little background stimulation as possible. It helps isolate their responses. I understand. Luke did not bother denying his revulsion. Silgo could certainly sense his feelings through the Force, just as Luke could sense the excitement that had caused her to calm him in the first place. And it's more than the darkness. The whole lab raises unpleasant associations. Yes, it does have a certain imperial utilitarianism, Silgo said. I wish there had been time to design something less dismal, but this configuration was the quickest to assemble. Speed is important, Luke assured her. It will only take Han a few days to repair the damage to the Falcon, and I'd like to have this thing figured out before he and Leia start back to the Koribus system. Silgal studied him out of one bulbous eye. You can't convince them to wait until we learn more? Not with Jaina still there, not after what happened to Saba. Saba will recover, and Jaina. Silgal turned up the palms of her fin-like hands. If Jaina would not return before, what makes them think she will listen to them now? I don't know, Luke said. But they're convinced we need to return to Koribu as soon as possible, and I think I agree with them. Luke had heard reports of Jason's visit to Tenoka and rumors of unexplained Hapan fleet maneuvers, and Leia had told him flatly that the balance of power at Koribu was about to shift. He and the other masters were still debating if that was a good thing or bad, but events were clearly moving faster than the Order's ability to deal with them. Whether the Jedi understood the Kilix or not, they had to take action soon. After considering Luke's words for a moment, Silgal said, Then I should just tell you what I need and not waste time reporting failures. Luke frowned at the hesitation, shame, he felt from the Mon Calamari. If you think that's best, he said cautiously. Silgal turned to her assistants, a trio of apprentice healers, and sent them out of the room. That bad? Luke asked. Yes. She pointed at the chambers holding Alma and Garag. I need to hurt them. Hurt them? Inflict pain, she clarified. Torture them, in truth. Not for long, and nothing that will injure. But it must be intense. It's the only way to test a critical hypothesis. I see. Luke swallowed and forced himself to look through the transparent steel doors at the two prisoners. There was a time when he would not even have considered such a request, and when Silva would never have made it. But now that the Jedi had elected to embrace all of the Force, to utilize the dark side as well as the light, nothing seemed off limits. They deceived, they manipulated, they coerced. To be sure, it was all done in the name of a higher purpose, to promote peace and serve the balance, yet he occasionally felt that the Jedi were losing their way, that the war with the Yuzen Vong had turned them from their true path. He sometimes thought this must have been how Palpatine started, pursuing a worthy goal with any means available. Perhaps we should back up a little, Luke said. Have you made any progress at all? Of a sort. Silgo pointed to her data hollow, which was basically a flat grid plotting each subject's name against various brain regions, with colored data bars above each square. As the level of activity changed, the bars rose and fell, changing colors and glowing more or less brightly. As you can see, all of our subjects display similar levels of activity in their sensory cortices, which suggests they're experiencing the same physical sensations. And they shouldn't be? 
The corners of Sildil's lips rose in a broad-mouthed grin. Not really. The environment in each chamber is different. Hot, cold, rank, fragrant, noisy, quiet. Luke raised his brow. Doesn't that confirm your theory about the corpus callosum receiving impulses from other brains? It does. Silgo pointed at four red bars near the end of Almaz and Garag's data rows. But look at this. The hypothalamus and limbic system are the center of the emotions. Almaz is correlating to Garag's. Luke noticed that this was true only of Alma and Garag. The hypothalami and limbic systems of Tessar, Tekli, and Tahiri remained independent. Jason's readings were, as usual, completely useless. He was playing with the brain scanner again, moving his color bars up and down in a rhythmic wave pattern. It was, Luke knew, a not-so-subtle form of protest. His nephew believed that the Jedi Order should have more faith in its Jedi Knights than in Silgal's instruments. Under normal circumstances, Luke would have agreed, but circumstances were not normal. Alma and Garag are in a meld? Luke asked. Silgal shook her head. No. They're not perceiving each other's emotions, as Jedi do in a meld. Alma and Garag are sharing emotions, the same way Tessar and the others are sharing sensations. This takes the collective mind a step deeper than we have seen before. Thinking of the will that Formby had described, Luke reached out to Garag in the force and felt only the vague sense of uneasiness that, after the battle in the Skywalker's cottage, he had come to associate with the blue killicks that had been attacking them. But the data bars matched to Garag's hypothalamic and limbic systems brightened to orange and started rising. So did Almas. Interesting, Luke said. This killick is force-sensitive. After a fashion, Silgal said. I believe she and other Garag can use the force to hide their presence, not only from us, but from other killicks as well. What I need to find out is whether they can also use the force to pass neural impulses to other members of the colony, even those outside their own nest. And that's why you need to inflict the pain? Luke asked. Silgal nodded. I'll neutralize the numbing agent, but leave Garag and Alma unable to move. If the pain is severe enough, Garag will be motivated to reach out to the others, and we'll see the results on their graphs. And this will tell us whether Garag is also able to influence the others, Silgal said. We need to know that before we can begin thinking about countermeasures. Luke's heart sank at the word begin. If Silgal had not yet started to think about countermeasures, it seemed unlikely she would have any ready before the Falcon was repaired. And if Luke asked her to find some other way to test her hypothesis, unlikely became almost impossible. Feeling just a little more lost inside, Luke nodded. If there's no other way. There isn't. Silgal's sad eyes grew even sadder. Not in the time we have. She activated the electromagnetic shielding between the cells, and all the sensory cortex readings returned to independent levels. Alma's hypothalamic and limbic systems remained the same color and brightness as Garag's, however. Silgal entered another command. A hypo dropped down from the ceiling panel and injected the neutralizing agent into a soft spot just below the Killix mouthparts. A few seconds later, the insect's cortex activity began to fluctuate as its physical sensations returned. The hypo ascended back into the ceiling, and a flat tip probe took its place. Garag's hypothalamic bar turned brilliant white, shooting to the top of the data hollow and staying there. So did Almas. Garag is angry with us, Silgal observed. I don't blame her, Luke said. He wanted to look away, but forced himself not to. If he was willing to sanction torture, then he had to make certain it never became easy. 
Silgo brought the probe down to where one of Garag's upper arms joined the thorax, then sent an electrical charge through it. All six limbs, even the two casted legs, extended straight out and began to quiver. All of the insect's data bars brightened to white and rose to the top of the hollow. Alma's limbic system continued to mirror the kilix, but her sensory cortices remained quiet. When the other subjects did not show a similar rise in the activity of their hypothalamic or limbic systems, Luke asked, Is that enough? Not yet. She must believe it will never end. The Kilix mandibles clacked close, and its antennae began to whip madly back and forth. Luke reminded himself that this was the insect that had tried to turn his son against his wife, but that did not make torture feel right. Mara was spending every waking minute with Ben, trying to make him understand how the things that Garag had said could be true and still not mean she was an evil person, and Luke knew that even she would not have approved of the insect's suffering. Mara reached out to him in the force, worried about Ben and curious about what was happening to Garag. Luke's stomach grew hollow with fear. Ben and Garag were clearly joined, perhaps not as completely as Alma, but too much. A part of Luke wanted to kill the Killick right now, to punish it for trying to use his son against him, to sever the connection before it grew any stronger. But a bigger part of Luke wanted to protect Ben, to spare him the anguish of knowing that his friend was in pain. He started to tell Sildal to turn off the probe, then Tessar's hypothalamic bar began to rise. Tahiri's limbic system also began to show more activity and Tekli exhibited steep rises in both. A moment later, the trio's data bars vanished as they pushed off their scanning helmets and began to peel electrodes off their bodies. Unlike Alma and Garag, they were not restrained. Okay, turn it off, Luke said. He could feel Mara growing more concerned about Ben. There's no sense. Silgo held up a hand. Wait. Garag continued to clench her limbs to her chest and whip her antennae. Tekli, who as a healer was a little faster at extricating herself from the equipment, emerged from her chamber first. I'm sorry, she said, marching straight for the exit. I need to use the refresher. Of course. Silgo swiveled a dark eye in Luke's direction, and he felt her interest growing. Take your time. Tahiri emerged next. You need to give us a break sometimes, she complained, walking over to the console. I'm beginning to feel like I'm on a week-long X-wing jump. Tahiri's gaze drifted to the data hollow and lingered for a moment on Garag's bars. Then she turned to Luke with her mouth twisted into a brutal grin. Looks like I'm not the only one who came out of the war part using Vong, she said. What's next? Jedi tattoos? The comment stunned Luke more than it should have, in large part because he could feel his wife growing more worried and angry as the experiment continued. This isn't for fun, Luke said. We're. Tahiri, are you feeling any pain? Silgal interrupted. Is that why you came out here? Tahiri looked at the Mon Calamari as though she were a dimwit. Sogal, I'm half using Vong inside. The only thing pain would cause me is a religious experience. You're sure? Sogal asked. You don't feel any at all? This one feels no pain either, but that does not excuse what you are doing. Tessar emerged from his compartment trailing a dozen broken sensor wires. This one is through with your gamas. He will not be party to a breaking. He tore a handful of electrodes off his chest, threw them on the floor, and started toward the exit. Tahiri watched him go, then looked back to Luke with the hardness of a Yuzin Vong in her green eyes. Tessar and I must not be completely joined, she said. I'd kind of like to stay. I think we're through, 
Luke said, wondering if the revulsion he felt was for the Yuzin Vong and Tahiri's personality, or for himself. Isn't that right, Silgo? Yes, I have seen everything I need to. She cut the power to the probe. Garag's data bars returned to normal, and Mara gushed relief through the force. We're through for today, Silgo said to Tahiri. Thank you. As Luke watched the young Jedi Knight leave, he began to feel increasingly disappointed. He had no doubts now that Tessar and the others were completely under Raynor's control, that they had agreed to return to the Galactic Alliance only so they could sneak away from the Academy, as they had all done at one time or another, and seek support for the colony. After the door had his shut, Luke shook his head and dropped onto a bench in front of the control panel. I guess that tells us what we needed to know, he said. They're all under control of the colony's will. Of a will, Silgo corrected. Not the will, as the Chiss believe. Luke looked up. You've already lost me. Silgo came out from behind the control console. Like the Force itself, every mind in the galaxy has two aspects. She sat next to Luke on the bench. There is the conscious mind, which embraces what we know of ourselves, and there is the unconscious, which contains the part that remains hidden. Luke began to see where Silgo was headed. You're saying that since the war, the colony has developed two wills, one conscious and one subconscious. Not subconscious, unconscious, Silgo corrected. The subconscious is a level of the mind between full awareness and unawareness. We're talking about the unconscious. It remains fully hidden from the part of our mind that we know. Sorry, Luke said. It's complicated. Just like every mind in the galaxy, Silgo said. This is an analogy, but it fits, and our experiment demonstrates just how closely. Alma and Garag are controlled by the unconscious will. The correlation of their emotional centers makes that clear. And Tekli, Tessar, and Tahiri are controlled by the colony's conscious will? Luke asked. Influenced by, Silgo said. They have not fallen under the colony's complete control. They still think of themselves as individuals. Then why did they end the experiment? How often do you do something without truly understanding why? Silgo countered. In every mind, the unconscious has a great deal of power. Some psychologists even think it's absolute. So when Garab was in pain, the colony's unconscious will influence its conscious will to end the experiment. Suddenly, Tekli had to use the refresher, Tahiri had to stretch. And Tessar became angry with us. Exactly, Silgo said. Of the three... He was the only one who had even a vague understanding of his motivations. Barabels are usually in touch with their unconscious. Luke thought of the mysterious attacks on him and Mara, and of the Killick's absurd insistence that they had not occurred. And the conscious will wouldn't be aware of the unconscious will, would it? It is the nature of the unconscious mind to remain hidden, Silgo said. That is why the Garag are so hard to sense in the Force. They use it to hide, not only from us, but from the rest of the colony as well. Garag is part of a secret nest, Luke said, making sure he understood what Silgo was telling him. The colony wouldn't be aware of it, and might well fool itself into believing it doesn't exist, Silgo said. We've more or less proved that and it explains the Killick's reaction to the attacks on you. It all makes sense, except for one thing. Why does the secret nest keep attacking us? Luke asked. Raynar seemed to want our help. But Lomi and Welk are threatened by you. It was Jason who asked this, his voice coming from the data hollow. And they're the ones who control the Garag nest. You know that for certain? Luke turned toward the data hollow and finding himself being addressed by a row of colored bars, frowned in irritation. 
And I thought I told you to stop playing with Sildo's brain scanner. Come out here, if you're going to be part of this conversation. I know that Raynar dragged Lomi and walk out of the burning flyer. Jason pushed the scanner helmet up and, now projecting his voice into the air in front of Luke, began to remove the electrodes attached to his body. And we know that Saba was attacked by a disfigured Jedi Knight, almost certainly Welk. I'm willing to take a leap of faith and guess that Lomi survived, too. Yeah, Luke said. I guess I am, too. Then only one question remains, Silgo said. Why did Alma join the Garag while the rest of you? Them, Jason corrected. In case you haven't noticed, my mind remains entirely my own. Very well, Silgo said. Why did Alma join the Garag while everyone else joined the Tot? Luke knew the answer to that, and he wished he didn't. Because of Numa, he was remembering the time he had stood outside Alma's back to tank awash in the guilt the Trilek felt for allowing the Voxen to take her sister. When Numa was killed, Alma turned a lot of her anger inward, and anger has always been fertile ground for the likes of Lomi Piello. You saw this coming, didn't you? Jason asked. He stepped out of the isolation chamber, pulling his tunic over his head. Even before the mission to MYRKR, I mean... Luke turned to look at the unconscious Trilek, held prisoner by Nyla Steel and Trancarist. Not this, not Garag, he said. But I knew Alma would fall. 30. Elders, welcome, Leia said, bowing. She stepped away from the door and waved her Athorian guests into the resewed room. With a costly Ruwood serenity table surrounded by extravagant flow-fit armchairs, the chamber was a conspicuous departure from the sparse decor of the rest of the Jedi Academy. Being the designated receiving area of an institute that cordially discouraged visitors, it was also one of the least used rooms in the facility, and one that reflected the sensibilities of its reconstruction authority builders far more than it did those of the Order itself. I hope you'll forgive the room, Leia said as the Athorians filed into the foyer. It's the best I could do under the circumstances. Oam Wabi, the eldest of the Athorian elders, politely swung his ocular nodes around the room. His small eyes blinking gently as they observed the automated beverage dispensers, the state-of-the-art holotheater, the transparent steel viewing wall that overlooked the academy's training grounds and low-slung instruction halls. Your presence would make any room pleasant, Princess Leia. Wabi spoke out of only one of the mouths on his throat, a reflection of the poor medical care aboard the Athorian refugee cities. But we thank you for your concern. And thank you for coming to Asus. Leia could barely contain the excitement she felt, nor her fear that the Athorians might balk at settling outside the Galactic Alliance. I know it was an unexpected journey. But Han and I must return to the unknown regions as soon as the Falcon is ready, and there is something I wanted to discuss. Leia let her sentence trail off as a pair of black-clad Galactic Alliance bodyguards stepped into the foyer behind the Athorians. The two women were not armed. Only Jedi were permitted to carry weapons on Asus, but their sinewy builds and supple grace suggested they did not need to be. Leia's hand dropped to her lightsaber and she slipped between Wabi and another Athorian elder to confront the newcomers. May I help you? She said. Yes. The first woman's cobalt eyes darted past Leia, scanning all corners of the chamber. You can clear the room. As the first woman spoke, the second was slipping past behind her, waving the feathery antennae of a threat scanner at various pieces of furniture and artwork. Leia glanced toward Han, but he was already placing himself squarely in the bodyguard's path, studying the scanner with feigned interest. Is that one of those new Tendrando arms Multisniffers Lando was telling me about? Han pushed his head between the delicate antennae, pretending he wanted to see the data display, and ruining the instrument's calibration. 
I've heard they can smell a gram of thermobum at 50 meters. Leia waited until the first bodyguard finally stopped looking past her, then said, I'll be happy to clear the room when our meeting is finished. Until then, feel free to wait in the reception. We have no time to wait. Kel almost entered the room wearing a rumpled travel tunic as red as the veins in his bloodshot eyes. This matter has taken too much of my time already. Chief Omis. Leia's diplomatic skills must have been degenerating from disuse, for she could not quite conceal her shock. What a surprise to see you here. I imagine. Omis started for the beverage station, walking straight past the Athorian delegation and failing to acknowledge them. Where's Luke? I really don't know. Leia began to fume at the way he had slighted her guests. Chief Omis, allow me to present Oama Wabi and the Council of Ithorian Elders. We were about to begin a meeting, a meeting for which they have traveled a long distance on short notice. Taking the hint, Omis set aside the glass of Bwago juice he had been filling and returned to the Ithorians. Elder Wabi, a pleasure to see you again. He bowed formally to Wabi, then greeted each of the other elders by name, stumbling only when he came to the young Jedi liaison, Izumnor. For a moment, Leia was impressed enough to recall why she had helped elect Cal Omis to the chief's office in the first place. Then Omis returned to the beverage station. Forgive me for pushing in like this. He retrieved his Buago juice and took a sip but I've asked the senior Jedi to meet me here to discuss a matter of vital importance. And I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed, Luke said. He entered the room with Mara and, pausing to bow to the Athorians, approached the chief of state. Most senior Jedi aren't available. Perhaps if there had been more notice. If you hadn't been hiding here on Asus, perhaps I would have been able to provide it. Omis gave Luke an icy glare. As it is, you will have to do. Aristocra Formby is demanding to know why the Galactic Alliance has sent a battle fleet to the colony. Have we? Luke's gaze remained fixed on Omis, but Leia felt his mind reaching in her direction, wondering what this had to do with her vague warning about the shift of power in the colony. I wasn't aware of that. Neither was I, Omis fumed. Yet a Hapan battle fleet was seen at some place called the Lizzle Nest. In the colony? Corin Horn asked, stepping into the room. What's it doing there? I was hoping someone here could explain, Omis's gaze swung to Leia. Perhaps you? I'm afraid not. Leia had been half expecting this. In the convoluted politics of the Hapan Royal Navy, there was sure to be some ambitious spy who saw an advantage in reporting the fleet's encounter with the Falcon to Galactic Alliance intelligence. They were in no mood to answer questions. Who was in no mood to answer questions? KYP asked, joining the group. He nodded to the Athorians, from him the equivalent of a full diplomatic salutation then ignored Omis and came to stand with Leia and Han. The Hapans? Yeah, Han said. They wanted to intern us. Intern you? Omis knitted his brow. You encountered this fleet? Leia began to have a sinking feeling. You didn't know? No, Omis's voice was icy. I apologize, Leia said. We gave our word not to reveal their presence. And you kept it? Omis demanded. Some of us still honor our promises, Han said. I know it's old-fashioned, but there you have it. The Galactic Alliance can't afford your promises right now, Omis retorted. I only hope they haven't started a war. Leia had no choice, Luke said. The word of one Jedi to another is binding. 
almost let his chin drop. Don't tell me there were Jedi aboard those ships. It was Tenoka's fleet, and she is a Jedi, Mara said. Leia's word is as binding to Tenoka's agent as it would be to the queen herself. The assertion was a stretch, since being honest with other Jedi was more of an unwritten policy than a formal code. And the concept of extending it to a Jedi's representatives was a new innovation entirely, but Leia appreciated the support. She started toward the conference area, initiating a subtle migration that she hoped would result in a shift of mood as well as location. Once she arrived, she turned and watched in silent amusement as Omis instinctively searched for the head seat at a round table. Now would have been a good time to ask the Athorians to wait in the reception area, but she was not about to sanction the rude way Omis had burst into the chamber. If he did not want to discuss this in front of the Athorians, he could be the one who asked them to leave. If you didn't know about our encounter with the fleet, Chief Omis, why did you think Han and I could tell you what it was doing in the colony? Leia asked. Because of your son. Olmus finally took a chair across from her, his gaze lingering on the concentric black circle, white star inlay that repeated itself on the table's surface in ever smaller renditions. I thought Jason might have told you why he arranged this. Jason? Han asked. He sat at Leia's right. Last time I checked, he wasn't king of anything. No. But Tenoka dispatched the Hapan fleet shortly after his visit. Omus waited as Luke, Mara, and the other Jedi Masters also took seats at the conference table, allowing his gaze to linger on the Athorians then finally seemed to accept that the Jedi were not going to ask them to leave and simply turned back to the conference table. I doubt it was a coincidence. It wasn't, Jason said, breezing into the room. I asked her to send a fleet to the colony's aid. Olmus twisted around in his chair. Why in the blazes would you do something like that? Instead of answering, Jason stopped and greeted the Athorians fondly, addressing several by name, then excused himself to go over to the conference area. The Athorians, as perceptive as they were gentle, remained in the foyer area, awkwardly greeting Kent Hamner, Silgal, and the other Jedi Masters as they continued to trickle in. Jason took a chair at Olmus's side, then said, I am a Jedi. All you need know is that my reasons were sound. The calming aroma of the rue would must have been working, because Olmus remained in his seat and looked across the table toward Luke. I didn't realize Jason was a master. The opinions of all Jedi are valued in this room, even those who don't consider themselves members of the Jedi Order. Luke looked to Jason. Perhaps you'd explain to the masters present? If you like. Jason's tone was cordial. I was trying to prevent a war. Prevent one? Omis demanded. The Chiss. Understand only power, Jason interrupted. And now the Killix have some. The Hapan fleet will buy us the time we need to resolve this conflict. At the Galactic Alliance's expense, Omis said. The Chiss are already threatening to withdraw their security patrols if we don't bring our Jedi under control. Mara's eyes, and those of several other masters, flashed at the word R, but Omis did not seem to notice. He turned back to Luke. And that's exactly what I want you to do, Master Skywalker, he said. By force, if necessary. I want all of our Jedi, and the Hapan fleet, back inside Galactic Alliance borders by this time next month. Wouldn't it be better for you to talk to Queen Tenoka? Leia asked. She is, after all, the leader of a Galactic Alliance Republic. And a Jedi, Olmus countered. He lowered his eyes, then continued in a softer voice. Frankly, she refuses to listen to me. 
She insists she is only doing what is right, and the discussion ends there. And perhaps ours should end here, KYP said. He sat at Leia's left, looking across to where Luke sat at one tip of the conference table's largest and laid stars. Jedi don't answer to politicians. What? This from Corin, who sat on the other side of KYP. Then who do we answer to? Ourselves? Of course, Jason replied calmly. Who else can we trust to wield our power? We must follow our own consciences. That's very arrogant. Kent Hamner said. He placed his hands on the table and... leaned forward, looking Jason directly in the eye. It concerns me to hear any Jedi say such a thing, but you, Jason? It is sound public policy to place powerful factions like the Jedi under the control of a civil authority. Leia kept her voice reasonable and conciliatory. Whether Jason knew it or not, he was digging at an old wound among the masters and she did not want the meeting to descend into another of the shouting matches that Luke had described over the Jedi's proper relationship to the government. Even in those with the best of intentions, power corrupts. And so we place the burden of remaining pure on lesser shoulders? Jason pressed. Mother, you've watched two governments collapse under the weight of their own corruption and inefficiency, and the third is sagging. Do you really believe Jedi should be the tools of such frail institutions? Leia was at a loss to respond. Jason's question was almost rhetorical. He had been there when she declared that she was done with politics forever, and he knew better than anyone, probably even Han, how disheartened she had been by the ineptitude of the new Republic government. In truth, she almost agreed with what he was saying and probably would have done so openly, had she known of a better way to run a galactic republic. When Leia failed to answer, Jason turned to Omis, who was flushing in speechless anger, and said, I'm sorry if this offends you. It offends me, Corin said. The Jedi exist to serve the Galactic Alliance. Our duty is to the Force. KYP's voice was calmer than Corin's, but harder. Our only duty. Kent Hamner held his hand out toward KYP, fingers forward in a conciliatory fashion. I think what Corin is saying is that it's our duty to serve the Galactic Alliance, because serving the Alliance serves the Force. That's so? Han asked. He usually avoided ethics debates like the black holes they were, but this time even he could not restrain himself. Because Corin made it pretty clear he thought the Jedi were just a bunch of Reconstruction Authority cops who ought to take their orders from Chief Olmus like everyone else. He winked at Jason, which was exactly the wrong thing to do at that moment. Corin glared blaster bolts at Han. I think we are answerable to Galactic Alliance Authority, yes. Even if it means war in another part of the galaxy? Mara retorted because Jason's right about this. The Force extends beyond the Galactic Alliance, and so does our responsibility. Then let the rest of the galaxy pay your bills, Oma snapped. Until that happens, I expect the Jedi to put Galactic Alliance interests first. A sudden silence fell over the conference table, with Corin and Kent casting accusatory glances at KYP and Mara and KYP and Mara studying Omis with knowing sneers. After a moment, Luke said, When the Alliance offered its support, it was with the explicit understanding that there were no conditions. In an ideal galaxy, that would still be true, Omis said. He met Luke's gaze without flinching, and with no regret or embarrassment for breaking his pledge. But Galactic Alliance finances are stretched thin as it is.
If we must suddenly replace the CHIS security patrols, the only way to afford the cost would be to slash the Jedi budget. KYP planted his elbows on a wedge of black tabletop and ran his gaze around the circle of masters. Well, at least the question is out in the open now. Are we mercenaries or are we Jedi? Corin's eyes bulged. And the debate deteriorated into an open quarrel, with Corin and Kent still arguing fiercely that the Order's first obligation was to the Galactic Alliance, and KYP and Mara stubbornly contending that Jedi should strive to bring justice and peace wherever the Force summoned them. Cringing at what the Athorians must think of such a contentious display. Leia glanced over at the foyer area and found them standing there in polite silence, as overlooked and forgotten by the Jedi as they had been by the Galactic Alliance government for the last five years, and that was when a terrible thought struck her. Leia had a solution to the colony problem, a solution that meant cheating the Athorians yet again. The Master's voices were growing sharp and loud, but Leia remained quiet. Her plan would please Omus more than it did her and that in itself was almost enough to make her reject it. Once, she had held the chief in high regard and helped place the war against the Yuzen Vong in his hands. But peace was often harder to manage than war. Over the last five years, Olmus had made too many compromises, bowed to the demands of the moment so many times that he could no longer hold his head up high enough to see what was coming on the horizon. And if Leia proposed her solution, she would be guilty of the same thing. She didn't know if she could do that, if peace would be worth seeing the defeated eyes of Cal Olmus in her own face when she looked into the mirror every morning. Finally, Luke had heard enough. Stop! When KYP and Corin continued to argue, he stood and sharpened his voice without raising it. Stop, he repeated. KYP and Corin slowly fell silent. Is this how Jedi resolve their disagreements? Luke asked. Both of the master's faces went red with embarrassment, and Corin said, I'm sorry. He was apologizing to Luke instead of KYP, but that was more than KYP did. He simply sank into his chair and, being careful to avoid Corin's eyes, stared blankly at the table's star within a star inlay. Too bad, Han muttered. I haven't seen a good lightsaber fight in ages. Leia was about to kick Han under the table when he exclaimed, Ouch. Sorry. Mara looked past Han to Leia. Just stretching. No problem, Leia said. Han's joke was too true to be funny. The rift in the Jedi Order had been widened today, and she was beginning to wonder if it could ever be closed. I was feeling a little cramped myself. Luke allowed a tense silence to fall over the room, then sat down and turned to Olmus. It may take some time to reach a consensus on your request, Chief Olmus. As you can see, our decision is complicated by the fact that the Chiss are acting against the Kilix not because of what they have done, but because of what they might do. Olmus nodded gravely, his irresolute gaze gliding around the table silently taking the measure of the Jedi who had defied him, trying to judge the resolve of those who had not. Finally, he came to Luke and stopped. Master Skywalker, I quite simply do not care, he said. The Chiss's trouble with the colony is no concern of ours. We can't put Galactic Alliance lives at risk just because a few Jedi feel bound by a quaint morality no one else understands. Cam Seleucer and Tyan arrived on the heels of the exchange. It had been over a year since Leia had seen either of them, but they looked much the same, Cam still wearing his white hair cropped close to the head and Tyan allowing her silver-white tresses to cascade over her shoulders. They had barely cleared the door before they drew up short, recoiling from the animosity in the force with the horrified expressions of someone who had just stumbled upon a pair of mating Togorians. Leia had not realized until she saw their alarm just how noxious the atmosphere in the room had grown. 
The rift in the council was widening before her eyes, opening a chasm that would only grow increasingly difficult for prideful masters like KYP and Corin to cross. Assuming that her idea was viable, and she felt sure it was, she had it in her power to close that rift, at the price of her own conscience. Cam and Tyan took seats next to each other, on the opposite side of Silva from Luke. We were just discussing the situation at Koribu, Luke said to them. Chief Omas has informed us that Tenoka has dispatched a Hapan battle fleet to aid the colony. Tyan's pearlescent eyes grew wide. That doesn't sound good. It gets worse, Corin said, scowling at Jason. A Jedi is responsible. He followed his conscience, KYP said. Which is more than I can say for half. Actually, Leia said, cutting off KYP's insult before it could be finished. There may be a way for the Jedi to stop the war and earn the trust of the Chiss. Han groaned but everyone else turned to her with a mixture of relief and expectation in their eyes. Han and I discovered. Ah, uh, sweetheart? Han grabbed her forearm. Can I talk to you a minute? This did not please Omis. Captain Solo, if you have discovered something useful to the Galactic Alliance. Excuse me, Chief. Leia spun her chair around, placing her back to the table then waited as Han did the same. Yes, dear? Han's eyes bulged. What in the blazes are you doing? Stopping a war, Leia whispered. Knowing Han would only grow stubborn if he realized how much this was going to hurt her, she tried to hide her dismay. Saving billions of lives, keeping the council together, preserving the Galactic Alliance. That kind of thing. Yeah, I know. Han jerked a thumb toward the Athorians. What about them? That world we found was perfect. And it's perfect for the Killix, too. She had a familiar queasiness inside, a heavy feeling that used to come whenever she was forced to make an unfair choice as the new Republic Chief of State. We'll take care of the Athorians another way. How? Han asked. Ask Omas to give them a planet? No, Leia said. Make him. She turned around and smiled across the table at Omas. On the way home, Han and I discovered a small group of uninhabited planets. Leia waited for the murmur of surprise to fade, then said, I think they might make a good home for the Coribin nests. A wave of disappointment filled the force and Leia could not help looking past Omis toward the foyer. The Athorians were all staring silently in her direction, their eyes half-closed in resignation, or perhaps it was sorrow. Still, when Leia met Wabi's gaze, he merely tightened his lips and gave her an approving nod. No Athorian would want to live on a world that had been bought with someone else's blood. Leia directed her attention to Luke. I propose that we move the Corabinest to these planets. How? Jason asked. There are four nests in the system, each with at least 20,000 killicks, and you don't just move a killick nest. You have to rebuild it inside a ship, lay in stores. I'm sure Tenoka will instruct her fleet to help with that, Leia said. In fact, I'm rather counting on it. Jason's jaw fell. Then he closed his mouth and nodded. That could work. And it will look as though it's what the Jedi intended all along, Omas added. Brilliant! You're sure about this planet? Luke asked Leia. It's completely deserted? We should stop on the way back to the colony and do a thorough sector scan. Leia glanced at Han, who nodded then added, But I'm sure. The astrobiology there is unique. Well then, Luke glanced around the circle, seeking and receiving an affirmative nod from each of the council masters. We seem to have reached an agreement. The bitterness began to fade from the force, and the tension drained from the faces of the masters. We'd better prepare to deal with the darkness, 
Mara said. It might not like this idea. Dark nest? Omas asked. The Garag nest, Luke explained. The colony seems completely unaware of it, so we've started calling it the Dark Nest. It's attacked us several times, Mara said. Why? Omas asked. Mara hesitated, clearly unwilling to tell the chief about the nest's personal vendetta against her, so Leia answered. We're not sure, she said. The nest doesn't seem to want us involved with the colony, so it's a good bet it will try to stop us. Maybe the dark nest wants war, Jason suggested. It sounds like the colony was pushing up against ascendancy territory even before their own worlds began to grow scarce. There must be a reason. I don't understand, Omis said. I thought you persuaded Tenelka to send her fleet because the colony is trying to avoid a war? The colony is, Silgal said. But the Dark Nest may have its own reasons to want a war, Leia said. She did not want to complicate Omis's view of the issue with a lengthy explanation of the colony's unconscious motivations, or give him reason to doubt the Jedi's ability to resolve the crisis. There's a bit of a, um, power struggle going on inside the colony. Isn't there always? Olmus said, nodding sagely. Power struggles were something that every government official understood well. He turned to Luke. Is this going to be a problem for us? Only finding it, Mara said. The Garag are pretty secretive. So far, we've seen them on Yaga and Tat but we have no idea. Not a problem, Han interrupted. I can find their nest. I don't know if that's even possible, Silgal said. The Garag social structure may be quite different from other nests. They may have parasite cells hidden among all the other. I can find them, at least the, uh, heart, Han said, following Leia's lead and not mentioning Lomi and Welk by name. Trust me. Fine. Luke turned to Chief Olmus and added, But we'll have to take along a Jedi team large enough to neutralize the nest. The Chiss will be alarmed, and nothing you say is going to reassure them. They'll be reassured when the Killix leave Korribu. I'll handle them until then, just don't take too long. Olmus braced his hands on the table and rose. Speaking of which, I'll be on my way. Not so fast, Chief, Han said. We haven't told you what this is going to cost. Cost? Olmus looked to Luke, who merely shrugged and directed the Chief back to Han. Of course, the Galactic Alliance will be more than happy to compensate you for any expenses the Falcon incurred. We're talking a lot more than that, Han pointed at Olmus's chair, motioning him back down. You see, Leia and I had something in mind for that group of planets, and we're not about to give that up just because you're afraid of what the Chiss think. Omis scowled. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. Borau, Leia said. We want you to annul Replanet Hab's claim in favor of ours. You see, we were there first, and they kind of claim jumped us, Han said. It's been scorching my jets ever since. You want me to give you a planet? Omus gasped. In the inner rim? Not us. Leia pointed over Omus's shoulder toward the Athorians. Our clients. Omus spun in his chair, slowly, and faced the Athorians, who were looking considerably less glum. I see, he said. If the decision were mine alone. Han, do you remember the coordinates of the new planet group? Leia asked. We were having that trouble with the Nava computer, and I'm not sure we made a backup of. I'll see what I can do, Omis said, rising again. But you understand I can't just do this. The Recovery Act is law. I'll have to push a special exception through. Then I suggest you hurry, 
Corin said, leaning back in his chair. The Koriba problem is time-sensitive, and I'm sure the Solos will want this matter resolved before they leave. That's quite impossible, Omis said. When Corin merely shrugged, Omis turned to Kenth, who suddenly seemed far more interested in the training fields outside than in the Chief of State. Omis sighed then said, But I can block Replanet Hab's claim. He turned to the Athorians and added, It may take a month or it may take ten, but I'll push this through. By this time next year, you'll have a planet of your own again. I give you my word as Chief of State. That's not much, Hound said, also rising. But it'll have to do. To the contrary, Captain Solo, Wabi started forward, holding out his long-fingered hand to shake Omis's and accept the promise. It is more than we have now. Thank you. Wabi's courtesy should have made Leia feel better, but it did not. Instead, she felt sad and sickened and a little bit soiled by the trade-off she had been forced to make. Like it or not, she was suddenly back in politics. 31. A weight lay across Jaina's chest, and the inside of one ear was being warmed by a soft, pulsing growl. The dormitory air was filled with a comforting melange of refresher soap and body smells from a dozen different species, but the predominant odor, familiar and musky and strongest, was human. Male human. Zek. Jaina reached down and felt his arm across her, and his leg a bit lower, then slowly turned her head. Through a lingering fog of membrosia excess, she saw the familiar chiseled features surrounded by a frame of shaggy black hair. Thankfully, he was still clothed. The previous night came flooding back to her, Yuna's arrival at Julio, the dance of union, the tot drifting off into the harem cave, the joiners leaving in twos and threes and fours, her hand in Zex. Zex's green eyes opened and the smile on his face was replaced by a confused squint. He blinked two or three times, then glanced at the lightly clothed female body over which he draped himself and raised his brow. Jaina sensed a distinct click in the back of his mind. His eyes slid away from hers, and she felt his emotions swinging from disbelief to bewilderment to guilt. Well, Jaina said, hoping to set a casual tone. Interesting night. Yeah. Zek pulled his arm and leg off of her body. I, I thought it was a dream. Jaina cocked her brow. You're saying it wasn't? Zek's eyes widened. No, it was fun. He said. Great, even. I just, it just didn't feel real. Zek let the sentence trail off sharing his thoughts and emotions with Jaina directly via the meld. Or perhaps it was the top mind, instead of trying to explain. He had loved her since they were teenagers, and he had imagined waking at her side countless times. But last night had not felt like them. They had been carried along on a wave of killic emotion. He had sought her out in the rapture of the dance, even when he knew she did not share his feelings and found himself leading her down into the dormitory with all the joiners. Zack, we didn't do anything, Jaina said. She could have answered him more quickly and clearly just by thinking, but right now she needed the sense of separation that came with speaking, even if it was an illusion. It was just a little cuddling between friends. You have a problem with that? No, Zack said. I just feel like I took advantage. Jaina clasped his forearm. You didn't. She was genuinely touched by his concern, and truly relieved that it had been handsome, muscular, familiar Zek who had taken her hand instead of Raynar. We lost control there for a minute, but we got it back. I'm just glad Alma went home with Mom and Dad. Zek remained quiet. Jaina propped herself up on an elbow. Hey! She punched him in the shoulder. I know what you're thinking. Sorry. 
Sek blushed and turned away, and Jaina felt him closing down emotionally. Sek, you can't do that, she said. They had to keep the meld open between them, to constantly draw on each other's strength and resolve to remain their own little entity within the greater top mind. And will you stop apologizing? Jaina rolled her eyes, then reached for her jumpsuit. I think I'm getting dressed now. She sat up and, sensing someone behind her, pivoted to find Raynar on the busy walkway at the head of their sunken bed. Dressed in scarlet and gold and surrounded by his usual retinue of assorted killix, he was squatting on his haunches, staring down into the hexagonal sleeping cell with no discernible expression on his melted face. A sense of overwhelming awe rose inside Jaina, Tot's reaction to Unithel's presence, and she felt her mouth broadening into an adoring grin. She managed to wipe it away by reminding herself that this used to be Raynar Thul. Raynar, good morning. Jaina pushed her feet into the jumpsuit and continued to dress without embarrassment. There was not much sense in being modest when several thousand nestmates had access to your innermost thoughts. Come down to see how the drones live. Raynar lowered his stiff brow. Why do you call us Raynar when you know Raynar Thal is gone? Raynar's still in there somewhere, Jaina said. I can feel him. Raynar glared down at her then said, Perhaps you are right. Perhaps a little Raynar Thal remains in us still. A glimmer of sadness appeared in his cold blue eyes. And he will be sorry to see you go. Jaina felt sex alarm at the same time as her own. Go? Your task here is done, Raynar explained. Really? Jaina thrust her arm through a sleeve. I hadn't heard the chis were gone. As she said this, the image of a clockraft reconnaissance patrol appeared in her mind, the scene being relayed to one of the tactical monitors in the top control room. The ships were silhouetted against Rosamber Disk flying just above the plane of Koriba's golden ring system. It looks like they're still here to me, Sex said, no doubt seeing the same thing in his mind's eye as Jaina did in hers. So why would the colony want us to leave now? We wish you to return to the Galactic Alliance, Raynar said, dodging the question. What about our mission? Jaina rose and closed her jumpsuit. You brought us here to keep the peace. Raynar stood. Your starfighters are being fueled. We thank you for coming. You seem eager to be rid of us, Sex said, zipping his own suit. What's going on? It's the Chiss. Jaina could not tell whether her inference came from her own mind, Zex, or Tots, but she knew it was correct. They're going to attack. A short, very Raynar like sigh escaped Raynar's lips. There's nothing more you can do here. And we don't wish to involve Jedi in this fight. There isn't going to be a fight, Sex said. Jaina and I will turn them back. Not this time, Raynar said. The Chiss intend to bring this to an end, and they won't be intimidated by Jedi tricks. There's no harm in trying. Jaina summoned her utility belt and began to buckle it on. She did not understand why the Chiss were suddenly changing strategy and launching a major assault, but in a war, some things you just did not have time to figure out. Where are you expecting them? Zek and I will. No. We don't wish to risk the lives of our friends in this matter. What do you think we've been doing? Zek asked, buckling on his own belt. We're here to keep the peace, and we're not leaving. There is no longer a peace to keep, Raynor said. And you are leaving. Suddenly his voice felt like it weighed a thousand kilos, and the urge to do as he ordered grew almost overwhelming. There was more going on here than Raynor was telling. Ambush. The thought had barely flashed through Jaina's mind before a tot in Raynor's retinue began to drum its chest. Raynor listened intently then met Jaina's gaze and shook his head. 
You have always been too headstrong for your own good, Jaina. Do not try to figure this out or... It won't work, Sex said, leaping to the same conclusion as Jaina. If you destroy the Chiss fleet, the next one will only be bigger. Raynor let his chin drop in another old Raynor gesture. Now you've done it. The urge to depart suddenly vanished. Now you must stay. We weren't leaving without Lobaka anyway. Jaina sounded more certain than she was. Raynar's will had felt like it was more than a match for her stubbornness. And Zek is right. The colony isn't strong enough to destroy the entire Chiss space force. That won't be necessary, Raynar said. We only need to hold them off until the Hapans arrive. Hapans? Jaina climbed out of the sleeping cell onto the walkway with Raynar, causing a soft clatter as his retinue scrambled to make room for her. What are Hapans doing out here? Defending the weak, Raynor said. Jason convinced Tenoka to send us a fleet. At least now Jaina understood why the Chiss were attacking. They wanted to destroy the Korriban nests before reinforcements arrived to complicate the job. Jason convinced Tenoka, or you used Jason to convince her? Jaina was thinking of how Raynar had nearly forced her to leave just a few moments earlier, and of the irresistible call that had summoned her and the others to the colony in the first place. Your touch can be very compelling. Perhaps, but even we are not strong enough to control Jason, Raynar said. He has moved beyond our control, or anyone else's. You know that yourself. Jaina could not argue. During Jason's five-year journey, she had felt him growing steadily stronger in the Force, but also more distant and isolated, like a hermit retreating to his mountaintop. At times, he had seemed to vanish into the Force entirely, and at other times she had sworn he was floating just above her shoulder. To tell the truth, it had given her the creeps. She had started to feel like she was sharing a twin bond with a different brother every few weeks or like he was practicing to be dead or something. Jason wouldn't send you a fleet, Sex said. He jumped up onto the adjacent side of the sleeping cell, into the middle of a steady line of joiners streaming past toward the communal refresher. They smoothly detoured down another walkway, and both the conversation and the morning parade continued unabated. That could start a war between the Chiss and the Galactic Alliance or prevent one between us and the Chiss, Raynor countered. Perhaps he is willing to run the risk. Even Solos don't like odds that long, Jaina said. When Chiss feel threatened, they don't back off. They get mean and aggressive. You can't do this, Sek added. What we cannot do is allow the destruction of the Koriban nests. Raynor's retinue abruptly started for the exit and he turned to follow. Once the ambush begins, you will be free to fight or leave, as you wish. Until then, you remain our guests. Jaina started after him. Raynar! When a pair of knobby-shelled bodyguards moved to cut her off, she used the force to shove them into a sleeping cell, then said, This is madness. Raynar continued moving away from her. It is self-defense. Again, his voice grew heavy and commanding, and this time it contained an edge that suggested he would abide no more argument. You will return to your proper barracks and remain there until the battle begins. Jaina felt an overwhelming urge to obey, but there was a darkness in his tone that alarmed her, a hint of brutality so utterly alien to Raynor Thal that she knew it was not him alone speaking. She planted her feet on the walkway and, drawing on Zek for the strength to resist the compulsion to start toward the barracks, touched Raynar in the force. The murky presence inside him was so caustic that she recoiled and would have lost contact had Zek not bolstered her through their melt. Jaina began to feel her way through the bitter darkness, searching for Raynar's pride and idealism, trying to find the core of him that she sensed was still there. They want this war she said. 
They're the ones who convinced you to establish your nest so close to Chis territory. Raynar stopped, but did not turn around. They? Who is they? Your shipmates on the flyer. Zek stepped past Jaina and, shuffling along the walkway, started toward Raynar. Lomi and Welk. Lomi and Welk are dead. Jaina found something pure and compassionate inside the prime and touched it. Then who attacked the shadow on her way in? Insect mercenaries hired by the Chiss, Raynar answered instantly. Zek stopped a step behind Raynar. You have proof? We have no time to look for proof. Raynar reluctantly turned around, and his retinue of insects began to file back toward the discussion. We are too busy defending our nests. Jaina sighed inwardly. It was the same circular logic they encountered every time they tried to investigate the mysterious attacks. What about the attack on Saba? Zek pressed. I suppose you're going to tell me she attacked a joiner by mistake, and he took her lightsaber away and wounded her? Yes, Raynar replied. That is the best explanation. Jaina tightened her hold on the core of benevolence she had found. Raynar, they're blinding you to the truth. The best explanation. We are tired of telling you. The murky presence welled up inside Raynar and swallowed the pure center that Jaina was holding, and she found herself suddenly adrift in a void of biting darkness. Instinctively, she reached for Zek and opened herself to their meld, but instead of his strength, all that came to her was cold, staining shadow. Raynar Thal is gone, Raynar said. Jaina felt herself turning. She tried to fight the compulsion, to lock her gaze on Raynar and keep it there, but she simply did not have the strength to fight him. She stepped away and started for the barracks. We are all that remains. 32. A long, golden arrow curved through the heart of the holographic flight control display tracing the route of the stolen skiff from the repair hangar to its current location on the edge of Asus's gravity well. The reckless manner in which the skiff had cut through the approach zone of the planet's primary spaceport suggested the pilot had been eager to get away from the Jedi Academy as quickly as possible. But Luke had already known that. Escapees like to move fast. Thirty seconds before she can jump, a flight controller reported. A large-headed Bith with an auditory data feed in one ear, he was seated at one of a dozen control stations surrounding the hologramic display. She still won't acknowledge our signal. Keep trying, Luke said. He could feel the anxiety of the XJ-3 pilots trailing the skiff, a pair of young Jedi Knights flying their first security rotation. They were worried they would have to blast it out of space. Do we know yet whether she has company? Not with certainty, said the Bith supervisor, a blue-skinned Duro's woman named Oraim. She stepped to an empty terminal and clacked a few keys. An inset of a repair hangar security vid appeared at the base of the flight control display. But we did find this. The inset showed Alma Rar striding through a darkened repair bay, two cases of food goods floating through the air ahead of her. We think that shadow. Enhance the cases, Mara said. Along with Han, Leia, and several others, she had accompanied Luke up from the hangar floor as soon as the stolen skiff had streaked skyward. Bring up a label if you can. The Duros typed a command, and the carton label filled the image. Neutrophit gel meat, Mara read. She's stealing Garag, Ben cried. The skiff's trajectory began to flatten as Alma prepared to enter hyperspace. The XJ-3 pilots come for permission to open fire, and Luke reached out to them in the force, urging them to avoid disabling the vessel. Permission granted, Oraim said over the comm channel. Open fire. The pilots hesitated. But... You heard the order, Luke said, still reaching out to the pilots through the force.
urging them let the skiff go. Open fire. The skiff's trajectory began to weave and wobble as it began evasive maneuvers. She's getting away. Ben cried. Stop her. They have to be careful, Ben, Mara said gently. Or they might hurt Garag. Ben considered this, then sighed and took her hand. Let them go. I don't think Garag wanted to stay anyway. The skiff's trajectory reached the edge of Asus's gravity well and vanished. The flight controller reported that the stolen skiff had entered hyperspace. Han let out a sigh of relief. Right on SCH. Not now, Luke interrupted, raising his hand to silence Han. He turned to Ben. How did you know Garag didn't want to stay? Do you still feel her in your mind? Ben closed his eyes, then nodded. Sort of. She wants me to be happy. Luke felt his own dismay mirrored in Mara. If Ben remained in touch with Garag after she had entered hyperspace, it could only be through the colony's will. He was part joiner. Dark Nest Joiner. Mara had reached the same conclusion. Luke could feel her alarm and anger through the Force, and she was as quick as he was to realize that they could not discuss their plans in front of their son. Ben, maybe Nana can take you to the pilot's lounge for some fizzer, Mara said. We have some things to discuss, then we'll find you there before we leave. Ben made no move toward the door where Nana and C-3PO were waiting. Luke frowned. Ben, I'm sure you've heard your mother. Ben nodded. I heard. But why do I have to stay behind on Asus? Without waiting for an answer, he turned to Han. Is there going to be another war? Han Grimace then said, Not if we can help it, kid. And certainly not in this part of the galaxy, Mara added. Why are you worried about that? Because this is what you do when there's a war, Ben said. You just dump me someplace with Masters Tyan and Seleucer and then never even come to visit. The accusation struck a pang in Luke's heart, and he felt Mara wince as well. They often wondered how much Ben's refusal to use the Force had to do with the separation anxiety he had suffered during the war with the Yuzen Vong and Ben knew this particular complaint had an effect on them. Even so, Mara refused to be manipulated by an eight-year-old. Don't exaggerate, Ben. We had to keep you safe, and you know we came to see you every chance we had. Besides, they won't be gone long this time, Jason said, stepping out from behind Han and Leia. There isn't going to be a war. Ben frowned. How do you know that? I know. Jason flashed a crooked solo smile. Trust me. Luke felt a sudden qualm in Mara, and though her eyes remained fixed on Ben, he sensed that her thoughts were on Jason. Besides, you're not going to be alone, Jason added. I'll be here too. You're not going back? Ben asked. Not yet. The Masters are worried that some of us have spent too much time with the Killicks already. Tell me about it, Ben answered, rolling his eyes. So maybe you and I could hang out together? Jason glanced at Mara. If that's all right with your mother. Of course, Mara answered with no outward hesitation, but Luke detected just a hint of apprehension, as though she did not quite trust the new and improved Jason. As long as Master Seleucer thinks Ben is keeping up with his schoolwork. No problem. Ben's smile was as broad as a hut's. School's easy. And as long as you obey Master's tie-in and Seleucer, Mara warned Ben. No secrets with Nana either. I can't do that anymore, Ben said. Dad altered her program. Good. Jason took Ben's hand and started for the door. Why don't we get that fizz in now? Can I have Kylie? Ben asked, not looking back. 
A blue giant size. As soon as they were out of earshot, Han said, Jason has a knack with kids. Go figure. It's his empathy, Leia said. I'm glad to see it's intact. Leia left unsaid what Luke knew she was thinking, that after the war, after all Jason had suffered at the hands of Vergeer and the Yuzen Vong, she was surprised he had any empathy left. Luke turned to Han. Sorry to interrupt you earlier, but we don't know how much the Dark Nest might be able to glean from Ben's mind. No problem, Han said. I got a little carried away when I saw how well the plan was working. I don't know why you're surprised, Leia said. Alma is still a Jedi. Once Silda let her regain consciousness, there was never any question she could escape. The tricky part is going to be following her. How did you know which vessel she'd steal? Mara asked. We didn't, Leia said. We bugged them all. Speaking of bugs, we'd better get going, Han said. That transmitter only has a subspace range of 50 light years. We can't be too far behind when Alma hits colony space, or we'll be stuck guessing where she went. Luke followed Han and the others toward the door. Their intention was to follow Alma to the core of the Dark Nest, then undermine its influence over the colony by eliminating Welk and, assuming she had survived the crash, Lomi Pielo. Silgal and Jason were convinced that at least Welk had survived, and that a Dark Jedi now led the Garag in much the same way Reyna led the Yunu. It was a somewhat ruthless plan, especially in the way it placed Alma's life at risk without her consent but it seemed to Luke to be consistent with the nature of modern Jedi themselves. The war with the Yuzen Vong had taught the Jedi the folly of valuing sentiment over effectiveness, the wisdom of striking quickly and fiercely at the heart of a problem. Sometimes, Luke wondered whether it was a lesson the Jedi had learned too well, whether in defeating their enemies they had not become a little too much like them. At the door, Han ran headlong into a short, gawky man with a heavily tattooed face and unruly blue hair. Without apologizing for, or even seeming to notice, the collision, the newcomer pushed past Han and stopped in front of Luke. R2-D2 followed close behind. Here you are, the man said. I've been looking everywhere. I don't understand why, Ghent, Mara said. We told you we were leaving on Jedi business. Gent furrowed his brow. You did? Several times. Luke saw Han tapping his wrist impatiently. And we have to leave soon. Oh. Gent's eyes dropped, then slid back toward R2-D2. I guess this can wait. What can wait? Leia asked. Luke had told her about the hollow hidden in the sequestered sector in R2-D2's memory and she was as eager as he was to learn more about the mysterious woman. Did you find something? Gent shook his head. Just a few seconds of hollow that I managed to relocate before I tripped a security gate. What I wanted to ask is if I could. Hollow of what? Luke asked. A brown-eyed woman? That's right, Gent said. But it's really not very much if I can. Can you show it to us? Leia sounded even more excited than Luke felt. Before we leave? Gent frowned. Of course. An uneasy silence fell as Luke and the others waited. Gent, we want to see the hollow, Mara said. Now. As Luke said, we haven't got much time. Gent's brow rose. Oh. He squatted and inserted the plug of a homemade diagnostic scanner into one of our 2D2's input slots, then hastily typed a command. Show them. Our 2D2 piped an objection, and Han groaned and looked at his chrono. Don't make me scramble your sector tables again, Gent warned. This time, I won't restore them. Our 2D2 let out a long, descending trill 
then activated his hollow projector. The hand-sized profile of the same brown-eyed woman that Luke had seen before appeared on the control room floor. She seemed to be standing alone, facing someone outside the hologram. Has Anakin been to see you? Asked a male voice. Wait a minute, Han said. That guy sounds familiar. He should, Luke replied. The voice was much younger than when they had known him, but there was no mistaking its clarity and resonance. That's Obi-Wan Kenobi. Gin tapped a key on his diagnostic scanner, stopping the hollow. Do you want to see this or not? Of course, we're sorry, Leia said. Please continue. Gin punched the key again, and our 2 d 2 restarted the hollow from the beginning. Has Anakin been to see you? Obi-Wan's voice asked. Several times. The woman smiled then said, I was so happy to hear that he was accepted on the Jedi Council. I know. Obi-Wan walked into the hologram, wearing a Jedi cloak with the hood down. He was still young, with a light brown beard and an unwrinkled face. He deserves it. He's impatient, strong-willed, very opinionated, but truly gifted. They laughed, then the woman said, You're not just here to say hello. Something's wrong, isn't it? Obi-Wan's face grew serious. You should be a Jedi, Padme. The name shot an electric bolt of excitement through Luke, and he could sense it had done the same to Leia. You're not very good at hiding your feelings, Padme said. Obi-Wan nodded. It's Anakin. He's becoming moody and detached. His hollow image turned half away. He's been put in a difficult position as the Chancellor's representative, but I think it's more than that. The image turned back to Padme again. I was hoping he may have talked to you. Padme's expression, at least what could be seen of it in the small hologramic image, remained neutral. Why would he talk to me about his work? Obi-Wan studied her for a moment. Neither of you is very good at hiding your feelings, Sither. Padme frowned. Don't give me that look. Obi-Wan continued to look at her in the same way. I know how he feels about you. Padme's eyes slid away. What did he say? Nothing, Obi-Wan answered. He didn't have to. Padme's face fell and she turned and walked out of the hologram. I don't know what you're talking about. I know you both too well. Obi-Wan followed her out of the frame. I can see you two are in love. There was no answer, and the hologram ended. Luke could see Han biting his tongue, forcing himself to remain patient while the distance grew between them and Alma skiff, but this was important, at least to him and Leia. That's all? Luke asked. Gent nodded and tapped our 2 d 2s silver dome. Arta's blocking me. When I tripped that security gate, he encrypted the rest of the data. Our 2 d 2 whistled an objection. It's not your place to decide what is good for Master Luke, C-3PO said. You're only a droid. Our 2 d 2 trilled an angry reply. No, I don't know the secret you're keeping, C-3PO answered. And if I didn't know, I'd tell Master Luke instantly. R2-D2 responded with a low, slurpy buzz. Luke frowned at the exchange, but turned back to Gint. Look, we've got about two minutes before we have to launch. Is there any way to see the rest now, without Arta's cooperation? Gint sighed. Sure. He pulled his scanner plug out of our 2 d 2s input socket. All I have to do is overwrite his personality sectors. The rest of Gent's explanation was lost to our 2 d 2s screech of objection. Don't expect me to translate that, C-3PO said. That's what happens to arrogant droids like you. I suggest you extend your cooperation immediately. R2-D2 trilled a sad refusal. 
Luke glanced at the droid then asked. I mean without a personality wipe. Not in two minutes, and maybe not in this lifetime, Gent said. This droid hasn't had a memory wipe in decades. His circuits are one huge personality fault. I know that, Luke said. What about the spyware? Gent looked confused. Spyware? The spyware that's keeping me from accessing those memories. Luke was losing patience with the programmer. The memories concerning the woman we just saw. Oh, that's spyware, Gent said. There isn't any. There isn't? Luke frowned. Then how come R2 won't give me access? Gent sighed, sounding as exasperated as Luke felt. That's what I'm trying to explain. Maybe you can explain on the way to the pilot's lounge, Mara interrupted. She motioned them out the door. We can finish talking on the way. We've still got a tree leg to catch, remember? Right. Luke was so excited by the hologram that he had let it overshadow their mission for a moment. Anakin, his father, had been in love with a beautiful woman named Padme. And Padme did not look so different from Leia. Did they finally know their mother's name? He could sense that Leia thought so, but she was too afraid to say as much out loud. So was he. Luke fell in beside Ghent. You were explaining why Artu won't let me access those memories? Because he thinks he's protecting you, Ghent said. He's a very stubborn droid. But you can get around that, right? Leia asked. I've seen you slice codes on units far more sophisticated than Artu's. Gint turned around and looked at Leia as though she had asked for the name of the last girl he had tried to pick up in a cantina. They never told him their name. No, he said. Our two units were designed to military standards. That means their security protocols will destroy the data before they let it fall into unauthorized hands. If you try to force access, a doomsday gate will reformat the entire memory chip. And there's no way to beat that security without wiping Artu's personality first? Luke asked. I didn't say that, Gent said. There's a way, but you'd have to help me, and you probably can't do it. Try us, Han said. Okay, Gent said. Bring me the Intellects 4 designer's data pad. What for? Because he had to have a way to access the data when his prototypes developed glitches like these, Gent said. And if he's like most droid brain designers, that hatch became part of the Intellect's IV's basic architecture. It's a very complicated computer unit, so there'll be a long list of passwords and encryption keys on that data pad. That shouldn't be too difficult, assuming it wasn't destroyed in a war, Luke said. Who was this designer? Gen shrugged. Your guess is as good as mine. The Arto was originally an imperial design, and the Imperial Department of Military Research kept the identities of its top scientists secret. You must be joking, Leia said. You want us to find this guy's data pad without knowing anything about him? It's not quite that bad, Gen said. Do you remember when Incom's design staff defected to the Rebellion with the X-Wing prototypes? Of course, Leia said cautiously. Well, this guy was consulting with them on the R2 interface, Gent said. And after the defection, Industrial Automaton never made another design modification to the Intellects 4. They were afraid to, Han surmised. Because this guy was the only one who could do it right and he had defected with the X-Wing designers. No, not because he had defected, Leia said. She was studying Ghent intently. If he had, we'd know who he was. Right. Right, Ghent said. He just disappeared. Luke had a sinking feeling. When you say disappeared, do you mean? 
Nobody knows. Gen turned to Leia. That's what disappeared means, right? Nobody knows. 33. The sky had been dark for hours beneath clouds of dart ships, roaring into the Totnes to refuel and refresh life support systems, roaring back out to await the arrival of the Chiss assault fleet. Jaina had given up trying to estimate how many craft the colony had assembled for the ambush, but the number had to be over a hundred thousand. The Todd hangars alone were servicing six swarms an hour, and there were three other nests in the Corribus system. It makes us proud, Zex said through the top mind. No other species could mount such an operation. The Chiss will be surprised, Jaina agreed. Somewhere deep in her mind, she knew that this was a bad thing, that it would make her mission as a Jedi more difficult, but it did not feel that way to Tot. To Tot, it felt like their nests were finally going to be saved. They will pay a terrible price. Good, Zex said. Good, Jaina agreed. The roar of arriving dart ships faded to a mere rumble and the kilometer-long oval of a top-of-the-line gallo-free medium freighter descended out of the rocket smoke. The well-maintained hull was finished in the scarlet and gold flames of the Bornerin Trading Company, with an escort of corporate E-wings providing security. Jaina wondered what the vessel was doing so far from home, but Tot did not know. Yunu wished the nest to welcome roaming Ronto, and so Tot welcomed roaming Ronto. Todd had heard, though, that similar vessels had landed on Ru and Zbo carrying a big surprise for the Chiss. As the Ronto neared the nest, it adjusted course, heading out over the plateau toward the freight yard, where a swarm of Tot workers were already assembling to unload it. Jaina thought briefly about going to see the cargo, but Yunu did not want that. Yunu wanted her to enjoy the beauty of the nest from the veranda of the Jedi barracks. That freighter should alarm us, Jaina said to Zek. It can only make war more likely. It's too late to stop the war, Zek replied. But we should try. Jaina started to rise, then suddenly felt too tired and dropped back onto her seat. Maybe later. Yeah, Zek said aloud. We'd rather sit here. There was something wrong with that, Jaina knew. Jedi were supposed to be dauntless, resourceful, resolute. They were supposed to accomplish the impossible, to keep trying no matter how difficult the mission. They were supposed to have indomitable spirits. Jaina felt a stirring deep down inside, in the place that had always belonged to her brother Jason, and she knew he was with her, urging her to fight back, to throw off her lethargy, to break the colony's hold on her, and reach for that part of her that was just Jaina. Jaina stood. Where are you going? Zek asked. It doesn't feel like you need the refresher. Get out of our, my, mind, Jaina said. Jason was urging her to remember how Welk and Lomi Pielo had tricked the strike team on Banu Ras, how they had stolen the flyer and abandoned Anakin to die. And now Jaina was allowing them to control her mind. Jaina did not understand how that could be. The entire colony knew that Raynar Thull was the only survivor of the crash. But Jason seemed so sure. A black fury rose in Jaina's mind, the same black fury to which she had succumbed when she went to recover Anakin's body, and finally she felt able to act. She wanted to find Welk and kill him. She wanted to find Lomi Pielo and make her wish for death. But first, there was duty. To let anger distract her was to let the Dark Jedi win. First, Jaina had to stop the war, then she could kill Lomi and Welk. Jaina turned toward the hangar. Where are you going? Zek whined from his bench. We can't do anything. It's too late. Jaina opened herself to their meld then reached out to him and let her anger pour from her heart into his. I won't surrender to them. I'm going to stop this war. Zek's eyes widened, then turned a bright, angry green. He slammed his palms down and pushed himself to his feet. I'm with you, 
he said, catching up. How are we going to do this? Tell you later, Jaina said. She did not yet have a plan, and she had no intention of developing one until after they were away from the tot nest. For now, let's just concentrate on getting to our stealth access. They stepped into the sweet dampness of the wax-lined access tunnel and started down toward the hangar. As they progressed, Tot began to fill Jaina's mind with doubts about her intentions, to make her wonder if she would really be stopping the war, or merely sparing the Chiss a much-deserved defeat. Jaina thought of Anakin, and her doubts vanished in the black fire of her anger. Tot workers began to pour into the tunnel, all scurrying up a passage that led only to the Jedi barracks. Jaina and Zek threatened them with word and thought, but the Killix continued to clamber past, slowing the pair's progress to a crawl. Zek took the lead and began to muscle forward, using the force to shove aside the Killix ahead of him. More Tot poured into the tunnel, convinced they had some urgent errand in the Jedi barracks. Zek continued to push ahead. Jaina added her force powers to his, and the entire stream of insects began to slide backward down the tunnel. The Killix dispersed, and a strange resistance began to rise inside the two Jedi, a cold hand pushing at them inside their own bellies. Their limbs grew heavier, their breathing became labored, their pulses pounded in their ears. They leaned against the cold hand, and still it grew harder to move. Soon, their legs were too heavy to lift, their lungs were ready to burst, their drumming hearts drowned out their own thoughts. They came to a stop, hanging parallel to the floor, and the harder they tried to move forward, the more impossible it became. They hung there for several minutes, testing their wills against that of the colony, and only grew more tired. Jaina thought of how Lomi and Welk had betrayed Anakin, and she grew more determined than ever to avenge him and less able to move. Jaina began to despair. Her anger was no match for the will of the colony. She had to find another way. The seed of a new plan came to Jaina, a plan that relied not on anger, but on love instead. Jaina did not nurture that seed. Instead, she buried it deep down in her mind, in that part that was still I instead of we. Keep trying, she urged Zek. Don't stop, no matter what. Never. He assured her. Good. Jaina let the pressure push her away from the hangar, back up the passage. Hey! Zek's voice was strained. Where are you going? The barracks, Jaina said. I'm giving up. What? I'm not as strong as you. It irked Jaina to say this, but it was the one way to be sure Zek would continue to struggle. I'll see you later. As Jaina retreated up the passage, the pressure gradually diminished. Finally, she was able to simply walk back to the barracks. She could sense Zek down near the hangar, feeling puzzled and angry and a little bit abandoned, but he remained determined not to quit, to show Jaina he was as strong as she believed. Once Jaina reached the barracks veranda, she returned to her bench and began to contemplate the beauty of the Killick mind. Every member of a nest worked flawlessly with all the others, executing unbelievably complex tasks, such as refueling and restocking several thousand rocket ships an hour, in near-perfect harmony. There were seldom any of the accidents or shortages or confusion so common to any military operation and there were never arguments or disagreements or territorial spats. Would it truly be so bad if there was a war, and the colony won? For once, there would be true galactic peace, no vying for resources, no clashes of interest, no territorial conquests, just all the peoples of the galaxy working together for the common good. Was that so wrong? Jaina supposed that the fact that she did not see anything wrong with that meant she had become a true joiner. She was only worried that the colony could never win a war against the Chiss. The colony would have help, Todd assured her. An image came through the nest mind of the Ronto being unloaded. 
A dozen long streams of Kilix were pouring in and out of its cargo bays, working together to offload the huge, telescoping barrels of at least a dozen turbo laser batteries. The Chiss were going to be very surprised when they attacked. Maybe the Kilix could win this war after all. Jaina decided to wait there on the veranda until Yuna called for her. Sooner or later, there would be a mission that only a Jedi and a Stealthex could do, and Jaina would be ready. Then, when her mind finally went quiet and she knew that Tot and Yunu were no longer paying her any attention, she pictured the handsome, square, scarred face of Jagged Phil. She held the image in her mind and performed a series of breathing exercises. Focusing on the feelings they had shared while they were fighting the Yuzen Vong together, and during those few times they had managed to rendezvous after the war, then turned roughly toward where the Chiss staging area would be, somewhere outside the orbit of Koribu. While Jag was not Force-sensitive, Jaina had touched him through the Force many times while they were together, and she felt sure he would recognize the sensation of her presence brushing his. But he wouldn't trust her. He would think she was just another joiner trying to lure him into a mistake. So she would have to convince him that he was discovering the ambush on his own, and she would have to do it before Tot realized what she was doing. Jaina reached out to Jag in the force and found his presence, distant and dim, somewhere ahead on Koribu's orbital path, exactly where he would be if he was guarding the staging area for a Chiss assault fleet. Come get me, lover boy, Jaina sent. Jag would not understand the words, of course but he would recognize the sentiment. She had used the same taunt many times when they sparred. If you can. Jaina felt Jag start in surprise, then she caught a flash of anger as he recognized her touch. This wasn't a game. This was war, and... His irritation suddenly changed to concern as it dawned on him why she had picked that particular day to reach out to him. Jaina sensed a rising tide of alarm, then lost contact as Jag drew in on himself. 34. Koriba's brightly striped orb hung sandwiched between the flat, twinkling clouds of two sizable space fleets. For now, both sides seemed content to avoid a battle, each hiding from the other behind the gas giant's considerable bulk. But they were also maintaining aggressive postures, keeping their sublight drives lit and their shields up, dropping reconnaissance patrols through the planet's golden ring system like air spinners from a bespin rock trawler. Good news, Han said, decelerating hard. As they had half expected, the homing beacon aboard Alma's stolen skiff had led them straight back into the middle of the Koribu conflict. Though the standoff between the two fleets was certain to complicate their plans, Han could not have been more thrilled. After they destroyed the Dark Nest, he could track down Jaina and have her safely away from the Tot Nest within hours. We're just in time for the war. Why is that good news? Juin asked from the navigator's station. Are we planning to go back into smuggling? No, Leia said. She keyed a command on the co-pilot's console and the tactical display began to light up with mass readings and vector arrows. Han's smuggling days were over a long time ago. Tarfon, still regrowing his fur after the head-to-toe clipping that had preceded a lengthy stay in the back to tank, chittered a rude-sounding question. Tarfon wishes to inquire whether Princess Leia always answers questions on Captain Solo's behalf, C-3PO said. Han did not bother to answer. He had brought Tarfan along only because Jun would not come without him, and he had brought Jun along because he was actually considering taking the Celestin on as a co-pilot. After seeing how deftly Leia had resolved the crisis between the Jedi and the Galactic Alliance, it had finally grown clear to Han that he was blocking fate. Leia had been born to run things and the wretched state of the Galactic Alliance reconstruction was evidence enough of how badly she was needed. Thus he had made up his mind to step aside so she could follow her destiny, again. 
Tafang jabbered something else, which C-3PO translated as, Tafang says it is quite unfortunate that old age has broken your spirit, Captain Solo. Wars are good for smugglers. You might have been able to earn enough to replace the fine ship you tricked Captain Juin into sacrificing on your behalf. This was too much. First, I'm not old, and my spirit is fine. Han twisted around and wagged his finger at Tarfong. Without any fur, the Yuak reminded him of a womp rat with a short nose and no tail. And second, I'm not the one who told Jun to outfly his cover. Getting that Ruskin blown out from under him probably saved his life. Tarfong started to yammer a reply. Later, you too, Leia interrupted. Luke and Mara will be arriving soon, and we have work to do. She pointed at the tactical display, which now identified the fleet hovering above Koriba's northern pole as Hapan and the one at the southern pole as Chiss. While the Chiss appeared to be outnumbered more than two to one, Han knew appearances were deceptive. In all likelihood, they had a much larger force waiting just inside Ascendancy territory ready to jump into battle the instant the enemy attacked. He only hoped that Ducat Grey, or whoever commanded the Hapan fleet, understood the basic deceptiveness of Chiss war doctrine. Across the center of Koribu ran a thick band of yellow bogey symbols. Dart ships? Han gasped. That's how it looks, Leia said. The spectrograph suggests a methane-based fuel. There must be a million of them. Closer to a hundred and fifty thousand, Captain, Juin said from behind him. Plus a handful of freighters, blast boats, and four KDY orbital defense platforms. Han raised his brow. I wonder where those came from. Tarfang offered an opinion which C-3PO reported as smugglers. Han ignored the Yuak and asked Leia, Where's Alma? Still working on that, she said. I could use a little help. Yeah, sure, Han said. All you have to do is ask. A grid appeared over the bright band of bogey symbols strung across Koribu's equator. Alma's skiff has to be somewhere in there, or we would have picked her up by now, Leia said. A quarter of the grid turned red. Do an efflux search on the areas I'm assigning you. She's only a few minutes ahead, so her ion drives must still be active. The homing beacon they had planted on the stolen skiff was only accurate to within a light month, which left a lot of territory to search via normal sensors. Han brought up the first grid square and began to look for a telltale plume of hot ions. At this scale, the band of dart ships resolved itself into a lumpy strand of swirling dots, with the gray disk of one of Koriba's moons hanging just beneath the main area of activity. After a moment of study, Han switched to the next grid and found several bogey symbols that turned out to be a gallo free freighter and a pair of patrolling blast boats. As soon as he brought up the third grid, he was tempted to move immediately to the next one. The dart ships in this area were spread so thin that he could make out the thin gold line of Koriba's ring system and the irregular nugget of a small ice moon. But the thin Killick defenses here just did not feel right. Han brought the moon, KR, to the center of his display and enlarged the scale. A blue circle the size of a fingertip appeared in the screen center, slowly growing smaller as it traveled toward the moon. Got it! Han began a mass analysis to confirm his suspicions, but he was sure enough of himself to transfer an inset to Leia's display. This one's still moving in system. It has to be her. Very good. Leia leaned across and kissed his cheek. You win the reward. That's my reward? Han complained. I get that every day. That could always change, fly boy. Come on. 
You know you can't help yourself. Han flashed her his best arrogant smirk, then activated the intercom. Battle station's back there. We might be going any time. We know, KYP replied. We're Jedi. Oh, yeah? Han looked at the ceiling and silently cursed KYP's arrogance. I must be getting forgetful in my old age. Miwol informed him that she and Cockmane were also ready. Nogri were always ready. When the mass analysis finally confirmed Han's guess, he turned to face Juin. You two had better head to your battle station, too. You remember how it works? Of course, you went over the procedure several times. Juin popped his data pad out of his vest pocket. And I've recorded all your instructions right here, in case I forget. Ah, uh, great. Han glanced away so Jun would not see him wince. That makes me real confident. I'm happy to know that, Jun said. But I do have one question. Han counted to three, reminding himself that it was better for the Celestin to ask his questions now rather than later, when they were being dive-bombed by a thousand dart ships. Okay, shoot. Has this ever been tried before? Han and Leia exchanged looks of surprise, then Leia said, I don't see how it could have been, Jay. Oh. Jun was silent for a moment, then said, I have another question. No kidding, Han grumbled. Maybe we should make this the last one, Leia said. I just felt Luke and Mara emerge from hyperspace. Of course. The Celestin slipped out of his chair and Tarfang did the same. How do we know it's going to work? Good question, Han said. He turned forward again and placed the tracking lock on Alma's skiff. After a moment, Leia explained. It was Han's idea, Jay. Oh, I see. June sounded satisfied. Of course it will work. Tarfang growled something doubtful but Juin was already leading the way back toward the engineering station. A moment later, the irregular, matte black body of two stealth X starfighters pulled alongside the Falcon, and Han saw Luke's and Mara's helmet-framed faces looking over from the cockpits of Phantom Craft. Leia closed her eyes for a moment, reaching out to them in the Force, trying to get some sense of their intentions. After the Dark Nest attack on the Shadow, they had decided to return with only the Falcon and a couple of Stealth X escorts. Since the Falcon was not equipped to carry fighters, Luke and Mara had been taking turns with the other two Jedi Masters on the mission, KYP and Saba, ferrying the Starfighters through hyperspace. Luke and Mara happened to be in the cockpit when the time came for the final jump to Koribu but Han suspected that Mara would have insisted on being one of the pilots to follow Alma into the Dark Nest. She was taking the whole assassin thing pretty personally. Leia opened her eyes, then Luke and Mara accelerated away toward K.R. They remained visible for a moment, a pair of dark X's silhouetted against Korriba's bright stripes, then shrank into invisibility. Luke wants us to hold here until they find the nest. Leia reported. Then, Excuse me, C-3PO interrupted. But we have an unfortunate situation. We're being hailed by both Dukat Grey of the Hapan fleet and Commander Fell of the Chiss. Put Grey on first, Han said. Fell is just going to. No, shift them to a conference channel, Leia said. Maybe we can promote a dialogue. Or a war, Han grumbled. Gray's voice came over the speaker first. Princess Leia, I demanded. Who's this? Fell demanded. Ducatale's son Gray, dutched it to Lady Algray of the Relifon Moons, Gray responded. There was a long silence. To whom am I speaking? Gray demanded. 
Commander Jagged Fell, Fell replied, of the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet. Another long silence. Finally, Gray said, I was attempting to calm Princess Leia and her crew. Have you boarded their vessel? I was wondering if you had, Fell said. Of course not. Why would I calm a vessel I had boarded? I don't know that you are coming them, Fell countered suspiciously. Your signal is coming from the Falcon. Your signal is coming from the Falcon, Gray accused. I warn you, I won't fall for any of your chiss. Pardon me, gentlemen, Leia said. Your concern is touching, but I assure you, the Falcon remains under Han's command. Will you both activate Idol Smasher? Idol Smasher was an old encryption system the Allies had used in the war against the Yuzen Vong. Outdated though it was, it was almost a certainty that both fleets would still have the decoding hardware available in their code room archives. Military cryptographers were notorious pack rats. After a short pause, Gray said, We'll need two minutes. We'll need one. Fell's tone was superior. Please notify us when you're ready, Ducat. Han glanced back at C-3PO, who was already plugging the necessary module into the comm station, and smirked. The Falcon is ready now. The transmission light went out then Leia said, Trouble, Han. Han looked back to the tactical screen and immediately began to warm the ion drives. The moon KR was fast vanishing behind a cloud of dart ships. As he watched, the spectrograph identified their propulsion as hydrogen-based. Darkness, he said. Anything from Luke and Mara? A little anxiety. They're not calling for us yet. Tell them not to push it, Han said. They're too old to play hero. Han, they're younger than you were at the Battle of Yuzentar. Yeah, well, I've got my luck, Han said. All they have is the Force. Fell's voice came over the calm. Checking encryption. Well done, Commander. C-3PO answered. That took only 33.7 seconds. 33.4, you neglected the transmission lag. Fell corrected. I wanted to have a word with the Solos before Ducat Gray joined us. Jag, we're not going home. Han was keeping one eye on the tactical display and one on Leia, ready to start toward KR the instant it looked like Luke and Mara were in trouble. Jane is in there, Anne. Yes, I know, Fell said. I think, actually, I'm convinced she saved our fleet. Leia's jaw fell, but her voice betrayed no hint of her shock. You find that surprising, Jag? The Jedi are here to stop a war, not choose sides. We've never doubted your intentions, Princess Leia, Fell said. Only your province in being here, and your ability to resist the colony's will. Then Jaina has changed your minds? She has opened mine, Fell corrected. But that is very different from convincing Defense Fleet Command that the Jedi can neutralize the Killick threat. We understand your concern, Leia said. Perhaps Defense Fleet Command would believe us if the colony withdrew from Korribu? There was a moment of stunned silence. On the tactical display, KR had vanished beneath a yellow swarm of dartship symbols. Han shook an inquiring finger in the moon's general direction, but Leia shook her head. Luke and Mara still did not want any help. Finally, Fel asked, The Jedi can arrange that. Testing encryption, Gray's voice broke in. You've been talking without me. Encryption confirmed. In a tone that mimicked Gray's peevishness, C-3PO replied, Though you are somewhat late. It was only two minutes twenty, Gray complained. That's no excuse. 
We were just catching up on old times, Leia said. You may not be aware of it, but Commander Fell came very close to becoming our son-in-law. As Leia spoke, her eyes grew wide, and she began to gesture frantically out the forward viewport. Han slammed the throttles forward, and the Falcon leapt toward Koribu. Commander Fell, Ducat Gray, your tactical officers are about to tell you that the Falcon is accelerating toward the Moon KR at maximum power. Though Leia's face was pale, her voice remained calm. I wanted to inform you both of the reason. Leia briefed them on the Jedi discovery of the Dark Nest and their theory about the power it held over the rest of the colony's collective mind. She even revealed the Order's fear that the Nest was being controlled by the two Dark Jedi who had abducted Reyna Thul on Banu Ras, keeping secret only the fact that the Dark Nest was also attempting to absorb Almarar. You're telling us that the colony is ruled by a hidden nest? Fell asked, incredulous. Only in the sense that any sentient mind is ruled by its own unconscious mind, Leia said. Influence might be a better term, though in the Killick's case the influence is very heavy. We're fairly sure the Dark Nest is responsible for the colony's decision to inhabit Koribu. For what purpose? Fell asked. To start a war, Han said. And so far, you guys are playing right into their snappy little pincers. It would be foolish to assume you know our plans, Captain Solo. Your plans were clear enough when the fleet of the glorious Defender Queen arrived, Gray said. You were maneuvering to attack. Obviously, I cannot discuss our plans with any of you, Fell said. I assume that the Jedi have located this dark nest on K.R. and intend to break its hold over the colony? You could say that, Han said. K.R. was visible to the naked eye now, a fuzzy blue nugget about the size of a thumb. If blasting it to bug parts counts. With just the Falcon? Gray asked. We have more than the Falcon, Leia said. Luke and Mara have already found the entrance to the nest. That explains the activity on KR, Fell concluded. The dart ships seem to be swarming something. Though the Falcon's tactical display showed no indications of weapons activity, Han had no doubt that the Skywalkers were busy dodging dart ships. He could see it in the tautness around Leia's eyes. Master Skywalker is under attack? There was more excitement in Gray's voice than concern. There's no need for alarm, Ducat. Leia commanded. Luke and Mara can easily. A pair of Hapan Novas began to slip down the tactical display toward K.R. Han's heart rose into his throat. Uh, what are you doing there, Ducat? Sending support, Gray said. Queen Mother Tenoka would not be pleased if I allowed this dark nest to kill Master Skywalker and her husband. Recall your vessels at once, Ducat, Fell said. We cannot permit any Hapan capital ship to approach the orbital plane. It's a small force, Gray said. Any fool cannot see it poses no threat to. Only a fool would allow his enemy to establish a forward position under the current circumstances, Fell replied. A Chiss Star Destroyer and half a dozen cruisers started upward to meet the Hapan Trio. And we Chiss are not fools. Oh boy, Han said under his breath. I've got a... Bad feeling. I know, Leia finished. Ducat Gray, leave this to us. We'll let you know if. A chain of tiny orange flashes suddenly flared along K.R.'s long axis as someone on the moon opened fire. Two more battle dragons, accompanied by a dozen novas, began to descend toward Korba's rings. The Queen's fleet will not stand idly by while Master Skywalker is viciously attacked, Gray declared. Ducat Gray. That was as much as Leia could say before Fell started to talk over her. The Chiss have no wish to see Master Skywalker and his wife injured either, 
a dozen Chiss cruisers joined the growing migration toward KR. But the Dark Nest is on our side of the rings. Allow us to support him. Out of the question. Gray shot back. Han had known even before the reply that Fell's offer would never reach orbit. Gray cared more about being able to claim credit for rescuing Luke and Mara than whether they actually needed to be rescued. The Chiss have made it clear they didn't want the Jedi here in the first place. We have no assurance that you wouldn't kill them yourselves. Perhaps not, Fell returned coolly. But if you don't recall those vessels, I can assure you. Dukat Gray, Leia said. Sparking a clash with the Chiss is not going to win the Queen Mother's favor. I suggest you recall your vessels and wait until your aid is truly needed. Another string of explosions lit K.R.'s face. It's apparent to me that our aid is needed, Gray said. And if we must fight the Chiss to deliver it, we will. He closed the channel. Stubborn rotter! Leia cursed. Jag, you understand. I'm sorry, Princess Leia, Fell said. The Chiss fleet began to stream upward on all sides of the planet. But my superiors refuse to take the chance that this isn't a ploy. I suggest you avoid getting caught in the crossfire. 35. A pillar of orange rocket exhaust arced out of K.R.'s frozen tangle of ethmane crystals, emerging from an ice line shaft more than a kilometer across. This column was far larger than any others Luke and Mara had seen its heat raising a wall of steam as it bent toward the skywalkers and streaked low over the moon's frozen surface. Confident they had finally found what they were looking for, Luke and Mara banked away and began to accelerate, drawing the orange column after them. Luke would have liked to make a reconnaissance pass to be certain the huge shaft was the hangar opening he believed it to be. But K.R.'s tortured terrain and icy blue light neutralized the speed and camouflage of their stealth excess, and both of their starfighters had already taken too much of a beating to risk another confrontation. Two seconds later, Luke's R-9 astromech unit, sitting in for an operationally challenged R2-D2, sounded an attack alarm. Luke felt a start from Mara as an explosion rocked her stealth ex, then his own starfighter gave a sharp double buck. The R-9 pointedly informed Luke they were being ambushed by Garag dartships, and the tactical display showed half a dozen of the little craft behind them, rising from the sensor-blocking depths of the frozen Ethmane jungle. Luke continued toward the Falcon, flying low over K.R.'s feathery jungle of Ethmane crystals. Ideally, he would have climbed for open space where their stealth excess would have full advantage but the tactical display showed a second swarm of dart ships flying top cover, in perfect position to stop them. The Skywalkers had traveled barely a kilometer when another column of dart ships rose out of the Ethmane jungle ahead. Luke sensed Mara's alarm almost before his own. They had stayed a little too long, and now Garag was boxing them in. The swarm spread out before them, creating an orange wall of rocket exhaust. The Skywalkers began to pour cannon fire into the swirling mass, trying to clear a lane for their stealth excess. It was like trying to blast a tunnel through a cloud. Every time they created a hole, it filled instantly. As the Skywalkers drew closer, the orange wall resolved itself into a pattern of fiery whirling disks, each with the black dot of a dart ship at its heart. Mara continued to fire, and Luke followed her lead. The tactic clearly had no chance of success, but Mara had a plan. Luke was almost sure of it. Finally, when the swarm was so close that the dart ships had grown into tiny cylinders, glowing streaks of missile propellant began to reach out toward the Skywalkers. Mara took the lead and pulled up, a loose wing stabilizer shuddering under the strain. The two nearest swarms, the one blocking their escape and the one pursuing from behind, nosed up to give chase. Stick close, she warned. Suddenly Mara dropped the nose of her stealth ex. Luke followed so quickly that he almost beat her, 
but the dark nest was not fooled. The dart ships simply leveled off and continued to close on the Skywalkers. Luke expected Mara to pull up again and outclimb their pursuers, gambling that the Stealth XS could withstand a barrage of killic chemical explosives long enough to fight through the top cover swarm. Instead, she continued to dive. The ice jungle's feathery canopy came up rapidly. Luke began to wonder when she intended to pull up. She did not. A flurry of cannon bolts lanced out from Mara's stealth X, instantly superheating the ice crystals in front of her and filling Luke's forward view with brown steam. He switched to instrument flying and followed her through the cloud into the snarled depths of the ice jungle. Flash-frozen spires of Ethmane stood at all angles, glowing translucent blue with Jewel's distant light, reaching out to embrace each other with delicate arms of hoarfrost. Mara flipped her stealth X up on edge and slipped between two Ethmane pillars, then crashed through a curtain of frost and sent up a glittering cloud of ice particles. Luke ducked under a frozen arch, then shot ahead of Mara into the lead. He offered his apologies through their force bond, along with an image of the loose stabilizer he had seen on her wing. Whatever, she answered. Luke felt a sudden compulsion to swing back toward the nest and wondered if his wife had gone crazy. Mara urged him to think. Garag expected them to run for the falcon. Luke quickly brought them around. It would be safer to go in the opposite direction and sneak a look at the nest. He focused all his attention on the frozen jungle ahead and began a Jedi breathing exercise, allowing his mind to race forward through the Ethmane spires to find its own route down the twining passages and rolling channels. Time seemed to slow. He surrendered his steering arm to the Force, and his hand began to move of its own accord, guiding the stealth X into one shimmering gap after another, bobbing over blue curtains, ducking beneath long fronds of frost, blasting holes through impassable walls of ice. Mara stayed close on his tail, almost joining her hand to his through their force bond, and thirty seconds later they shot through a small icy portal into an irregular blue shaft barely broad enough for Luke to bank the stealth X into a tight inside spiral. Stang! Luke felt Mara's fear through the force, and his heart jumped into his throat. Then... As he continued his own spiral around the small shaft, he saw the jagged hole where her stealth X had bounced off the icy wall. His tactical display showed her still on his tail, but weaving badly. Mara? Fine. She answered. Luke continued to bank, setting the stealth X up on one wing so that he could look up out one side of the cockpit and down out the other. He estimated they were about two kilometers deep though that was impossible to confirm with instruments. This far down inside the frozen moon, the Stealth X's sensor range extended only as far as the walls of frozen ethmine. Below, the shaft continued to narrow and curve back under itself, concealing the nest entrance, assuming it was down there, behind a wall of blue ice. Aside from the walls, which had been polished smooth by the heat and freeze cycle of countless rocket launches, there was no sign of dart ships. Mara seemed worried by how quiet it was. Luke didn't like it either. Garab would have left something to defend the nest. The hair on his neck began to rise, and he decided they had seen enough. Mara, now directly opposite him on the other side of the shaft, agreed and started to climb. Her shields were flickering, and that loose stabilizer was flapping around beneath her wing. Luke fell in behind her, then an attack alarm sounded and a laser cannon began to fire blue bolts up the shaft. He felt another jolt of emotion from Mara, this time anger, as her stealth X took a trio of hits. Her shields went down with the second, and the ends of both starboard wings vanished with the third. Luke did not waste time looking at his tactical display. He simply dropped the stealth X into a dive and started firing and then saw the nose of Alma's stolen skiff, just slipping back out of sight. He continued to fire for a second longer, pouring his rage and disbelief at her through the force, 
until the bend in the shaft vanished behind a curtain of ethmane steam. He sensed no shame or sorrow in the Twi'lek, only the enormous, murky presence of the dark nest. When no more cannon bolts rose out of the fog, Luke pulled up into a tight banking turn that would allow him to keep an eye on the shaft in both directions. Mara was still above him, her stealth X crawling around the shaft in a wobbling circle, both starboard engines shut down and the stumps of her starboard wings vibrating badly. Mara? Everything good, she reported. It didn't look good. Luke was about to tell her to try climbing when the mouth of the shaft, two kilometers above, began to brighten with the orange glow of dartship rockets. Mara brought her stealth X out of its circle and fired at the icy wall, trying to punch through into the ethmane jungle beyond. The stumps of her starboard wings tumbled away in a cascade of sparks and mini explosions. Then she slipped into a spin and flashed past Luke, vanishing into the ethmane steam below. Luke felt her stretching out to him, clinging to their force bond as she fought to bring the stealth X under control. He poured reassurance into their bond, trying to let her know that he would not abandon her, that he was coming right behind her. Then he reached for Leia in the Force, pouring out his alarm and picturing a crashing starfighter, and dived after Mara. He caught up to Mara on the other side of the fog. She was using a combination of the Force and power manipulations to keep the Stealth X under control, corkscrewing down the shaft in an ever-tightening spiral pushing the damaged craft to its limits and a little beyond to stay ahead of the approaching dart fighters. The shaft twined its way another seven kilometers into the ice moon, growing ever smaller and more twisted. Finally the squarish, cave-like opening of a launching bay appeared at the bottom of the shaft, perhaps a kilometer away. Luke armed a pair of proton torpedoes, then urged Mara to do the same. They would need to give the Falcon something to look for. With pleasure. Mara stabilized her spin just long enough to send a pair of proton torpedoes streaking toward the cavern mouth. Under other circumstances, Luke might have felt a pang of concern knowing that Alma's skiff had entered the hangar only a short time before. But under these conditions, even understanding that she was under the control of the dark nest, he felt nothing. Whatever happened, the Twi'lek had brought it on herself. A brilliant flash filled the cavern mouth as Mara's torpedoes detonated inside, and suddenly the last five hundred meters of shaft were filled with glittering ice shards. Luke activated his targeting computer, but between Mara's wildly gyrating stealth X and interference from the F main ice, he was unable to get a lock. Mara. Luke moved his finger to the torpedo trigger. Stay left. The first barrage of turbolaser fire fanned down from the Hapan batteries, and KR was suddenly veiled behind a curtain of crimson energy. The Chiss answered with a volley of missiles, and a thousand propellant trails rose to bar the way forward. Han pulled up short and rolled the Falcon away from the sudden fury. No! Leia's eyes were fixed on her display where a navigation lock had been guiding them toward the detonation site of the Skywalker's proton torpedoes. Luke and Mara need help. And they won't get it if we fly into that mess, Han said. In fifty years of flying, he had never seen a battle this compact before. There had to be a hundred capital ships fighting over a moon only eighty kilometers long. Even I'm not that good. Yes, Han, you are. Look, I'm not leaving, Han said. We just have to find another way in. Leia's voice grew sober. Han, I think they're down. Down? A leaden ball formed in Han's stomach. What do you mean, down? Crashed, Leia said. They may need. Han swung the falcon around and started back toward KR. Extraction. Leia finished. How did that happen? Han demanded. Space ahead had become a flashing sheet of turbolaser fire, striped at irregular intervals by growing lines of missile flame. 
Their Jedi blasted. In stealth excess. They were just supposed to find the nest and call us. Things go wrong even for Jedi. Leia's eyes were fixed out the viewport. Through PO, break out the EV suits. EV suits? C-3PO squealed. If we go EV out there, we're doomed. The odds of surviving are, why, they're entirely incalculable. Still better than with no suit, Han said. Do as she says. We may need suits to recover Luke and Mara. As you wish, Captain Solo, C-3PO said. But I really don't think we're going to survive long enough to reach them. The sheet of flashing energy ahead brightened rapidly as the falcon drew closer, and the canopy tinting darkened. Han looked to his instruments and found nothing but electromagnetic static, its density increasing as space ahead grew more brilliant. Sweetheart, Han asked as casually as he could manage. Do you think you can do that Jedi thing? Quiet. Leia was already staring out the forward viewport with a faraway expression in her eyes. I'm concentrating. Han waited for instructions. Leia continued to concentrate. A web of tiny efflux trails, all that was visible of the Chiss and Hapan starfighters vying for control of the attack routes, began to lace the darkened canopy. Even that faded when the Falcon entered the battle zone. A shudder ran through the decks as Miwal opened up with the belly turret against some hazard Han could not see. Then the attack alarms shrieked as cannon fire pounded their lower shields. Who was that? Han demanded over the intercom. Miwal informed him it was a starfighter, but she had no idea whose. All she had been able to see was a blurry tail of ion exhaust. Ah, uh, sweetheart? Concentrating. The invisible fist of a turbo laser blast glanced off the Falcon's port side, instantly overwhelming the shields and sending her spinning out of control. The cockpit erupted with damage alarms, and Leia began to scream. It took Han a moment to realize she was finally giving him instructions. Port! Go port! He steadied the Falcon, relieved to see that he still could, then swung hard to port. 3PO, give me a damage report! The droid dropped an EV suit on the deck. We've lost her! Auxiliary acceleration compensator. He babbled. And do port doc and gring is compromised. We'll never get out of these in no piece. The damage is minor, Saba said over the intercom. This one will see to it. Han frowned. Saba still had a piece of skull missing under that thick hide of hers. She had talked Luke into bringing her along only by threatening to come anyway, but he knew better than to protest. It just wasn't smart to question a Barabelle's ability to do anything. Leia ordered, Climb! Han pulled back on the yoke and felt the falcon buck as something exploded under her. Dive! Han pushed the yoke forward and was nearly thrown out of his seat as a turbolaser blast blossomed just to their stern. Starboard, gentle. Han swung to starboard, and the red streak of a missile shot past the Falcon's blackened canopy. Dead ahead fast. Han pushed the throttles into overdrive. The canopy grew suddenly transparent again, and still he could not see anything. There was only a thick brown fog, blossoming here and there with cannon fire and laced with the blue trails of starfighter ion drives. They melted it. Han gasped. They melted an entire. Instruments, Han. Han glanced down and found the reassuring sight of a space battle on his tactical display. What looked to be about ten dozen squadrons of starfighters were whirling around KR, maneuvering for position and pouring laser fire at each other. A single Chiss cruiser was sliding quietly around the moon's bulk playing a game of Mogan Ranker with a pair of Hapan Novas. KR's surface, a sensor-blocking layer of frozen ethmane, was literally disappearing before their eyes. 
Every time a stray cannon blast struck ground, a thumb-sized area of ice vanished from Han's display. Leia found the fading rad signature of the Skywalker's proton torpedoes and re-established their navigation lock. Han slipped the Falcon under the moon, streaking toward their destination only a hundred meters below K.R.'s jagged belly. Their goal lay about ten kilometers ahead of the Chiss cruiser, so he chose a slow, direct route that would take them past its weapons turrets at a respectable distance. In a battle like this, the only way not to get shot at was to make clear you were no kind of threat. As the Falcon neared the cruiser, a flight of cloak craft dropped out of the fog to look her over. C-3PO opened an emergency channel. This is the Millennium Falcon hailing all combatants. We are neutral in this conflict. Please direct your fire away from us. I repeat, we are neutral. The cloak raft dropped back into the kill zone behind the Falcon and hung there. The navigation lock slowly drifted toward the center of the screen. The stolen skiff was floating amid the rest of the wreckage, a pile of flattened durasteel flickering in the light of Mara's two functioning spotlights. There was no way to tell whether Alma and Ben's Killick, friend, had been aboard when the proton torpedoes eviscerated the launching bay. Bamara was betting the pair had escaped. So far, she had seen no signs of the Twi'lek's body among the scorched pieces of chitin tumbling past her canopy, and Alma was a Jedi. She would have sensed what was about to happen and raced for shelter. Mara guided her ailing starfighter through a jagged breach in the launching bay's rear wall. Her spotlight stabbed through a dusty cloud of floating rubble illuminating a maintenance hangar with a bank of shattered dart ship berths on the far wall. She sealed her EV suit and dropped her stealth X to the deck, skidding to a lopsided landing between the broken remnants of two egg-shaped storage tanks. Knowing that Luke would be covering her from his own craft, Mara sprang out of the cockpit and tumbled all the way to the ceiling, coming to a rest beside a spit creed ridge that would have served the garage as a sort of upside-down catwalk. When no attacks came, she exchanged her lightsaber for her blaster and covered Luke while he landed. A large part of her, the part that was Ben's mother, would have preferred him to rejoin the Falcon and come back with the solos and the heavy artillery. But she had known from the moment her R9 died that would never happen. Luke would no more have left her alone than she would have him. Besides, this wasn't so bad. It had been her and Luke against the world more times than she could count, and they always won. Luke took cover inside the shattered base of a storage tank, then Mara pushed off the ceiling and joined him. They were taking care to stay out of their stealth excess spotlights, but there was enough ambient light to see his lips pressed tight together through his faceplate. What do you think? Mara spoke over their suit calm. She wanted to keep her force senses clear for alerting her to danger. Try to squeeze into your stealth and sneak out. Luke shook his helmet. There won't be any slipping past that dart ship swarm out there. As a matter of fact, he turned toward his stealth X and cummed his R9. Arnie, go find a dark corner and... The command came to a sudden end as the orange glow of rocket exhaust lit the launching bay entrance. Mara grabbed Luke's arm and kicked off the floor, using the force to pull them toward a ruptured door membrane in the back of the maintenance hangar. Arnie started to tweedle a question, but the calm channel abruptly dissolved into static as a trio of bright flashes lit the chamber. There was no boom, of course. But Mara suddenly grew uncomfortably warm inside her vac suit, and the shock wave hurled her and Luke headlong through the door membrane into the darkened utility passage beyond. With no gravity or friction to slow them down, they did not stop until they slammed into a wall two seconds later. Mara hit back first, driving the air from her lungs but not breaking anything she could feel. A sharp crack over the calm suggested that Luke had impacted on his helmet. She started to ask if he was okay, then sensed him wondering the same thing about her, and knew he was. Check Aaron's suit, Luke said, riding himself. 
The reminder was unnecessary. The heads-up status display inside Mara's faceplate was already glowing, though she did not remember activating it. I'm good, she said. You. Have a hisser, he reported, indicating a small air leak. But we'd better look for it later. He pointed back toward the maintenance hangar. Thirty meters away, the orange glow of rocket exhaust was flickering against a section of curved tunnel, dimming and brightening as dart ships landed and shut down their engines and more poured into the hangar behind them. I don't recall seeing any EV suits in the tot hangars, Mara said hopefully. No, but a carapace is a good start on a pressure suit. Killed you. Mara turned her wrist over and entered a four-digit code on her forearm command pad. The Stealth X's self-destruct alarm began to gong inside her helmet, and the heads-up display on her faceplate began a twenty-second countdown. Come on, Skywalker. Let's stay on the move until we hear from the Falcon. Mara turned away from the hangar and started into the frozen darkness ahead. 36. The walls and floor were coated in a frozen black wax that absorbed the light from Luke's helmet lamp and made the passage seem even darker and murkier than it was. Every few meters, a fissure caused by the tunnel's sudden decompression ran all the way to the moon ice, sometimes exposing a short length of spikrete piping or power conduit. There were none of the shine balls that illuminated other Killick nests, nor any sense of order to its convoluted plan. The passages seemed to meander at random, twining around each other like vines, branching off at arbitrary intervals and rejoining the main passage without crossing any obvious destination between. At the speed he and Mara were sailing through the darkness, using the force to pull themselves along through the zero-g, Luke was growing badly disoriented. He no longer had any sense of whether they were traveling deeper into the moon or back toward the surface whether ten meters of ethmane ice separated them from the hangar or a thousand. Were it not for the frozen beads of vapor that his leaky vac suit was leaving behind, he wasn't even sure he could have found his way back down the same passage. Mara suddenly grabbed a crack in the wall and brought herself to a stop. Luke did the same and found himself looking at one of the bulging hatch membranes that Killix used instead of airlocks. A pull chain hung to one side of the hatch, attached to a set of valves positioned to spray sealing gel over the membrane before anyone tried to push through. Mara didn't reach for the pull chain, and neither did Luke. Both their spines were prickling with danger sense, and they were all too aware of how difficult it was to sense Garag in the force. Ambush, Mara concluded. They're starting to come after us. Starting? Luke looked around, and his helmet lamp illuminated a torrent of dart ship pilots pouring around the bend, at most thirty meters away. Wearing their dart ship canopies like carapaces, they were scurrying along every available tunnel surface, with their legs and arms sheathed in a shimmering fabric that bunched and gathered at the joints. They had no weapons other than their six limbs, but that would be enough if the swarm ever caught up. There was no question of using the force to hide. Whenever the Garag lost sight of their quarry, they simply spread out, scrambling over every surface in every direction, literally hunting their quarry down by feel. Luke began to pour blaster fire into the front ranks. Most bolts ricocheted off the canopies, while those that hit a limb simply activated a safety seal at the nearest joint. The insects just kept coming. Trouble, Luke said over the suit calm. Lightsabers would be more effective, but he really didn't want to go hand-to-hand -hand with who knew how many bugs. Big trouble, in fact. Maybe not that big, Mara said. No. They can't all be dartship pilots, Mara said. He felt rather than saw her nod at the bulging hatch membrane so they won't all be wearing pressure suits. You're right, Luke said. 
The first pilots were less than ten meters away now, but he holstered his blaster and grabbed his lightsaber. Not that big. They ignited their lightsabers, then pressed themselves against the tunnel wall and slashed a large X across the center of the hatch. The membrane blew apart, and there would be ambushes when tumbling past on a tide of explosive decompression, crashing into the pilot's swarm and bringing its advance to a tumbling, confused halt. Once the torrent slowed, Mara floated through the tattered membrane into a corridor filled with flash-frozen killix. Luke followed a few meters behind, using the force to pull himself along, shouldering aside Garag warriors with heads painted in the dark spray pattern of decompression death. How's that hisser? Mara asked. Luke checked the heads-up display inside his faceplate. He was down to just 15 minutes of air, and the loss rate was increasing. Fine for now. He turned his helmet lamp back through the burst hatch and was relieved to illuminate only a small portion of the throng that had been pursuing them so far. About fifty of the insects were still coming, pushing their way up the body-choked passage toward him and Mara. The last dozen or so were scurrying in the opposite direction, vanishing into the darkness behind the hundreds of pilots that had already started back toward their dart ships. But the next time we come to a pressure hatch, Let's try to leave it intact, Luke said. I think our rescue party is about to be delayed. The navigation lock finally reached the center of the display. Relieved to note their chess escorts were still behind them, the cruiser was less likely to blast the Falcon to atoms that way. Han began a slow, spiraling descent into KR's thickening fog. He would have liked to drop into a power dive and go screaming down to find Luke and Mara, but that would have looked suspicious. And when Chiss grew suspicious, they killed things. Let's see what it looks like inside that fog, Han said. Activate the terrain scanners. Leia brought the scanners online. Unlike Ethmane ice, Ethmane fog was almost as transparent to sensors as air and a moment later the mouth of a broad, funnel-like pit appeared on Han's display. The hole appeared to be a deep one, descending more than two kilometers before finally curving out of sight. Any sign of rescue beacons? Han asked. Leia shook her head. None. She closed her eyes. They're too deep. Deep? Inside KR, she said. I think they're in the nest. In the nest? Han felt like he was going to choke on his heart. That's not funny, Leia. It gets less funny, she said. Luke seems to think we'll meet a reception committee. You don't say. Han smiled. Good. Good? C-3PO demanded. I don't see anything good about this situation at all. There's every chance that both Master Skywalkers will be killed by our Baradium missiles. Not really. Han pushed the Falcon's nose down and dropped into a steepening dive. For that to happen, we'd have to actually fire the Baradium missiles. You don't intend to fire them? C-3PO asked, growing even more alarmed. Not even one? No. Leia's tone was relieved. It had been her idea to bring the Baradium missiles along, but she had spent most of the trip worried about how they were going to keep Alma clear when they fired the weapons at the nest. Han had not been quite so worried. Not with Luke and Mara inside. But you won't be able to clear the nest. C-3PO objected. Without those missiles, the odds will be... Easy, 3PO. The last thing Han wanted to hear was how bad the odds were. He was already having to hold the yoke tight to prevent his hands from shaking. I wasn't counting on the missiles anyway. You weren't? Of course not, he said. They're Baradium. 
You never get to shoot the Beradium missiles. Oh, C-3PO grew calmer. That's true. I have no record of one ever actually being launched. They descended a thousand meters into the fog, then a chis voice crackled over the calm. Millennium Falcon, be advised that if you attempt to evade us, we will open fire. We're not evading, Han answered. We're going in, and you're welcome to follow. Going in? The Ethmain ice was already beginning to make the calm signal scratchy. Clarify. We have two Jedi pilots down inside the nest, Leia explained. We're going to extract them. The clock raft reappeared on the falcon's tail. We've detected no other craft. Do you ever? Han interrupted. She said they were Jedi pilots, Luke and Mara Skywalker, to be exact. You coming or not? There was a moment's silence, then the two cloak raft began to drop back. Your request lies outside our mission profile, but we have been authorized to wish you good luck. Thanks for nothing, Han grumbled. You're welcome, the Chiss replied. We could have shot you down. The Falcon continued to descend, then finally broke out of the fog into a twisting, ice-walled shaft that was much narrower than it had appeared on the terrain scanner. Han gasped and pulled the ship in a spiral so tight it was almost a spin. Oh dear! C-3PO cried. Relax, circuit brain. Han spoke between clenched teeth. I've got us under control. That isn't what concerns me, Captain Solo. We have a safety margin of point. 3PO. Leia barked. What does concern you? C-3PO's golden arm stretched toward the viewport. That. It took a moment for Han and Leia to see the faint orange glow building in the depths of the shaft. Okay, Leia sighed. That kind of concerns me, too. Relax. Everything's under control. Han activated the intercom. Juin, you ready back there? There was a short delay, followed by the electronic screech of someone speaking too close to the intercom microphone. Yes, Captain, if you think this is going to work. It's going to work, Han said. He checked the power levels on the Falcon's tractor beam and saw that they were holding at maximum. Still, he asked, Are you sure you're ready? There was a short pause, then Tarfung jabbered something sharp. Tarfung assures you that he and Captain Juin are very prepared, C-3PO translated. He adds that if your Gijar plan fails, it's your own fault. You shouldn't try to blame it on them. It's going to work, Han said. He started to address the rest of his passengers, but KYP cut him off. Of course we're ready. KYP's voice came over the comm channel rather than the intercom, an indication that he was already in his vac suit and buttoned up tight. We're Jedi. Han glanced over at Leia. I hate it when he does that, he growled. You ready? She nodded gravely. As soon as you tell me how you're going to get past that swarm. Han grinned. Who says I'm going to? They rounded a bend and, about two kilometers below, saw the first haze of the dartship swarm filling the shaft. Han pointed the falcon's nose at them and accelerated. Han? Yeah? You don't have to impress me. Leia pinched her eyes shut. I've never thought you were faint-hearted. Not even once. Han chuckled. Good. Just want to keep. Juin's voice came over the intercom. Captain Solo, I have a question. Now? Han asked. The swarm of dart ships had thickened to a gray and orange cloud. Now you have a question? I can't find the activation safety, Juin said. There isn't one. 
Hans said. Just activate, now. But the CEC maintenance manual clearly states that every freight moving apparatus shall have. Flip the criffing switch. Leia yelled. The shaft's blue walls vanished behind the swarm, and bolts of red energy began to streak down into the shaft as Cockmaim and Newall cut loose with the quad laser cannons. That's an order, Han added. Juin flipped the switch. The cabin lights dimmed, and every display on the flight deck winked out as cockpit power dwindled to nothing. Even the quad lasers started to dribble beams of blue light. Han? Leia's voice broke with fear. We don't have any status displays. I can't monitor our shields. Is it supposed to do that? You bet, Han said proudly. When I reversed the polarity of the tractor beam, I had to feed it every spare erd of power I could find. All Han could see ahead was the cloud of dart ships, so close now that he could make out individual exhaust trails curving toward the falcon's nose. But not the shields, right? Leia said. Canopy bulges began to appear atop the closest dart ships, some with antennae waving inside, and propellant trails began to stab out from the swarm. Please tell me we're not drawing on the. A cone of iridescent energy shot out from beneath the Falcon, swallowing both the Garag missiles and the swarm beyond. A series of fiery blossoms erupted as the missiles interpreted the repulsion beam as impact and detonated. The dart ships were harder to defeat. The pilots increased power, and the cloud of ships hung in stasis, still struggling to ascend the shaft. But as the falcon continued to descend, the beam grew stronger. Soon the Killix primitive rocket engines began to overload and explode. Some dart ships fell out of control and crashed, while others began to tumble back down the shaft. For several moments, Han and Leia continued to catch glimpses of dart ships rolling around inside the beam, smashing into each other, spontaneously exploding, erupting against the pit's icy walls. Han slowed their descent until the eruptions grew less frequent. Finally, the boiling cloud of rubble dispersed, and nothing lay below them but a jagged star of darkness that had once been a dart ship launching bay. He brought the Falcon to a full stop and activated the intercom. Okay, June, you'd better shut down before something blows up. Han looked over at Leia and winked then added, and shift that power diverter back to the shields. 37. The battle dragon and its escorts were floating nose down above Koribu's blast-tattered rings, trading fire with two Chiss cruisers as the great swarm swept down to join the fight. Jaina's and Zek's cockpit speakers crackled to life with a pancom officers demanding explanations and colony joiners outlining in his plan, but the two Jedi paid the exchange little attention. They were 200 kilometers behind the swarm with a third stealth ex slave to Jaina's controls, and their mission was completely independent of the Killick assault. Unithal was still angry about the spoiled ambush, and he had planted one notion firmly in their minds before allowing them to launch. Jaina and Zek were to find Lobaka and leave. The Great Swarm reached the Hapan fleet and swallowed it in a flickering cloud of rocket exhaust, then streamed past to engulf the maelstrom of starfighters battling for the crucial space midway between the two sides. The Chiss cruisers redoubled their fire. Brilliant bursts of crimson and sapphire blossomed inside the great swarm, three or four a second, but the colony continued to descend, a dozen dart ships vanishing every time a turbolaser struck. The Killix did not even break formation. Hoping to locate Lobaka before they entered hostile territory, Jaina and Zek quieted their minds and reached into the force, and were so surprised that they gasped. Together. That feels like Master Skywalker, Zek said through their shared mind. Both of them, Jaina confirmed. And Mother and KYP and others, hard to tell. Pretty shut down. Trying to hide, Zek agreed but having a bad time. Wonder if Yuna knows? Yunithal must know, 
Jaina replied. Though she and Zek were hundreds of kilometers from the nearest tot, and not currently in touch with the larger collective mind, they could still feel the colony's will. Unithal was too powerful not to know when so many Jedi entered the system. Wonder why Yuna hid it from us. Yunus will began to press down on them, and their thoughts turned back to Lobaka. After a few moments of searching, they found their friend, groggy and confused and barely conscious, down below Koriba's southern pole in the heart of the Chiss command group. Drugged, Zek said in their thoughts. Not surprising. Predictable, Jaina agreed, growing impatient. We'll have to move fast. Yunus will press down, and their hands grew too heavy to lift toward their throttles. Their turn would come later, once the great swarm prepared the way. By the time the colony's command ship, an outdated Lancer-class frigate operated by the Yunu, appeared, the first start ships were closing with the cruiser escorts. Jaina's and Zek's tactical displays turned white with propellant trails and did not darken again. The Chiss escorts flickered and vanished one after the other, and the Killick barrage fell on the cruisers themselves. Both vessels lost shields within seconds and withdrew under fire. The lead cruiser took a drive hit and was overtaken. Its turbolasers continued to fire for another few seconds, then it suffered a hull breach and began to belch flame. Once its weapons had fallen silent, the great swarm stopped attacking and streamed after the surviving cruiser. The Hapan squadron started to follow, moving to secure the hole the Killix had opened in the enemy's lines, but Jaina and Zek were in no mood to wait. They needed to retrieve Lobaka before the Chiss withdrew to ascendancy space. Yunus will grew lighter, and Jaina and Zek shot past the nearest Hapan Nova passing so close to the bow that they saw the bridge pilots squinting at the shadowy silhouettes of their stealth excess. The passage opened into a murky vault too large for Mara's helmet lamp to illuminate. The beam merely reached into the darkness and vanished. She shined the light at her feet and found a dark, ribbed slope strewn with membrosia balls. In places, the balls were heaped a meter high. Her spine felt prickly and cold but that was nothing new. Her danger sense had been on overload since the moment they entered the nest. Luke's blaster flashed behind her. A distant pew-pew sounded through Mara's helmet, suggesting that air pressure had been restored to at least this part of the nest. A quick check of the heads-up display inside her faceplate confirmed her guess. At least my hisser's no problem now. Luke opened his faceplate and continued to fire. One less thing to worry about. Mara glanced back and found a wall of six-legged dart ship canopies scurrying up the passage. She used the force to shove all but one of the insects back down the passage, clogging the tunnel while Luke concentrated on the leader. Half a dozen shots later, the canopy finally cracked, and a blaster bolt burst the pilot's head. Mara allowed another killick to come forward, and she and Luke repeated the maneuver once more before the insects and in back turned around and started down the tunnel. Time to go, Mara reported, still speaking over her suit calm. Trying to flank us again. Luke finished the insect they had isolated, then they floated out into the weightless darkness. Fifteen meters in, Luke stopped and began to shine his helmet lamp around the chamber. Might be a good place to make a stand he said. Room to maneuver. With the force, we'll have an agility advantage. Mara swept her own lamp around the vault. Once in a while, she glimpsed a stretch of shapeless wax or a few membrosia balls resting on a dark, sloping wall. Otherwise, they seemed to be floating in empty air. Sounds good. Mara shined her light back into the passage from which they had come. She was surprised to find it completely empty. The dart ship pilots were nowhere in sight. Just one problem. Luke turned to look as well. Mara sensed him reaching into the force, then he said, Han and Leia must be drawing them off. I think the falcon is inside the nest. 
Mara equalized her suit pressure, then retracted her faceplate and nearly gagged on the cloying rankness of the air. You could have won me, she complained. What is that smell? Maybe it's better not to know, Luke said. Something rotting, I think. And I thought Lizzle smelled bad. As Mara spoke, a ball of membrosia drifted past, falling, at an angle toward her knees. In contrast to the clear amber syrup of the Lizzle and Yagley nests, this liquid looked dark and muddy inside its wax container, with stringy clots of solids silhouetted in the glow of her helmet lamp. Mara looked up toward the ceiling and thought for a moment she was only looking at an area of burnished wax. Then, as her eyes grew more accustomed to what she was seeing, she began to make out several speeder-sized killick heads. All were deep, dark blue, and all were facing a two-meter tunnel opening. What the blazes? Mara reached for her lightsaber. Queens? I don't think so. Luke said, sounding a little disgusted. Membrosia givers. Look at the other end. Mara ran her light along one of the Killix bodies, past the thorax clamped to the ceiling by six tubular legs running to a hugely swollen abdomen. About the size of a banda, it was oozing cloudy beads of dark membrosia and crawling with tiny garaga tendons which carefully slurped up each drop and redeposited it in a waxy ball extruded from their own abdomens. Appetizing, Mara commented dryly. Neither the membrosia givers or their attendants seemed inclined to attack, no doubt because they were entirely lacking in combat ability. What now? Start back? As Mara asked this, Alma Rara appeared in the tunnel above, still dressed in the skin-tight flight suit she had been wearing when she stole the skiff back on Asus. Now the material was stained and rumpled in a way Alma would never have permitted before. The Membrosia givers extended short feeding tubes and began to clack their mandibles for attention, but Alma ignored them. Sorry, she said to Mara. We can't let you leave. You can't let us? The sight of their betrayer made Mara's blood boil. She tried to remind herself that Alma was not entirely responsible for her actions, that the Twi'lek had unwittingly fallen under the Dark Nest's influence, but it didn't make her feel any less angry. She pulled her lightsaber from its belt hook, then glanced toward the empty tunnel that led back toward the hangars. From where I stand, you're in no position to stop us. Alma gave a sly smile. We believe we are. A muffled rustling rolled up the tunnel, and a wall of Garag warriors appeared in its mouth. Though they lacked the canopies that had protected the dart ship pilots, they were much larger and armed with both tridents and electrobolt assault rifles. The rifles, Mara knew, were relatively feeble weapons, cheap and reliable but requiring three or four hits to take down most targets. Unfortunately, she did not think the Killicks were going to have any trouble massing their firepower. A shrill chorus of squeck-squecking began to spread outward from the dark corners of the chamber, the sound of hundreds of Killick feet rushing across the sticky wax that lined the nest. Mara swept her helmet lamp over the walls and found them crawling with Garag warriors, and the anger she felt toward Alma assumed an acid taint. Tell your masters they're about to wish they had died in the crash. Mara slipped a fresh power pack into her blaster pistol. We're coming for them. Alma smirked, and Garag warriors began to pour out of the tunnel behind her. You will need more than lightsabers and blaster pistols, we think. The falcon's darkened air locks slid silently open. The four YVH, Bug Cruncher, War Droids, on loan from Tendrando Arms and specially programmed to Han's specifications, jumped into the pitch-black hangar. Next went the four Jedi, KYP, Saba, Octa Ramus, and Kal Katarn, in their combat-rated vac suits. Han was just glad he had convinced Miwal and Kokmane to help Jun and Tarfan guard the Falcon, or he and Leia, bringing up the rear in standard-issue EV suits, would have had to follow them, too. 
I'm the captain of Millennium Falcon, Han grumbled into his faceplate. That used to mean something. A moment later, Leia took his wrist, and they jumped out of the airlock. She drew him along through the weightless darkness, using the force to move them away from the Falcon so they would not need to activate their jet belts and make targets of themselves. To Han, it was like making his way through a cargo hold during an all-systems failure. He kept bumping into stuff, and stuff kept bumping into him. Finally, the YVHs gave an all-clear and activated their thrusters, briefly illuminating the airless, flotsam-choke launching bay before they shot through a hole in the rear wall. Conversing through the Jedi battle meld if at all, KYP and the other masters activated their green combat lamps and used the force to pull themselves after the war droids. Leia drew Han by the wrist and followed. He felt like a little kid being dragged through a bad dream, what with all the loose bug heads and chunks of thorax chitin floating around. As they passed through the hole, Leia's helmet lamp came on. Han activated his own light and found himself in a small repair hangar. The YVHs led the way into a small utility tunnel filled with garag bodies. Most of the insects had burst eyes and dark strings of tissue extruding from the breathing spiracles on their thoraxes, signs of a quick but painful decompression death. KYP motioned the rescue party forward, then activated his belt thruster and led the way up the passage. Glad to finally be under his own power, Han started his own thrusters and followed at Leia's side. The accumulation of insect bodies grew thicker as they advanced and soon the group almost seemed to be swimming through them. Han touched his helmet to Leia so they could speak without breaking calm silence. Luke and Mara did all this. KYP seems to think so. Huh. Han started to wonder who might need rescuing more, the Skywalkers or the Bugs. Nice of them to leave us a trail. They passed through the tattered remains of a hatch membrane and continued deeper into the twisting warren of tunnels, following a steady trail of dead garag and gouged walls. Han began to think the Skywalkers had decided to hunt down Welk and Lomi Pielo on their own. The rescue party came to another hatch, this one intact, and progress slowed to a crawl as the bug crunchers pushed through one by one. KYP and Octa Ramus followed the droids, and suddenly the membrane grew bright with battle flashes. Enemy located. Bug 1 reported, terminating calm silence. Engaging now. Han armed the T-21 repeating blaster he had brought along as bug repellent, then started toward the membrane. Leia put out a hand to stop him. Not yet, she said over the calm. KYP's suit has been punctured. She did not need to explain further. With KYP's suit damaged, it would not be smart to draw more fire in the hatch's direction. Well, tell him to hurry up, Han said. My trigger finger is getting itchy. Leia's eyes slid away from Han's, looking past his shoulder back down the corridor. Then Saba's faceplate suddenly loomed up behind Leia's head, her pebbly lips broadening into a huge, fog-filled smile. It will not itch for long, this one thinks. Han spun around, and his stomach sank. Dozens of dartship canopies on legs were racing up the tunnel toward them. Han raised his T-21 and opened fire. One canopy shattered, but most of the bolts ricocheted off, melting holes into the walls and filling the passage with an ever-thickening cloud of ethmine vapor. Han slid over to stand shoulder to shoulder with Leia. Sweetheart. He lowered his aim and began to blast Killick legs. Did I ever tell you how much I hate bugs? 38. The Chiss were retreating in disarray, spiraling down below Koriba's south polar region in a tangled vortex of ion trails, lacing space behind them with a ragged net of turbo laser fire. Jaina and Zek spotted an opening and swung their stealth XS toward it. Before they could dart through, a pair of frigates managed to shift their fire and string the hole with streaks of energy. Jaina and Zek peeled away, 
the stealth axe slaved to Jaina's controls lagging half a second behind. Silhouetted against the white backdrop of Korba's south pole, they were visible to any sensor operator with a tracking telescope, and it would be folly to attempt a penetration when they had so clearly been spotted. If they wanted to reach Lobaka alive, they would have to try another approach. Not as disorganized as they look, Jaina observed. This is a show, Zek agreed. Jaina and Zek checked their tactical displays. The screen showed only the portion of the battle not hidden behind Koriba's mass. But what it did show clearly revealed the Chiss falling back in a crooked, disjointed line that was barely managing to stay ahead of the swarm's dart ships. A couple of frigates and light corvettes were blinking with damage, but most of the cruisers, and all of the star destroyers and fighter carriers, were safely below Koribu, milling about in the heart of the fleet. A Bahan fade, Jaina remarked. The Chiss probably have a different name for it, Zek pointed out. Probably, Jaina agreed. They swung around in a crooked, uneven curve, ducking behind blossoming turbolaser strikes and changing their approach frequently to throw off anyone trying to track them by sight. But Koribu's polar region was as vast as it was bright, and their stealth excess remained silhouetted against its whirling white clouds. We should warn Yunithal, Zek suggested. Our help isn't wanted, Jaina replied. That fact made them feel sad and rejected and horribly, utterly alone. Our mission is to Retrieve Lobaka and leave, Zek finished. But we're Jedi. Our first mission is prevent a wider war, Jaina agreed. They were deliberating more than discussing, weighing both sides of the argument in a single shared mind, and an unhappy thought occurred to them. What if they did nothing? The Great Swarm would be destroyed, perhaps even the Hapan fleet, which was advancing behind the safety of the Killick dart ships. Without the means to defend the Koribu nests, the colony would be forced to abandon them, or to find a way to evacuate. In either case, the Chiss would no longer feel threatened, and a greater war would be averted. Unithal might be killed, Zek pointed out. Would the colony return to normal? Jaina wondered. Impossible to know. Impossible, Jaina agreed. But maybe not a bad thing. Jaina and Zek waited, expecting to feel Yuna's will pressing down on them, driving them to act in the colony's best interest. But they were out of contact with the top mine, cut off from it by distance as well as by Yuna's anger, and Yunithal was too busy coordinating the overall battle to join their combat meld. Jaina and Zek's mind was their own, for now. A hole appeared in the turbolaser net, and they accelerated toward it, aiming for a quartet of tiny blue circles that their R9 units assured them was a cruiser's sublight drive. If they could sneak up close enough, they could slip into the heart of the Chiss fleet by hiding near its exhaust nozzles, where the glare would blind anyone peering in their direction. This feels wrong, Zek said like we're betraying the colony. And Yunithal, Jaina added, But we're Jedi. Jedi do what is necessary, Zek agreed. To prevent war. To keep the peace. The cruiser was so close now that they could see the boxy outline of its engine skirt enclosing the bright discs of its four huge thrust nozzles. Turbo laser beams stabbed out all around them, but never close enough to suggest that the Stealth XS had been spotted again. Jaina and Zek continued to close the distance. Then another unhappy thought occurred to them. Welk. If Unithel dies. The possibility was almost too terrible to consider. If Unithel died, Welk, or Lomi Pielo, if she had survived, might become the new Prime Yunu. They did not know what that would mean for the colony, but it would certainly be bad for the rest of the galaxy. The Dark Jedi would use the Killix for their own ends, perhaps even to draw the entire galaxy into a single collective mind. Need to protect Unithal, Zek concluded. Better warn him. Jaina and Zek were relieved. 
it was what they had wanted anyway. Maybe they had even convinced themselves it was the best thing when it was not, but their mind was made up. They reached out to Unithal in the force, urging him to open himself to their combat melt. Yunus will press down on them. Suddenly, rescuing Lobaka seemed more important than stopping the colony's attack. If Jaina and Zek did not rescue their friend quickly, he would perish along with his captors when the Great Swarm destroyed the Chis fleet. Jaina and Zek pushed back, but being out of touch with the top mind, they had no way to explain the Chis trap. All they could do was pour their alarm into the force and urge Unithal to join the combat melt. Yunus will grew heavier, and they began to believe it was not so important to reach Unithal after all. Afraid we're trying to trick them again, Zek surmised. Only the knowledge that Yunu was wrong gave them the strength to resist, to continue reaching into the force. Finally, someone reached back, but it was Jaina's mother, not Unithal. Jaina and Zek stretched out toward her, inviting her into their battle melt, and the situation grew a little clearer. Leia and the others were under attack. An image of dozens of blue-black Killick soldiers appeared inside their mind, swarming up a dark tunnel, pouring electrobolt fire toward them. Jaina and Zek were alarmed, but Leia did not seem frightened or worried. Why should she be? She and Han had been trapped in worse situations a hundred times. Now Jaina and Zek were really worried and confused. They did not know of any blue-black Killicks in the Koribus system, nor of any nests with such gloomy walls. K.R., Leia explained. Secret nest. A nest could not be secret. Yuna would know about it. Welk? Leia reminded them. Saba? Now Jaina and Zek understood. Every time they had tried to investigate the assault on Saba, the Tot, and later Unithal, had turned them aside. The Baribal had mistakenly attacked a joiner, it was claimed, or she had fought a Chiss assassin. Perhaps Unithal had been attempting to hide the secret nest all along. Or maybe he just did not want to believe it existed. Either way, the situation was worse than Jaina and Zek had realized. They wanted to go to KR to help Leia and the others, but if Unithal died, the Dark Jedi would be close by, waiting to take over. Leia seemed to understand. She was already withdrawing from the meld, urging them to be careful, assuring them that Luke and the other masters had things well in hand on KR. When she was gone, Jaina and Zek still felt no hint of Unithal. Have to do this the hard way, Jaina said. Go back and make contact with Tot, Zek agreed. Then the colony will know what we're thinking. Jaina and Zek hesitated. Yunus will was a band of sitting on their shoulders, pushing them toward Lobaka, toward the heart of the Chiss fleet. Loi can wait a few more minutes, Jaina said. We'll come back for him. Loi would understand, Zek agreed. Loi is a Jedi. Jaina and Zek rolled into simultaneous wingovers in reverse direction, pointing their noses back toward the Great Swarm. Yuna's weight sank to their stick hands. Only one problem with this plan, Zek observed. Jaina could feel Zek fighting, as she was, to keep his controls dead center. Not really. Jaina released her stick. Sneaky, take us in. The astromech took control of the stealthex, then chirped a question. To Yuna's squadron. As Jaina spoke, Zek was giving the same orders to his own astromech. The Tot were flying escort for Unithal's flag frigate, so all the two Jedi needed to do to was rejoin the swarm, and the Tot mind would know everything they did. And that command is none. There is no need to desert our friend. Unithal's gravelly voice reverberated over their comm speakers, but when Jaina and Zek checked their reception meters, they discovered that their transceivers were not receiving a signal. We will listen to your plea, but Yunu will never let you stay. You have betrayed the colony's trust. It's not about us. 
Jaina was not quite certain what form of reply Yunithal could hear, so she simply spoke the words aloud. We need to warn you. You're flying into a trap, Zek added. They took control of their stealth excess again, turned back toward the Chiss cruiser they hoped to use for cover. Lobaka would not have to wait after all. This is about you, Unithal insisted. You are trying to save the Chiss fleet. Again. We're trying to save you, Jaina replied. It's a Bahan fade, Zek added. The Chiss are drawing you into the open. You studied battle tactics on Yavin, Jaina said. You know what's going to happen when the fight moves beyond Koriba's gravity well. The boxy outline of the cruiser's engine skirt was again visible ahead. Unitho remained silent as the brilliant circles of the thrust nozzles continued to swell in front of the stealth excess. Jaina and Zek began to hope that they had convinced Yunu of the danger. Then Yunithal said, It must be a coincidence. There were no chiss in our tactics classes. Jaina and Zek knew better than to waste time pointing out the flaws in Yunu's argument. Kilik logic did not follow the same rules as that of most species. In fact, it did not follow rules at all. Instead, Jaina asked, Can the colony really afford to take that chance? When the Great Swarm reaches Korobu's South Pole, take a minute to regroup, Zek suggested. You remember what will happen if we're right? Of course, Yunithal said. We have an excellent memory. The calm speakers fell silent, leaving Jaina and Zek feeling alone and shunned again, worried their pleas would go unheeded. The first tendrils of the cruiser's exhaust tail began to lick at their forward shields. Jaina and Zek dropped below it and closed to within 300 meters of the ship's stern. Their canopy tinting darkened to solid black, and they flipped their bellies toward the ion stream to protect the delicate sensor windows on top of the stealth excess nose cones. For the next 30 seconds, they remained on the fringes of the exhaust stream, following the cruiser toward the heart of the Chiss fleet. Jaina and Zek tried to keep an eye on their tactical displays, but the ion interference rendered their screens almost unreadable. To discern anything, the R9S had to use a complicated algorithmic analysis to separate interference from true sensor returns. Jaina and Zek were beginning to think Yuna had ignored their warning when the R9S announced that the Great Swarm had slowed. The eyes of the two Jedi Knights went to their tactical displays, desperately trying to infer a picture from the static on the screens. The astromechs reported that the Chiss retreat appeared to be growing even more disorganized. Trying to tempt the enemy, Zek observed. Hope Yuna sees that. To Sneaky, Jaina said, Give us a simple schematic. Sneaky interrupted with a series of concerned tweets. Jaina looked out the canopy to see the cruiser swinging back toward Koribu. Baiting the trap, Jaina observed. With our camouflage, Zek complained. Too many eyes watching now. Better find something else to follow in, Jaina agreed. They dropped out of the exhaust stream. As their canopies grew transparent again, they found themselves surrounded by durasteel hulls ranging in apparent size from that of a finger to something closer to a Wookiee's arm. Already deeper than we thought, Jaina observed. Yes, yeah, Zek agreed. The static began to clear from their tactical displays. But is that a good thing or? Blossoms of turbo laser fire lit the space around them. Jaina and Zek surrendered their hands to the force, and their stealth excess began to weave and bob, swinging wide before a strike exploded in front of them, climbing away from a beam even as it lanced out behind them. Jaina's hand pushed the stick forward. The third stealth ex, the one slave to her controls, followed her into a dive and slammed into a blossom of fire behind her. Her R9 let out a sad whistle as it received the final data burst from its counterpart. Then Jaina jinked starboard and Zek juke port, and a trio of turbo laser strikes burst into a miniature sun between them. Our boyfriend means business, Zek observed. Don't know that it's him. 
and its old boyfriend. Right. We're so over him. We? Jaina and Zek dropped the line of thought there. It was just getting too creepy, with Zek sharing everything that Jaina still felt for Jag, and Jaina sharing everything that Zek still felt for her, and it didn't help matters that, at the moment, Jag was doing his best to kill them both. He's just following orders, Zek consoled. He has to, Jaina agreed. He's just. They continued to dodge through the barrage, angling first one direction, then another, always working deeper into the fleet. Despite the loss of the third stealth X, they could still rescue Lobaka. Zek's storage compartment was filled with oxygen tanks, and there was an air feed running into the empty torpedo bay below his seat. Unfortunately for Jaina, she was the only one small enough to fit inside. The Chiss brought more ships to bear, stringing kilometer-wide screens of crimson energy ahead of the stealth XS, hoping the elusive starfighters would simply fly into a strike. Jaina and Zek rolled away from one beam and found another crossing their noses. Jaina pulled up hard, her astromech screeching alarms as the inertial compensator strained to keep the ship together. Zek dropped his nose and squeezed past underneath, his stealth axe shuddering and bouncing as its shields crackled and overloaded. Enough. To her droid, Jaina said, Sneaky, give us a one-second fuse and drop a shadow bomb, now. The droid tweeted its alarm, but obeyed. Jaina gave the bomb an afford force shove, and a silver flash filled the space behind them. The shock wave hit an instant later, slamming both stealth XS forward and pushing their tails down. Jaina and Zek did not right themselves. They simply poured on the power and shot away, doing anything they could to change course and location before the Chiss eyes tracking them recovered from the blinding flash of the shadow bomb. The Chiss brought even more turbo lasers to bear, but well behind and below the stealth XS. Jaina and Zek were close enough now to feel Lobaka's presence aboard a heavily armored dreadnought escorting the flagship. They closed formation and swung toward it, then finally had time to check their tactical displays. Yunar had listened to their warning. The Great Swarm remained at Koribu, spread out just beneath the southern pole, with the Hapans taking a supporting position behind the dart ships. Meanwhile, the Chiss had given up trying to draw out the colony and were smoothly dispersing into their own defensive wall, three layers deep and just out of Hapan Turboli's range. Could have timed this better. Going to be hot as a Nova getting through that picket field, Zek agreed. The dreadnought's ion drive suddenly brightened, then Jaina and Zek's heart sank as the ship turned and accelerated away from the fleet. The Chiss were not fools. Having lost track of their quarry, they had decided to remove the bait. Could have timed this a lot better. Jaina's vision blurred with welling tears, and she and Zek reached out to Lobaka, trying to reach him through the stupor in which his captors were keeping him, trying to assure him that they would find him, urging him not to lose faith. They felt a question struggling toward the top of Lobaka's mind, then anger. Then the dreadnought vanished into hyperspace, and they felt nothing at all. 39. The chamber was choked with dead Garag, and still more came, pushing through the bodies and floating globules of gore to press their assault, their electrobolt rifles stringing the darkness with bright ropes of silver. Luke was tumbling through the rancid air, somersaulting over forks of crackling energy and spinning away from thrusting tridents his lightsaber tracing a green cage around him as the blade moved smoothly from defense to offense, from diverting electrobolts to cleaving dark chitin. Mara was twisting along three meters behind him, connected by an invisible force tether, firing her blaster with one hand and wielding her lightsaber with the other. They were sinking deeper into a battle trance, becoming one with their weapons, becoming the hands of death, and drawing ever closer to Almarar. 
Luke felt the warm prickle of danger sense and glimpsed a large band of Garag gliding through the bodies to his right, the electrodes on their rifles already charged and glowing. Still rolling and twisting, fighting off attacks from every direction, he pointed at one of the Membrosia givers on the ceiling and used the force to pull it down, legs flailing and chest booming, into their line of fire. Alma tried to wrench the creature free, but her grasp was no match for Luke's. The Membrosia giver remained in the thick of battle, a shrill screech rising from its feeding tube, long gobs of Membrosia shooting from its abdomen. Alma spat a Twi'leki curse and ignited her lightsaber. Luke's chest tightened with cold anger. He had not thought her foolish enough to come for him, and he steeled himself to do what was necessary. But Alma went straight to the Membrosia giver, stunning Luke by sinking her lightsaber deep into the insect's thorax and dragging the blade along the insect's entire length. The two halves of the huge body drifted apart and a deafening volley of electrobolt fire lit the darkness. The Skywalkers ducked away, Luke protecting them with his lightsaber while Mara's blaster added more dead killix to the shell of bodies already shielding them. Getting dangerous! In here! Mara observed. Looks like. Time to carry the fight to them. Mara stopped firing and reached for a fresh power pack. Time to go after Welk. She slipped the pack into her blaster and resumed firing. And Lomi Pielo. Luke risked a glance toward Alma, who was clearly in no hurry to engage the Skywalkers directly, and was gliding back toward her tunnel. Hoping to wear us down, Mara observed. Luke shook his head. Protecting something, he said. Or someone. Take her, Mara ordered through their force bond. I'll cover. Luke moved to intercept, no longer dodging or twisting, just shouldering past Killick corpses and going after Alma. He was shocked by her ruthlessness, but hardly surprised. The line she had crossed was an invisible one, a matter of degree and intention rather than principle. Had another Jedi Knight made a similar sacrifice pursuing a Jedi goal, Luke might have condoned the act, even tried to console the individual and reassure her that it had been the best choice available. And that made him wonder more than ever what the Jedi had become. A trio of Garag warriors zeroed in on Luke, forcing him into somersaults until Mara took them out. He arrived at the cutoff point after Alma but close enough on her heels that she had to turn and face him. She showed no emotion on her face or in the force, but she raised her lightsaber into a middle guard, the best initial defense for an outmatched fighter. Luke continued to bat electrobolts aside, his lightsaber weaving a green cage around him, but he made no move to attack. Alma, this doesn't have to happen, he said. You still have a home with us. Garag persuaded you to betray the Jedi, but we can forgive you. Luke did not like what the war had done to the Jedi, what it had done to him, and he was determined to start undoing that right now. Alma, reach out to me. I can help you find the way back. We don't want to come back. Alma sprang, flying at Luke behind a whirling onslaught of slash and backslash. Stop interfering. Luke blocked and redirected her momentum, sending her tumbling into the body-choked darkness, and placing himself between her and the tunnel she had been guarding. He felt an inquiry from Mara, then glimpsed her pointing her blaster at the Twi'lek's back. He shook his head. Be quick. Mara broke their force tether, then launched herself into a wild gyre of sweeping blade light and flashing blaster fire. Han and Leia. Luke could sense the rest for himself. Han and Leia were almost there, and they would not be so forgiving. He began to retreat toward the tunnel, weaving and dancing as the electrobolts flew thick and fast around him. Alma started after him and had to slow down to dodge and block herself. 
Alma, your anger has made you vulnerable, Luke said. Your sister's death made you angry, and the Garag are using that anger to hold you. Numa was a warrior. Alma snarled, readily shifting topics, as Luke had known she would, to the still open wound of her sister's death. She would defend the colony. This time, she came at Luke under control, combining the flashing blades of a speed attack with the driving stomp kicks of a power assault. He switched to a one-handed grasp, parrying her strikes with his own lightsaber, slipping her kicks with a deft trunk twist, deflecting electrobolts with the palm of his free hand. Numa was wise. Luke continued to fall back, spinning around to slash open a pair of Garag warriors foolish enough to charge him from behind. She would have been the first to warn you against your anger. Luke reached out for the Twi'lek, trying to embrace her in the Force and shield her from the Dark Nest's touch. She would have been disappointed to see how you have surrendered to it. Alma was too far gone. She attacked all the more furiously, shrieking her grief and rage in Twi'leki, slashing low and high, kicking right and left, her words as hard and angry as her blows. Time and again, Luke forced her to leave her body open for a killing blow he did not want to deliver, and time and again she failed to notice his mercy and spun around in another wild attack. Then Luke felt an icy jolt of fear. He looked past Alma to see Garag warriors closing on Mara from all sides, silver rays crackling at her so fast and furious she could not block them all. The first bolt burned a fist-sized hole in the thigh of her vac suit and filled the air with the stench of scorched durafiber. The second caught her in the chest, and Luke did not see the third. By then he was driving forward, pressing the attack and forcing Alma back toward Mara. Suddenly the Twi'lek stopped, determined to stand her ground. Luke tapped her lightsaber aside then used the force to pull her hand toward him, drawing her off balance onto his own weapon. Her eyes widened, and the blade sliced down through her clavicle, deep into her shoulder. Luke brought his boot up under her chin, snapping her head back, sending her arms flying out to her sides. She began to backflip away her lightsaber slipping from her open fingers. Luke summoned the weapon into his empty hand and continued toward Mara, who had disappeared inside a knot of Garag. Her weapons were still flashing inside the snarl and her presence was burning hot in the force, and that gave him hope. He reached out to Leia, urging her to hurry, then fell on the jumble with both lightsabers whirling. The battle erupted into a tempest of hissing blades and shrieking blasters and crackling electrobolts. Luke opened a dozen thoraxes in a dozen strokes, then his back spasmed with the paralyzing heat of an electrobolt strike. Mara fired from somewhere inside the tangle of limbs and mandibles, and the acrid stench of melted chitin rose behind him. Luke stretched out with the force, dragging Kilix away from Mara hurling them into their fellow warriors or impaling them on crooked forks of energy. Luke pulled himself toward a glimpse of red-gold hair, his lightsabers opening a path, filling the air with globules of insect gore. Twice, a mandible slipped through his defenses, one stabbing deep into his thigh, the other slipping a barb inside the face opening of his helmet. Both times, he slashed off the attacker's heads and moved on. Finally. Luke came to Mara's whirling figure. Her vac suit had been burned to tatters, and she had half a dozen black circles where electrobolts had hit her. A faint aura of gold had arisen around her, a sign she was drawing on the force to keep her exhausted, wounded body going. Mara briefly locked gazes with Luke, then her green eyes slid away, looking overhead. Luke followed her line of sight, and was surprised to see Alma Ra pulling herself into the tunnel mouth. Her left arm was floating at her side, a deep, gaping V where she had been cleaved. Mara lowered her gaze again and continued her defensive whirl. She batted away an electrobolt, then groaned. This isn't really taking the fight to them. Not too late, though. 
Luke sent a flurry of electrobolts screaming back toward the killicks that had fired them. Got them overconfident now. Better make it look good, then. Mara sent a dozen bolts screaming toward the Twi'lek. Luke did not see whether any hit. By then, the Garag were pressing the attack again, and he was too busy defending himself and Mara to worry about Alma. Leia's arms had become deadweights, fifteen minutes into the fight, and she was able to wield her lightsaber now only by virtue of the strength Saba was lending her through the Force. Han had run out of power packs, she had not noticed when, and traded his T-21 for a pair of captured assault rifles, which he had taken to firing one in each hand. The bug crunchers had taken so many hits that bugs one through three had exhausted their laminanium repairing its. With the exception of Saba, who only seemed to grow quicker, stronger, and more joyful as the battle wore on, even the Jedi Masters were slowing, if the tattered condition of their combat vac suits was any indication. And the Garag just kept coming, blocking the way ahead, clattering out of side passages, rumbling up the tunnel behind the rescue team. A Limitless Swarm A Limitless Swarm Han! Leia's lightsaber swept down to divert an electrobolt streaking toward his knee then swung up to block one coming at her own head. Her arms were so numb she did not even feel them move. Do those bug crunchers have thermal detonators on them? What do you think? Use them. In here? The assault rifle in Han's left hand ran low on power and began to shoot sparks. He let it float free. That's crazy! If we blow a hole in this ice cube. You, Sam. Leia used the force to pull a rifle out of a dead Garag's hands and floated it up the corridor to Han. I don't think we're going to reach Luke and Mara in time. And we're not doing very. Why VH bug crunchers? Han said over the combat channel. Go BM. Use your detonators. BM status requires authorization. Do it! Han shouted so loudly that his voice reverberated out of five other helmets. Do it now! Authorization code do it now accepted, Bud one said. The soft crump of the droid's grenade launcher sounded from the head of the line. By any means status. A brilliant flash lit the corridor and the rest of the report was lost to the ear-splitting crackle of a thermal detonator. The rescue team surged forward into the crater, and Bug forecalled. Proceed with all haste. A soft crump sounded as the droid launched his detonator. Explosion imminent. Leia and the others barely had time to start forward before a brilliant flash filled the corridor behind them. Leaving Bug 4 to handle rearguard duty. They followed KYP and the other masters forward. Another crump sounded from the front of the line. Another detonator exploded. The tunnel behind them filled with Garag, and Bug 4 launched a detonator. Blast! Saba shut down her lightsaber. Where is the fun in that? Moving much faster now, they passed through another crater and started around the next corner then stopped short when a deafening storm of electrobolt fire sent Bug-1 tumbling back into the adjacent wall. His armor was blasted down to the frame and his internal systems were hanging out, sparking and shooting green lubricant. Major Anemi I can see. He raised his arm, and a detonator floated out. D. His system shut down, leaving the detonator floating in front of him its red warning light blinking the countdown. Misfire! Misfire! Bug 2 started toward the detonator. Please seek. Stand fast. Leia ordered. She raised her finger toward the detonator, but Saba or KYP or someone had already sent it sailing around the bend. 
It detonated with a brilliant flash, then Bug 2 led the charge forward. When the rescue team followed, they found themselves entering a vast, murky vault filled with Garag warriors. Leia could sense Luke and Mara a dozen meters above, hidden in a tangle of insects so thick and large she could not see the glow of their lightsabers. How about it, Saba? Han asked. That enough fun for you? Before the Baribul could answer, some of the Garag recovered their senses and fired a volley of electrobolts. Leia's lightsaber came up automatically, as did those of KYP, Saba, and the other masters, but there were just too many strikes to block. She took a scalding hit in the shoulder and heard Han curse as he took one, then a pair of crumps sounded as Bug 2 and Bug 3 launched more detonators. Careful! KYP warned. Master Skywalker. The rest was lost to a pair of air-splitting crackles, and Leia's sight flashed to white. The air shuddered as the bug crunchers opened up with their blaster cannons. By the time her vision cleared, both droids had activated their thrusters and were shooting toward the combat tangle above. KYP and the other masters were close on their heels. Leia looked over at Han. A hand-sized expanse of blistered flesh showed through a hole in the stomach of his vac suit. You all right? He asked. Fine, Leia said. She started to remark that Han's wound looked worse than hers, but stopped when Jaina and Zek touched her through the battle meld, wondering what the blazes was happening and assuring her that help was coming. She grabbed Han's wrist. Han, there's something I should tell you. Now? He leaned down and kissed her on the lips. I love you too, but maybe. Not that, Leia said. I mean, it's Jaina. She's on her way. Here? Han scowled. Good thing or bad? Leia could only shrug and shake her head. I'm pretty sure she and Zek are joiners. Han let his chin drop. Just shoot me. A volley of electrobolt fire crackled up the tunnel behind them. Bug 4 retreated around the corner, armor smoking, a deep melt crease along one side of his head. Okay, I didn't mean that. Han dropped one of his electrobolt rifles and grabbed Leia around the waist then activated his belt thrusters. They jetted toward the combat above, plowing through an ever-thickening morass of blood globules and drifting bodies. The largest part of the Garag swarm had turned to face KYP and the other masters, but Luke and Mara were still trapped a few meters above the main combat, their lightsabers weaving brilliant snakes of color as they spun and slashed and killed. Leia and Han were about halfway to the fight when she noticed that no Garag were firing in their direction. Faced with a line of Jedi Masters and Bug Cruncher droids, apparently Leia and Han just did not seem like much of a threat. Leia hated being underestimated. That way! Leia reached across Han's face, pointing away from the battle at an angle. Flank M! I was just about to think of that. Han turned in the direction Leia had indicated, then dropped his second assault rifle and drew his trusty DL-44 blaster. Take the stick! Before Leia could ask for clarification, Han braced his blaster hand across his free arm and pointed the emitter nozzle at one of the Garag attacking Luke and Mara. Are you crazy? Leia cried. You can't shoot into a hand-to-hand -hand fight. No kidding? Han replied. I didn't know that. Leia grabbed Han in the force and, as they continued to approach the battle, tried to steady him. He squeezed the trigger, and a bolt streaked up to blast the garage's head apart. He fired again, and an abdomen exploded. The third shot burned a hole through a warrior's thorax. Han began to fire more rapidly now always aiming for the perimeter of the battle. 
The two masters used the force to shove targets into his line of fire, and it was only a few seconds before the only garage between them and the solos were dead ones. Han stopped firing and waved them down. Come on! Let's get out of Luke and Mara shook their heads, then turned toward the ceiling and vanished into a tunnel surrounded by the five largest, ugliest killicks Leia had ever seen. Hey! Han yelled, still trying to wave them back. The ship's this way. 40. Jaina and Zek knew they were getting close to the launching bay when the broken cylinders of derelict dart ships began to appear in the Ethmane fog. They could feel Leia and the other Jedi somewhere beyond, deep within K.R., awash in a battle whirl of anger and fear and pain. They followed the shaft around a bend and, in the fog below, saw the hazy star of a blasted-out launching bay. From inside came the silver flicker of a small arms barrage, punctuated at intervals by the brilliant bursts of laser cannons. Jaina and Zek stretched their force awareness into the battle. They felt only four living presences aboard the Falcon, the Nobri and two others they did not recognize. As their stealth excess slipped through the entrance, forks of white energy began to crackle across their forward shields. Jaina and Zek activated their forward floodlights. The launching bay was filled with wrecked dart ships and drifting insect parts. In the heart of the carnage floated the Millennium Falcon, taking fire from dozens of positions concealed in the flotsam. Perhaps two dozen insects in the chitinan and cell fiber carapaces that served as killic pressure suits had slipped inside the falcon's shields. They were blasting it with electrobolts at point-blank range, melting fist-sized pits into the hull armor. Jaina and Zek paused, struggling to grasp what they saw. Despite what they had sensed from Leia through the Force, they still found it difficult to believe that a nest of Killix would attack the Falcon without reason, and all too easy to believe the Falcon might have provided a reason. Only the memory of the unprovoked attacks on the Shadow and Master Sabatine earlier, and of the illogical explanations provided by the colony, gave them the resolve to open fire. Their laser bolts were blindingly brilliant in such a narrow space, and their canopy flash tinting went to black. Jaina and Zek instinctively reached into the force to locate their targets, but the only presences they felt were aboard the Falcon. They had to settle for counter-fire, allowing their R9 units to control the laser cannons and target the source of each electrobolt. It took longer, but the result was the same. The positions in the flotsam fell silent, leaving only the Killix on the Falcon's hull to contend with. Jaina and Zek sealed their vac suits and moved their stealth XS deeper into the launching bay. Before they could pop their canopies, the Falcon's rear cargo hatch opened and two Nogri in vac suits dropped out of the vessel with a pair of T-21 repeating blasters. The hatch closed behind them, and they turned in different directions, twisting and spinning like Jedi, working their way around the hull, burning the Killix off the ship. As much as it pained Jaina and Zek to watch the deaths of so many kind, they had to admire the artistry. The Nogri had almost completed their hull cleaning when the Falcon's ion drives glowed to life. Jaina and Zek stretched their awareness into the ship again, trying to figure out why the two presences aboard would do such a thing. They did not like what they felt. Help! C-3PO's voice came over the emergency channel. This Yuok is a criminal. He has the death mark on ten planets, and now he's attempting to steal. C-3PO's plea trailed off into a deep rumble as someone tripped his primary circuit breaker. The Falcon spun her bow toward the exit. Still fighting the Killix, the Nogri were thrown from the hull and began to drift. Jaina swung her stealth exon behind her father's beloved freighter and armed a proton torpedo. Zek began to wonder if this was not overkill. The specifications of the Falcon's military-grade shields rose to the top of their mind, and Zek understood. He armed a torpedo of his own. They activated their targeting computers. The Falcon stopped spinning, 
no doubt as target lock alarms filled the cockpit. A nervous Celestin voice came over the calm channel. This is Jay Jun, second mate of the Millennium Falcon, requesting the two unseen craft to deselect us as targets. Jaina and Zek did not comply. The glow died from the Falcon's ion drives. This is Jay Jun, second mate of the Millennium Falcon. C-3PO was mistaken. Our only intention was to move the ship out of the line. What the blower is that? Jaina and Zek did not need to see past the Falcon to know what Juin was talking about. They could feel it in the growing pressure of Yuna's will, and the growing weight inside them. The Falcon slipped away from the exit, exposing the old Lancer-class frigate now blocking the way outside. A small, well-armed launch was gliding silently through the jagged entrance, nosing aside ruined dart ships and tumbling pieces of Killick. Yuna's will grew crushing compelling Zek and Jaina to answer honestly, even before they sensed the question. Who did this? Mara and Luke were ten meters down a sticky, wax-lined tunnel, and every time Mara made the mistake of breathing, she came close to retching. The dank air stank worse than a sarlax belch, a cloying melange of decay, spice, and free ethmine. And the smell was only growing worse as they advanced. At least it keeps you from thinking about the burns, Luke said. Mara's awareness of her wounds, half a dozen aching circles where electrobolts had burned thumb-sized craters into her flesh, returned. She drew a little more of the force into herself, using it to reinvigorate exhausted muscles, to keep her pain-crippled body functional. That's what I love about you, farm bowl, she said. I always look on the bright side. Not really. Mara assumed a cynical tone. You always know how to make a girl feel better. The tunnel finally opened into a large vault where the air was so humid and hot that their faces grew instantly moist. An eerie whine permeated the chamber, barely loud enough to hear above the pounding of her own heart, and the force grew heavy with the pain of the nearly dead. Mara followed Luke into the vault and suddenly she forgot the eerie sound, the horrible smell, even her own fiery pain. The entire chamber was lined by large hexagonal cells, some sealed with a wax cap, some containing a paralyzed chis captive curled around a garag larva. Many of the prisoners were dead and mostly devoured, with the barbed mandibles of a nearly developed larva protruding half a meter above the cell walls. Just as many remained alive, groaning weakly as larvae nod at their immobile bodies. I'm beginning to understand the Chiss point of view, Luke said. I wonder if Raynar knows about this. Maybe on some. Mara's neck prickled with cold, and she spun around to find the wrong end of an electrobolt rifle illuminated in her lamp beam. Behind it, sighting down the stock, was a blue face framed by a pair of Trilek Leku. Rather than taking half a second to ignite her lightsaber and another half a second to block, Mara pointed and released the force energy she had been using to keep herself going. Her body erupted into pain and muscle tremors, but blue lightning shot from her fingertips and blasted the rifle, driving the stock back into the Twi'lek's mangled shoulder and crackling deep into the wound. Alma cried out and let the weapon slip from her hands, then went limp and floated away into darkness. Mara felt a hint of uneasiness in Luke. What? Nothing, Luke replied. Just thinking. Luke's lightsaber crackled to life and droned past Mara's ear, blocking what sounded more like blaster fire than another electrobolt. She sensed a second attack coming and activated her own blade, sweeping it up behind Luke's to bat away another string of bolts. The blaster fire fell silent, but not before Mara could swing her helmet lamp toward its source. She glimpsed a hump-shouldered man with a half-melted face and one chitinous insect arm grafted to his shoulder. Then he slipped out of the light. Force lightning. The man's voice was raspy and sharp. We had thought Skywalker's Jedi considered themselves above that. We make exceptions, 
again, Mara sensed a certain apprehension in Luke. She ignored it and swung her helmet lamp toward the voice, and again the dark figure slipped out of the light. Especially in your case, Welk. As Mara spoke, she and Luke moved apart, positioning themselves just within each other's reach, where they could still take advantage of overlapping fields of defense. A soft flutter sounded above Mara's head. Hear that? Mara asked. What? I was afraid you didn't. Mara reached out in the force but felt only a shadowy sense of danger, so vague and ambiguous she could have been imagining it. There's something flying around over here. Welk? Luke asked. A string of blaster bolts erupted from Luke's other side, directly opposite the fluttering. He brought his lightsaber around and sent the bolts tearing back toward the source. I don't think so, Mara concluded. She brought her own blade up, slashing through the darkness above her head, finding only dank air. Another flutter sounded behind her. She spun to attack and suddenly found herself in the forced grasp of someone else, twirling across the room and accelerating. Mara reached out, searching for her attacker. She felt only the horror and anguish that permeated the entire room. Then she came to the wall, and a piercing agony blossomed low in her back. She looked down to find ten centimeters of mandible tip protruding from her abdomen, and the pain spread across her entire belly. Rod de der. The second mandible closed, driving a pair of barbs deep into the flesh above her hip. That hurts. Mara reversed her grip on her lightsaber, and a flutter arose in the darkness at her side. Suddenly the handle grew stinging cold, then the blade started to sputter, flicker, and fade. Mara attacked anyway. The blade sank two centimeters and sizzled out. The larva began to shake its head back and forth, its mandibles tearing at her inside. Mara? Luke had activated his second lightsaber, the one he had taken from Alma earlier, and was advancing on Welk, batting the dark Jedi's blaster bolts back at him. Need the spare. Fine here. Mara returned her useless weapon to its clip. Just take care of Welk. Welk broke into an evasive tumble, firing as he moved and seldom going astray. Luke deflected a chain of bolts, but finished with his blades out of position and had to somersault away. Trying. Mara drew her blaster and put a bolt into the larva's head. It shook even harder drawing an involuntary cry from her as a barb scraped something inside. She fired a second time, then heard a soft throb in front of her and brought her weapon around. The handle grew icy cold, then a depletion alarm sounded. When she squeezed the trigger, she heard only the soft pop of a gas charge moving into the excited chamber. Neat trick, Mara said to the darkness. It isn't going to save you. The air pulsed above Mara's left shoulder. She swung her helmet lamp toward the sound and, as always, saw nothing. Then a prickle of danger sense raced up her spine, and she looked in the opposite direction. Gliding out of the darkness, just at the edge of her light, was a meter-high garage with thick chitin armor and overlong mandibles. Even had she not seen the splint fuse to its broken leg, Mara would have known that this was the assassin she had fought on Asus. Much smaller than a typical Garag warrior, it was coming at her in a fury, mandibles clacking, thorax drumming, crooked proboscis foaming. Mara finally hesitated, confused, unsure, angry. The nest would be reaching out to Ben now, using the force to share all that was happening here, to make him feel every Garag death. A puff of dank air brushed Mara's face. Her helmet grew biting cold and the lamp dimmed to darkness, then a soft foot sounded from the direction of the approaching assassin bug. A glob of caustic-smelling acid hit the front of her ragged vac suit, and her flesh erupted with a new kind of burning. Ben would have to get over it. Opening herself completely to the force, 
Using her resolve to draw it in, Mara lifted her hand toward the assassin bug and squeezed. It popped with a long, sharp crackle and the rotten smell of dissipating methane. A pair of blue bolts flashed up from Welk's direction and streaked into the smashed body. Mara had just enough time to push out with the force and create a small bubble of protection before the assassin bug exploded. In the orange light, floating just beyond arm's reach, she glimpsed a pale oval with little to suggest a face, only a few dark areas where there might have been a mouth and nose and eyes. Mara swung her hand toward it, but the blast light faded and the apparition was gone. Luke barely felt the heat of the explosion, but the shock wave sent him cartwheeling into darkness. He kept his helmet lamp fixed on Welk's tumbling form and brought himself to a halt a few meters later. Welk slammed into a sealed cell and crashed through the wax cap. Luke force plucked the blaster from Welk's hand and started toward him. He could feel that Mara was wounded but, at the moment, no longer under attack. The best thing he could do was keep the enemy too busy to worry about her, at least until Han and Leia arrived with the rest of the team. Luke was still five meters away when Welk pulled his twisted body free of the cell. His black armor was smeared in yellow pulp, and the lipless slash of his mouth hung agape with what was either fear or disdain. Luke reactivated his lightsabers. The soft whiffle of wings sounded to his right, and the air suddenly grew as thick and heavy as water. He twisted toward the noise, but his body seemed to move in slow motion and by the time he turned there was nothing to see but darkness. A crimson blade ignited a few meters ahead, and Luke knew Welk was coming. He brought his lightsabers around in a cross guard and looked back toward the attack. Again, his actions seemed to take forever, and the glow of the crimson blade drew within striking range long before Luke was ready to defend. The fight was about to get interesting. Luke extended himself toward the glow, slamming his force presence into Welk. It was like trying to push Koribu out of orbit. Welk continued to come, bringing his blade around in a brazen full-reach attack. Luke didn't even try to block. The Dark Jedi was strong, even stronger than Saba had said, but great strength was like great power. It seduced those who had it lulled them into relying on might when other tools were better. Luke reversed tactics, pulling his attacker toward him. Welk tumbled forward, his hoarse voice croaking in alarm, his scarred face dropping toward Alma's silver blade. The low throb of wings sounded overhead, and the hilt of Alma's lightsaber grew painfully cold as the thing causing the sound. He wondered if that could be Lomi Pielo, drained the energy from its power cell. The blade sputtered and died. Welk slammed into Luke headfirst, sending them both into an uncontrolled tumble. The Dark Jedi's crimson blade flashed past Luke's leg and burned a gouge into his shin, sending a fiery shaft of pain straight to the heart. Luke righted himself, but he was still moving in slow motion, and Welk was already coming again. Luke reached out in the force, bringing his thumb and forefinger together. Welk's lipless mouth fell open. Dire gurgling sounds began to rise from his throat, and then Luke remembered Alma's sacrifice of the Mambrosia giver. Had he grown that casual about killing? So accustomed to the power he wielded that he would use it to kill when he had other means to defend himself? Luke opened his fingers and released Welk. The dark Jedi's breathing returned to normal, but he stopped where he was rubbing his throat and eyeing Luke in suspicion. Skywalker Mara's voice was a screech in the force, but when she spoke aloud, it sounded weak and pained. Are you crazy? Finish him. Not that way, Luke answered. The force may have no light or dark side, but we do. We must choose. Right now? Mara asked. Especially now. Luke caught Welk's gaze then, still moving slowly, raised his remaining lightsaber to high guard. Are you ready, son? We are not your son! 
The dark Jedi sailed forward, bristling at the condescension, striking at the flank Luke had left open. Moving even slower than was necessary, Luke pulled his guard around and rotated away. A soft flutter sounded behind him. The hilt of his lightsaber grew cold, as Almaz had a moment earlier, and the blade died. By then Luke had already released the weapon and accelerated to his best speed, slipping forward even as he twisted away from the attack. The sudden speed change caught Welk by surprise. Luke trapped the Dark Jedi's wrist in an X-block and continued to pivot smoothly away, forcing those hands into a tight circle and driving the lightsaber back up into Welk's stomach in one not-so-fast motion. Welk let out a blood-curdling scream and tried to deactivate the lightsaber, but Luke had his hand over the switch and now he was the strong one. He wrenched the handle free and ripped the blade out the Dark Jedi's side, then turned to face the attack he felt certain would be coming from Lomi Pielo, and went spinning out of control when the air suddenly grew light and thin again, and he could once more move at normal speed. Luke saw the wall flashing past, coming up fast, barbed mandibles protruding where he was about to hit. He deactivated the lightsaber, then reached out in the force and jerked the larva from its cell slammed into it in the dare, and tumbled off in a new direction. This time he managed to stop himself before he hit another wall. He reignited Welk's lightsaber and spun around with the crimson blade swinging, then felt a jolt of alarm and sensed Mara approaching out of the darkness. Hey, it's me! Mara used the force to push the weapon down. Don't you recognize your own wife anymore? Luke deactivated the blade. Sorry. Being careful to keep the beam below her chin so he didn't blind her, Luke turned his helmet lamp in Mara's direction. Her force aura had subsided to a mere blush, and the charred circles on her body reminded him of how much his own electrobolt wounds ached. But it was the jagged, triangular puncture wound in her right abdomen that he found most alarming. About the size of three fingers bunched together, it was smeared with grime and oozing dark blood. How are you feeling? About as good as I look. As Mara spoke, her eyes were searching the darkness around them. But I'll last until we can find Alma. Any idea where she's? A series of dull thuds reverberated through the chamber, followed by the fading light and dying crackle of the thermal detonators that had just discharged inside a wall across the chamber. An instant later, a pair of Hans YVH bug cruncher droids rode into the chamber on the blue-white tails of their propulsion thrusters and quickly swung toward the Skywalkers. Remain calm! One ordered in its ultra-deep, ultra-male voice. Remain stationary! Help is coming. 41. The bolt burns had been smeared with bacta salve, the puncture wounds were covered with acta bandages on both sides, and there was enough stericlean in the air to disinfect half the nest. All that could be done in the field, Leia had done, and still she did not like how her sister-in-law looked. Mara had an ashy complexion and a hint of blue in her lips, and her eyes were so sunken they looked like crash craters. We'll get you to the Falcon soon. Leia said. They were back in the Membrosia chamber, where the worst of the battle had taken place, waiting for a pair of fresh vac suits for Mara and Luke. Bug 4 should be returning any time now. No hurry. Mara squeezed Leia's hand. I've been hit worse than this. It's not you she's worried about, Han said. If I don't get out of this place soon... Han let his sentence trail off, and Leia turned to find him shining his helmet lamp into the haze-filled darkness. The beam extended only about ten meters before terminating in a wall of floating garage corpses. What, Han? I don't know. Han pointed into the carnage, then swung his helmet lamp away to reveal a faint golden glow snaking through the corpses and floating blood globules. Trouble, maybe. Leia reached out in the force and felt a swarm of Killix approaching in the company of three joiners. It's Jaina and Zek, she said. 
with Raynar. Like I said, Han muttered. Trouble. The golden glow resolved itself into a line of shine balls being carried by a long column of Killix and Chitinous pressure suits of many different configurations. At the head of the procession came the hulking form of Raina Thull, his vac suit helmet tucked under one arm, his scarf-frozen face red with fury. Half a meter behind, Jaina and Zek followed, looking more nervous than angry. Leia waited as they approached, then bowed to Raynar. Yunathal, I'm sorry we must meet. So are we, Raynar said. The battle-pitted form of Bug-4 drifted out from among the mass of Yunu following him. The droid's photoreceptors were dark, the seams of his body shell were smeared with soot, and he was surrounded by the acrid stink of scorched circuits. Your droid murdered Yunu. Giving Leia no chance to respond, Raynar floated around her to the sides of Luke and Mara, and several hand-sized killick healers poked their tiny heads up past the collar of his pressure suit. Leia started to go after him, but was stopped by a gentle force tug. Wait with us, Jaina said from behind Leia. Trying to explain now will only make Yunu angrier. Thank you for the advice. Leia turned to face Jaina and caught the flash of several tiny eyes peering out of her collar, too. Looks crowded in there. Jaina stared into Leia's eyes. Not really. It grows on you, Sex said. He reached over and rubbed the backs of his fingers down Jaina's cheek. To tell the truth, we kind of like it, Jaina added. Oh, Leia said. I would have thought all that creeping inside your suit would feel, um, uncomfortable. Jaina and Zek shook their heads in unison. Not at all, Jaina said. It makes us feel whole, Zek added. The trio spent an awkward moment looking at each other, Jaina and Zek softly humming and clicking to themselves, Leia hiding her feelings behind a polite smile. Though she had already sensed in the Force what had become of her daughter and Zek, actually seeing them behave like joiners was almost more than she could bear. Her heart was dropping with every beat. Finally, Jaina asked, What are you doing here, mother? Little Killick healers began to crawl out of her suit and launch themselves into the darkness. We thought you were going to open negotiations with the Chiss. I had another idea. Leia said. One that might actually work. Jaina and Zek waited patiently for her to elaborate. There's no sense explaining it twice, Leia said. Let's wait until Ray or Unithal is available. A hurt look came to the faces of Jaina and Zek. Leia felt a pang of regret, but she did not apologize. Too much depended on her plan and she could not risk having the pair speak against it before she had a chance to present it to Raynar. What about Dad? Jaina asked quietly. She glanced toward Han, who remained with Luke and Mara but was looking over at his daughter and Zek. Is he still going to cut our tether for staying? It may take some time for your father to accept this, Leia said. He still has nightmares about whatever happened to him after that misunderstanding with the Chimerians. We're not Chimerians, Jaina objected. Zek absent-mindedly rubbed his forearm along the back of her neck, and Han made a sour face and looked away. We're still his daughter. Just give your father some time, Leia said. She did not know how to explain, without offending Jaina and Zek, what she knew in her heart that Han was not as disappointed with Jaina as he was angry in himself, that he blamed himself for not protecting her from what she had become. This is going to be hard for him. It will be hard on us all, we think, Sex said. Raynar slipped away from Luke and Mara, who were now crawling with Killick healers, and returned to Leia. He fixed his gaze on her, and suddenly her vision darkened around the edges. His blue eyes seemed the only lights in the chamber, and she felt an enormous, murky presence pressing down on her inside. Now you can explain this slaughter, Princess Leia, 
Rainer said. Why did the Jedi kill all these kind? Quite simply, we had no choice, Leia said. They were attacking Luke and Mara. This drew a round of suit-muffled chest pulsing from the entourage of Yuna. Strange, Raynor said. This does not look like the Skywalker's nest. Are you sure they were not the ones attacking? It's complicated. Leia started to suggest they come back to that in a moment, but the presence in her chest grew heavy, and she found herself explaining more about the mission than might have been wise. This nest was drawing the colony into a devastating war. We hoped to undermine their influence so you would consider our peace plan. Han's jaw fell. Leia! How about a little tact? We prefer her candor, Reyna growled. His burning eyes continued to hold Leia's gaze. But this slaughter was pointless. Eliminating this nest can only turn us against your plan. Unfortunately, we had no choice. By the sound of Luke's voice, Leia remained unable to see anything but Raynar's eyes. He was floating over to insert himself into the conversation. They were trying to eliminate us. It was self-defense. Self-defense? Raynar sounded outraged. The kind fight only when they are attacked. Yeah, Han said. You're a lot like the Chiss that way. Raynar turned to glare at Han. Leia's vision returned to normal, and she found Han sneering confidently back at Raynar, looking as though he were staring down an Aqualish bar brawler instead of the leader of an interstellar civilization. Leia slipped between the two. Let me show you something. She addressed herself not only to Raynar, but to the entire Yunu entourage. You need to understand something about this nest, and then we can talk about whether the colony truly wants peace. Without waiting for permission, Leia turned toward the ceiling, leading Raynar, Han, and the unit through the body-filled darkness toward the nursery entrance. Luke and Mara, who had stopped using the Force to compensate for their injuries, remained behind at the insistence of the Killick healers, and Jaina and Zek stayed with them. Leia did not understand why, but there was a lot about her daughter and Zek that she did not understand right now. After a few moments, they reached the cave that Bugs 2 and 3 had blasted through the ceiling, and the smell of decay grew sickening. KYP and the other masters were inside the nursery gathering Chiss survivors and searching for Lomi Pielo, so Leia opened herself to the battle mouth and urged them to have the Bug Crunchers stand down. Bug Crunchers? Raynar said. Leia was a little surprised, since she could not sense Raynar's presence in the meld, but Han was nonchalant. No offense. We had to call him something. Halfway through the cave, they found Saba waiting. Her vac suit and face scales were smeared with wax and offal from pulling chiss out of larval cells, and the stench rising off her was enough to send a rustle of revulsion through the Yunu. Saba allowed Raynar and the entourage to stare at her for a moment then said, This one is sorry for her smell. The work in here is messy. What is your work? Raynar asked. Saba looked to Leia before answering. It will be better if we just show you, Leia said, directing her comment more to Saba than Raynar. Any sign of Alma yet? None, Saba said. Perhaps she was disintegrated in a detonator explosion. Maybe. Having seen for herself how acute the Twi'lek's danger sense was, Leia had her doubts. What about Lomi Piello? Saba turned her palms up. Vanished. Lomi Piello is dead, Rayner said as if by rote. She died in the crash. Saba glanced his way gnashing her fangs, then looked back to Leia. You are sure about this? Leia nodded. Yuna needs to see this. Silently, she added that it was still the only way to break the dark nest's hold on the colony. Saba shrugged, then led Leia and the others into the darkness of the nursery. 
The air was hot and dank and so filled with the stench of decay that Raynar gulped and the unit rumbled their thoraxes. KYP and the rest of the rescue team were working along the far side of the chamber, the beams of their helmet lamps sweeping across the wall but revealing little more than the hexagonal pattern of the nursery cells. A few meters in, Leia stopped and swung her helmet lamp toward the nearest wall. The beam illuminated the half-devoured corpse of a Chiss prisoner, still curled around a squirming garag larva. Raynor gasped, and the nearest unit brought their mandibles together in shock. Han shined his helmet lamp on a second cell, and Saba a third. Both of those cells also contained the bodies of Chiss captives. What is this? Raynar demanded. Looks pretty clear to me, Han said. As more unit poured into the room with their shine balls, the chamber brightened rapidly, and the true extent of the horror grew more apparent. Kind of makes a fella see how the Chiss might have a point, doesn't it? Raynar whirled on Han. You think we did this? Not you, exactly, Leia said, silently cursing Han's biting humor. The Dark Nest did it. The Garag. Garag? Raynar's gaze drifted back to the gruesome sight in the cells. What is this Dark Nest? This. Saba waved her arm at the murk around them. The nest that keeps attacking us. The one that has been feeding on Chish Captives. The one that made you build more nests at Koribu. Raynar glowered at the Barable. The nests do not lead Yunu. Yunu leads the nests. Really? Leia cocked her brow. Then all this is Yunu's doing? No. Raynar's voice grew sharp. When his entourage began to clack and drum, he added, This is not even a colony nest. We do not have a nest on KR. Han looked around pointedly. Funny. Looks a lot like that nursery on Julio, except for all the Chiss captives, of course. Actually, it can be a colony nest, Leia said to Raynar. And you wouldn't remember. This drew an even louder protest from the Kilix, but Leia spoke over it. Silgal thinks the Dark Nest serves as a sort of unconscious for the colony's collective mind. It would be able to influence the kind without you knowing, just as the unconscious mind of most species influences their behavior. Impossible, Raynor said far too quickly. There are no Garag in the kind. How could the Nest influence us? The same way you influenced Jaina and the others when you called them to help the colony, Leia replied. Through the Force. Raynar's voice grew soft. Through the Force. That's right, Leia said. The same way you convinced Tessar to visit Borner in trading. The same way you convinced Tahiri and Tekli to argue the colony's case to the Jedi Order. Raynar's eyes flared in understanding but Yuna's protest rose to a crescendo. He closed his eyes as though trying to concentrate, but Leia could see in the twitching muscles of his face some internal struggle, some insect argument she would never understand. She began to have the unpleasant feeling she was attempting the impossible. Leia glanced over at Saba and mouthed Welk's name. The Barabelle's eyes narrowed, but she nodded and quickly slipped away. At last, the insect din quieted, and Raynar opened his eyes. Even if you are right about the dark nest, conquering is not our way, he said. The kind seek only to live in harmony with the song of the universe. Yeah, well, you don't have to conquer something to take it over, Han said. And the dark nest had more in it than just Killix. I assume you remember the dark Jedi, Leia pressed. Raynar fought them as a young man at Yavin 4. And Welk and Lomi PLO abandoned the strike team on Banu Ras. Raynar studied her for a moment, then nodded. We remember. And you think? He let the sentence trail off as the Yuna began to rustle and clack. Then his voice grew stubborn again. But you must be wrong. Welk and Lomi PLO died in the crash. 
Then who is this? Saba asked. She emerged from shadows dragging Welk's badly slashed body. He was still dressed in his chitin and plastoid armor, with a new insect arm grafted to his shoulder. His face looked even less human than Raynar's, but he clearly wasn't Chiss. Saba sent the corpse gliding toward Raynar's chest. Han waited until the thing hit, then said, He's got some pretty bad burn scars, but that tells you something right there. Once it was in front of him, Raynar seemed riveted by the corpse, his blue eyes slowly sliding back and forth beneath his scarred brow, his breath coming in ever agate rasps. Jason investigated the crash, Leia said. He saw you pull Welk and lo me out of the flames. The unit fell deathly quiet, and Raynar's gaze swung to Leia. Saw us? Through the force, she clarified. Yes, we remember. Raynar nodded and closed his eyes. He was there, on the bridge, for just a moment. You saw Jason? Han gasped. That's impossible, Leia said. He would have had to reach across time. We saw Jason. He gave us the strength to continue to pull them. Suddenly Raynar stopped and turned toward the center of the nursery. Where is Lomi? He had barely asked the question when the Yunu entourage began to disperse across the nursery, their shine balls illuminating the vault in a spray of whirling light. Where is Lomi? Raynar repeated. Relief washed over Leia like a Balian pet oil shower. She had broken through to Raynar's memory. Then you recall saving her? We remember, Raynar said. She was afraid that the Yuzen Vaughn would find us again, or that Anakin would come looking for her, or Master Skywalker. She was afraid of many things. She wanted to hide. Well, Han said, that sure confirms Silgal's theory. What theory? Raynor asked. The way Silgal sees it, Han said, when a Killick nest swallows up someone who's Force-sensitive, the nest takes on some of his personality. In your case, the Yaga absorbed the value you place on individual life, Leia said. They started to care for their feeble and provide for the starving, and it wasn't long before their success led to the creation of the Yunu. That's much how we remember it, Raynar allowed. But it has nothing to do with the Garag. You said you remember pulling Welk and Lomi Pielo out of the fire. Han pointed out. But then they just disappeared. You said Lomi was afraid and wanted to hide, Leia added. That was what Yaga absorbed from her. Isn't it possible that she also created a nest of her own, a nest hidden from everyone else? As Raynar considered this, the color seemed to drain from his face. We caused this. That's not what we're saying, Leia said. Only that the dark nest is influencing. If we saved Lomi and Welk, we are responsible. An eerie tempest of clacking and muffled booming rolled through the nursery as the Yunu again started to protest. Raynor turned from Leia and the others and slowly glided along the wall, peering into each cell he passed and shaking his head in despair. If we saved Lomi and Welk... Han caught up and took Raynor by the arm. Look, kid, you couldn't have known. Amazingly, Raynard did not send Han tumbling across the room or silence him with a gesture or even pull away. He merely continued to float along, seemingly unaware of Han at all, staring into the cells. If we saved Lomi and Welk, we did this. You should get a medal for saving them, Han said. What happened later, that's not your fault. That got Raynar's attention. He stopped and turned to Han. This is not our fault? No way, Han said. All you did was save their lives. That doesn't make you responsible for what they did later. We are not responsible. Raynar's voice was filled with relief, and Yuna's clacking died away. That's right. 
The spray of shine ball light slowly began to contract back toward Raynar, and Leia felt KYP reaching out to her, demanding an explanation, but she could not sense what he wanted explained. Maybe this is a chiss ruse, Reyna said, talking more to himself than Han now. It must have been a trick to convince the Jedi that the colony is in the wrong. Saba shined her helmet lamp into one of the cells. To this one, it looks like the trick was on the Chish. The Chish are ruthless, Raynor said. There was an ominous note of insistence to his gravelly voice. They would sacrifice a thousand of their own kind to turn the Jedi against us. That doesn't explain the Garag that attacked us on the way in, Leia said. She was alarmed by how Reyna was trying to reshape reality, by how he seemed to be searching for a story that worked. They weren't Chiss, and neither are all these larvae. Yes, it was a very insidious plan, Reyna said. The Garag must have been brain slaves. They were forced to fight and to feed on Chiss volunteers. Perhaps, Leia allowed carefully. In a human mind, she would have called Raynar's thought process a psychotic break. In the collective mind of the colony, she didn't know what to make of it. But there is another explanation. The Chiss are creating killer clones? Raynar asked. I don't think so, Leia said. The Yunu entourage began to return, many of them drawing the helpless wide-eyed forms of the Chiss survivors that the rescue team had been pulling out of the cells. KYP and the other masters were also approaching, pouring their displeasure into the battle melt. Salba reached out to them, urging them to stand by, assuring them Leia was in control. Thanks a lot, Leia thought. Do you remember what we were talking about? Leia asked, continuing to address Raynar. The Dark Nest? Of course. Our memory is excellent. Raynar's eyes turned bright and angry. Han said we were not responsible. That's right, Leia said. Her vision began to dim around the edges again, and the heavy presence she had experienced before returned to her chest. But that doesn't mean... The murky weight inside grew heavier and Leia began to understand that Raynar had been damaged as much on the inside as on the outside. Hopelessly marooned, in unimaginable anguish, dependent on a bunch of insects, the shock had just been too much. Raynar had dissociated from the situation, literally becoming Unithal so he would not recall all the terrible things that had happened to Raynar Thal. We understand what not responsible means, Raynar said. It means that just because the Dark Nest exists, we are not the ones who created it. He pointed to the nearest captive, a frightened-looking male wearing the black shreds of a CDF gunnery officer's uniform. The Chiss did. The officer's face paled to ash, and his eyes grew even wider, the only signs of fear that his paralyzed body could still exhibit. What we do not understand, Raynor said, is the purpose of this nest. An unintelligible groan rose from the Chiss's throat, so weak and low that Leia took it to be more of a pained whimper than an attempt to speak. Tell us. Raynar commanded. The officer moaned again, but the noise sounded even less like words than before. We know you are lying. Raynar's tone was ominous, and the officer's face grew white. Do not insult us. I don't think he means to. Leia said. She felt certain that the officer had not said anything at all. Raynar's shattered psyche was just imposing its own meaning on the Chiss's incoherent groans. I'm sure he doesn't even know that the Chiss created this nest. Raynar turned back to Leia. You are sure? Perhaps confident is a better word, Leia corrected. Again, the weight pressed down inside and she knew she had to tell Raynar something he wished to hear, something that would make him agree to her plan. What if the Chiss didn't even know they created the Dark Nest? How could they create the Dark Nest without knowing it? Raynar's voice was doubtful. 
We don't see how that could work. By accident, Han said, picking up on Leia's plan. That's the only way it could happen. The Chiss would never intentionally do something like this to themselves, not even to volunteers. They have too many honor codes. That's right, Leia said. The weight inside was decreasing. Chiss society is defined by war. They're always fighting against the Vagari, the SSI Rook, even each other. And the Koribin nests are filled with Chish joiners. Saba let the statement hang, leaving it to her listeners to draw their own conclusions. Under normal circumstances, it would have been perfect persuasive technique. But with Raynar, Leia did not want to take any chances. There were too many dangerous turns available to a dissociative mind especially a dissociative collective mind. Remember what Han said about Sildal's theory? Leia asked. She believes that when a killic nest absorbs a force-sensitive being, the nest mates assume a portion of that being's personality. When the Yaga absorbed you, Han added, they started to value individual life. When they absorbed Lomi Pielo and Welk, they assimilated the desire for secrecy in. We are not responsible for the dark nest. Raynar protested. Lomi Pielo and Welk died in the crash. That's right, Leia said, cringing inwardly. Welk and Lomi Pielo died in the crash. It was growing more apparent that dragging Welk and Lomi Pielo out of the burning flyer had been just too much for Raynar to bear, that whenever he remembered it, he also remembered how much he had suffered and all that he had lost, by doing it. Leia continued, But the Yago absorbed your respect for living things, and it wasn't long before their success led to the creation of the colony. That is how we remember it, Raynar agreed. But we do not see what that has to do with the dark nest. Everything. Saba waved her scaly arm at the nursery again. Look at how many Chish joiners they had. Raynar's eyes brightened with anger. The kind are not cannibals. Our nests do not feed on our own joiners. Something happened in this nest, Saba pointed out. And the Chiss are bloodthirsty warriors, Leia added. It was a wild exaggeration, but one that Raynar would be eager to believe. Really, I'm surprised this hasn't happened to the other Koriba nests. This? Raynar shook his head. This could not happen to another nest of kind. It happened here, Saba pointed out. Maybe there's some sort of balance point, Han added, feigning contemplation. When a nest gets too many chis joiners. He let the sentence trail off and turned toward Raynar, his expression growing steadily more concerned. Raynar finished the thought. It becomes a dark nest? The Yunu broke into a distressed drone, and he nodded. That could explain what happened here. The Chish are great believers in secrecy, Saba offered helpfully. Yes, Raynar spoke with an air of certainty. The kind will take no more Chis into our nests. That's one solution, Leia agreed. She caught Han's eye and they shared one of those electric moments of connection that made her wonder if he was force-sensitive after all. But what are you going to do with all your prisoners? A nervous clatter rose among the Yunu, and Raynar asked, Prisoners? Chish prisoners, Saba said. As the war spreads, you will have hundreds of thousands. Millions. Only one thing to do. Han shook his head in mock regret. Of course, that'll only make the rest of the Chiss fight that much harder. Raynar turned to glare at Han. Leia found herself holding her breath, hoping she had not made a mistake reading Raynar's warp psyche, that he had not grown ruthless enough to accept Han's suggestion. At last, Raynar said, The colony does not kill its prisoners. No? Han returned the glare for a moment, then shined his helmet lamp on a half-eaten body. 
That'll change soon enough. The Yunu entourage erupted into an angry buzz, but Raynar said nothing. Maybe it will not be so bad for the colony, Saba said. She turned to address the Yunu. Soon, all your nests will be like the Garag. The kind will become great fighters. We do not wish the kind to be great fighters, Raynor said. We have seen what happens to great fighters. Anakin was a great fighter. A pang of grief struck Leia, but she forced herself to continue. I'm sorry, Unithal. I don't see how you can avoid it. Too bad there's going to be a war, Han said. If there wasn't, the colony could set up some sort of buffer zone and keep the Chiss away from their nests. That might work, Leia said. But Koribu is too close to Chiss territory. The nests are bound to keep coming into contact with Chiss exploration and mining crews. Sooner or later, they'll reach the balance point. Koribu is too close, Saba agreed. The colony would have to move its nests. Impossible, Raynor said. It cannot be done. That's very unfortunate. Leia said this to the Yunu entourage. Because Han and I found this paradise world. Several worlds, probably, Han added. All empty, lush with foraging grounds, just waiting for a species to come along and claim them. The entourage began to rustle with interest. Tell us more. Raynor said. It's in a subsector on the edge of colony territory, Leia explained. We didn't have time to do a complete survey, but the world we visited would be perfect for the Totten Nest. There were at least two other habitable planets in the same system, with another dozen systems nearby that gave every indication of being just as profuse. We were thinking the colony would want to have a look, Han said. But if you guys aren't interested, there are still plenty of displaced species in the Galactic Alliance. We are interested, Raynor said. We always have need of new territory. Good, Leia said. I'm sure the Chiss could be persuaded to stand down long enough for you to organize a relocation. The corners of Raynor's mouth turned down. I've told you, that is impossible. There's no way to transport the Korriban nests. They are too large. Really? Han flashed a smug smile, then asked, So large they couldn't be temporarily rebuilt in the hangars and launching bays of, say, a few Hapan battle dragons? Raynar's jaw dropped. The Hapan fleet would help us escape the Chiss? Sure, why not? Han retorted. That has to be easier than defending you. And they would let us build nests in their battle dragons? This one thinks they would, Saba sissed in amusement. In fact, she is sure of it. The unit thrummed their chests and tapped their mandibles for a long time, then Raynar finally said, We understand what you are doing. You're just as bad as Jaina was. Was? Han scowled and looked back toward the other room, the one he had departed without even greeting his daughter. If you've... Relax, Han. Leia touched Jaina through the force, then said, She's fine. She's still with Luke and Mara. Of course she is, Raynor said indignantly. We meant that Jaina is no longer welcome in her nest. Han raised his brow. I've been kicked out of a few saloons in my time, but a nest? What did she do? She's too much like you, Raynor said. She is stubborn and tricky, and she cared about nothing but preventing a war. You don't say. Han smiled proudly, then asked. Does this mean she'll stop being a bug hooker? Raynor's eyes flashed in anger and Leia began to have visions of her carefully crafted peace initiative falling apart. Han, she said. Remember, Unithal hasn't agreed to our proposal yet. Well, he hasn't disagreed either. Han turned to Raynar. What's it going to be, kid? 
a nasty war in a colony full of dark nests, or a free ride to a free world. The Yunu erupted into a riot of chest drumming and antenna waving, but Han ignored them and kept his eye fixed on Raynar. The entourage kept the racket up for a few moments longer, then abruptly fell silent and began to stream out of the vault. Leia frowned. Are we to take that as a yes? Of course, Raynor said. He rubbed his arm down the antennae of a small, red-eyed killick about half the size of an Ewok, then turned and started after his nest. Wasn't it our idea? Na Maynard suppressed a shiver at the sight of the shamed one Anami leering from the doorway. Something in him shrank at the appearance of the lank creature with his misshapen head and knowing smile. Anami's grin widened. Na Maynard, distaste prickling, pushed past the shamed one and entered. The rounded resinous walls of the chamber shone with a faint luminescence, and the air bore the metallic scent of blood. In the dim light Na Maynard made out the magnificently scarred and mutilated form of Supreme Overlord Shimra, reclining on a dais of pulsing red hal polyps. Anami, the Supreme One's familiar, sank into the shadows at Shimra's feet. Na Maynard prostrated himself, all too aware of the scrutiny of Shimra's rainbow eyes. The Supreme Overlord's deep voice rolled out of the darkness. You have news of the infidels? I have, Supreme One. Stand, Executor, and enlighten me. Na Mena repressed a shiver of fear as he rose to his feet. This was Shimmer's private audience chamber, not the great reception hall, and Na Mena was absolutely alone here. He would much rather be able to hide behind his superior Yugskel and a whole deputation of intendants. Never think to lie to the Supreme One, Yugskel had warned. Na Maynard would not. He probably could not. Fortunately, he was well prepared with the latest news of the infidel's efforts against the Yuzen Vong. The enemy continued their series of raids against our territory. They dare not confront our might directly, and confine themselves to picking off isolated detachments or raiding our lines of communication. If a substantial fleet opposes them, they flee without fighting. The Supreme Overlord's head, the sum of its features barely discernible as a face with all its scars and tattoos and slashings, loomed forward in the shadowy light. Have your agents been able to inform you which of our conquests are being targeted? Na Maynard felt a cold hand run up his spine. He had seen what happened to some of those who disappointed the great Overlord Shimra, and he knew his answer would be a disappointment. Unfortunately, Supreme One, it appears that the new administration is giving the local commanders a great deal of latitude. They're choosing their own targets. Our agents on Mon Calamari have no way of knowing what objectives the individual commanders may select. There was a moment of silence. The new head of state, this infidel Cal Omis, permits his subordinates such freedom? Na Maynard bowed. So it appears, Supreme One. Then he has no true concept of subordination. His rule will not trouble us much longer. Na Maynard, who thought otherwise, chose not to dispute this analysis. The Supreme One is wise, he said instead. You must redouble your efforts to infiltrate the military and provide us with their objectives. I shall obey, Supreme One. What news of the Peace Brigade? The news is mixed. The collaborationist Peace Brigade government had been established on Ilesia, and had grown sufficiently large and diverse to have divided into squabbling factions, all of which competed ferociously in groveling to the Yuzen Vong. None of this cringing actually aided the creation of the Peace Brigade army and fleet, which, when built up to strength and trained, were to act as auxiliaries to the Yuzen Vong. Perhaps it should be admitted that infidels so disposed as to join an organization called the Peace Brigade may not be temperamentally inclined toward war, Na Mena said. They need a leader to exact obedience, Shimra concluded. That role was to be assigned to the infidel Viki Shesh, Supreme One, Na Mena said. 
Another leader shall be assigned, Shimra said. His eyes shimmered from blue to green to yellow. We should choose someone who has nothing to do with these factions. Someone from outside, who can impose discipline. Namainer agreed, but when he searched his mind for candidates, no names occurred to him. We are having better luck with infidel mercenaries, he said. They have made no true submission and possess no loyalty, but they are convinced they have joined the winning side and are content to obey so long as we pay them. Contemptible creatures. No wonder a galaxy that spawns such as these was given by the gods to us. Indeed, Supreme One. Shimra shifted his huge form on his dais, and one of the polyps beneath him burst under the pressure, spraying the wall with its insides. An acid reek filled the room. The other polyps at once turned on the injured creature and began to divide and devour it. Shimra ignored the clacking and slurping. Speak of our visitor from Karelia. Na Maynard bowed. He is called Thraken Salsolo. Solo? He is related to the twin Jedi? The two branches of the family are estranged, Supreme One. A thoughtful rumble came from the dais. A pity. If otherwise, we could hold him hostage and demand the twins in exchange. That is indeed a pity, Lord. Shimra waved one huge hand. Continue, Executor. Sal Solo is the leader of a large political faction on Corellia and has been elected Governor General of the Corellian sector. He says that, with our support, he can assure that the Corellian system, five planets, is detached from the infidel government. Once this is done, he can assure its neutrality, including the neutrality of the centerpoint weapon that so devastated our force at Fonder. Then, as Dictat, he will sign a treaty of friendship with us. Shimra shifted thoughtfully on the pulsing bed. The dismembered polyp twitched and fluttered as its siblings consumed it. Is this infidel trustworthy, Executor? Of course not, Supreme One. Namainer made a deprecatory gesture. But he may be useful. He gave us the location of the Jedi Academy, and that information was correct and led to our colonization of the Avon system. Corellia is a major industrial center where many weapons and enemy ships are built, and its neutrality is desirable. What is our information on the centerpoint weapon? Sal Solo did not come alone. He brought with him a supporter and companion, a human female called Darjilai Swan. While I interviewed Sal Solo, we took his companion and interrogated her. According to this person, the centerpoint weapon is not functional though efforts are being made by New Republic military forces to rehabilitate it. So this Sal Solo offers to trade us what he does not have. True. And also according to Darjilai Swan, it was Sal Solo himself who fired the center point weapon at our fleet at Fonder. Shimmer's hands, giant black to lone things, each implanted from a different carnivore, made massive fists. And this creature has the effrontery to bargain with me? Indeed, Supreme One. Anami piped up. Fetch him to our presence, Lord. And bring us all into Concord. I wish it known and made a rule. That I am not the only fool. Shimra's vast frame heaved with what might have been laughter. Yes, he said. By all means. Let us meet the master of Corellia. Na Maynard bowed in response, then hesitated. Shall I bring his guards as well? Contempt rang in Shimra's answer. I am capable of defending myself against anything this infidel should attempt. As you desire, Supreme One. Like most humans, Thraken Salsola was a thin, ill-muscled creature, with hair and beard growing white with age. His eyes widened as he entered the chamber and perceived, in the darkness, Shimmer's burning rainbow eyes. Nevertheless, he summoned a degree of swagger and approached the supreme overlord on the pulsing polyp bed. Lord Shimra, 
he said, crossed his arms, and gave an out to brief bow. Na Maynard reacted without thought. One sweep of his booted foot knocked the human's legs out from under him, and a precise shove dropped the startled Corellian onto his face. Anami giggled. Grovel before your lord! Na Maynard shouted. Grovel for your life! I come in peace, Lord Shimra! Sal Solo protested. Na Maynard drove a boot into Sal Solo's ribs. Silence! You will wait for instruction. He turned to Shimra and translated the human's words. The infidel says that he comes in peace, Supreme One. That is well. Shimra contemplated the splayed human figure for a moment. Tell the infidel that I have considered his proposals and have decided to accept. Na Maynard translated the overlord's words into basic. Sal Solo's face pressed against the floor, displayed what might have been a trace of a smile. Tell the Supreme Overlord that he is wise, he said. Na Maynard didn't bother to translate. Your opinions are of no interest to the Supreme Overlord. Sal Solo licked his lips nervously. The only way I can guarantee the success of the plan is to be given a free hand in Corellia, he said. Na Maynard translated this. Tell the infidel he misunderstands, Shimra said. Tell him that the only way the plan will succeed is if I am given a free hand in Corellia. Sal Solo looked startled as this was translated, and his lips began to frame a protest, but Shimra continued. Tell the infidel that we will give his associates in the center point party all assistance necessary to gain control of the Corellian system. He will direct them to cooperate with us. Once Centerpoint Station is taken by his people and surrendered to our forces, the Centerpoint Party will rule Corellia in a state of peace with the Yuzen Vong. Sal Solo's eyes widened as he listened to Nam Aner's lengthy translation. The executor did not bother to state the fact that, in the Yuzen Vong language, peace was the same word as submission. Sal Solo would find that out in time. Sal Solo licked his lips again and said, May I stand, Executor? Na Maynard considered this. Very well, he said. But you must show complete submission to the Supreme Overlord. Sal Solo rose to his feet but didn't straighten, instead maintaining a sort of half-bow toward Shimra. His eyes ticked back and forth, as if he were mentally reading a speech before giving it, and then he said, Supreme One, I beg permission to explain the situation on Corellia in more detail. Permission was given. Sal Solo spoke about the complex political relations at Corellia, the center point party's desire to cast off the new republic. As he spoke he seemed to grow in confidence, and he paced back and forth, occasionally raising his eyes to shimmer to see if the supreme overlord was following his argument. Nam Aner translated as well as he could. Anami, from his posture at Shimmer's feet, watched with his upper lip curled back and one misshapen fawn exposed. I shall have to return to Corellia immediately in order to undertake the Supreme One's plan, Sal Solo said. And regretfully I must warn that it will be difficult to gain cooperation once it is known that the Yuzen Vong plan to seize the center point weapon after we evict the New Republic military. The answer to that difficulty is a simple one. Shimra said to Na Maynard. Do not tell your associates that the Yuzen Vong are destined to control the weapon. Sal Solo hesitated only a fraction of a second before he bowed. It shall be as the Supreme Overlord desires, he said. Shimra gave an appreciative growl, then turned to Na Maynard. Is the infidel lying? He said. Of course, Supreme One, Na Maynard said. He will never voluntarily relinquish a weapon as powerful as the center point device. Then tell the infidel this, Shimra said. It will not be necessary for him to return to Corellia. He will simply inform us which of his center point party associates we should contact in order to deliver his orders and our assistance. 
Tell the infidel that I have a much more important duty for him to perform. Tell him that I have just appointed him president of Ilesia and commander-in-chief of the Peace Brigade. Na Mena was struck with admiration. Now that is truly inventive vengeance, he thought. Thraken Salsolo had destroyed thousands of Yuzen Vong warriors at Fonder, and now he would be publicly linked with the Yuzen Vong, allied government. His reputation would be destroyed. He would be at the mercy of those whose warriors he had killed. Sal Solo listened to the translation in horrified silence. His eyes ticked back and forth again, and then he said, Please tell the Supreme Overlord that I am deeply honored by an appointment to this position of trust, but because this would make it impossible for his plans for Corellia to be realized, I regret that I must decline the appointment. Perhaps the Supreme Overlord doesn't realize that the Peace Brigade is not admired by all Corellians, and that anyone identified as Peace Brigade wouldn't be able to command the respect necessary to win power in Corellia. It is, furthermore, absolutely necessary that I be in Corellia to coordinate the Centerpoint Party, and... Sal Solo went on at some length, long enough so that Na Maynard began to feel toward him a thorough contempt. Sal Solo, convinced of his powers to charm others, thought that once he could get in the same room with Shimra, he could talk to him, one politician to another, and convince him of the rightness of his schemes. As if he could lobby the supreme overlord of the Yuzen Vong the same way as he might lobby some miserable senator from his homeworld. Executor, Shimra said conversationally, as Sal Solo continued to speak, Is there a place where one might strike a human in order to cause a mobilizing pain? Na Maynard considered the request. There are organs known as kidneys, lord. One on either side of the lower back, just above the hips. A strike that causes considerable anguish, often so severe that the victim is unable to cry out. Or so I am given to understand. Let us find out, Shimra said. He made a slight gesture, and Anami rose from his place at the foot of Shimra's dais. In the dim light Na Maynard saw, coiled in the shamed one's hand, a batron of rank, the officer's version of the amphistaff. He was shocked to discover that Shimra permitted his familiar to carry weapons. But who else would be more trustworthy? Na Mena thought. Anami must know that if Shimra is killed, his own death will surely follow. Anami stepped behind Sal Solo and flung out his lank arm. The whip-like Batron froze into its solid form, now a lean staff, and Anami with a single efficient swing slashed the weapon into Sal Solo's left kidney. The human opened his mouth in a silent scream and fell like a bundle of sticks, hands scrabbling at the floor. Na Maynard stepped to the helpless man, bent, and seized him by the hair. Your resignation is declined, infidel, he said. We shall see you are transported immediately to Ilesia, where you may take your place as head of the government. In the meantime, you will give us the names of your associates on Corellia, so they, too, may be given their instructions. Sal Solo's face was still distorted by an unvoiced shriek, and Na Maynard decided that his information regarding a human's vulnerable kidneys was true. Nod your head if you understand, infidel, Na Maynard said. Sal Solo nodded. Na Maynard turned to Shimra. Does the Supreme One have any further instructions for his servants? He asked. Yes, Shimra said. Instruct that humans guards well. I shall, Lord. Na Maynard prostrated himself beside Sal Solo's shuddering body, and then he and Anami carried Thrak and Sal Solo to his guards, who managed to stand the man upright. I believe I address you as president from this point, Na Mena said. Sal Solo's lips moved, but again he seemed unable to utter a sound. By the way, Your Excellency, Na Mena continued, I regret to say that your companion Darjilai Swan died while furnishing the Yuzen Vong information. Is there anything you wish done with the body? Sal Solo again voiced no opinion. So Na Mena ordered the body destroyed and went about his business. 
The pale form of the cruiser Rauras floated in brilliant contrast to the green jungles of Kashyyyk below. The immaculate white paint of its hull proof that the assault cruiser served as the flagship of a fleet admiral and was maintained to the standard that befit his rank. Around the cruiser were grouped the elements of an entire fleet. Frigates, cruisers, star destroyers, tenders, hospital ships, support vessels, and flights of starfighters on patrol, all formed and ready for their next excursion into Yuzenvong, controlled space. Jason Solo watched the swarming fleet elements through the shuttle's forward viewport. The outlines of the warships seemed too hard somehow, too defined, a little alien, lacking the softer outlines of the organic life forms he had grown accustomed to while a prisoner of the Yuzenvong. Bets anyone? came his sister's voice. Where's the next raid? Hut space? Duro? Yavin? I'd like to see Yavin again, Jason said. Not once you see what the Vong have done to it. He turned at the bitter tone in Jaina's voice. She stood slightly behind him, her intent gaze directed toward Ralrust. A major's insignia was pinned to the collar of her dress uniform, and a light saber hung from her belt. Yavin was our childhood, Jason thought. And the Yuzen Vong had taken that childhood away, and Yavin with it, and left Jaina a grown woman, hard and brittle and single-minded, with little patience for anything but leading her squadron against the enemy. Sword of the Jedi that's what Uncle Luke had named her at the ceremony that had raised her to the rank of Jedi Knight. A burning brand to your enemies, a brilliant fire to your friends. That's what Luke had said. I think it will be hut space myself, Jaina said. In hut space the Yuzen Vong have had their own way for too long. Yours is a restless life, and never shall you know peace, though you shall be blessed for the peace that you bring to others. Luke had said that as well. Jason felt an urge to comfort his sister, and he put an arm around her shoulders. She didn't reject the touch, but she didn't accept it either. He felt as if his arm were draped around a form made of hard and steel. It didn't matter, Jason thought, if she accepted or rejected his help. He would make his aid available whether she wanted it or not. Luke had offered him a choice of assignments, and he had chosen the one that would place him near Jaina. When Anakin had died, and Jason had at the same time been made a prisoner of the Yuzen Vong, Jaina had allowed herself to be overcome by despair. The dark side had claimed her, and though she had fought her way out of that abyss, she was still more fragile than Jason would have liked. She had grown fey, haunted by death by the memories of Chewbacca and Anakin and Annie Capstan and all the many thousands who had died. To his horror Jaina had told him that she didn't expect to survive the war. It wasn't despair, she insisted. She'd beaten despair when she conquered the dark side. It was just a realistic appraisal of the odds. Jason had wanted to protest that if you expect death, you won't fight for life and so he volunteered for duty with the fleet at Kashyyyk, determined that if Jaina wouldn't fight her utmost to preserve her life, he would fight that battle on her behalf. I think Yavin is a good bet for the next strike, another voice said. We've had squadrons clearing Yuzen Vong raiders off the Hidian Way, as if they're preparing a route for us. We might soon find ourselves moving in that direction. Corin Horn stepped to the viewport. The rogue squadron commander wore a battered colonel's uniform that dated from the wars against the Empire. Yavin, he said. Bimiel, Dathomir, somewhere out there. A polite hissing signaled the disagreement. We forget the enemy are behind you, Z, hissed Saba Sebatine. If we take Bimisari and Kessel, the enemy will be cut in two. That would bring on a major battle, Corin said. We don't have the strength to fight one. Yet, Jaina said, and through their twin bond Jason felt the fierce power of her calculation. She had probably reckoned to the day when the New Republic would have the power to shift to the offensive, and could hardly wait. 
The sword of the Jedi wanted to strike to the enemy's heart. The shuttle swept into Ralrus docking bay and settled onto its landing gear. The droid pilot, a metal head and torso wired onto the instrument console, opened the shuttle doors. Its head spun clean around on its shoulders to face them. I hope you enjoyed your ride, masters. Please watch your step as you exit. The four Jedi stepped out of the shuttle onto Admiral Crefe's pristine deck. Scores of people bustled about, rode hovercarts, or worked on starfighters. Most were furred Bathans, but among them were a fair number of humans and other species of the galaxy. Jason was suddenly conscious that he was the only person present without a military uniform. They stepped toward the bulkhead, with its open blast doors that led forward to the ship's command center. Above the open doors was a sign. How can I hurt the Vong today? This was what Admiral Crefe called his question number one, which everyone in his command was to ask her, or himself, every day. In a few moments, Jason thought he'd hear an answer to that question. Jason craned his head as he passed through the blast doors, and on the other side he saw Crefe's question number two. How can I help my own side grow stronger? The answer to that question was going to be a little harder to find. The four Jedi reported to Snade, Admiral Crefe's aide, who took them to a conference room. Jason followed the others into the room, and in the dim light he first saw the Bahan Admiral Treus Crefe, who stood out by virtue of the unusual color of his fur, the same brilliant white as Raurus's paint. As Jason's eyes adjusted to the room's darkness, he saw other military officers including Commodore Farlander, and another group of Jedi who were quartered on the cruiser. Almarar, Zek, and Tahiri Vela. Jason felt the welcoming presence of the others greeting him in the Force, and he sent his own warm reply. Greetings! Kree Fae returned the salutes of the three military Jedi, and stepped forward to clasp Jason's hand. Welcome to Raurus, young Jedi. Thank you, Admiral. Unlike other military commanders, Crefe had been happy to work with Jedi in the past, and had sent a specific request to Luke Skywalker for more Jedi warriors. I hope you'll be able to help us in this next mission, the Admiral said. That's why we're here, sir. Fine. Fine. Crefe turned to the others. Please be seated. We'll begin as soon as Master Durin joins us. Jason seated himself in an armchair next to Tahiri Vela, the soft, smooth leather embracing his body. The little blonde Jedi gave him a shy smile, her bare feet swinging clear of the carpet beneath her. How are you faring? He asked. Her wide eyes turned thoughtful as she considered the question. I'm better, she said. The meld is helping a lot. The fierce, impulsive Tahiri had loved Jason's brother Anakin and had been present at MYRKR when Anakin had met his hero's death. Devastated by Anakin's passing, her fiery character had come close to being snuffed out. She had withdrawn, and though she had continued to function as a Jedi, it was as if she were only going through the motions. Her impetuous personality had vanished into a subdued, ominously quiet young woman. It had been Saba Sebatine, the reptilian leader of the Al-Jedi Wild Knights Squadron, who had suggested that Tahiri should be sent to join Anmaro Crefe at Kashyyyk. Crefe wanted as many Jedi as possible under his command, to form a Jedi force meld in combat, all the Jedi linked together through the force and acting as one. Saba insisted that the force meld would help a wounded mind heal by drawing a Jedi in pain toward light and healing. Apparently Saba had been right. I'm glad to know you're doing better, Jason said. His own experience with the Meld on MYRKR had been more ambiguous. If it amplified Jedi abilities, it also enlarged any disharmony that existed among them. Tahiri gave Jason a quick smile and patted his arm briefly. I'm glad you're here, Jason. Thank you. 
I wanted to be here. It seemed to be where I was needed. He wanted to experience the meld again. He thought it could teach him a great deal. The doors slid open, KYP Duran entered, and at once the mood of the room seemed to shift. Some people, Jason thought, carried a kind of aura with them. If you met Silgal, you knew at once you were in the presence of a compassionate healer, and Luke Skywalker radiated authority and wisdom. When you looked at KYP Duran, you knew you were seeing an enormously powerful weapon. If only Jason didn't know how erratic that weapon had been. The dark-haired, older Jedi wore a New Republic-style uniform without any insignia, to show that he led an all-volunteer squadron that fought alongside the military forces but was not formally a part of them. KYP and his unit, the Dozen, had always gone their own way. They flew with Kreefe not because they were under orders, but because they chose to. KYP and the Admiral exchanged salutes. Sorry I'm late, Admiral, KYP said. He showed the data pad he carried in one hand. I was getting the latest intelligence reports. And, uh, he hesitated. Some of the data were kind of interesting. Very good, Master Durin. Kreefe turned to the others. Master Durin has submitted a plan for action against the enemy. As it's fully in line with our operational goals as established by Admirals Sav and Akbar, I've given it my tentative approval. I thought I would place it before my senior commanders, and you squadron commanders, to see if you might have anything to add. Jason looked at Tahiri, startled. She was a squadron commander? Her feet would barely reach the foot controls in a starfighter cockpit. And then, as what he'd heard struck home, he exchanged a quick glance with his sister. KYP Duran's plans, in the past, had been aggressive in the extreme. At Serpital he tricked Jaina and the New Republic military into destroying a Yuzen Vong ship womb thus stranding untold numbers of Yuzen Vong in intergalactic space and dooming them to a cold, lingering death. KYP was said to have changed in the months since then, and had been appointed to the High Council that advised the Chief of State and oversaw Jedi activities. But Jason was prepared to examine carefully any plan put forward by KYP Duran before he could bring himself to approve it. Kreefe surrendered his place at the head of the room and seated himself on a throne-like armchair. KYP nodded to the admiral, then swept the others with his dark eyes. Jason sensed KYP's firmness of purpose, his conviction. He also thought that it was a good idea to be wary of KYP's conviction. When the Vong struck at us, KYP said, their way had been prepared for them. They had agents already in place, both disguised Yuzen Vong and traitors like Viki Shesh. And after our first encounters with the Yuzen Vong, the enemy found there were tens of thousands of people who were willing to collaborate with them in attacking and enslaving their fellow galactic citizens. He gave a shrug. I'm not willing to speculate why the Peace Brigade and their ilk chose to work with the invaders. Maybe some are simply cowards, maybe some were bought, maybe some were given no choice. I suppose most of them are opportunists who think they're on the winning side. But I know this, up until now there's been no real penalty for being willing to betray the New Republic and work with the invaders. The Amber Room lights glowed in KYP's eyes. I propose we inflict a penalty, he said firmly. I propose that we strike the Peace Brigade right in the center of their power. I say we raid Alesia, their capital, destroy the collaborationist government, and show everyone in the galaxy that there is a penalty for collaboration with the Yuzen Vong, and that the penalty is a dire one. There was a moment of silence, and Jason again turned to Jaina. You were right, he thought. Hut space, after all. Corin Horn raised a hand. What kind of opposition might we expect? KYP pressed the data pad in his hand, 
and a number of surreptitiously taken holos were projected on the wall behind him. We have no permanent intelligence presence on Ilesia, he admitted, but Ilesia's most profitable export is Glitterstem Spice, and a number of New Republic agents have scouted the planet while posing as crew from the merchant ships. They report few Yuzen Vong warriors. Most of the Vong on the ground seem to be members of the intendant class, who help the Peace Brigade run their government. There haven't been any Yuzen Vong fleets in orbit since the original conquest, though sometimes Vong fleet elements, mostly coral skippers and their transports, transit the Ilesia system on their way to somewhere else. What we have instead is the Peace Brigade military itself. The Yuzen Vong are trying to build up the Brigaders as an independent government, with their own fleet. They're also using Glitterstem revenues to hire mercenaries. Here are the agents' estimates of what we might be up against. More figures flashed on the screen. Mostly starfighters, a mixed bag, KYP continued. There are a dozen or so capital ships. Intelligence thinks they were probably in dry dock in places like Jindin and Abroa Sky when the Vong captured them. The Vong then completed the repairs with slave labor and handed the ships to their allies. It looks easy, Tahiri said softly in Jason's ear. But I don't believe in easy anymore. Jason nodded. He couldn't bring himself to believe in easy either. Krife rose from his chair. Excellent, Master Durin! He boomed. I will commit fleet resources to this, including interdictor ships, enough to assure that this so-called fleet can't escape. Fifteen squadrons of starfighters. Three squadrons of capital ships. We'll outnumber the enemy three to one. He held up a white-furred hand and then drew the fingers together as if capturing an enemy fleet in his fist. And then we'll sit above the enemy and obliterate their capital from orbit. Jason felt a mental hesitation from every Jedi in the room. Even KYP Duran's face reflected uncertainty. Tahiri's voice piped up instantly. What about civilian casualties? Krife made a deprecatory gesture. The population of Ilesia is very scattered, he said. The civilians were slaves of the huts, working in glitterstem packing plants scattered over the countryside, and now they're slaves of the Vong, or of the Peace Brigade, it's hard to say which. The town the Peace Brigaders are using as their capital used to be called Colony One, but now it's Peace City, and there are few slaves there. Most of the city's inhabitants are collaborators and they're guilty by definition. KYP Duran gave a solemn glance to his data pad. The latest reports have slave barracks all over Colony 1. They're constructing palaces for the leaders of the Peace Brigade, and a building to house their Senate. He paused. And they were excavating one very large shelter, just in case of orbital bombardment. Destruction would be awfully random. Tahiri said. Krife nodded, then stepped toward her and looked at her with what seemed to be great respect. I esteem the Jedi traditions of compassion for the innocent and of precise personal combat with an enemy, he said. But my own people don't have your training. It would be too great a danger to send them to the planet to sort out the innocent from the guilty and I don't want to lose good troops in a ground fight when I could accomplish the mission from orbit in safety. Krife turned to KYP. All that shelter would require is increased firepower, and then we get all of them in one go. His eyes traveled from one Jedi to the next. Remember who we're dealing with. They destroyed entire worlds by seeding alien lifeforms from orbit. Just think what they did to Ither. What we're doing is merciful by comparison. He shook his head sadly. And those slaves would be dead anyway, within a year or two, just from overwork. Jason could see the logic in Krefe's argument, and he had to admire a powerful, 
important fleet admiral who would bother to engage in a serious debate with a 15-year-old, but he could also see the reverse of Crefe's position. Killing civilians was something the enemy did. The fact that the civilians were slaves made their deaths even more unjust. The new republic forces should be liberating the slaves, so that even if the huts returned they would have no workers for their wretched factories. Let's capture the government instead, Jason said, the idea occurring to him even as he spoke it aloud. Crefe looked at him in surprise. Jason? He said. Jason turned his face up to Crefe. If we captured the Brigaders' government and put them on trial and exiled them to some prison planet, wouldn't that be more of a propaganda coup than simply bombing them? He forced a smile. They'll all be in one shelter, right? As you say, that should make it easy. Jason has a point, KYP said, from over Crefe's shoulder. If we destroy Peace City, we make an announcement, and then it's forgotten. But if we put the traitors on trial, that would be on the hollow net for weeks. Anyone thinking of switching sides would have to think twice, and any collaborators would be shaking in their boots. Not only that, Jason said, but a team could be landed in Peace City to become our permanent intelligence presence in the enemy capital, and perhaps to organize the underground there. Crefe's long head turned from Jason to KYP and back again. He tugged at his white fur chin in thought. This requires a more elaborate mission. Perhaps you do not realize how much more elaborate. With the original plan, there's very little that can go wrong. We transit to the system, engage, win our victory, and leave. If the enemy are too strong, we run without a fight. But with Jason's idea we need transports, dropships, ground forces. If things go wrong on the ground, we'll take a lot of casualties just getting our people away. If things go wrong above the planet, the forces on the ground may be stranded there. Sir, Jaina said, I volunteer to lead the ground forces. The Sword of the Jedi, Jason thought, thrusting straight to the heart. KYP turned to Jaina his voice hesitant. I, uh... For once in his life Jason was privileged to watch KYP Duran embarrassed. I really don't think that would be a good idea, Styx. Jaina's eyes flashed, but her voice was very controlled. You don't have to be so protective of me, Master Duran, she said. Surprise rose in Jason. He sensed history here something between Jaina and KYP that he hadn't known existed. Now that's interesting. Ah, uh, that's not it, KYP said hastily. It's just that, he looked at his data pad. The latest news from Ilesia indicates that you have a personal relationship with, ah, uh, one of our potential captives. And, as Jaina's indignation increased, KYP turned to Jason as his embarrassment deepened. And Jason, too, of course. Jason, too? Jaina demanded, outraged. KYP looked at the data pad again and shrugged. The Peace Brigade just announced their new president. He's, ah, uh, your cousin Thraken. Confusion swept Jaina's face. That doesn't make any sense, Jason said immediately. Sorry, KYP said. I know he's a member of your family, but... No, Jason said. That's not it. I'm not going to defend Thraken Salsolo because he's a distant cousin. A cousin who's vicious as a slash rat and slippery as an Umgullian blob, Jaina added. Jason took a breath and continued, intent on making his point. I was only going to point out, he said that it doesn't make any sense because Thraken is a human chauvinist. He's always wanted to run Corellia so he could throw the other species out. He'd never make a deal if that meant he'd have to collaborate with an alien species. KYP looked dubious. I suppose the story could be false, he said, but it's all over the holonet, 
complete with pictures of your cousin taking his oath of office in front of the Peace Brigade Senate. Jason saw Jaina's face harden. Right, she said. Now I've got to be with the ground party. Me too, I guess, Jason said. It'll be enlightening to see Cousin Thracken again. Treus Crefe looked from Jaina to Jason and back again. I must say, he said, that the two of you belong to the most interesting family. Admiral Crefe continued his show of reluctance, but eventually he set his staff to exploring the possibility of a landing to capture the Peace Brigade leadership. By the time Jaina entered the shuttle that would take her party back to their quarters on the old dreadnought Starsider, she was already calculating her deployments for the battle. She'd leave Tessar in command of Twin Sun's squadron and take Lobaka onto the ground with her. She'd like Tessar with her, too, but a Jedi would have to stay with the squadron and keep it connected to the meld, and keep her new pilots from doing anything foolish, as well. Before the operation, she'd get her squadron as much practice as she could fit into their schedule. The military had taken half her veteran pilots to use as a cadre around which to build new squadrons, filling their slots with rookies, inexperienced pilots who needed all the drill Jaina could give them. The New Republic's industries were finally on a war footing and pouring out war material by the millions of tons. All the personnel losses the military had suffered in the war had been replaced, but with raw recruits. What had been lost was experience. Jaina was terrified of Twin Sun's squadron being committed to a major battle before her new pilots were ready. That's why she was a supporter of Crefe's current strategy of raiding the enemy only where the Yuzin Vong were vulnerable. His raids were staged only against weak targets, building morale and experience against an enemy guaranteed to lose. She could only hope the Yuzin Vong didn't move against Kashyyyk, or Karelia or Quat or Mon Calamari a place where the New Republic would have to fight. That would be a conflagration in which Twin Sun's squadron would be lucky to survive. Odd to think of Tahiri as a squadron commander. Jason's comment interrupted Jaina's thoughts. Tahiri's doing all right, Jaina said. She's not a crack pilot, though. She's more experienced than most of her pilots. Almost all of them are green and she fought well at Borlias. Crefe's given her a good executive officer to help her with organization and red tape. She smiled. Her pilots are very protective of her. They call themselves Barefoot Squadron. Jason smiled also. That's good of them. Jaina sighed. The Barefoot's real problem is the same one most of us have, too high a percentage of rookie pilots. She looked at Saba and Corin Horn. Some commanders get all the luck. Horn's mouth gave a little quirk. Saba has the true elite force here. What I wouldn't give for a roster made up of Jedi. Saba's eyes gave a reptilian glimmer, and her tail twitched. A pity you humans lack the advantage of Hatchmites. Horn raised an eyebrow. Hatching Jedi. Now that's an interesting idea. Saba hissed amusement. I can testify that it works. I hope you enjoyed your ride, masters. The head of the droid pilot spun on its neck. Please watch your step as you exit. A few minutes later, after they'd separated from their companions and begun walking toward their quarters along one of Starsiders avenues, Jaina turned to Jason. Prefay will give you a squadron she said. I'm surprised he hasn't asked you already. I don't want one. Why not? Jaina asked, more snappishly than she intended. Jason had always been on a quest for the deeper meaning of things, and that meant that occasionally he'd give something up just to find out what it meant. For a while he'd given up being a warrior, and he'd given up use of the Force, and for all intents and purposes given up being a Jedi. Now he was giving up being a pilot? The one thing he hadn't given up was being exasperating. I can pilot and fight well enough, Jason said. 
but I'm rusty on military procedure and calm protocols and tactics. I'd rather fly for a while as an ordinary pilot before I'm given responsibility over eleven other lives. Oh, Jaina was abashed. You could fly with Tahiri then. Another Jedi in her squadron would be a boon to her. But not this next mission, Jason said. Not Ilesia. I want to fly with you, since we're both going on the landing party. Jaina nodded. That makes sense, she said. We'll find a slot for you. Jason seemed uneasy. What do you think about KYP Duran's plan? He asked. Do you see a secret agenda here? I think KYP's past that sort of thing. It's your plan that worries me. Jason was taken aback. To capture the Brigada leadership? Why? Krefe was right when he said there was a lot that could go wrong. We don't have enough data on Ilesia to make certain the landings will go as planned. But you agreed to join the ground party. Jaina sighed. Yes. But now I wonder if we ought to leave Ilesia alone until we have a more seasoned force and better intelligence. Jason had no answer to this, so they plodded up the corridor without speaking, stepping carefully past the droid polishing the deck. The scent of polish wafted after them. Then Jason broke the silence. What's with you and KYP Duran? I sensed something a little out there. Jaina felt herself flush. KYP's been feeling a little sentimental toward me lately. Jason looked at her in solemn surprise. It was that solemnity, Jaina decided, that she disliked most about him. He's a little old for you, don't you think? Jason asked. Solemnly. Jaina tried to throttle her annoyance at this line of questioning. I'm grateful to KYP for helping me come back from the dark side, she said. But with me, it's gratitude. With KYP, she hesitated. I'd rather not go into it. Anyway, it's over now. Jason nodded. Solemnly. Jaina came to her cabin door and put her hand on the latch. Good, Jason said. Because you've been conquering a bewildering number of hearts while I was away. First Baron Fell's son, and now the most unpredictable Jedi in the Order. Supremely irritated, Jaina opened the cabin door, stepped inside, and in the darkness of the cabin was seized by a pair of arms. Pressure was applied in an expert way to her elbow joints, and she was whirled around. A familiar scent, a spicy aroma from the unknown regions, filled her senses, and a hungry mouth descended on hers. A moment later, and the length of that moment was something she would not forgive herself, it occurred to her to resist. Her arms were securely pinned, so she summoned the force and flung her assailant across the room. There was a crash and items tumbled off a shelf. Jaina took a step to the door and waved on the lights. Jagged fell lay sprawled across her bed. He touched the back of his head gingerly. Couldn't you just have slapped me? He asked. What are you doing here? Conducting an experiment. A what? Furious. His brilliant blue eyes rose to meet hers. I detected a degree of ambiguity in your last few messages, he said. I could no longer tell what your feelings toward me might be, so I thought an experiment was in order. I decided to place you in a situation that wasn't the least bit ambiguous, and see how you reacted. An insufferable smile touched the corners of his mouth. And the experiment was a success. Right. You got thrown into the wall. But before you remembered to be outraged, there was a moment that was worth all the pain. His eyes turned to the door. Hello there, galactic hero. Your mother told me you'd escaped. She mentioned she'd met you. Jason, in the doorway, turned his oldish expression to Jaina. 
Sis, do you need rescuing? Get out of here, Jaina said. Right. He turned back to Jagged Phil. Nice seeing you again, Jag. Give my regards to the folks, Jag said, and sketched a salute near his scarred forehead. The door slid shut behind Jason. Jag looked at Jaina and removed from his lap some of the objects that had fallen from her shelf. May I stand up? He said. Or would you just knock me down again? Try it and see. Jag elected to remain seated. Jaina folded her arms and leaned against the wall as far from Jag as the small cabin would permit. Last I heard you were clearing Vong off the Hidian Way, she said. He nodded. That's where I met your parents. It's important work. If the roots from the rim to what's left of the core were broken, the new republic would be broken into, well, into even smaller fragments than it is now. Thanks for the lecture. I never would have guessed any of that in a million years. She frowned down at him. So you left this important work in order to sneak into my cabin and conduct your experiment? No, that was by way of a bonus. Jag swept a hand over his dark short-cropped hair. We're here for routine maintenance. Since my squadron flies chis cloak raft that aren't in the New Republic inventory, it's difficult to find maintenance facilities geared to our requirements. Fortunately, Admiral Crefe's star destroyers have all the equipment necessary to maintain Sinar Fleet System's TIE Fighter Command pods, and their machine shops should be able to create anything we need for our Chiss Wing pylons. He smiled up at her. A lucky coincidence, don't you think? Jaina felt herself softening. I've got six rookie pilots, she said. And there's an operation coming up. He gave her an inquiring look. You weren't planning on taking them out on an exercise at this very moment, were you? I, she hesitated. No. You've got me there. But there's a ton of administrative work, and... Jaina, he said. Please allow me to observe, one officer to another, that it is not necessary to do all the work yourself. You absolutely must learn to delegate. You have two capable, veteran lieutenants in Lobaca and Tessar Sebatine, and not only will it aid you if you share the work with them, it will aid their development as officers. Jaina permitted herself a thin smile. So it's to the benefit of my officers and pilots to spend the evening in my cabin alone with you. He nodded. Precisely. Do you play Sabak? Jag was surprised. Yes. Of course. Let's have a game, then. There's a very nice sabac table in the wardroom. He looked at her mutely. She brought in her smile and said, I played your little game, here in the darkened cabin. Now you can play mine. Jag sighed heavily, then rose and stood by the door. As she walked past him to open the door, he clasped his hands behind his back. I should point out, he said, that if you chose to kiss me at this moment, I would be absolutely powerless to prevent you. She regarded him from close range, then pressed her lips to his, allowed them to linger warmly for the space of three heartbeats. After which she opened the door and led him to the wardroom, where she skinned him at the sabac table leaving him with barely enough credits to buy a glass of Yuri juice. Her father, Jaina thought, would have been proud. Jag contemplated the ruin of his fortunes with a slight frown. It seems I've paid heavily for that stolen kiss, he said. Yes. But you've also paid in advance for others. Jag raised his scarred eyebrow. That's a good thing to know. When might I collect? As soon as we can find a suitably private place. Ah, he seemed cheered. Would it be precipitate to suggest that we go immediately? Not at all. She rose from the table. Just one thing. 
he gained his feet and straightened his impossibly neat black uniform. What's that? I think you're right about my not doing all the work. I intend to delegate a fair share to you. Jag nodded. Very good, Major. I hope this will contribute to your development as an officer. Oh, he followed her out of the wardroom. I'm sure that it will. Thrak and Salsolo looked out his office viewport at the squalid mess that was Peace City. Half-completed construction covered with scaffolding, muck-filled holes in the ground, slave barracks boiling with alien life, and he thought, and all this is mine to command. If, of course, he could avoid being murdered by one of his loyal subjects. Which was the topic of the present discussion. He turned to the black-haired woman who sat before his desk and contemplated the suitcase he'd opened on the desktop. The suitcase that contained a kilogram of glitter stim. You get one of these every week, he said. She looked at him with cobalt blue predator's eyes and flashed her prominent white teeth. And how many people do I have to kill to earn it? You don't have to kill anyone. What you have to do is keep me alive. Ah. A challenge. Daiga Marl steepled her fingertips and looked thoughtful. Then she shrugged. All right. It'll be more interesting work than all the boring assassinations the Senate has been handing me. If I ask you to kill anyone, Fracken said, I'll pay you extra. Good to know, Daga said as she closed the case and stowed it neatly under her chair. He stepped from the viewport to his desk, then grimaced at the stitch in his left side. He massaged the painful area, feeling under his thumb the scar from Anami's nasty little batron. Thraken swore that if he ever caught up with Anami, that malignant lop-headed little dwarf was going to lose a lot more than a kidney. The first thing he'd done on Ilesia was be sworn in as president and commander-in-chief of the Peace Brigade. The second thing he'd done on Ilesia was to meet with the chiefs of the Peace Brigade, an experience that left him undecided whether to laugh cry, or run in screaming terror. The Peace Brigade had originally owed its allegiance to something called the Alliance of Twelve. Maybe there had been twelve of them at one point, but there were around sixty of them now, and they called themselves the Senate. One horrified look had shown Thraken what they were, thieves, renegades, turncoats, criminals, slavers, murderers, and alien scum. The people who had betrayed their galaxy to the terror that was the Yuzen Vong, and it wasn't as if they'd done it out of conviction in the rightness of their cause. They made the huts who had built the original colony look like a congregation of saints. The huts were dead. The Yuzen Vong had made a clean sweep of the whole cast, then installed the Peace Brigade in their place without altering any of the hut's other arrangements. The flayed skin of the hut chief was still on display in front of the Palace of Peace where the Senate met, just in case anyone was tempted to grow nostalgic about the old order. Most of the population of the planet were slaves, and most of these, oddly enough, were volunteers, religious ecstatics who worked themselves to death in the Glitterstim factories in exchange for a daily blast of bliss directed at them by the Hutt's telepathic t till henchmen. The t till were still very much a part of the picture, having exchanged one overlordship for another. Thraken didn't like slavery, at least for humans, but he supposed there was no alternative under the circumstances. The Yuzen Vong wouldn't allow the use of droids, so someone had to dig the ditches, build the grand new buildings of Peace City's town center, and process the addictive glitter stem that made up the entirety of Ilesia's gross planetary product. The son of Tyan Gama Sal had been raised on an estate, as a gentleman, with an army of droid servants. In the place of droids, he needed someone to see to his comforts. Just as he needed someone to keep him from being murdered by the Senate and their cronies. They'd been madly conspiring and committing quiet violence against one another over control of the Glitterstim operation, but now they'd united against their new president. Thraken decided that he needed to find the most cold-blooded, ruthless, efficient killer among them, 
and win that person to his side. And one look at Dagomarl had convinced him that she was exactly what he was looking for. She was completely mercenary and completely without morals, something Thraken thought was to his advantage. She made her living as a bounty hunter and an assassin. She'd killed people for the Peace Brigade, and she'd killed Peace Brigade on behalf of other Peace Brigade. She seemed perfectly willing to kill Peace Brigade on behalf of Thraken, and that was all he asked. The most important thing about Daga was that she was smart enough to know when she was well off. Others might offer her a large sum to kill Thraken, but they weren't going to offer her a kilo of spice per week. The spice was the only thing on Ilesia that passed for money. The Yuzen Vong intendants in charge of running the supposed economy hadn't even seen a need for money. Their chief economic principle was that those who obeyed orders and did their work without question would be rewarded with shelter and food. It hadn't occurred to them that a person might want a little more than organic glop to eat, a membranous cavern to live in, and an overgrown fungus to sit on. A person might prefer to live in marble halls enjoying a bath with golden fixtures and the latest model atmosphere craft. Daga looked up at him. Is there anything you'd like me to do right now? Thraken sat, fingers stroking the smooth, polished surface of his desk. Evaluate security here in my office and in my residence. If you can't fix whatever's wrong, tell me and I'll fix it. She flipped him a casual salute. Right, chief. And if you can recommend any reliable people to assist you. She tilted her head in thought. I'll think about it. Reliability isn't one of the more common Peace Brigade virtues. Did I say Peace Brigade? Daga seemed startled by the vehemence of Thraken's words. I said reliable. I'll import someone if he's good enough. Though, he admitted, I prefer them human. A white smile flashed across Daga's features. I'll put together a little list, she said. There was a knock on the door. Daga made a slight adjustment to her clothing to enhance her homicidal capabilities, and Thraken said, Who is it? It was his chief of communications, an eddy named Dimu. Beg pardon, sir, he said, but the advance party for the joint maneuvers has entered the system. When are they scheduled to arrive? Thraken asked. They'll be landing at the spaceport in approximately two hours. Very good. Send the Quednak to the spaceport now, and I'll follow in my land speeder at the appropriate time. Ah, uh, Dima hesitated. Sir? Your Excellency? Yes? The Yuzen Vong, they don't like machinery, sir. If you arrive at the spaceport in a land speeder, they may consider it an insult. Thrak inside, then explained slowly and simply so that even an alien like Dimma could understand. I'll arrive before the Vong and then send the land speeder back to its docking bay. I will return with the Vong on the riding beasts. But I will not ride those stupid six-legged flatulent herbivorous lumbering ninnies to the spaceport when I don't have to. Understand? Dima hesitated, then nodded. Yes, sir. And please tell the construction gangs to keep their machinery out of sight while the Vong are in town. Yes. Of course, Your Excellency. Dima left the room. Daga Marl and Thraken exchanged looks. Of this I build a nation, he said. The Yuzen Vong frigate analog, which looked like a large brownish-green lump of vomit, arrived escorted by two squadrons of coral skippers, which looked like rather uninteresting rocks. Thraken's official bodyguards, whom he would not have trusted to guard his body if they were the last on Ilesia and who were most likely in the pay of various factions of the Senate anyway, shuffled into line and presented their amphistaffs. Amphistaffs. One of the Yuzen Vong's most annoying and dangerous exports. Thraken gave his official bodyguards a wide berth, 
as experience had shown they weren't very good at controlling the weapon their Yuzen Vong sponsors had so graciously given them. The previous week he'd lost two guards, bitten during practice by their own weapon's poisonous heads. Followed by his real bodyguard, Dagamal, Thraken marched to the frigate Analog and waited. Eventually a part of the hull withdrew somehow, and an object like a giant, wart-encrusted tongue flopped down to touch the landing field. Down this ramp came a double file of Yuzin Vong armored warriors with amphistaffs, which these warriors looked as if they knew how to use. Once formed on the pavement, they were followed by Supreme Commander Ma La, architect of the Yuzin Vong capture of Coruscant. Ma La's appearance was presentable for a Yuzin Vong. Unlike Na Maynard, with his brand new Plarian bowl implant, this eye replacement even larger and nastier than the one he had lost, or Shimra, who was so scarred and mutilated that his face looked as if it had gone through a threshing machine, Maul La's regular features were still recognizable as features. He'd restrained the impulse to carve himself up in honor of his vicious gods, and for the most part settled for red and blue tattoos. Thraken could actually look at him without wanting to lose his lunch. If he let his eyes go slightly out of focus, the tattoos formed an abstract pattern that was almost pleasing. He made a note to try to keep his eyes slightly out of focus for the rest of the day. Greetings, Commander, he said. Welcome to Ilesia. Maul La had fortunately brought a translator along a member of the intendant caste who had cut off an ear and replaced it with a glistening, semi-translucent slug-like creature the function of which Thraken preferred not to contemplate. Salutations, President Salsolo, Mala said to his translator. I come to remind you of your submission and to bring your fleet to its obedience. Air quite, Thraken said. A fine way with diplomacy these Vaughn have. The intendants on Ilesia have grown your Damutech. Would you care to see it? First I will inspect your guard. Thraken stayed on the far side of Maul La as the warrior inspected the presidential guard, hoping that if Maul La were accidentally sprayed with poison, Thraken himself might have a running head start before Yuzin Vong warriors began to massacre everyone present. Fortunately no fatalities occurred. A shabby lot of useless wretches, totally without spirit or discipline, Maula commented as he walked with Thraken to the riding beasts. I agree, Commander, Thraken said. Discipline and order should be beaten into them. What I wouldn't give to see them in the hands of the great Chokang La. Now that might be fun, Thraken thought, though without knowing who or what Chokang La might be. Thraken always enjoyed a good thrashing provided he wasn't the one on the receiving end. I'll dismiss their commander, he said. Their commander was a Duros, and therefore expendable. He'd replace the Duros with a human, provided he could find one who might conceivably be loyal. I trust the Peace Brigade fleet is ready? Mala said. Admiral Capo assures me that they are fully trained and alert and eager to serve alongside their gallant allies, the Yuzin Vong. Actually Thraken had no great hope for the motley force that was the Peace Brigade fleet. In fact he rather hoped that Ma La would be so disgusted as to execute the Ra Dian Admiral Capo, thus providing another vacancy Thraken could fill with a human. Again, if he could find one to trust. Here that always seemed to be the problem. Reflecting that he was a little old for this sort of thing, Thraken followed Ma La up the vine ladder to the purple-green resinous tower atop the six-legged form of a Yuzin Vong riding beast. The Quednek's moss-covered scales reeked of something that needed flushing down the nearest sewer. At the urging of its intendant handler, the beast lurched to its feet and set off for Peace City at a slow walk. Thraken hoped the motion wouldn't make him ill. A pair of swoop analogs, open cockpit flyers with a crew of two and sped along by Dovin basils, rose to take position on either side of the riding beast. Ma La wasn't trusting his life entirely to guards who moved on foot. 
Thraken cast a glance at the double file of Yuzen Vong warriors trotting along in the big lizard's wake. By the time they traveled the 22 kilometers to Peace City, perhaps even the fabled Yuzen Vong would be tired of the pace. Now that we have more of your people on the planet, Thraken ventured, I wonder if we might better provide for their spiritual needs. Mal La's answer was dry. How would you do that, Excellency? There are no temples to your gods here. Perhaps we could provide one for your people. That is a generous thought, Excellency. Of course, it is we who would have to provide the template for the structure, and, of course, the priest. We could donate the ground, at least. So you could, Ma La considered for a moment. As with many of my clan, I have always been a devotee of Yunyamka, the Slayer. It would be an act of devotion to foster his worship on a new world. Of course, the worship requires sacrifice. Plenty of slaves for that purpose, Thraken said, as heartily as he could manage. Ma La bowed his head. Very good. So long as you are willing to donate one from time to time. Thraken waved a hand dismissively. Anything we can do for our brothers. At least he could make sure none of the victims were human. I have a piece of land already in mind, he added. He certainly did. The land in question was adjacent to the Altar of Promises, where the Tilanda Till administered to the slaves their daily dose of telepathic euphoria. The Tilanda Till were said to have powers over all humanoid species, and Thraken was inclined to wonder if that included the Yuzen Vong. The sight of the Yuzen Vong rolling about in ecstatic bliss would certainly be a pleasing one. The sight would be even more pleasing if he could get the mighty warriors addicted to their daily blast of cosmic communion, as were the slaves. It seemed worth sacrificing a few aliens to have a whole regiment of Yuzen Vong addicts willing to do anything Thraken suggested in return for a daily ecstatic thunderbolt from their god. Thraken chuckled to himself and Shimra thought he was an expert on the taking of vengeance. So agreeable did Thraken find this vision that he almost missed Ma La's next statement. You should prepare yourself and the Senate for a special visitor in the next few days. It took Thraken a few seconds to realize the import of this. All his pleasing fantasies vanished like vapor before the wind. Shimra is coming here? He gasped. Mala snarled at him. The Supreme Overlord, he corrected savagely, will remain in his new capital until the gods tell him otherwise. No, it's another who will soon be paying you an official visit. With this one you will sign a treaty of peace, mutual aid, and non-aggression. A smile snarled its way across the warrior's face. Prepare yourself to meet the chief of state of the new republic. The streaming stars flashed and nailed themselves to the heavens, and the Ilesia system leapt into life on Jason's displays. Alarms bleeped at the realization that the ships in orbit around the planet were enemy. Jason closed up on Jaina, the formation leader, his X-wing tucked in neatly behind his sister's fighter. Twin Sun Squadron, check in! Jaina's voice on the calm. Twin Two said Jaina's Nymoidian waymate veil, vale, in real space with all systems normative. Twin three, another pilot said, in real space, all systems normative. The pilots all checked in, all the way to Jason, who had been added to Jaina's flight as twin thirteen. He made his report, the force filling his mind, and through it he felt the Jedi, fierce, Loyal Lobaka and the exhilarated Tess are near at hand, Corin Horn distracted by his own pilot's checklist, the cold-blooded exhilaration of Saba Sebatine and her wild knights. And more distantly, other elements of the fleet, the concentration of Tahiri, the melancholy determination of al the confidence of Zek, and the sheer power of KYP Durin, a power very much akin to rage. And most clearly of all, Jason felt the presence of Jaina, her mind ablaze with machine-like calculation. 
The Jedi meld filled Jason's mind, a psychic feedback mechanism between himself and the other Jedi. He was impressed by the meld's power, and by how it had grown since he'd last experienced it on MYRKR. There, it had been a mixed blessing, but then the Jedi war party at MYRKR had been divided among themselves. Here, they were united in a single purpose. Jason's sensitivity to the Force had grown within the meld, and he was aware of the other lives around him, the non-Jedi pilots of Twin Sun Squadron, and others nearby, particularly the disciplined minds of Jagged Fell's Chiss Squadron, which flew to port and slightly behind them. Jag had volunteered his squadron for this fight, even though they weren't technically a part of Kreefe's command. Once Kreefe had been reminded that Jag's veterans had originally been a part of Twin Sun's squadron before being split off, he'd accepted Jag's offer. Listen up, people. Jaina's voice came again on the calm. I know we outnumber the enemy, but that doesn't make the ordnance they'll shoot at us any less real. This isn't a drill, and you can get killed if you're not careful. I want everyone to stick with their waymate and keep an eye open for an enemy maneuvering to get behind you. Streak, she said to Lobaka. I want your flight to our right, a couple of clicks behind. Tessar, you're flying above and behind. Above was a meaningless term in space, but it was easier than saying, 90 degrees from Maya and Lobaka's axis. And Tessar knew what she meant, anyway. Copy, Tessar said, and Lobaka gave an answering roar. Remember that Jag fells to our left. Understood? There was a chorus of acknowledgments. Right then, Jaina said. Let's teach these traitors a thing or two. Jason was impressed. He hadn't realized Jaina had become such an effective leader. Her performance was even more impressive because, through the Jedi meld, he could also sense her scanning her displays while she was talking minding her calm channels, and worrying about her inexperienced pilots while trying to work out tactics that would keep them from killing themselves. Jason kept his fighter tucked into formation behind Jaina's, an extra wingmate for twin leader. His eyes scanned the displays and saw that Kreefe's entire armada had by now entered real space, three task forces grouped as close to Ilesia as the planet's mass shadow would permit. Each of the three groups was the equal of the entire Peace Brigade fleet, and they had the enemy force trapped between them. The only hope for the enemy commander was to leave orbit instantly and attack one of Kreefe's task forces, hoping to smash through it before the others arrived to overwhelm him. Moments ticked by, and the enemy commander made no move. His only real hope was slipping through his fingers. And then the enemy fleet moved, choosing as its target Twin Sun Squadron, and the task force behind it. The chief of state of the New Republic was in the middle of his address to the Ilesian Senate when one of Thraken's aides, the human one, fortunately, came scuttling down the aisle of the Senate building and began to whisper in Thraken's ear. Mala, who was watching the speech from another seat nearby, suddenly became very preoccupied with talking into one of the villops he wore on the shoulders of his armor. Thraken listened to the aide's agitated whisper, then nodded and rose. I regret the necessity of interrupting, he began, and saw the Senate's malevolent gaze immediately turn in his direction. A fleet from the New Republic has appeared in Ilesian space. He watched the august senatorial heads turn to one another in growing panic as a buzzing filled the hall. Thraken turned to the chief of state of the New Republic. You didn't tell anyone you were coming, did you? He asked. If it weren't a dire emergency in which he might be killed, Thraken might almost enjoy this. These are rebels! The new Republic Chief of State proclaimed. Rebels against rightful authority! They wouldn't dare fire on their leader. Perhaps, Thraken suggested, you'd care to get on the calm and order them to stop. The chief of state hesitated, then came down from the podium. This is the sort of misunderstanding that can only be cleared up later. Perhaps we should, um, seek shelter first. 
An excellent idea, Thracken said, and turned again to the Senate. I suggest that the honorable members proceed to the shelter. As a few bolted at top speed for the exit, he added, in an orderly manner, as if it would do any good. His words only seemed to accelerate their flight, desks overturning as the founders of the noble Ilesian Republic jammed shoulder to shoulder in the doors. Thracken turned to Ma La and suppressed a shrug. These people hadn't betrayed their own galaxy out of an excess of courage, and he couldn't say he was surprised by their behavior. The Yuzen Vong commander was barking into his little shoulder villop. His translator sidled up to Thracken. Commander La is ordering the forces that were already in transit for the joint maneuvers to come at once. Very good. Will the commander be going to his command ship? The distance to the spaceport is too great. Especially if you're traveling at the pace of a fat, ugly, hut-sized reptoid, Thracken thought. I can offer the commander room in our shelter, Thracken said. The commander has no need of the shelter, the translator said. He will instead take charge of the troops here in the capital. Excellent! I'm sure we're in good hands. Mal La finished his one-sided conversation and stalked toward Thracken, his fingers curled around his batron of rank. I will need to take command of your presidential guard and your paramilitaries. Of course, Thracken said. Be my guest, he feigned thought and added. It's a pity the Yuzen Vong gods are so opposed to technology. If they weren't, we'd have installed planetary shields and be perfectly safe. Mal La gave him a murderous glare, and for a moment Thracken's kidney tingled at the thought that he'd gone too far. Will you lead your forces into battle, Excellency? La demanded. Or will you seek shelter with the others? Thracken raised his hands. I regret that I have no warrior training, Commander. I'll leave all that to the professionals. He turned to Daga who had been waiting politely behind him all this time. Come, Marl. He left the room at a rapid but dignified pace, Dega falling into step by his side and half a pace back. Will you be going to the shelter, sir? She asked. Thracken gave her a sidelong smile. I know better than to hide in a hole with no back door, he said. Her cold grin answered his own. Very good, sir, she said. I'm going to the docking bay in back of the presidential palace and take my land speeder on the fastest route out of town. Daga's smile broadened. Yes, sir. Can you drive fast, Marl? She nodded. I can, sir. Very fast. Why don't you drive, then? While I make use of the razor I've stored in the back seat and change into the fresh clothes I stored there. Shadow bomb away. Jaina's voice came over Jason's headphones. Altering course, 30 degrees. Copy that, twin leader, Jason said. Jason remained tucked in behind Jaina's X-wing as the fighter lifted out of the way of the enemy fleet, which was set to come rampaging through this part of space in about 10 seconds and he used the force to help Jaina push the shadow bomb on ahead, toward its target, a Republic-class cruiser that was spearheading the Peace Brigade escape attempt. Enemy fighters ahead. Accelerating. Jason had already felt the enemy pilots in the force. He opened fire at where he knew they would be, and was rewarded with a flash that meant an enemy pilot hadn't powered his or her shields in time. Jason shifted to another target and fired, another deflection shot, but the bolts slammed into shields and flashed away. The target formation burst apart like a firework, each two-fighter element weaving away from Twin Sun's attack. At that moment Jaina's shadow bomb hit the enemy cruiser, and its bow blossomed in a blaze of fire. Jason was following Jaina after the corkscrewing enemy fighters, E-wings and the Jedi meld rose in his perceptions. He felt Corin Horn making a slashing run at an enemy frigate, the Wild Knights methodically destroying a flight of B-wings, 
but the knowledge wasn't intrusive. It didn't demand attention or take away from his piloting. It was just there, in the back of his mind. Stay close, Vale, Jason told Jaina's wandering waymate. Oh. Sorry. No chatter on this channel, Jaina admonished. I'm breaking right, now. Vale wandered even farther from her assigned position during this maneuver, and through the force Jason sensed the intense concentration of an E-wing pilot trying to get her into his sights. Jason deliberately wove out of his assigned place in an S-curve, and as he did so he was aware through the force meld that Jaina knew exactly what he was doing, and why. Turning left 30 degrees, Jaina said, which swung her fighter and veils into what the enemy pilot certainly thought was a perfect setup. Except that it led the enemy right into Jason's sights. He touched off a full quad burst of laser fire and saw the E-wing's shields collapse under the concentrated barrage. Jason fired again, and the E-wing disintegrated. Jason's heart gave a leap as the E-wing's wingmate chanced a deflection shot and scored a triple laser burst on Jason's shields, which held, and then Jason wove away. The E-wing in pursuit, until Jaina's own fighter swirled through a graceful, unhurried series of arcs, and she and Vale blew the brigadier and his craft to atoms. As she overtook Jason he could see Jaina's grim satisfaction through the cockpit, and she waggled her wings at him as he slid once more into position. Then he sensed her mood shift, and he knew she was receiving orders on the command channel. Twin sons, she said. Regroup. Reform on me. We're going to cover the landing party. Jason knew she was reluctant to leave the combat once it had begun, but he also knew that the fight was going well for the New Republic. The forces were evenly matched in numbers but the Peace Brigade personnel simply weren't up to the mark. Some mercenary pilots and starfighters were giving a good account of themselves, but the capital ships weren't fighting very well, and some of them were shedding escape pods even though they hadn't taken critical damage. A pair of enemy starfighter squadrons were fleeing the battle as fast as they could, with A-wings in pursuit. Kree Phase 2 additional task forces would soon be on the scene decisively tilting the odds even farther toward the New Republic, and at that point Jason wouldn't be surprised to see some of the Peace Brigade ships surrender. It was good to feel the enemy in the force again, Jason thought. The Yuz and Vong were an emptiness in the force, a black hole into which the light of the force disappeared. These Peace Brigaders at least registered as a part of the living universe, and because he could feel them in the force, Jason could anticipate their actions. Compared to the Yuzen Vong, these people were easy. Easy to destroy. He tasted a whiff of sadness at the necessity. These targets shouldn't be targets. They should be fighting on behalf of the galaxy against the invaders. Instead they had chosen to betray their own, and KYP Durin and Treus Krife were determined they'd pay the penalty. Twin Sun Squadron reformed and Jag Fell's Chiss squadron fell into place on their flank. The blue and white sphere of Ilesia grew closer. Jason saw the landing force separating itself from the closest of Crefe's task forces. We're going to take out the spaceport, Jaina said. And also to draw fire, Jason knew, so they could learn where the defenses were and knock them out before the ground forces, in their lightly armored landing craft attempted their assault. Configure your foils for atmosphere, Jaina said. The X-wings took on an eye shape as the foils drew together to become wings. The blue planet rolled beneath them, and then they saw a patch of green, one of the small continents coming up, and Jaina tipped her fighter toward it, with Jason and the others after. Jason's craft rocked to the buffets of the atmosphere. Flame licked at his forward shields. If he looked over his shoulder he could see sonic shock waves rolling over his foils like spiderwebs. The green land drew closer. Then new symbols flashed onto his displays, and his own voice echoed Jaina's cry. Skips! Coral skippers, dead ahead! 
The enemy fighters were rising from the spaceport, two squadrons worth, their Dovin basils yanking them clear of the planet's gravity. And in their wake came a much larger target, a frigate analog. The Yuzen Vong were clearly aiming for the landing force, which was swinging above the planet in high orbit, guarded by a pair of frigates and the screamers, a rookie squadron of X-wings under a 23-year-old captain. The escort could probably handle the attackers, eventually, but in the meantime the Yuzen Vong could cut up the landing force badly. Accelerating! Maximum thrust. Jaina called, and twin sons poured power to their engines. They were in a good position to bounce the enemy as the Yuzen Vong clawed their way up through the atmosphere. Jason looked at his displays and calculated angles, trajectories. I've got a shadow bomb, twin leader, he said. Let me take a run at the frigate. Through the Jedi meld he felt Jaina duplicating his own calculation. Twin 13, she decided. Take your shot. Jason dipped his nose and aimed for the patch of air he thought the frigate would pass through in another twenty standard seconds or so. The moment of release was difficult to judge. He couldn't find the frigate analog in the force, and Jason would have to make a guess based on how it appeared on his displays. Suddenly he felt the power of the force swell in his body, as if he just filled his lungs with pure universal power. Calculations stormed through his mind, faster than he thought possible. And distantly, he found he could detect the enemy ship, not as a presence in the force, but as an absence, a cold emptiness in the universe of life. There were Jedi nearby that hadn't yet engaged the enemy, Tahiri, KYP Durin, Zek, and Almarar. Since they hadn't been distracted by combat, they had just loaned him their power through the Jedi meld, sending him strength and aiding his calculation. He felt the cold metal of the bomb release mechanism in his fist, and he pulled it. Shadow bomb away. And then, as he pulled back the stick and fed power to the engines, he fired a pair of concussion missiles. The shadow bomb was a missile without propellant, packed instead from head to tail with explosive, and would either drift toward its target or be pushed with a little help from the force. The lack of a propellant flare made the bomb hard for the Yuzen Vong to detect, and the extra explosive gave a tremendous punch when it hit. The two concussion missiles were intended as a distraction for the Yuzen Vong. If the enemy were paying attention to the two missiles, coming in on a different trajectory, then they'd be less likely to see the shadow bomb dropping toward them. Thanks, Jason sent into the meld. And then he felt the others fade from his perceptions as first KYP, then the others, entered combat. The three parts of Kreefei's fleet had just united, Jason thought with the Peace Brigade forces trapped between them. The Brigaders were about to lose their whole fleet. The nose of Jason's X-Wing pointed higher, toward the distant glowing exhaust ports of Jaina's squadron. This put the frigate below in a perfect position to shoot at him, the fire heading practically up his tail. He saw the plasma cannon projectiles and missiles coming, and he jinked wildly for a few seconds, until his shadow bomb hit the Yuzen Vong ship and blew its nose off. Along with the nose went the Dovin basils that were being used for defense, so even the two concussion missiles slammed home. What doomed the Yuzen Vong frigate wasn't the damage, but the aerodynamics. If the frigate had been in the vacuum of space it probably would have survived, but its fate was sealed by Ilesia's atmosphere. The frigate began to weave through the air like an out-of-control skyrocket as the wind seized hold of its torn bow section. Parts tore off and flew away, spinning downward, and then the frigate lost control completely and began a death spiral toward the planet below. Jason's attention was already on the combat above him. Jaina and Jag Fell had bounced the coral skippers and had killed at least three of them, their wrecked hulls plunging downward in the atmosphere with tails of flame but now the battle had become a melee. Again aerodynamics worked to the advantage of the New Republic. A coral skipper had all the aerodynamics of a brick, but the X-Wings, with their foils closed, made decent, 
maneuverable atmosphere craft. Still, Jason sensed Jaina's tension through the Jedi meld. Half of Twin Sun Squadron were still rookies, easy meat for an experienced enemy, and the Yuzen Vong were flying like veterans. An X-Wing trailing fire plunged past Jason as he climbed, and he saw a flash as the pilot ejected. Fragments of burning Yorick coral crashed onto Jason's shields as he climbed. That meant another coral skipper accounted for. He would be at too much of a disadvantage if he climbed straight into the fight, so he avoided the battle and got above the fur ball before rolling his craft into a dive. He felt control surfaces biting air as the X-Wing accelerated and found a target ahead, a coral skipper maneuvering onto the tail of an X-Wing that seemed to be wandering around randomly, like a dewback looking for its herd, doubtless one of Jaina's rookies. Jason chanced the deflection shot, quad his lasers, and opened fire, and only when he saw the coral skipper explode behind him did the rookie panic, flinging his fighter all over the sky to avoid a menace that Jason had already destroyed. Jason flew on, saw a coral skipper being chased by a Chiss cloak raft, the Yuzen Vong's dove in basil snatching the pursuer's bolts from the air as he flew. It was another chancy deflection shot, but Jason carefully pulled the fighter after the enemy, a smooth curve, then found that he was falling short, the enemy dancing just ahead of his shots. Frustration sang in his nerves, and he was on the verge of ordering his astromech to check his controls when he realized it was all the fault of the air. The atmosphere had slowed the fighter too much. He triggered a concussion missile then, and was rewarded by seeing it slam home on the Yuzen Vong's flank. The tough coral skipper kept on flying, but its dove basal was distracted and the Chiss pilot's next shot flamed it. Jason's heart leapt as he realized he was in danger, and he jerked his stick to the right as shots flared past his canopy. He'd spent too long lining up his last target, and an enemy had jumped him. He corkscrewed through the sprawl of swirling fighter craft and managed to lose his pursuer and when he stopped his dodging there was an enemy right in front of him, flying right into his sights while lining up on a cloak raft. Jason blew him apart with a quad laser burst. He was through the fur ball now, and pulled back the stick to climb and repeat his maneuver. The others had slowed down to maneuver, and were easy targets for anyone diving in from above. He doubted that he could manage three hits on every pass but there was no reason not to try. Jason made a lazy loop while he scanned the fight through his cockpit, then he half rolled upright and fed power to the engines. A sudden cry came over the calm. I've just lost rear shields. Anyone. This is Twin 2. I've just lost an engine. Help. Twin 2 was Vale, Jaina's rookie wingmate, probably lost and without cover. He felt Jaina's rising tension through the force meld as she searched for Twin 2, and he scanned the mass of weaving fighters as he approached, seeing one madly dancing X-Wing with a tail of flame, a pair of skips weaving after her. Break left, Twin 2, he called. I've got you. Breaking left. Panic and relief ward in Vale's reply. Jason hit the atmosphere brakes and the X-Wing slowed as if it had hit a lake of mercury, and then he crabbed his jouncing fighter around into a shot on the lead coral skipper. His laser bolts blew the canopy away and sent the craft in an end over and spin for the planet below. The second enemy dodged his lasers, and Jason yanked his fighter into an even tighter turn, the atmosphere jolting the craft, dropping its speed. The enemy swallowed his concussion missile into the singularity of its Dovin basal and caught the laser bolts as well, but Jason saw Vale dart away into safety while her pursuer was preoccupied. And then enemy rounds were hammering on Jason's shields, and he released the atmosphere brakes and tried to roll away, punching the throttle. He'd slowed down too much, losing speed and maneuverability and choice. An enemy had found him and was hovering off his tail, hurling round after round after him while he tried desperately to regain speed and the ability to maneuver. 
Jason's astromech droid chittered as the aft shields died. And then there was a crash that Jason felt through his spine, and the stick kicked against his gloved hand. The X-wing slewed abruptly to the left. It slowed so much that the pursuing coral skipper overshot, passing within meters of Jason's canopy, and his head swiveled on his neck as he looked frantically in all directions, trying to spot any additional threats. And there it was. On the end of Jason's left foils, its claws dug into the paired laser cannons, was a Gretchen, one of the winged, insected, metal-eating creatures that the Yuzenvong sometimes released with their missiles. A Gretchen whose malevolent black-eyed gaze stared back at Jason, before it turned to its work and took a leisurely chomp out of the upper left foil. Jason dived to gain speed, working the controls frantically to keep the X-Wing balanced as the weight and drag of the Gretchen threatened to destabilize it. As speed built he was rewarded by the Gretchen digging its claws more firmly into the foil, hunching against the battering it was receiving from the atmosphere. Jason felt his lips draw back in a harsh smile. He'd hoped the wind would strip the Gretchen away, but this was the next best thing. The creature couldn't eat his ship as long as it was spending all its strength just to hang on. Then Jason pulled back on the stick and fed power to the engines. The only way to get rid of the Gretchen was to open the canopy and shoot the thing off his wing. But he couldn't open the canopy and stand up as long as he was in Ilesia's atmosphere. The wind would tear him right out of the craft and send him tumbling toward the planet below with half the bones in his body broken. An interesting dilemma, he thought. The Gretchen couldn't eat his craft as long as Jason was flying at speed through the atmosphere, but he couldn't get rid of the Gretchen until he got out of the atmosphere altogether. This would call for fine judgment. This is Twin 13, he said into the calm. I've got a Gretchen on my wing. I'll be back after I deal with it. Copy, came Jaina's voice. He could hear the strain of combat in the terse expression and feel her stress in the force. Jason kept his eyes on the Gretchen and his throttles all the way forward. He kept the nose tipped as far as he could without losing speed, and slowly the buffeting of the atmosphere eased as the air thinned. When the Gretchen was able to lift its head and take another bite of the upper port laser cannon, Jason stood the X-wing on its tail and fled straight up into space. The Gretchen shifted its grip and took another bite, and the laser cannon tore free and spun away into the darkening sky. Jason reached for his blaster and loosened it in its holster. The whisper of wind on the canopy was almost gone. The second laser tumbled into the sky, and the Gretchen turned, its claws clamped firmly on metal, and walked methodically along the two united foils, heading for the engine. Jason extended the foils into the exposition, hoping to shake it free or slow it down, but without success. Instead he felt, rather than heard, a crash as the Gretchen's head drove like a metal punch into his engine cowling. Better do something, he thought. He threw the cockpit latch. As the cockpit depressurized, force fields snapped into place around him, preserving his air. The sound of flight vanished, though he could still feel the vibration of his craft sounding up his spine. Red lights were flashing on his engine displays. He nudged the controls to the cockpit servos, lifting it slightly open. When he felt no turbulence, he opened the cockpit all the way. He summoned the force to guide the fighter's controls as he stood in the cockpit and pulled his blaster from its holster. As he leaned out of the cockpit he saw the upper left foil fly away spinning, eaten away at the root. There was a flash of fire in the engine and it died. Surely, he thought, the flameout was enough to cook the Gretchen. He leaned farther out, bracing one arm on the cockpit combing, and thrust out the blaster. The Gretchen's beady eyes stared back at him with malevolent purpose. And then the creature's wings extended, and Jason's heart gave a lurch as he realized the Gretchen was going to leap straight for his face. He fired while mentally rehearsing the move necessary to snatch his lightsaber with his free hand in case the blaster didn't do the job. 
he fired again and again. The Gretchen reared, its clawed forelegs pawing the airless space between them, and Jason fired twice more. The Gretchen's head tumbled away into the emptiness. The rest of the Gretchen then followed. Blaster's work, Jason reminded himself as he eased back into the cockpit and sealed the canopy. His astromech droid had already prepared a damage report. Rear shields down, both port lasers gone along with the port upper S-foil, the other port foil damaged, and one engine destroyed. Jason thumped a frustrated fist on the cockpit combing. The X-Wing's aerodynamics had been wrecked. If he went into the atmosphere to aid Jaina now, his craft would go into a spin that would end only when he hit the ground. He had come here to aid Jaina, to make certain that she would never be without his support. Now he was leaving her in a desperate fight with the enemy. But once he had time to listen on Twin Sun's comm channel, it appeared that Jaina no longer needed his aid. She was ordering her squadron to regroup. Twin leader, this is Twin 13, he said. The Gretchen's dealt with. Jaina was all business. Twin 13, what's your status? I'm going to need to get a new fighter before I can rejoin. What's your condition? The fight's over. KYP and Saba came to help us. We're regrouping to hit the spaceport and cover the landing. And the Brigada's fleet? Surrendered. That's how KYP and Saba were free to join us. There was a pause. Twin 13, Twin 2 has lost an engine. I need you to escort her to rejoin the fleet. Understood, Jason said. Though considering the state of my fighter, Vale may end up escorting me. He heard snickers over the calm. Through the meld Jason felt his sister bearing the humor with patience. Just get her there, Twin 13, she said finally. Understood, Jason said, and rolled his fighter so that he could spot Vale approaching from the planet below. Inertial compensators, Thracken said as he contemplated the wreck of his land speeder. What a good idea. It had taken Thracken and Dagamar longer to escape Peace City than he'd expected, largely because so many others were fleeting on foot and had gotten in the way. Barely had they emerged from Peace City's ramshackle limits than a colossal spiraling chunk of Yorick coral had come tumbling down out of the sky like a grayish-green lump of cosmic vomit and impacted on the road just ahead of them. The explosion had thrown the landspeeder off the road and spinning into a patch of trees, where, between tree trunks and flying chunks of Yorick coral, it had been comprehensively destroyed. But the deluxe landspeeder, built originally for a young hut, to judge by the fittings, had been equipped with inertial compensators, and these had failed only after the vehicle had come to a complete halt. Thraken and Daga emerged from the wreck and scathed. Thraken turned to look at the shattered Yuzen Vong frigate lying in fragments beneath a thick cloud of smoke and dust. I don't think Ma La's forces are doing very well, Thraken said. There was a horrific smell of burning organics, and he remembered that the frigate had actually been alive, that something akin to blood had pulsed through its hull. He turned to Daga. You wouldn't have private means of getting us off the planet, do you? No, I don't. Or knowledge of a landspeeder anywhere nearby. Daga shook her head. Thracken shrugged. That's all right. One will come along in a minute, stop to work out how to get around the wreckage, and then we'll steal it. Daga flashed him her shark's grin. Boss, I like the way you think. They crouched for some time in the trees by the road, but no landspeeder came. The explosion, with its cloud of smoke, had discouraged anyone from fleeing in this direction. Thracken shrugged. I guess we walk. Where are we walking to? Away from the city that's about to be pounded into gravel. Thracken began picking his way through the debris field. There was relatively little left to burn. Most of the frigate had been rock, and the smoke was dissipating. 
He and Daga fled back into the cover of the trees as a flight of fighter craft howled out of the sky and shrieked along the road toward Peace City. The fighters were distinctive, with ball cockpits and weird jagged pylons on either side. Thraken was annoyed. TIE fighters? We're being attacked by the Empire now? He glared. I call this excessive. He shook his finger at the sky. I call this overkill on the part of fate. He waited a few minutes, then rose from his crouch among the bushes and scanned the sky carefully. I guess they're gone. But let's stay in the trees and... Daga cocked an ear to the sky. Listen, boss. Thraken listened, then ducked into the bushes again. This is outrageous, he muttered. Haven't these people anything better to do? Another squadron of fighters, X-Wings this time, blasted along the road, their wakes sending the last of the debris smoke swirling out to the sides in huge corkscrew whirls. Then out of the smoke came a phalanx of whining white landing craft that settled onto the huge scar created by the falling frigate. The last wisps of smoke were flattened by the repulsor lift fields as the landers neared the ground, and then the great forward hatches swung open and whole companies of armored soldiers floated out on military land speeders that bristled with armament. Right, Thraken said as he and Daga tried to dig themselves into the turf. We wait till they've gone on to the city, and then we steal one of the transports and head for home. Daga gave him a look. Home had better be pretty close. Those transports won't have hyperspace capability. Thraken ground his teeth. This was not working out. The soldiers briskly secured a perimeter, and more craft whined to a landing. It looked as if the soldiers had landed in at least regimental strength. I think we're in trouble, Daga said. The soldiers' perimeter had expanded as new craft landed, and troopers were now quite close. An officer with a scanner had spotted the two lifeforms in the trees, and at his command a pair of land speeders swung toward the wooded area where Thraken and Daga were hiding. Right, Thraken said. We give ourselves up. First chance you get, you break me out, and we steal a ship and head for freedom. I'm with you there, Daga said, right up to the point where I take you with me. I don't think you're going to have access to a weekly kilo of spice after this. I've got more than spice, Thraken said. Get me to Corellia, and you'll find I'm stinking rich and willing to share. His words were interrupted by an officer's amplified order. The two of you in the woods, come out slowly and with your hands up. Thraken saw Daga's cold eyes harden as she calculated her chances, and his nerves leapt at the thought of being caught in a crossfire. He decided he'd better make up her mind for her. Darling! He shouted. We're saved! And then... As he scrambled to his feet, he whispered, Leave your weapons here. He pasted a silly grin to his face and came out of the trees, his hands held high. You're from the New Republic, right? Bless you for coming. The officer approached and scanned him for weapons. We saw those Thai fighters and we thought maybe the Emperor was back. Again. That's why we were hiding. Your name, sir? Phasem, Thraken said promptly. Ludus Phasem. We were part of a refugee convoy from Falin, got captured by the Peace Brigade and enslaved. He turned to Daga, who was walking carefully out of the trees with her hands raised. This is my fiancé Daga, he coughed, realizing Daga might have a warrant out for her. Fargoblag. He gave her a grin. What do you think, darling? He asked. We're rescued. She managed a smile. You bet. She said. This is great. Daga was scanned and came up clean. The officer gave them a searching look from under the brim of his helmet. 
You look pretty well fed for slaves, he said. We were house slaves, Thracken said. We just did, ah. Uh, his invention failed him. House things. The officer turned to look over his shoulder. Corporal! Thracken and Daga were marched to an open area under the guard of the corporal. The area, gouged dirt scattered with hot, crumbling Yorick coral, had been reserved for captured civilians, but Daga and Thracken were, for the moment, its only two occupants. Fargoblag? She grated. Sorry. How do you spell it? Thracken shrugged. He looked at the troopers in their white armor, ready for an advance on Peace City, and wondered what they were waiting for. The answer came in the form of a pair of X-wings that hovered to a stop right over their heads, not knowing the large open space had been reserved for civilians. Thracken and Daga were forced to move to one side as the two crafts settled onto their repulsor lifts. Thracken spoke under cover of the engine whine. You've got to hold out, right? Sure. I always carry a weapon that'll get past the scanner. The engines whined to a halt, and the cockpits lifted. A ginger-haired Wookiee stood in the cockpit of the nearest and lowered himself to the ground. Good, Thracken said, lowering his voice. It's a Wookiee. They're not very bright, you know. What happens now is that you clip the Wookiee, then we both hop in the fighter and rock it out of here. Dega raised an eyebrow. You can fly an X-Wing? I can fly anything Inca makes. Won't it be a little crowded? It'll be uncomfortable, yes. But it won't be nearly as uncomfortable as prison. He gave her a significant look. You can take my word on that last part. And if the cockpit seemed to be too small for them both, Thracken thought, he'd just leave Daga behind. No problem. Daga gave the matter some thought, then nodded. It's worth a try. She turned to examine the situation more closely just as the second pilot stepped around the Wookiee's craft. Thracken saw the slim, dark-haired form and felt all the color drain from his face. He turned away abruptly but it was too late. Hi, Cousin Thracken, Jaina Solo called. However did you know we've been looking for you? I wonder if you can remember when you held me prisoner, Jaina said cheerfully. Thracken Sal Solo tried to fashion a smile. That was all a misunderstanding. And long ago. You know... Jaina cocked her head and pretended to study him. I think you look younger without the beard. General Tigran Jumeirah, the commander of the landing force, whirred up in his command vehicle, rose from his seat, and gave Thracken a careful look. You say this is the Peace Brigade president? He asked. That's Thracken all right. Jaina looked at the black-haired woman who had been with Thracken. I don't know who this is. His girlfriend, maybe? Thracken seemed a little indignant. This is the stenographer the government assigned me. Jaina looked at the woman and her cold eyes and bright white teeth and thought that clerical assistants were certainly looking carnivorous these days. Thracken approached the general and adopted a pained tone. You know, there's a family vendetta going on here. He pointed at Jaina. She's got it in for me over something that happened years ago. General Jamira gave Thracken a cold look. So you aren't the Peace Brigade president? Thracken threw out his hands. I didn't volunteer for the job. I was kidnapped. The Vaughn were getting even with me for killing so many of them at Fonder. Lobaka, who had been listening, gave a complex series of moans and howls, and Jaina translated. He says they got revenge by making you president? If you killed more of them, they'd make you emperor? They're diabolical, Thracken said. 
It's a very elaborate piece of revenge. He jabbed a finger toward the small of his back. They destroyed my kidney. It's still bruised, you want to see? He began pulling up his shirt. Jaina turned to the commander. General, she said, I'd put Thraken on the first land speeder into town. He can guide us to our objectives. She turned to her cousin and winked. You'll want to help us, right? Since you're not Peace Brigade, after all. I'm a citizen of Corellia. Thraken insisted. I demand protection from my government. Actually, you're not a citizen anymore, Jaina said. When the Centerpoint party heard you defected, they expelled you and sentenced you in absentia and confiscated your property and... But I didn't defect. I... Right, General Jamira said. On the first land speeder he goes. He looked at Thraken's companion. What do we do with a woman? Jaina looked at her again, cogitated for a moment, and moved. In a couple of seconds she had the woman's wrist locked and had relieved her of her holdout blaster. I'd put stun cuffs on her, Jaina said, and handed the blaster to General Jamira. How did you know she was armed? Jaina looked at Dagamarl and thought about why she'd made her decision. Because she was standing like a woman who had a blaster on her, she decided. Daga, her wrist locked and her elbow hoisted above her head, snarled at Jaina from under her arm. Troopers came to cuff her and put her under guard. Let's get moving, Jamira said. Jaina marched Thraken to the first land speeder and sat him in front, next to the driver. She herself folded down a jump seat and sat directly behind him. The operation was going better than she'd expected. Jamira had landed most of his force here, to drive on Peace City, but he'd stationed blocking forces on all routes from the capital to catch any brigaders trying to flee. The fight in the atmosphere had delayed things a bit, but it had also wiped out the only Yuzen Vong ships in the system. Still, a wary alertness prickled along Jaina's nerves. There was plenty that could yet go wrong. She turned to Thraken. Now you be sure and let us know where your side's first ambush is going to be, she said. Thraken didn't bother turning to face her. Right. Like they tell me. The first ambush took place on the outskirts of the city center. Peace Brigade soldiers firing from atop flat-roofed buildings on the land speeders below. Blaster bolts and shoulder-fired rockets sparked off the land speeders' shields, and the soldiers aboard returned fire from their heavy vehicle-mounted weapons. Jaina, crouched behind the bulwark in case something got through the shields, looked at her cousin, who was crouched likewise, and said, Want to order them to surrender, President? Oh, shut up. Jaina ignited her lightsaber and sprinted to the nearest building, a two-story block of offices. Lobaka was on her heels. Rather than burst in through a door, which was what defenders might expect, Jaina sliced open the shuttered viewport and hurled herself through the gap. There were no peace brigaders, but there was a mine set up to blast anyone coming in through the door. Jaina disarmed it with the press of a button, then cut the wire connecting it to the door for good measure. Lobaka was already roaring up the stairs, his lightsaber a brilliant flash in the dark stairwell. Jaina followed him to the roof exit, which he smashed open with one huge furry shoulder. Whatever the dozen or so defenders on the roof might have expected, it wasn't a Jedi Wookiee. They fired a few bolts at him, which he deflected with his lightsaber. Then before Jaina even emerged they fled, dropping their weapons and crowding for the wooden scaffolding that supported a part of the building that was being reinforced. 
Lobaka and Jaina charged them and were rewarded by the sight of several of the enemy simply diving off the building in their haste to escape. When Jaina and Lobaka reached the scaffolding, with the eight or nine soldiers still clinging to it and lowering themselves to the street, Jaina looked at Lobaka and grinned, and knew from his grinning response that he shared her idea. Swiftly the two sliced the lashings that held the scaffold to the building, and then, with Lobaka's wookie muscles and an assist from the force, they shoved the scaffolding over. The brigaders spilled to the ground in a splintering crash of wood and were swiftly rounded up to by more of Jamira's troopers, who had sped around the ambush to outflank it. Jaina looked up. Enemy on the next roof were still firing at the land speeders below, unaware their comrades had been captured. She and Lobaka had worked together so long they didn't need to speak. They trotted ten paces back from the edge, turned, and sprinted for the parapet. Jaina put a foot on the edge and leapt, the force assisting her to a soundless landing on the roof. The squad of brigaders were turned away, firing into the street below. Jaina grabbed one by the ankles and tipped him over the edge, and Lobaka simply kicked another over the parapet. Jaina turned to the nearest as he was reacting, sliced his blaster rifle in half with her lightsaber, then punched him in the face with the hilt of her weapon. He sprawled over the parapet unconscious. Lobaka deflected a bolt aimed for Jaina, then caught the rifle with the tip of his lightsaber and flung it into the air. Jaina used the force to guide the flying rifle to a collision with the nose of another brigader which gave Lobaka time to heave his disarmed enemy into the street below. That took the fight out of them, and the rest surrendered. Jaina and Lobaka chucked the captured weapons to the street, then turned them over to a squad of New Republic troopers who came storming up the stairs. The shooting was over. Jaina looked ahead to see the large, new buildings of the city center. She saw no reason to return to the landspeeder. She could guide the military to their objective from her vantage point on the rooftops. She leaned over the parapet and gestured to General Jamira that she would go ahead over the roof. He nodded his understanding. Jaina and Lobaka took another run and leapt to the next roof, checking the building on all sides to make certain that no ambush lurked in its shadows. They then sprang onto the next building, and the next. Across from this last was what was probably intended to be a wide, impressive boulevard, but which consisted at the moment of a muddy excavation half filled with water. The air smelled like a stagnant pond. Beyond were some large buildings that would be very grand when finished. Jaina knew from her briefings that a large shelter had been dug behind the largest building, the Senate House, and subsequently covered over by the plantings of what was supposed to be a park. The whole expanse was deserted. Smoke rose from several areas on the horizon. Jaina called the force into her mind and probed ahead. The others in the force smelled, sensing her purpose, sent her strength and aided her perception. The distant warmth of other lives glowed in Jaina's mind. There were indeed defenders in the Senate building, though they were keeping out of sight. Sending thanks to the others in the force meld, Jaina clipped her lightsaber to her belt, hurled herself off the building, and allowed the force to cushion her fall to the Duracrete below. Lobaka followed. They trotted back to General Jamira's command speeder. There they found the general conferring with what appeared to be a group of civilians. Only on approaching did Jaina recognize Lilla Dade, a veteran of Page's commandos who had volunteered to lead a small infiltration party into Ilesia in the aftermath of the battle and set up an underground cell in the enemy capital. This is your chance, Jamira told her. Very good, sir. She saluted and flashed Jaina a grin as she led her team into the nearly deserted city. Jamira turned to Jaina, who saluted. There are defenders in the Senate building, sir, she told him. A couple hundred, I think. I have enough firepower to blow the Palace of Peace down around them, Jamira said.
but I'd rather not. You might see if you can get your cousin to talk them into surrendering. I'll do that, sir. Jaina saluted and trotted back to the lead landspeeder. The general's got a job for you, cousin Thracken, she said. Thracken gave her a sour look. I'll give diplomacy my best shot, he said, but I don't think Shimmer is going to give Karuskin back. Ha ha, Jaina said, and jumped into the landspeeder. Jamira's forces advanced on the government center on a broad front, repulsor lifts carrying them over the baggy, torn ground, their heavy weapons trained on the half-finished buildings. Starfighters split the sky overhead. The landspeeders halted 200 meters from the building. Jaina looked at what she thought was a tarpaulin stretched over some construction work, and then realized it was the flayed skin of a very large hut. She nudged Thracken. Friend of yours? Never met him, Thracken said shortly. At Jaina's instruction, he stood and picked up the microphone handed him by the landspeeder's commander. This is President Sal Solo, he said. Hostilities have ceased. Put down your weapons and leave the building with your hands in plain sight. There was a long silence. Thracken turned to Jaina and spread his hands. What did you expect? And then there was a sudden commotion from the Senate building, a series of yells and crashes. Jaina sensed the soldiers around tightening their grip on their weapons. Repeat the message, she told Thracken. Thracken shrugged and began again. Before he was half finished the doors burst open and a swarm of armored warriors ran out. Jaina started as she recognized Yuzin Vong. Then she saw that the warriors had raised their hands in surrender, and that they weren't Vong, just Peace Brigade wearing laminate imitations of Vanduin crab armor. In their lead was a Duro's officer, who ran up to Thracken and saluted. Sorry that took so long, sir, he said. There were some Yuzin Vong in there, intendants who thought we should fight. Right, Thracken said, and ordered the warriors into the hands of the landing force. He turned to Jaina, his look dour. My loyal bodyguard, he explained. You see why I decided to head out on my own? Why are they dressed in fake armor? Jaina asked. The real armor kept biting them, Thracken said acidly, and sat down again. We need you to lead us to the bunker where your senators are hiding, Jaina said and to the secret exit they'll use for their escape. Thracken favored Jaina with another bitter glare. If there was an escape hatch from that bunker, he asked, do you think I'd be here? The bunker turned out to have a huge blast-proof door, like a vault. Thracken, using the special comm relay outside the bunker to talk with those inside, failed to persuade them to come out. General Jamira was undeterred, sending for his engineer company to come down from orbit and blast the door off the bunker. Jaina felt time slipping away. None of the delays so far had been critical, but they were all beginning to add up. Mal Law restrained the instinct to duck as another flight of enemy starfighters roared overhead. The villip in his hands retained the snarling image of the dead executor he'd used to try to command President Sal Solo's useless bodyguard and whom the presidential guard had killed rather than obey. The cowards would be thrown in a pit and crushed by riding beasts, he promised himself. The Damutech grown on the outskirts of the capital to house his troops had been destroyed early in the attack, fortunately after he'd gotten his warriors out. But since then they'd been forced to remain in cover, pinned down by the accursed starfighters that patrolled at low altitude overhead. Fighter cover had been so heavy that Mala had been unable to move even a few of his warriors toward the city center to guard the Peace Brigade government. He gathered that the Peace Brigade fleet had surrendered, more candidates for the pit and the riding beasts, Mala thought. His own small force of spacecraft had at least gone down fighting. And now, he suspected Ilesia's government was about to fall into the hands of the enemy. 
But even considering these developments, Ma La found himself content. He knew that the new Republic forces were about to suffer a surprise, and that the surprise should draw the heavy fighter cover away. And once he could safely move his warriors, there would be more surprises in store for the raiders of the new Republic. And many blood sacrifices for the gods of the Yuzen Vong. Jason and Vale brought their limping X-Wings aboard Crefe's flagship Raurust. By the time Jason powered the fighter down he knew that the Peace Brigade forces had folded like a house of cards, both in space and on the ground, and that the New Republic forces were digging the last of the leadership out of their bunker. Those who had nothing in common but treason, he thought, had no reason to trust one another or fight on one another's behalf. There was no unifying ideology other than greed and opportunism. Neither was likely to create solidarity. He dropped to the deck, breathing gratitude that the raid was a success. It had been his idea to capture the heads of the Ilesian government, and his fault that Jaina had volunteered to go in with the ground forces. If the mission had gone wrong he would have been doubly responsible. Jason first checked out Vale to make certain she was all right, then inspected their X-Wings. Both would require time in a maintenance bay before they would fly again. Jason Solo? A Bahan officer, very much junior, approached and saluted. Admiral Crefe requests your presence on the bridge. Jason looked at Vale, then back at the officer. Certainly, he said. May Lieutenant Vale join us? The Bataan considered the question, but Vale was quick to give her own answer. That isn't necessary, she said. Admirals make me nervous. Jason nodded, then followed the Bahan out of the docking bay toward the forepart of the ship. And then he felt the universe slow down as if time itself had been altered. He was aware of how long a time it seemed to take for his foot to reach the floor, aware of the long space between his heartbeats. Something had just changed. Jason let the Jedi meld that had been sitting quietly in some back room of his mind come to the fore, and he felt surprise and consternation in the minds of the other Jedi, a confusion that was soon replaced with grim resolve and frantic calculation. Jason's foot touched the deck. He took a breath. He was aware that a Yuzen Vong fleet had just entered the system, and that his plan for the Battle of Ilesia had just gone terribly wrong. I think we'd better hurry, he told the startled Bahan lieutenant, and began to run. The huge cutting beams of the engineer's lasers were chopping the vault door into scrap. Jaina shrank away from the bright light and heat. She could sense panic through the vault doors, panic and flashes of desperate readiness from those preparing themselves for hopeless resistance. A few blaster bolts came spanging out of the torn vault but the lasers were shielded and the blasters did no damage. Jaina looked at the troopers preparing to storm the Senate bunker, and she thought that was a lot of firepower to subdue a group who might be no more prepared to resist capture than their army or fleet. She found General Jemina and saluted. Sir, I'd like to be first into the vault. I think I can get them to surrender. Jamira took barely a second to consider the request. I'm not going to tell a Jedi she can't be the first into a tight spot, he said. I've seen what you people can do, he nodded. Just be sure you call for help if you need it. I will, sir. She snapped the general a salute and trotted back to the vault door. The cutting was almost done. Melted Duralai had frozen on the floor of the anteroom in the shape of a waterfall. Jaina stood next to Lobaka, who gave her a significant look as he unclipped his lightsaber. Jaina grinned. Without a word he'd shown he understood her plan and approved. Jaina ignited her own lightsaber as the laser finished its final cut. With a shove of the force she pushed the final chunk of the vault door into the interior, where it rang on the floor. Blaster bolts flashed out of the hole, and someone inside shouted. You people keep out. 
Jaina leapt through the door headfirst, tucked into a somersault, came out on her feet. The blaster fire sizzled after her, allowing Lobaka to follow through the hole without being targeted. The room was bare duocrete, with no furniture and few fixtures. The Peace Brigade senators were huddled in corners, shrinking away from those who were determined to fight for their freedom. Blaster bolts came at Jaina thick and fast. She leapt for the nearest shooter, parrying blaster fire with her lightsaber. Bolts ricocheted off the hard walls and ceiling, and someone cried out as he was hit. The shooter was a big genet, and snarled at Jaina as she came for him. She sliced the blaster apart with her lightsaber, then kicked the genet in the teeth with an inside crescent kick. She followed through with a heel hook that dropped the genet to the floor. She saw Lobaka grab a couple of other shooters, a pair of fighting ganks, and bang their heads together. Peace Brigade senators scuttled and huddled for cover. Another blaster went off, and Jaina parried the bolt back into the shooter's knee. The force powered a jump that took her the six meters to the Ishi Tib shooter, where she kicked the blaster out of her hand, and then the force seized the blaster and smashed it into the face of another shooter. His own bolt went wild into the crowd of senators, and there was a scream. Lobaka leapt on him from behind and smashed him in the head with one massive furry hand. There was silence, except for the sobs of one of the wounded. The room stank from the ozone discharge of weapons. Armored New Republic troopers began to enter the room, weapons directed at the brigaders. Jaina brandished her lightsaber over the cowering group its loud thrum echoing in the small room, and called, Surrender! In the name of the New Republic. On the contrary, a commanding voice said, In the name of the New Republic, I call on you to surrender. Jaina looked in surprise at the tall, cloaked figure that rose from a huddled group of brigaders, at the arrow-shaped head and writhing face tentacles. Senator Plo? She said in surprise. Chief of State Po, the Quarren corrected. Head of the New Republic. I am present on Ilesia in order to negotiate a treaty of friendship and mutual aid with the Ilesian Republic. I call upon New Republic forces to cease these acts of aggression against a friendly allied regime. Jaina was so taken aback that she barked out a surprised laugh. Puo, an avowed foe of the Jedi, had been a member of Borsk Felaya's advisory council. When Felaya died in the ruin of Coruscant, Po had declared himself chief of state and began to issue orders to the new republic government and military. He might have gotten away with it if he hadn't overplayed his hand. When the Senate reconvened on Mon Calamari, ironically, Po's homeworld, they'd issued an order calling on Po and all other senators to join them. Instead of obeying, Po had issued an order to the Senate calling for them to join him on Quat. The Senate had been offended, formally deprived Po of any powers, and conducted their own election for chief of state. Eventually, and after a full measure of the usual skullduggery, the pro-Jedi Cal Olmus was elected. Since then, Po had been traveling from one part of the galaxy to another, trying to rally his ever-diminishing number of supporters. This peace treaty is vital to the interests of the New Republic, Po went on. This typical Jedi violence is on the verge of spoiling everything. Jaina's grin broadened. Apparently Po had grown so desperate that he decided that he could only regain his prestige and following if he came to Mon Calamari waving a peace agreement. I'm very sorry to disturb any important treaties, she said. Perhaps you would care to step outside and speak to General Jumeirah? That will not be necessary. I call upon the general and the rest of you to leave Ilesia at once. The Ishitib, lying at Jaina's feet, began a gradual movement aimed at freeing a weapon concealed somewhere within her robes. Jaina stepped on her hand. The movement ceased. I think you should speak to the general, she said 
and turned to the dozen soldiers who had been quietly entering the room during the course of this discussion. Please escort Senator Plo to the general. Two armored troopers marched to either side of Plo, seized his arms, and began carrying him toward the vault door. Take your hands off me. He boomed. I'm your chief of state. Jaina watched as Poe was carried away. Then she bent to relieve the ishi tib of her hidden blaster, and straightened to address the rest of the brigaders. And the rest of you, she raised her voice, should file out of the room one by one, with your hands in plain sight. Soldiers searched and scanned the brigaders, then cuffed them, before they were allowed out of the vault. Engineers entered and began preparing explosives to destroy the bunker once it had been evacuated. Jaina and Lobaka waited in the bare room as the brigaders slowly left. They were aware of the change in the Jedi meld at the same time, the sudden vast surprise at the appearance of a new enemy. Here's where it all goes wrong. The thoughts sang at the back of Jaina's mind. She looked at Lobaka and knew that the Wookiee shared the knowledge that their time on the ground had run out. Maul La gave a roar of triumph as the patrolling starfighters suddenly throttled up their engines and pointed their noses to the sky. The arrival of a Yuzen Vong fleet had given the infidels better things to do than cruise the air above Peace City. It was time to meet the enemy, but Maul La knew that the battle was lost at the city center. There was no point in reinforcing the Peace Brigade's failure. Another course recommended itself. The commander also knew where the New Republic forces were at the present. He knew that eventually they would have to retreat to their landing zones outside of town. Between these two places he would make his killing ground. And conveniently, the Quednak stables happened to be nearby. He called into the shoulder villop that communicated with his warriors. Our hour has arrived, he said. We will advance to meet the enemy. Jason arrived breathless on Raurus' bridge to find Admiral Crefe already making his opening moves. An enemy fleet had leapt out of hyperspace, and Crefe was placing his own ships between the Yuzen Vong and the ground forces on Ilesia. Welcome, Jason. The white-furred Bahan said, his eyes still fixed on the holographic display that showed the relative positions of the fleets. I see you understand there's been a new complication. How many? Jason said. Their forces are roughly equal to ours. But so many of our personnel are inexperienced, I would prefer not to engage. He raised his eyes from the display. Fortunately, my opposite seems in no hurry to begin a fight. Indeed, this was the case. The Yuzen Vong weren't moving to attack, but were instead hovering just outside Ilesia's mass shadow. Can you give me a starfighter? Jason asked. I'm afraid not. Our fighter bays were packed with operational craft only, plus their pilots. We carry no spares. Frustration snarled in Jason as Crefe's attention snapped back to the display. Ah, the admiral said. My opposite is moving. The Yuzen Vong had detached a part of their force and were extending it to one flank, perhaps intending a partial envelopment. Easily countered, Crefe said, and ordered one of his own divisions to extend his own flank, matching the enemy movement precisely. Jason stalked around the room in a brief circle, angry at his own uselessness. He considered returning to his X-Wing and flying to Ilesia to Jaina's aid, and then realized that his wounded craft wouldn't be an asset, but a liability. She'd have to detach pilots to look after him, pilots who would have many better uses in an engagement than escorting a crippled ship. He finally surrendered to the fact he was going to spend the rest of the battle aboard Raurust. Jason found a corner of the bridge out of everyone's way and let the Jedi meld float to the surface of his mind. If he couldn't be of any direct use in the upcoming battle, he could at least send strength and support to his comrades. Jaina and Lobaka, he sensed, were in motion, speeding toward their fighters. The other Jedi were waiting in their cockpits, 
waiting for the battle to begin. Jason could sense them in relation to one another, an array of intent minds focused on the enemy. Through the meld, he sensed the Yuzen Vong fleet make another move, another division shifting out onto the flank, extending it farther into space. Only half a minute later did he hear Krefei's staff announce the move, followed by the Bathan Admiral's counter. The Yuzen Vong kept moving to the flank. And Jason began to wonder why. Plo and Thrak and Sao Solo, cuffed, were keeping each other company in the back of the land speeder. Neither of the illusory presidents seemed to have much to say to the other, or to anyone else, at least not since Thrakens muttered. Do I really have to sit with the squid head? As Paul was directed into the vehicle. As it turned out there was no room for Thraken or anyone else to sit. The land speeders were standing room only, packed with soldiers, prisoners, and refugees. The vehicles moved as fast as possible toward the landing zone, though they were being slowed by crowds of refugees, slaves, and other unwilling workers begging for transport off-planet. As many as could fit into the land speeders were pulled aboard. In their withdrawal to the landing zone the speeders hadn't gotten onto the roads in any particular order, and the speeder that Janus shared with Lobaka, Thraken, and Poole was more or less in the middle of the column. The column had reached the outskirts of the city, which at this point consisted of a strip of buildings on either side of the main road, all surrounded by wild country, unaltered terrain. Jaina turned at the sound of an explosion behind her, a concussion followed by a shock wave that she could feel in her insides. Smoke and debris jetted high over the surrounding buildings. The engineers had just destroyed the brigadier's bunker as well as the Palace of Peace and other public buildings. Jaina turned to face forward just as a giant, lichen-colored beast stepped from behind a building into the road in front of the column. Jaina's heart thundered as the lead land speeder crashed into the animal, enraging the beast even though the inertial dampeners on the machine saved the crew and passengers. Another speeder smashed into the first from behind, preventing it from reversing. The beast reared onto its hind legs, and Jaina saw Yuzen Vong warriors clinging for dear life to their basket on the beast's back. Shields sparked and failed as the Quednek's first four feet dropped massively onto the speeder. Jaina could hear the screams of the passengers as they died. Jaina reached for her lightsaber, then her blaster, then hesitated. None of her weapons could kill this animal. Vehicle-mounted weapons split the air as they opened fire on the riding beast. The Quednak screamed and charged forward, crushing the forepart of a second landspeeder and brushing aside a third. One of its riders was hurled from his seat and flew, arms windling, into the side of a nearby building. Back! Back! Take a side street out of here! The officer in command of the land speeder barked orders to the driver. And then Jaina felt a shadow fall over her, and she turned. Another riding beast was being driven out into the road behind Jaina's speeder. Her lightsaber leapt into her hand and she took three long jumps to the back of the land speeder and launched herself for the riders on the Quednex back. The force seemed to catch her by the spine and fling her onto the creature's back and she gave silent thanks to Lobaka for the assist as she landed on the broad, flat haunches. She was poised atop the middle pair of legs, her balance uneasy with the creature's lurching, swaying motion. The two riders sat in a shell-shaped box forward. Jaina ignited her lightsaber and charged, her boot driving for traction on the moss-covered surface of the beast's scales. One of the Yuzen Vong in the box leapt out to face her while the other continued to guide the beast. The air reeked of the Quednak's stench. Landspeeders dodged from beneath its clawed feet. Panicked gunners at the tail of the column were opening fire, scorching the creature's massive sides, but the Quednak remained under the control of its driver. Jaina's opponent thrust out his amphistaff, its head spitting poison. Jaina slapped the poison out of the air with a force-generated wind and sprang forward to engage, thrusting right for the Yuzen Vong's tattooed face. 
His circular parry almost tore the lightsaber from her fingers, but she managed to disengage in time, and now she made a less impulsive attack. Jaina's violet blade struck again and again, but the Yuzen Vong parried them all, an intent look visible under the brim of the Vanduin crab helmet. He was concentrating solely on defense, on keeping her off the driver until he could trample the maximum number of land speeders under the beast's claws. Frustration built in her as she redoubled her attack, the violet blade building into a pattern that would result in the amphistaff being drawn out of line and opening the Yuzen Vong for a finishing thrust. Unexpectedly Jaina threw herself flat on the Quednek's back. A bright red-orange bolt from a blaster cannon ripped the air where she'd been half a second before. The Yuzen Vong hesitated, blinking, dazzled by the flash, and then Jaina rose on one hand only and lashed a foot forward, sweeping the warrior's feet. He gave a cry of pure rage as he tumbled off the creature's sides. Jaina hurled herself toward the driver in his box, but another cannon opened fire, and the box disappeared in a flash of flame, the heat scorching her face. Frantically she looked for a way to control the creature. The Quednak gave a cry of absolute fury and began to back, trying to turn to get at the source of the blaster bolts that were tormenting it. A volley of bolts slammed into the beast and blew Jaina off the creature's back. She tumbled free, calling on the force to cushion her landing on the Duracrete. Even so the impact knocked the breath from her lungs, her teeth clacking together on impact. From her position on the ground she saw Loi dragging wounded civilians from a wrecked landspeeder, other intact speeders milling amid a swarm of confused refugees and stunned prisoners, and the death agonies of the other Quednak, which had finally succumbed to heavy weapon fire. Then the second beast, the one she'd ridden, took a cannon bolt to the head, and reared as it began to die. Jaina saw the slab-sided wall flank begin its fall and she scuttled like a crab out of the way as the creature came down in a wave of stench and blood. An agonized thrash of its tail threw a pair of land speeders against the wall, and then the giant lizard was dead. Dead riding beasts now blocked the road at either end, trapping the column between rows of buildings. Overhead came a pair of swift flyers, swoop analogs, that dived over the street, plasma cannons stuttering. Jaina rolled away from fire and flying splinters as superheated plasma ripped the duocrete near her. The worst threat from the swoop analogs wasn't their cannons, however. Each had a Dovin basal propulsion unit in its nose, and these living singularities leapt out to snatch at the landspeeder's shields, overloading them and causing them to fail in a flash of frustrated energy. Jaina rose to her feet, her head swimming with the magnitude of the disaster. There was nothing she could do against the aircraft without her X-Wing, so she staggered across the Duracrete to aid Lobaka in helping injured civilians. With the force she lifted rubble from a wounded Radian. Concentrated fire from the soldiers blew one of the swoop analogs apart. The other, trailing fire, was deliberately crashed by its pilot into a landspeeder, and both craft were destroyed in an eruption of flame. It was then that Jaina heard the sudden ominous humming, and her nerves tingled to the danger as she swung to face the sound, her lightsaber on guard. A buzzing swarm of thud and razor bugs sped through the air, racing for their targets, and then Yuzen Vong warriors swarmed out of the office buildings on the south side of the street, while from either end of the street they came pouring like a wave over the bodies of the dead riding beasts. From five hundred throats came the chorus battle cry, do Aroic Vong Pratt! There were screams as scores went down before the flying wave of deadly insects. Jaina slapped a thud bug out of the sky with her lightsaber and neatly skewered a razor bug that was making a run for Loi's head. The Yuzen Vong warriors slammed with an audible impact into the stunned, milling crowd in the street. The New Republic soldiers were so hampered by the swarms of non-combatants that they were barely able to fire in their own defense. The Yuzen Vong leapt right aboard the landspeeders that had suffered the loss of their shields, slashing through screaming civilians and prisoners in order to reach soldiers so tightly packed they couldn't raise a weapon. 
Jaina parried away an amphistaff that was swung at her head, and let Loi, thrusting over her shoulder, dispose of the warrior who wielded it. The next warrior went down before a pair of lightsabers, one swung high, one thrust low. Jaina readied a cut at a figure that lurched toward her, then realized it was one of Thraken's bodyguards in his preposterous fake armor. A shrieking human female, bloody from a razor bug slash and helpless with her hands cuffed, stumbled into Jaina's arms, and died from the lunge of the snarling Yuzen Vong warrior who was willing to run her through in order to reach Jaina. Jaina shuffled away from the thrust in time, and then, before the warrior could clear his weapon from his victim, her point took him in the throat. The two halves of a razor bug, sliced neatly in half by Loi's lightsaber, fell on either side of Jaina. She and Lobaka were able to protect themselves against the buzzing horror, and the troopers were at least armored, but the civilians had no defense and were being torn to shreds. The handcuffed prisoners were even more helpless. We've got to get these people into the buildings where we can protect them. Jaina shouted to anyone who could hear. Get them moving! With shouts and gestures, Jaina and Loi rounded up a group of soldiers who helped to herd the civilians into the buildings on the north side of the street. This gave other soldiers, and the few land speeders that were still in operation, a clearer field of fire, and the Yuzen Vong began to take more casualties. In the midst of the confusion Jaina saw General Jamira staggering backward with a group of his troopers around him. All of them seemed wounded. A squad of Yuzen Vong were in pursuit, their amphistaffs rising and falling in a deadly, urgent rhythm. Loi! It's the general! The Jedi charged, lightsabers swinging. Jaina hamstrung one enemy warrior, then ducked the lunge of another to drive her lightsaber up through the armpit, the one part unprotected by armor. A third Yuzen Vong was knocked to his knees by a force-aided double kick after which one of Jamira's troopers shot him with a point-blank blaster bolt. Two of the soldiers grabbed Jamira under the arms and hustled him to one of the buildings on the north side of the street, a restaurant with booths by the viewports and a bar against the back wall. There, other soldiers firing from the viewports had clear fields of fire and were able to score hits on any pursuers. Loi and Jaina covered the retreat, blocking one shot after another with their lightsabers before rolling backward through the viewports. The room was filled with stunned people, most of them civilians slumped at the tables. Jaina recognized Poe standing tall among them, his face bloody, one tentacle sliced neatly off by a razor bug. The Yuzen Vong were still fighting, trying to get into the buildings. Jaina and Lobaka each chose a viewport cutting and parrying through the opening while the soldiers fired continuously at the attackers. It was flanking fire that eventually drove the attackers away. The Yuzen Vong had ambushed only the first half of the returning convo. The rear part of the column was largely intact, though unable to maneuver its speeders over the dead riding beast that blocked the road. Instead Colonel Tosh, in command of the rear guard, pulled his soldiers off the land speeders and sent them climbing up the massive flank of the dead Quednak. From its summit the troopers commenced mass volley fire on the street below, a fire intense enough to cause the Yuzen Vong to fall back to the buildings on the southern side of the street. Jaina extinguished her lightsaber and gasped for air. It was amazing how fast things had gone wrong. Time was running out and with it lives. General Jamira stood gasping for breath, one arm propping him against a wall while he talked into his calm unit. Blood stained his white body armor. He looked up. What's behind us? He said. Can we pull back to the north, then rendezvous with the land speeders? One of the soldiers made a quick check, then returned. It's uncleared forest, sir he reported. The land speeders couldn't get through it, but we could move through on foot. Negative. Jamira shook his head. We'd lose all cohesion in the woods and the Vong would hunt us to death. He turned to look out the shattered front viewport. 
We've got to get back to the land speeders somehow, then take another route around the roadblock. He looked grim and pressed a hand to a wound on his thigh. Tell Colonel Tosh he's got to give U.S. covering fire as we break out. But we're still going to lose a lot of people once everyone gets into the street. Jaina became aware that her comm unit was bleeping at her. She answered, This is Solo. This is Colonel Fell. Are you in difficulty? The other Jedi seemed to think so. Relief sang through Jaina at the sound of Jag's voice, though the relief was followed immediately by embarrassment at its intensity. She struggled to keep her voice calm and military as she answered. The column's run into an ambush and has been pinned down, she said. What's your location? I'm with Twin Sun Squadron in orbit. We're on standby, waiting for you and Lobaka to rejoin us. An enemy fleet has appeared and the situation has grown urgent. It's imperative that the landing force return to orbit as soon as possible. You don't say, Jaina snapped, her relief fading before annoyance at Jag's pompous tone. Stand by, Jag said. I'll lead the squadrons on a bombing and strafing run and blast you out of there. Negative, Jaina said. The Vaughn are right across the street, too close. You'd hit us, and we've got civilians here. I still may be able to help. Stand by. Jag, Jaina said. You've got too many rookies. They'll never be able to stay on target. They're going to splatter a hundred civilians, not to mention the rest of us. Stand by, twin leader. Jag said, insistent. Annoyance finally won over relief. Jaina looked at General Jamira in exasperation. Did you hear that, sir? Jamira nodded. Even if he can't do a strafing run, starfighters might keep the Vong's heads down. We'll wait. General! Poe's commanding voice rang from the back of the room. This is absolute folly! I demand that you allow me to negotiate a surrender for these people before those fire-happy pilots blow us all to pieces. The Corrin stalked forward. Jamira faced him, straightening, and winced as he put weight onto his wounded leg. Senator, he said. You will oblige me by remaining silent. You are not in charge here. Neither are you, it appears, Poe said. Your only hope, and the hope of all under your command. With his cuffed hands he made a gesture that encompassed the soldiers, the civilians, and the prisoners. Is to surrender at discretion. I shall undertake the negotiations entirely at my own risk. Surrender at discretion. Jaina was surprised by Thraken's sarcastic voice coming from the back of the room. Her cousin rose from the chair he'd occupied and limped forward. She could see that the long muscles of his back had also been sliced open by a razor bug. Up until now I thought the Jedi were the most pompous, annoying gas bags in creation, Thraken said. But that was before I met you. You take the prize for the most preposterous, self-important, prolix fiasco I have ever seen. And on top of that, he stared at close range into Poe's indignant eyes. On top of that, sir, you are a fish. So sit down and shut up, before I take a harpoon to you. Poe drew himself up. Your display of rank prejudice is... Thraken waved a hand. Can it, chief? Nobody's listening to your speeches now. Or will ever again, I guess. Poe returned Thraken's glare for a long moment and then his gaze fell, and he retreated. Then Thraken turned his scowl on the others, Jaina, Jamira, and the rest. I'm not a Vong collaborator, no matter what the rest of you think. And I'm not about to let a subaquatic imbecile sell us out to the enemy. With an air of painful triumph, Thraken dragged himself to his seat. From above came the peculiar creaking roar of a claw fighter passing slowly overhead. 
Jaina could imagine Jag in the pilot's seat, flying the cloakraft inverted to give himself a better view of the scene below. When Jag's voice returned, it was thoughtful. Our forces are on the north side. Yes, but... The Yuz and Vong are regrouping. They'll be launching another assault in a few minutes. I'll commence a bomb run with our two squadrons to break up the attack. Tell your people to stay undercover and be ready to run. No, Jaina said. I know my rookie pilots. They don't have the experience. Stand by, twin leader. And tell those soldiers standing on the dead animal to take cover. Jaina almost dashed the calm link to the ground in frustration. Instead, she gave a despairing look to General Jamira, who was looking at her with a furrowed, thoughtful expression. Jamira raised his own calm link to his lips. Fighters are about to make a run. Everyone is to get under secure cover and prepare to run for the land speeders on my command. Tosh, get your people off that creature and under the speeder shields again. And then, with weary, silent dignity, General Jamira took shelter beneath the table. The others in the room did their best to follow suit. The roar of starfighters floated through the broken viewports. Jaina, remaining on her feet, stepped to the viewport and took a quick look out. Black against the western sky was the Chiss squadron, the craft flying nearly wingtip to wingtip, echelon back from the leader in a kind of half-wedge. Of course, Jaina thought in admiration. Jag Fell would be in the lead, flying along an invisible line down the battlefield between the Yuzen Vong and the New Republic troops. The others were echeloned onto the Vong's side of the line. As long as they maintained their alignment on the leader, their fire couldn't hit friendly forces. Laser cannons began to flash on the Chiss leader, then on the others. Bolts fell on the street and on the roofs of the buildings opposite, a clatter of high-energy rain. Jaina dived under the nearest table and found Loi already taking up most of the room. You know, she said, sometimes Jag is really. Her thought was left unfinished. The first wave seemed to suck the air from Jaina's lungs, then transform it into light and heat that Jaina could feel in her long bones, her liver and spleen and bowel. Twenty-one more detonations followed the first as the Chiss unloaded. Whatever was left of the restaurant viewports exploded inward. Storms of dust blasted in from the street, and bits of debris. And then there was a silence broken only by the ringing in Jaina's ears. Slowly she became aware that her calm link was talking at her. She raised it to her lips. Say again? Hold your positions came the faint voice. Twin Sons is next. Tessa would be in the lead position, with the rest echelon in the same formation Jag had used. Jaina had no fear that any of the fire would go astray. Hold your positions! Jaina called. Another strike coming! There were sixteen runs this time, two from each of the X-Wings remaining. Jaina coughed as wave after wave of dust blew in the viewports. Again there was silence, broken only by the sound of sliding rubble from the buildings opposite. As she blinked dust from her lashes Jaina could see General Jamira rise painfully from his position under one of the tables, then raise his calm link to his lips. Soldiers, take up positions to cover the civilians. All non-combatants to the speeders, and then the rest of us follow. Hands toward the rubble off him, and Ma La saw the sky where he had thought he would never see the free sky again. He wheezed as he coughed dust out of his lungs. It's the commander! Someone called, and a host of hands joined to rip the debris away, then lift Ma La free of the wreckage. Ma La gave a gasp at a sudden, nauseating wave of pain, but he clenched his teeth and said, Subaltern! Report! The infidels made their escape after the bombing, Supreme Commander. But they've left hundreds of dead behind.
the subaltern hesitated. Many of them are Peace Brigade allies. Payne made Ma La snarl, but he turned the snarl into one of triumph. The treacherous infidels deserved their fate. They should have died fighting, but instead they surrendered and left it to us to give them an honorable death. He managed to turn another grimace of pain into a laugh. The invaders feared us, subaltern. They fled Ilesia once they had felt our sting. The supreme commander is wise, the subaltern said. Dust streaked the subaltern's tattoos, and his armor was battered. His eyes traveled along Ma La's body. I regret to say, Supreme Commander, he said slowly, that your leg is destroyed. I'm afraid you're going to lose it. Ma La snarled again. As if he needed a young infant of a subaltern to tell him such a thing. He had seen the Duraloid beam come down like a knife, and he had felt the agony in the long minutes since. The Shapers will give me a better leg if the gods will it, Mala said. He turned his head at a series of sonic booms, the infidel landers leaping skyward from their landing field. They think they've escaped, Subaltern, Mala said. But I know they have not. Before the enemy fire blew the building down on him, he had been in contact with his commanders in space and devised a strategy that would give the enemy another surprise. Was it possible to die of surprise? He wondered. As a tactician, he knew that it was. Jason stood in silence and held the Jedi meld in his mind. The last of the landing party was leaving Alicia, with Jaina and Lobaka, and the enemy commander still had not made his move. Instead, he continued to extend his flank, shifting a constant trickle of ships into the void. Admiral Crefe matched each enemy deployment with one of his own. Both lines were now attenuated, too drawn out to be useful as a real battle line. But why? Why had the enemy commander handicapped himself in this way, drawing out his forces until they were no longer able to fight cohesively? He had similarly handicapped Crefe, that was true, but he wasn't in a position to take advantage of it. What he should have done was attack immediately and try to trap the ground forces on Ilesia. In Jason's mind he could feel the Jedi pilots in their patrolling craft, scattered up and down the thinned-out enemy line. He felt their perceptions layered onto his, so he knew as well the positions of most of the fleet. And to their unified concentration on their own displays he understood where they were in relationship to the enemy. Why? Why was the Yuzen Vong commander maneuvering this way? It was almost as if there were a piece missing. A missing piece. The piece fell into place with a snap that Jason felt shuddering in his nerves. With some reluctance he banished the force and the comforts of the meld from his mind, and he called up his Vongsense, the strange telepathy he had developed with Yuzen Vong lifeforms during his captivity. An immeasurably alien sense of being filled his thoughts. He could feel the enemy fleet extending its wing out into space, the implacable hostility of its every being, from the living ships to the breathing Yuzen Vong to the Gretchens that waited packed into Yuzen Vong missiles. Jason fought to extend his mind, extend his senses deep into space, into the void that surrounded the Ilesia system. And there he found what he sought an alien microcosm filled with barbarous purpose. He opened his eyes and stared at Crefe, who was standing amid his silent staff, studying the displays. Admiral! Jason said. There's another Vong fleet on its way. He strode forward among the staff officers and thrust a pointing finger into the holographic display. It's coming right here. Right behind our extended wing where they can hammer us against the other Yuzen Vong force. Crefe stared at Jason from his gold-flecked violet eyes. Are you certain? Jason returned Crefe's stare. Absolutely, Admiral. We've got to get our people out of there. Crefe looked again at the display, 
at the shimmering interference patterns that ran over Jason's pointing finger. Yes, he said. Yes, that has to be the explanation. He turned to his staff. Order the extended wing to rejoin. A host of communications specialists got very busy with their microphones. Crefe continued staring at Jason's pointing finger, and then he nodded to himself. The extended wing is to fire a missile barrage here, Crefe said, and gave the coordinates indicated by Jason's finger. The capital ships on the detached wing belched out a gigantic missile barrage, seemingly aimed into empty space, and scurried back to the safety of the main body. When the Yuzen Vong reinforcements shimmered into real space the missiles were already amid them, and the new arrivals hadn't yet configured their ships for defense, or launched a single coral skipper. On the displays Jason watched the havoc the missiles wrought on the startled enemy. Almost all of the ships were hit, and several broke up. Crefe snarled. How can I hurt the Vong today? We've answered that question, haven't we? One of his staff officers gave a triumphant smile. Troop ships report the landing party has been recovered, Admiral. About time, someone muttered. Since the wing was contracting inward anyway, Crefe got the whole fleet moving in the same direction. The newly arrived Yuzen Vong were too disorganized and too out of position to make an effective pursuit. The first arrivals charged after Crefe but they were strung out while Crefe's forces were concentrating, and their intervention had no hope of being decisive. But even though Crefe had assured the escape of his force, the battle was far from over. The Yuzen Vong commander was angry and his warriors still possessed the suicidal bravery that marked their caste. Ships were hard hit, and starfighters vaporized, and hulls broken up to tumble through the cold emptiness of Ilesian space before the fleet exited the traitor capital's mass shadow and made the hyperspace jump to Kashyyyk. I don't want to do anything like that again, Jaina said. She was in the officer's lounge of Starsider, sitting on a chair with a cup of tea in her hand, her boots off, and her stocking feet in Jagfell's lap. Ilesia was like hitting your head again and again on a brick wall. She went on. One tactical problem after another and the solution to each one was a straightforward assault right at the enemy, or straightforward flight with the enemy in pursuit. She sighed as Jag's fingers massaged a particularly sensitive area of her right foot. I'm better when I can be Yun Harla the trickster, she said. Not when I'm playing the enemy's game, but when I can make the enemy play mine. You refer to Sabak, I take it, Jag said a bit sourly. Jaina looked at Jason sitting opposite her and sipping on a glass of gizzer ale. Are you going to take Crefe up on his offer of a squadron command? Jason inhaled the musky scent of the ale as he considered his answer. I think I may serve better on the bridge of Raurust, he said finally, and thought of his finger floating in Crefe's hollow display, pointing at the enemy fleet that wasn't there. Ilesia, he continued, showed that my talents seem to be more spatial and, uh, coordinative. Is coordinative a word? I hope not, Jag said. Jason felt regret at the thought of leaving starfighters entirely. He had joined Crefe's fleet in order to guard his sister's back, and perhaps that was best done by flying alongside her in an X-wing. But he suspected that he'd be able to offer a higher order of assistance if he stayed out of a starfighter cockpit, instead using the Jedi meld to shape the way the others fought. Look, Jag pointed out, Jane has got it wrong. Ilesia wasn't a defeat. Jaina's down pilots were rescued, and so were mine. We hurt the enemy a lot more than they hurt us, thanks in part to spooky mind meld man, here. He nodded toward Jason. We destroyed a collaborationist fleet and captured enough of the Peace Brigade's upper echelon to provide dozens of splashy trials. The media will be occupied for months. It didn't feel like a victory, Jaina said. It felt like we barely escaped with our necks. 
That's only because you don't have a sufficiently detached perspective, Jag said seriously. Mention of the Peace Brigade had set Jason's mind thinking along other channels. He looked at Jaina. Do you think Thraken's really innocent? Jaina was startled. Innocent of what? Of collaboration. Do you think the story he told about being forced into the presidency could possibly have been true? Jaina gave a disbelieving laugh. Too ludicrous. No, really. He's a complete human chauvinist. I know he's a bad guy and he held us prisoner and wants to rule Corellia as diktat, but he hates aliens so much I can't believe he'd work with the Yuzen Vong voluntarily. Jaina tilted her head in thought. Jag's foot massage had put a blissful expression on her face. Well, he did call Po a squid head. That's a point in his favor. If Sao Solo wishes to prove his innocence, Jag said, he need only volunteer for interrogation under truth drugs. If his collaboration was involuntary, the drugs would reveal it. Grim amusement passed across his scarred features. But I think he's afraid that such an interrogation would reveal how he came to be in the hands of the Yuzen Vong in the first place. That's what would truly condemn him. Ah, Jaina said. Jason couldn't tell if she was enlightened or, in light of the foot rub, experiencing a form of ecstasy. Jason, sipping his ale, decided that whatever the truth of the matter, it wasn't any of his business. End of Star Wars Dark Nest Book One The Joiner King by Troy Denning <laughs>